Hey, what's up? It's John from Coding Addict and welcome to React tutorial video. So as you already probably know, some time ago, React released its latest version, React 18. And I thought it's a great time to re-record React tutorial video. So essentially in this video, we're going to cover React from the very scratch using latest React version, React 18. Since it's a third iteration of this video, I also added a bunch of useful stuff. A readme file with all the notes, bunch of new challenges to immediately test our knowledge, and of course, tons of useful resources where you can find more info on specific topic. As a quick side note, this video is the first part of my React course. And since quite often I get this question, what's the difference between this video and the course? Let me just answer it here. First, course contains way more content. At the moment, it's somewhere around 60 hours. Specifically, it contains more tutorials for advanced libraries and complex custom projects. Second, if there are any changes, let's say React comes out with some minor update, I'm able to update the course content, which unfortunately is impossible to do with a YouTube video. And third, I provide assistance. So if you get stuck on some topic or project during the course, I will help you troubleshoot the issue. Lastly, if you enjoy the content and want to enroll in the React or any of my other web dev courses, just navigate to johnsmilk.com. Again, the URL is www.johnsmilk.com. Pick the course you want to attend, sign up for a newsletter, and I'll provide a $10 coupon for any of my courses. All right, and welcome to the course. And we're going to kick things off by quickly covering what in the world is React. And there's no better place to start than official docs, which by the way, are located at this URL, reactjs.org. Again, the URL is www.reactjs.org. And once we navigate there, we're greeted by this one profound sentence. React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. That's it, my friends, not a 10 page essay, just a short, concise, one sentence explanation. And while I'm a big fan of such straight to the point answers, let me elaborate a bit on that. So react was developed by Facebook. And it's still maintained by Facebook. But as you know, now the company name is meta. Its initial release was all the way back in 2013. And currently, it is by far the most popular JavaScript library to build user interfaces. As a side note, some of React competitors are Angular, Vue, and Svelte. Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, it's this one. When it comes to React, it's all about components. And you can think of components as independent chunks of user interfaces. Components can be as small as one HTML element, let's say a button or a heading two, or you can be a rebel and jam your entire Facebook clone in one component. At the end of the day, a lot of it depends on your preference and approach. In reality, though, you'll probably avoid the one component route since such approach somewhat defeats the entire purpose of using React in the first place. You see, the benefit of component is that you can build a bunch of independent, isolated, and most importantly, reusable user interfaces that you can then piece it together just like the Lego blocks. And as a result, build even super big and complex apps without going insane. While your app can have as many components as you like, it will always have at least one called a root component. We already glossed over it a bit, but just to reiterate, the major benefits of using components and essentially react to develop your next app are following. 
you can build independent pieces of user interfaces, meaning changing logic or layout in one component will not break your whole app. And once the component is ready to go, you can reuse it all throughout your app. But the component code is still stored in one place. So if you ever need to make some changes, you don't have to run around like a headless chicken. Simply locate the component, apply the changes, and all of the instances will be automatically updated. And of course, let's not forget about the speed. You see, behind the scenes, React is using something called a virtual DOM, where only the component that needs to be updated is affected. And what's really cool, it's done without re-rendering the whole app, which in turn, of course, increases the speed of your final product. And as a result, the user experience as well. Before I let you go, I also want to show you a great example of React components in action. And I'm going to use our beloved Twitter. If we take a look at the sidebar, we can see list of links. And you'll notice this repeating pattern where each link has the icon as well as the text. So with React, what we can do, we can set up a component that is going to accept those two things, the icon and a text. And essentially, once we have the structure in place, every time we want to use that link, we simply need to provide the data. So the icon and the text. And what's really cool, if we want to change something about the structure, we only need to do that in one place. And then all of the instances where we use the link are going to be automatically updated. And if we keep looking, in reality, there's tons of repeating patterns, not just in Twitter, but pretty much in any app or site that you see. For example, this feed notice again, we have the photo, we have the name of the person who's posting, we have the Twitter handle, and I can go on and on and on. So notice with every post, only the values are changing. So it's the same deal. We set up a structure, and then we just pass in the data. And if you're looking at it, you're like, well, okay, what's the big deal? Well, try doing that with HTML and CSS. You see, with just HTML, we don't have any kind of templating, correct? So effectively, we'll have to hard code all of this. But that's not the case with React. And if you're still not convinced, hopefully by the time I show you the first component, you'll see why React is so popular when it comes to building user interfaces. When it comes to course requirements, my expectation is that you're familiar with fundamentals of HTML, CSS, and most importantly, JavaScript. I'm going to honestly say that the more JavaScript you know, especially ES6, the easier it's going to be pick up React. Since at the end of the day, React is just JavaScript. So if you're familiar with basic tags, the general concept behind CSS selectors, array methods, and for example, a spread operator, you'll be in good shape. Now, it's not the end of the world if you're still getting comfortable with JavaScript. Just keep in mind that once in a while, you'll have to do some extra studying. Yes, of course. I'll try to cover even the straight up vanilla JS features in as much detail as I possibly can. But at the end of the day, it's a React course. So if you still need more info, please be prepared to utilize external resources. And one such resource is my YouTube channel, Coding Addict. More specifically, JavaScript Nuggets playlist. So before each video where we will utilize some vanilla JS feature, I'll share a link to a corresponding video where I cover that feature in vanilla JS environment. And hopefully that way you can simply watch the video, get up to speed, 
with what the specific feature is doing and continue with the course videos. All right, and up next, let's work on our dev environment. You see, when it comes to React, it requires more tooling than straight up vanilla JS, where we only need text editor and a browser. Now, not to worry, the setup is still extremely straightforward and you'll only need to do it once. Meaning, once the setup is in place, you will be able to start your React project in a lightning speed. Okay, and let's start with the browser. Yes, since we'll be developing web projects, we do need a browser. I personally use Chrome, but technically it's optional. You'll be able to follow along with a different browser as well. Just keep in mind that here and there, your results might slightly differ. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that your entire project won't work on a different browser. Just keep in mind that each browser has some default presets and therefore the same element, for example, input in different browsers can look slightly different. If you also want to download the Chrome, go to your favorite search engine, which in my case is Google Chrome, type install Google Chrome, click on a link and follow the instructions. All right, and up next we've got text editor. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, pretty much a standard these days, but just like the browser, you can follow along with a different text editor. The only downside here and there, I will show some nifty ways to speed up our development and you'll have to search for alternative available in your text editor. As far as my configuration, I keep it as close to default as possible, simply because I'm recording content. And as far as my extensions, I'm not going to cover them in this video, since in my opinion, a more solid approach is to showcase what the extension is doing with the actual example. So once we reach a point where one of the extensions becomes useful, I'll stop and explain in detail. And don't worry, you won't need all of these extensions to follow along. And the same goes for settings JSON. I will showcase the code once we actually need to work in the file. Now, just in case you are like super eager to see my config right away, just navigate to my GitHub profile and look for this repo, VS Code Setup 2022. Again, the repo is VS Code Setup 2022. Lastly, if you wanna install Visual Studio Code, just navigate to this URL and follow the instructions. Not bad, not bad. And before we install Node.js, let's quickly talk about this scary thing the terminal, or if you use Windows, the command prompt. And first, let's just establish that terminal is simply an alternative way to communicate with our computer. So instead of graphical interface, we just type commands. Also, don't worry, we won't run any dangerous commands in this course, like wiping out the entire file system or anything like that. For the most part, we'll run some basic commands like CD, which stands for changing directory, as well as commands provided by Create React App, a tool which we will install in few videos. Lastly, throughout the course, I'll also utilize the integrated terminal and Visual Studio Code. Please keep in mind that we can use them interchangeably. Essentially, you'll get the same results. And the only reason why I prefer integrated terminal in Visual Studio Code is simply because it right away points to the existing project. Effectively, it requires less work. And up next, let's install Node.js on our machine. Now, if you're not familiar with Node.js, it's a cross-platform JavaScript runtime environment, which allows us to build fast and scalable network applications. 
If you want to check whether the node is already present on your machine, just navigate back to the terminal and type node hyphen hyphen version or dash dash version. Again, the command is node hyphen hyphen version. Press return. And if it returns some numbers, you're good to go. However, if it returns something along the lines of command not found, please continue with the video. Now, in order to install a brand new node instance, we need to navigate to this URL, nodejs.org, or you can simply go to your search engine, type install node, and most likely this is going to be the first link. But again, the URL is nodejs.org. It will right away detect which operating system you're using. And in my case, that is Mac. And I highly, 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 highly recommend installing the LTS version instead of the current one. Again, I recommend installing the LTS version since that way there's a smaller chance you'll have to chase some weird bugs. You see, we will use some external libraries and it takes some time for those libraries to catch up with the node versions as well. So if you go with LTS, which is a stable version, there's a higher chance library or a package will work without any issues, which can't be said about the current version. At the time of this recording, the latest LTS version is 1812. But of course, since you're watching this in the future, your number most likely will be different. It will be higher. With that said, let me emphasize something. Just because you're using different node version, most likely a newer node version, does not mean, does not mean that the course content is old or invalid. Effectively, we only use Node to run our React app. Basically, we'll use Node to create a new React app instance. So newer or older Node version does not affect our code. Again, let me be very clear. And the reason why I'm being so annoying because I get these questions in Q&A, so I just want to address them here. And if by any chance a newer Node version will introduce some breaking changes, to our entire setup, rest assured, I will update the course content. So again, download the LTS version, follow the instructions, and once the install is complete, type again in the terminal, node dash dash version. Again, the command is node dash dash and version. And if everything is correct, you'll see the node version. However, if you get the error, please utilize your search engine and troubleshoot the issue since you won't be able to follow along with the upcoming videos. And once we have successfully installed Node, now let's finally spin up our first React application. Like I mentioned before, unlike vanilla JS, React does require more tooling. But luckily for us, we won't have to do it manually. For the longest time, the most popular option for scaffolding React apps from scratch was packaged by the name of Create React App. But as everything in web dev, things are changing and they're changing fast. And as I'm recording the third iteration of the React tutorial, actually there's a better and more popular option called Veet. And yes, it is pronounced Veet, not Byte. Now, since you will encounter create react app code examples in bunch of videos and blog posts during the first part of react tutorial so during the fundamentals part we are going to use create react app and once we get to advanced react concepts then we're going to switch to vite and of course i'll discuss why at this time Beat is a better option once we get there. Don't worry, both of them have similar setups, so it's going to be a very easy transition, I promise you. So as I was saying during the first part of React Tutorial, 
we're going to utilize package called create react app and you can easily find it by just typing create react app in your search engine it was created and it's being supported by the facebook team which means that we can always be sure that it uses all the latest and more importantly correct setup and if you go through the docs you'll see that the main goal of this package is to speed up our development basically with the help of this package we can right away start building our awesome react applications instead of tinkering and getting frustrated with complex config setups and effectively in order to get started we want to open up our terminal navigate to our working directory in my case that is going to be desktop and run this command npx create react app and the name of your application so in their example it's my app now before we do that let me explain the npm part you see when we install node we also install npm or node package manager which allows us to quickly install external packages and normally the command is going to be npm install or npm i for short and then the package name and don't worry if this sounds iffy it will make all the sense in the world once we install our first package and yes we'll do that throughout the course now why this command starts with npx instead of npm simply because instead of installing the create react app package on our machine which by the way used to be their old approach so we needed to install that globally and then we were able to create that new react application instance now we want to execute this package in order to create that new react app instance so instead of installing create react app on our machine we'll just execute it and as a result we'll get a brand new react application on our machine and yes basically every time we want to start working on new react app we'll have to repeat the same steps so let's try it out i mean you can type it manually you can copy it's really up to you in my case i think i'm just going to copy i'm going to navigate back and first let's just get on the same page so as i'm looking at my terminal i can see that i'm sitting in the root and um, i can definitely check that by just typing ls which effectively is just going to give me all the directories that i have and notice here i have desktop so in my case since i want to set this project in desktop i'm going to use cd which is change directory and then navigate to the desktop now do you have to work on a desktop no of course not for example you can set it up in your documents this part is really up to you so i'm going to go with cd then desktop so now i can clearly see that instead of root i'm located in a desktop again pretty much the same idea as with graphical interface the difference is that now of course we're just typing the command and then i'm going to copy and paste this command now let me right away show you a possible error that you might get and therefore i'll just keep this my app and i'll change that in a second so let's say if you run this command and it spits back the following error a fix that works for me is to add at latest at the end of create the react app now if the install is successful then of course you don't need to do anything but if you run into the same error just go with npx then create react app then add at latest and then come up with a name so in my case i'm going to call this tutorial like so again i'm located in the desktop we run npx because we want to execute this package and in order to avoid this bug we just go with at latest and then whatever is the name of our project 
and in my case that is tutorial press enter and the package is going to start setting up the application now it takes a little bit of time so i'll stop the video and i'll resume it once the install is complete okay it looks like the install is complete and like i mentioned before essentially we have two places where we can run our commands we can do that in the terminal or we can do that in the integrated terminal so notice here we have this npm start run build test as well as the eject and we'll talk about these commands a little bit later first i just want to spin up the application and in order to do that we need to run npm start and notice over here it pretty much says what the command is doing it starts up the development server on our machine now like i just said we have two places where we can run that we can use the terminal, but make sure that you navigate to this actual project. Because at the moment, I'm located in the desktop. So the fastest one is basically to drag and drop this one. And once I press enter, notice now I'm located in tutorial. So now I can run this npm start. And essentially, it's going to spin up the dev server. However, I prefer the integrated terminal that is in the Visual Studio Code. And how we can run that? Well, we first need to open up our text editor. Then we need to open up this project in our text editor, which again, I can simply drag and drop. And once we're done with that, we want to open up the integrated terminal. And in my case, the shorthand for that is control and tilde. And tilde key is located just to the left of the one key. So press this one and notice you'll have the terminal. And again, what's really cool about this integrated terminal that we right away located in this particular project. So I don't have to worry whether I'm in a desktop or I'm in some other folder. I know for sure that integrated terminal always points back to my project. And let's spin up that application. So I'm going to go over here with NPM and start. And effectively, this is going to spin up our React application. And we'll have our application on localhost 3000. And this is how our initial application is going to look like. As a side note, I prefer setting up VS Code and browser side by side, since that way I don't have to switch screens if I want to showcase something in the browser. But it's totally optional. You're not required to do that. Also, it's a Mac thing. So effectively, it has nothing to do with React. So here's what I want to do. I want to move this one down. Then I'll make it bigger, smaller again. Now it's going to be on my desktop. And essentially, I'll grab the code and then set it side by side. I'll spend the next video going over the files and folders that we can find in our new instance in this video i'll simply showcase that every time we'll make some changes in our code the dev server will right away update the browser as well now you don't have to code along again we haven't covered what is a source folder and all that but in my case i'm going to go to source folder then app.js and instead of this paragraph i'm just going to say i don't know maybe heading one so i'll just change from the paragraph to a heading one and then i'll say react tutorial once you save check it out right away we see the latest version in the browser which is really really awesome it definitely speeds up our development and like I said, in the following video, I'll go over the files and folders that we can find in our new React app instance. Okay, and once we're done with the install, now let's cover React fundamentals. As a side note, if you ever want to reference the complete source code, just navigate to my GitHub profile and look for this repo.
more specifically search for fundamentals directory. Also in there, you'll find a readme file with all of the topics we're going to cover in the fundamentals section. And yes, I will reference this file quite a bit in the upcoming videos. As far as the readme, I tried such approach in my MERN course. And since students seem to really like it, I decided to implement it in my other courses as well. Basically, the goal of the readme file is to save your time on note taking and to allow you complete tasks independently if that's your preferred way of learning content. All right, and once we have created our first React app, now let's quickly discuss files and folders provided by Create React App. And first up, we've got node modules. And effectively, in there, you'll find all of our dependencies. Essentially, the dependencies our project is using. And if you're iffy on the whole dependencies concept, just wait a little bit. In a few minutes, we'll cover package JSON. And once we do that, it's going to be easier to see the big picture. After that, we've got public folder, which contains static assets, including index HTML, which basically is the thing that is served to the browser. In other words, index HTML is responsible for whatever you see in the browser. And if you decide to inspect index HTML file, you'll see that it's pretty typical HTML file. So if you crack it open, you'll see that it has typical tags, it has the head element, it also has the body one and in the head element, we can change the title, get the fonts, CSS, maybe even a favicon. And just to show you that I'm not making this up, I'm going to navigate there, I'll search for the title tags and it's right here react tutorial or whatever value you want to provide and check it out the moment i change it i also can see that in the browser now one thing that is very very important is this div with id of root believe it or not our entire application effectively lives over here and i know it sounds somewhat unbelievable, but effectively our workflow is going to be following. We'll set up whatever logic we want or need in the source one, in the source folder. And then it's going to get injected in this route. And essentially as a result, we'll render our application in the browser. And don't worry, I will come back to this concept quite a few times because I fully understand that the first time you see that you're like, whoa, that's some really impressive stuff. Yep, I agree. After that, we've got source folder, which basically is the brain of our app. And therefore, in there, we'll do all of our work. Now, I'm not going to cover any of the files in source folder for now, since create react app creates bunch of boilerplate. And actually, I prefer, especially while we're covering fundamentals, setting everything up together from the scratch. But in short, in the source, we'll set up all our components, pages, utils functions, assets, CSS, and whatever else we need for our project. As we continue with the course, you'll see that there are really no restrictions on the folder structure inside source. So the way you manage your code really comes down to your preference, as long as there's index.js, which is going to be our JavaScript entry point. So remember the ID root in the index.html. Once we're done adding our functionality, like I said, it's going to get injected in there. And as a result, we will render our application in the browser. After source, we've got dot git ignore, which specifies which files will be ignored by the source control, effectively git. So if you navigate there, you'll see a list of files and folders that are going to be ignored once we push our project up to GitHub, for example. After that, we got package log, but let's just skip it for now. And first, let's discuss package JSON. And effectively, 
package JSON contains useful info about our project. Now, we will mostly be interested in two things, in scripts, as well as the dependencies. Now, package JSON is not specific to React apps. Pretty much every Node project has one, so let's take a peek. Essentially, like I said, useful info about our project. And you'll also most likely hear this term manifest file. So in here, we can see the name, we can see the version. And like I said, we are mostly interested in two things, independencies our project is using. So these are the main dependencies, as well as the scripts. So these are the commands we can run in our project. That's why when we run npm start, essentially, it sets up our application. And yes, we'll discuss the other commands a little bit later. For now, we're literally interested in this one, the npm start. Now, when it comes to commands, normally you go with npm run and then the command, but with start, we can simply go with npm and then start. Now, if you peeked at the node modules, you probably noticed that it's huge. It's literally massive. But in the package JSON, we actually have way less dependencies. So what's up with that? Well, you see, so these are the main dependencies our project is using. But we need to keep in mind that every time we get a dependency, so some kind of library, some other devs were kind enough to set up, and essentially we're just utilizing the code in that library. Well, those libraries can have dependencies on their own, which is the case over here. So every time we'll install dependency, which of course we'll do during the course, there's going to be more dependencies because the dependency has its own dependencies. Hopefully I'm making myself clear. So again, these are the main dependencies. And then since they have dependencies on their own, the node modules is quite big. And that's actually one of the reasons why you will always see it in Git ignore. I mean, in most cases. So when we're pushing this up to a GitHub, normally node modules are not included because they're huge. And there's also no need. If you have package JSON, the moment you'll run npm install, essentially you'll right away install all dependencies. So not just the main libraries, but also the dependencies that they are using. And that's why we also need a package lock because essentially it's a snapshot of our entire dependency tree. Now I can tell you right away that you really are not going to do any work in a package lock or node modules. So this is just a general info and pretty much you can forget about them. All of our work is going to happen in the source. And then yes, once in a while, we'll navigate to a package JSON, we'll discuss some package. And yes, we'll add few commands of our own, but that's later in the course. And lastly, we have a readme file, which essentially is a markdown file where you can share more info about the project. For example, build instructions and summary. And while we're still on a topic of readme, I just want to showcase how you can quickly get the readme that I provided. Now again, you don't have to do it. It's totally up to you. But just in case you're interested, navigate to that repo, look for fundamentals, then click on readme, then you want to go with the raw, essentially select everything, go back. Now, of course, I already have these values here select everything that's currently in a readme, copy and paste, and you are good to go. Now, one last thing that I quickly want to mention here and there, your results might differ a little bit as far as the browser, just because I'm using zoom level. So at the moment, I have 175. That's pretty typical for me. But here and there, you might see me going more or less. Since that way, I can showcase some stuff better. Again, not a big deal. It doesn't mean that the code is different. I'm just saying that visually here and there, our results might differ just because I use specific zoom level. That's about it. And up next, we're going to remove some boilerplate code. While well, create react app is super useful tool. Unfortunately, it adds quite a bit of boilerplate code. And especially while we're covering react fundamentals, I prefer setting up everything from scratch. Since that way we can build everything together. 
and in the process discuss the main purpose of some specific file or code snippet. So with that said, our first task is going to be somewhat straightforward. Remove most of the boilerplate. And we're going to do that in the following way. Navigate to your sidebar, remove the entire source folder, then create one from the scratch. Yes, I know this might sound redundant, but this is what we're going to do. And then inside of it, we want to create index.js. I can tell you right away that your application is going to break. Don't worry, we'll fix it in the next video. So let's navigate over here. Notice the source folder. I want to remove it. Yep, the entire folder. It goes to trash. Then we want to create a new folder. Let's call it source. And inside of the source, let's create that file. Our JavaScript entry point. So the index.js. And once we do that, like I said, our application is going to look different. Don't worry, we'll fix it in the next video. And also in this video, I want to mention that throughout the course, I'll toggle the sidebar just so I have more real estate. And in my case, the shortcut is command B. Now, if you're using different operating system, there's a great possibility that your shortcuts are different. And in order to get the shortcuts for your Visual Studio code, just navigate to this cog and then look for keyboard shortcuts. So for example, if I mention toggle sidebar, you can go here and then type toggle and then sidebar. And somewhere in there, you'll find your shortcut. And the reason why I prefer using such shortcuts is because they save a bunch of time and in the long run, massively speed up the development. All right. And now let's finally set up our first component. And in order to create a component in React, effectively, this is what we'll need to do. And as you're looking at it, your first thought probably is, wait a minute, guy with a weird accent. That looks a lot like a JavaScript function. And guess what? You're absolutely, positively, 100% correct. Yes, in order to create a component in React, essentially, we need to create a function. Yes, of course, there are differences. Essentially, that's the whole point of the section is to show you what differences are there between the good old vanilla JS function and the components that will be creating React. But always, 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 when you think of component, think of function. Every time you want to create a component, think I need to create a function. And yes, it can be function with good old function keyword, or you can create the arrow function. That part doesn't really matter. Like I said, a lot depends on your preference. Now, we will cover more rules later. For now, I just want you to be aware that we want to start our components with capital letter. That's very important. Yes, we're creating a function, but we want to start with a capital letter. And we must, 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 must return some kind of HTML from this function. Now, technically, this HTML is called JSX, but you'll see in a bunch of blog posts and you'll hear me throughout this course as well, effectively to use them interchangeably. Yes, what we're doing from the function, we are returning HTML. Essentially, this is going to be the tag that is displayed on the screen. And technically, you can return empty one. You're just not going to see any content on the screen. So once we know this info, let's just go to index.js and let's create that function. Again, the actual syntax is really up to you. In my case, I think I'm going to go with good old function keyword just because I feel like good old function today. Then let's type return and whatever we want to display on our screen. So I'm not going to be very original and I'm just going to say, my first component. So we're done. But once we save, 
nothing happens. And you're like, wait a minute, you just said that we're going to create a function and we're going to be good to go. So normally, every time we'll create a component, we'll need to do these two things. We'll need to create a function, aka component, and we'll need to export it. Now, if you're not familiar with ES6 modules, don't worry about it. We'll spend quite a few videos on it. And essentially what we're doing here is we're just exporting this particular component and then we can use it anywhere in our application. Again, we'll focus on that a little bit later. I really want to uh, kind of hone in on the React stuff first. Again, if you're not familiar, don't worry, we'll cover it. If you are familiar, you know that essentially we're exporting as default, so we can just grab it anywhere in our application and we can render it essentially on the screen. Now, this is different though. In the index.js, that's where we're setting up our root component. Remember, I said that we can have as many components as we want. I mean, you can have thousands and thousands and thousands of components, but you'll always have at least one. So that's the root component. That's the sucker that we will inject into that ID root. Remember, we talked about it. Uh, when we discussed the folder structure, I said that there's a public one, there's index.html, and then there is this famous ID root. So now what do we want to do? We want to inject this greeting sucker into that ID root. And then since this is our JavaScript entry point, we do need to add a little bit more code. Now, please keep in mind, just like this code, it's not specific to React. This is ES6 modules. So in here, we export stuff away from the file. And in here, we import. And we're actually importing from the libraries, basically from our dependencies. Again, if you are iffy on this, a little bit later, I'll cover everything in detail. Okay, don't worry about it. For now, just worry about the component and the function you need to create. That's it. And essentially, as far as this entry point, we want to grab React and React DOM. And notice this one is coming from React package, and this one is coming from React DOM forward slash client. And then we still have our function. That doesn't change. And then we want to go with React DOM create a root. So there's a special method that creates the root, and it's looking for one thing. It's looking for that ID. Now, how we can select ID in vanilla JS, we go with document get element by ID root. And then eventually we go with root.render. Again, if you're looking in this code and you're like, whoa, this got really confusing really fast, this is going to be your typical setup. And I'll show you the extension that actually sets up all the code for you. This is only for our root component, for our JavaScript entry point. And I can tell you right away that once we set it up, We'll pretty much forget about all this code. That's why, again, I know I've said this already 10,000 times. Focus, please, on this one. Rest of the stuff we'll figure out as we continue with the section. So first, let's grab those two imports. We're looking for React. So let me type over here. If you want, of course, you can copy and paste from the readme. So let's go here with the React. And as a side note, most likely VS Code is going to give you the auto import. If it doesn't, then again, just look for React. Then we want to go with import React and then DOM. And then this is coming from React DOM library forward slash and client. And as a side note, they changed the syntax in React 18. So prior to that, there was React DOM render. Now they create that root first. So right after the greeting, we want to go with const. And we'll create a root. So React DOM. And now we're looking for that create root. And now let's select the ID with the value of root. So this is where we go back to vanilla JavaScript. And we go with get element by ID. And yes, we're looking for the ID of root. And once we have all of this in place, we want to go with a root and then render. And here we want to pass our component. Now, when we create a component, we create a function, correct? We create a JavaScript function. Now, when we want to render it, the syntax is following. We go here 
with the angle bracket, then the name of the component. And then one thing we need to know about React that we always, always need to self-close it. So this is again, one of the rules that we'll discuss a little bit later. Just remember that when you pass in the component, you have two options. You can pass it like so with the opening one and the closing one, even though there's nothing in between. Yes, that's the case. Or you can self-close it, but you always, always have to do that. You kind of just leave it like this, notice. It right away shows this red squiggly line, and that means that there is error in our application. And once we save it, we should see my first component in the browser. Now, if you don't, just go back here and refresh. Since we're messing with the source folder and all that, maybe create React app just needs a little nudge. Now, if for some weird reason, you're still stuck on this error, don't panic. Since we tinkered with index.js, we just need to give create react app a little nudge. Basically, we need to restart the server. So navigate to your integrated terminal, press control C, which is going to stop the server and then restart the server with npm start. Again, navigate to the terminal, press control C, which is going to stop the server and then just restart the server with npm start. And at the very end of the video, I just want to showcase the casing. So if I go here and if I, let's say, go with greeting and then greeting over here, again, the same deal, we'll have an error. Notice I have nothing on the screen. And if I open developer tools, I have warning with that greeting, blah, 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 blah. So again, we don't want to do that. We always want to start with capital letter. And once I fix the casing, of course, everything works as expected. We're done setting up our first component. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, every time you think of component, think of function. That's it. If you do that, you'll be solid. And once we're done with our first component, I think this is an excellent time for me to show you the extensions I use as well as my settings JSON setup. And first let's start with two easy ones. So the ones that don't require much explanation and that is auto rename tag and highlight matching tag. So if you wanna take a look at those extensions, so that's how the auto rename tag looks like. And then the highlight one looks like this. Essentially you just go search for extensions you install it. In some cases, you might need to restart the text error. And after that, you're pretty much good to go. As far as the auto rename tag, if I go here and let's say select the setting two, notice right away, I'm changing the values in the opening one, as well as the closing one. So if I go here with heading three and save, yep, I'll have the heading three now in the browser. Now, when it comes to the matching tags, this is technically optional. You don't have to do it, but I just prefer when I select the element, I can right away see both of these tags. And again, the extension is this one. Now, once you install, probably your results are gonna be tiny bit different just because I customized the way it looks. So let me go here to the settings JSON and showcase that. And again, remember the repo I shared, that's where you can get the code. So let's keep on scrolling and notice over here, I have this highlight matching tag styles, and then I added these values. And essentially, if you wanna know your options, just navigate to the docs of the extension. And essentially in there, they provide all of the details. So those are the easy ones. Now let's actually start working with some heavy lifters. First one is prettier, which is really awesome because it formats the code. So if I go back to index.js and if I do something silly like this, again, there's technically nothing wrong with my code, but imagine if all my files look like this. I mean, you would have to agree that it's somewhat annoying. So once I save, check it out. Everything is back to tip top shape. 
Why? Well, because I use this extension by the name of Prettier. Once you install this extension, you'll also need to add some modifications to the settings JSON. So let me showcase that. As far as the settings, we have two options. So essentially we have this, the GUI. This is what we can basically see. And then we have settings JSON, where essentially we add rules to the JSON file. Now, as far as the settings, the ones that I prefer are format. And then I have format on paste and format on save. And also very, very important, otherwise it's not going to work, you want to set up your default formatter as a prettier. So let me go back over here. And then we want to go with default format. Yep, over here. Notice I selected prettier. So this is what you need to do. Most likely you'll have this none. And if that's the case, it's not going to work even after you install it. And then once you select this, once you go to prettier in the settings JSON, essentially you'll have, no, that's for the Emmet. That's not what I want to do. Let me showcase three. It's probably going to be easier. You'll see editor, format on paste, format on save, yada, yada, yada. Then we have this one, the default formatter. And then these are just the rules that I applied again. You can search for them here in the GUI, or you can add them directly here in the settings JSON. So as you can see, my preference is the single quote, and I don't use the semicolons. So if I change that around, of course, I'll have the double quotes and I'll have the semicolons. This is totally, again, up to you. You don't have to use the same settings. But then we've got Emmet. So throughout the course, You'll see me essentially do something like this, where I go with heading two, and let's say if I want to go with an ID, I go with the hashtag, and I'm going to call this, I don't know, something, something over here. And then if, let's say, I want to add a class, I'm going to go with dot. So this adds a class, and again, this is going to be some value. And check it out. I right away have this option where I simply need to press return or the tab key, at least that's my setup. In some cases, students have said that they only can use tab. In some cases, they say that they can only use return. Again, that's something that you need to check. In my case, I can use either of them. And notice the moment I press the enter or tab, I right away have this value. Now we'll discuss why this is a class name, not a simple class a little bit later. Don't focus on that one. What I'm simply trying to say is that in order to speed up development effectively, I'm not going to type the opening tag and the closing tag. Essentially, I'm just going to type what element I want to add. And then if I'll use some classes, I'm just going to go dot and then the class name, the class name or the ID. Now, IDs are not going to be that often, but classes for sure will do this way. So we go with heading two. And now let me again type my first and then component. And essentially, this is done by Emmet. And Emmet comes by default in VS Code. So it's right away available. However, if we want Emmet to work in React, we need to add this code to our JSON. Now, you can also search for it in the GUI. But to tell you honestly, I find this approach more straightforward, where basically you go with this code. And once you add it, you're going to be good to go. If you want, you can copy it from my readme, or you can just pause the video and type it. That's really up to you. Just make sure that you have this code. And just to showcase that I'm not making this up, I'll try to find it. Yep, it's over here. So Emmet, include languages, and we want to add JavaScript and then JavaScript React. And once you do that, Emmet is going to work in React effectively in our components. And I guess the last thing I want to cover in this video is the awesome snippets extension. And this is super, super, super helpful extension. Uh, you're looking for this one. Now I'm too lazy to say the whole name. Just look for ES7 and then 
somewhere there, you'll see snippets. And essentially, this allows us to set up our components really fast. So remember, I said this is going to be our typical component, we don't have to type it ourselves. And we haven't covered the exports and imports and all that. But I'll showcase the typical setup. So let's navigate to the source. And we want to create a new file. So every time we'll need a new component, we'll create a new file, because components sometimes can be really big. Again, this is really up to you. If you want to jam all your components in one file, who am I to judge you? So let's go here with new file. And we can go with uppercase or we can go with lowercase. Just remember that the extension essentially is going to set up the component based on file name. So I'm in a testing, I have installed this extension. So everything's in play. I don't need to add anything to the settings JSON. Pretty much once you're installed, you're good to go. And then you'll see in the docs that they have tons and tons and tons and tons of snippets that they provide. And essentially, you just want to click on snippets, and then be prepared to spend the rest of the day going through those snippets. So I'm not going to cover all of them. Of course, you can spend some time in the docs, what we're going to use pretty much all throughout the course, R A F C E which is a arrow function right away with export and then RFCE, which is a regular function with the export. So if we go to the testing, once we have installed the extension, notice, I have essentially right away these snippets. So this is going to create a component as a arrow function and notice how the names match. And if I go with the other one, if I go here with the R F C E, this is going to create a regular function. Now don't let this fool you. Notice over here how we're using the lowercase. It's only going to work because we will import it and we'll set it up with the uppercase. And therefore, for the most part, you'll see me essentially setting up files with the uppercase right away. So that way I know that there are going to be no issue. Now, one last thing that I want to mention about this particular extension is that once you initially install it, most likely, you'll see this import for react on top of the file. And I think probably is going to be faster if I just showcase the settings one. So let's navigate to the settings, we're looking for react snippets, and we have this import react. So let me navigate there. So settings here, then we want to go with react snippets. And notice over here, how my one is unchecked. Most likely, once you install it, it's going to be checked. So in here, notice it says that we need to restart VS code and all that. And effectively, what's going to happen pretty much every time you run the snippet, again, doesn't really matter which one, you'll get this import react from react. Now that used to be the older syntax. So prior to react version 17, we had to also right away import react, we don't have to do that anymore. Now, if you have the import, there's nothing wrong with that. So the code is not going to be wrong just because you have the import. But since technically, we don't need the import, essentially, we can set up our snippets extension to avoid importing react for pretty much every component. And again, if you navigate to the settings GUI, look for react snippets, and then you just need to uncheck it. Yep, again, we'll have to restart the VS code. And just to show guys that I'm not making this up, I'm going to remove the testing one. Let me create a new file. I'll say test over here, JS. And now let me run the snippet. I actually prefer the arrow function syntax. So most likely throughout the course, that's the syntax that I'm going to use. And now check it out. I don't have an import for react. Again, there's nothing wrong if you do. But I just showcased how we can remove that. And also my component name, 
matches exactly to my file name. So those are my extensions as well as settings JSON setup. In the long run, it will greatly speed up your workflow. And now we're ready to dive back into the awesome world of React. All right, and up next, let's see how React creates JSX under the hood. And first, let me just reiterate the main rules that we want to start with capital letter as far as our component, and we must return something. Now, it looks like in the latest version, if we don't return anything, it doesn't throw an error. But it used to do that in the previous versions. However, if you're not returning anything from component, it kind of defeats the entire purpose for the component. And as far as the JSX, if you find the whole syntax super weird, let me just reiterate that the whole idea is to make our lives easier. Technically, if we want to, we can call create element, which essentially is what React is doing under the hood. But I'm pretty sure that by the end of this video, you'll probably agree with me that using JSX is a little bit easier. So let's navigate to index.js. And this video might be a little bit annoying because I'll comment this one out, the first one, since I don't want to essentially create two separate components and then change the values here as well. So let me showcase how we can create a component by calling react dot create element. Because remember, react is a JavaScript library. So essentially under the hood, we are using JavaScript, we are calling this method. But in order to make our lives easier, we can actually type here JSX. So first, let me just copy this, comment this one out. And let me showcase that I can go here with return. And I can type react dot, and then create element. And in here, we need to provide three things, what element we want to create, props, which we haven't covered. So for now, we'll just pass an empty object. And then what value is going to be inside of that element. So let's try this one out. I'm going to go with heading two. I'll pass in the empty props, empty object. And I'll say the typical hello world. Let me save it. And everything works. Okay, well, that's awesome. But keep in mind that our components are not going to be as straightforward as this one. What if, let's say I want a div, and then inside of the div, I'm going to have the heading two. Like I said, this video is going to be a little bit more annoying than the usual ones, because I'll toggle them back and forth. So if I want to do that, I can simply go here with a div. So so let me type the div tag, and then I'll place that heading two inside of it. So let me take this one out, set it up. And of course, technically, since it's a div, we don't see that, but I can guarantee you that the element exists. So if we take a look at the root notice, so I do have the div and then I have the heading two. So the next question is, well, how we can set this one up with create element? Well, check it out. We need to go with react create element. Then since the parent now is div, that's what we're creating. Again, same deal with the props, don't worry about them, just empty object. And then since the heading two is sitting inside of it, again, we type react dot create element, and then we pass the data. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this. I mean, you can have maybe 20, 50 or whatever elements in here, in this one component. And what do you think is going to be easier? Typing the HTML, aka JSX, or doing these acrobatics. Now, I'm not going to set up the code. If you want, you can copy and paste and you'll see that. Yes, it still works. But you would have to agree with me. As weird as it looks the first time you see this kind of approach in the long run, it's going to be easier and more straightforward than calling bunch of react dot create elements. All right. And up next, let's talk about the JSX rules. So before we discussed the rules for the components, and again, I'll repeat, 
capital letter and we need to return something now let's talk about the jsx rules so essentially the stuff that we are returning and let's start with this one we always 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 need to return a single element basically one parent element so if we take a look at our return we can go here as wild and crazy as we want so let's imagine that i want to go here with div inside of the div i decide that there's going to be a heading three and in there i'll say hello people after that we want to go with an ordered list in there there's going to be a list item inside of the list item i'm going to go with an href for now i'm just going to add the hashtag over here don't worry there's probably going to be a warning in the console we don't really care about it and let's say over here hello world let's save it and as you can see everything works there are no issues and as a side note i don't want this one over here however problems are going to start if for some reason i decide that you know what right next to this div i need to have a heading too so not inside of the div but right next to it check it out right away i have this red squiggly line pretty much running all throughout my code why because we cannot we cannot return in JSX adjacent elements. So we always, always need to return a one parent element. So what's the solution? First, let me type some kind of code. I'm gonna go with hello world. And effectively what we wanna do is to wrap both of them. So for now, I'm just gonna go with div and I'll talk about why maybe it's not the best way, but let me grab the opening and closing tag and check it out. The moment we save, everything works again. So I know I already said this a thousand times. We need to return one parent element. So once we refactor, we are good to go. Now, this is not a rule, but keep in mind that whatever elements we set up, they actually live in the browser. So we are actually returning them. It's not like we're just making them up in a code. Notice I have div, div, and then heading two. So again, this is not a rule. If your favorite element is div, you can definitely do so. Who am I to judge? But I do suggest sticking with HTML semantics where we can use the section element, we can use the article, and of course, whatever element you want to create. So for nav, we can use nav, footer, header, and Hopefully you see where I'm going with this. Again, it's not a rule. If you want to add, I don't know, 100 divs in your component, absolutely. React is not going to complain about it. However, as far as maintaining the code, it might be an issue down the road. Again, just a suggestion. And also another approach we can take. If, let's say, you don't want to add any semantic elements and you're also maybe not in a fan club of div, you can add fragment. So fragment allows us to group elements without adding those extra nodes. And essentially we have two ways how we can use that. We can go with react a dot and then fragment. So notice the syntax, it's kind of like a component, opening and closing one, or there's a shorthand. So in here we can go with angle brackets and we just need to make sure that we close it so let's try it out i'm going to go back to index.js let's say that i don't want to go with section which is also an option of course so once i save here notice now the section is returned not a div but if let's say i'm not a fan of that type of approach i can just remove the code and i can go to react dot and then fragment so we're importing react that's something you'll need to do then if that's the case and we go with react.fragment. And once we save, notice that essentially there's not that extra div. So we have id root, but we don't have that div, 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 div type of syntax. We only have this one div that we have over here. And like I said, the shorthand is following. Just remove the stuff and everything is going to work. After that, let's talk about the camel case property naming convention. If you're familiar, when it comes to attributes in the index.html, 
you write them in the following way. For example, tab index on click for read only. When it comes to JSX, don't be surprised if you see the camel case property naming convention. Please don't worry about this code, effectively what it's doing, the values and all that. Just focus on naming here. So instead of tab index, we're going to type tab index as a camel case. If we want to use four for the label in the JSX, we'll use HTML four. Again, those are just the rules. And of course, as we're progressing with the course every time, we'll add that camel case property. I'll tell you, hey, this is the rule that we need to use. And this is just something that you need to remember. Again, please don't focus on this code. I'm not going to type it. We're going to cover all of this in great detail, essentially why we have those funny curly brackets and all that. For now, just don't be surprised if you see this type of naming convention. Also, speaking of naming conventions, we don't have class, something that I already showed you when we worked with Emmett. So if I go back, and to this div, I want to add some kind of class. It's not going to be class. So you can type here like this, but it's not going to work. We need to go with class name. Again, just the rule that we need to remember. That's it. We need to go with class name, and then we provide some kind of value over here, some class name. And then if we take a look somewhere there, yep, notice. Eventually in the browser, it's set up as a class but in our code, it's going to be a class name. And up next, let's discuss how we need to handle elements that don't have the closing tag. So as you know, in HTML, we have some elements that do have closing tags, and some that don't, for example, image or input. And HTML5 has somewhat spoiled us where if we want, we can omit the self closing and everything is going to be rendered just fine. However, we cannot do that in React. All the elements that don't have the closing tag, we need to self close them. So essentially, you need to add this forward slash. Otherwise, you'll get an error. So if I navigate over here, and let's say I'm going to go with input, and I'll say text, if I remove the forward slash, I'll right away get an error. So make sure if you use the element that doesn't have the closing tag, to self close it. And lastly, let's talk about the formatting. As you've probably noticed, when it comes to return, sometimes we have these parentheses, and sometimes there are no parentheses. So what's up with that? Well, you see, parentheses are here to help us. Technically, you don't need to use them. So now let me go back to the heading two. And let's say, hello world, I save and everything works. However, if by mistake, I move this to the next line, you'll see that it right away gets grayed out. And essentially, we'll have no content in the browser. So if you're not using parentheses, you need to make sure that your opening tag is in the same line as return. So set it up here. And I removed one character. And then we can do whatever we want. So again, we save it. And then of course, prettier formats for us. If you have parentheses, you don't need to worry about it. And a friendly suggestion, keep in mind that we're using prettier. So a lot of times prettier will add them or will remove them. So I wouldn't suggest stressing about it. Just something to keep in mind. So notice over here, if I have those parentheses, it doesn't really matter where the opening tag is, I save it and, and prettier removes it for me anyway. Just keep in mind the general concept. If you want to add them, add them. If not, make sure that the opening tag is in the same line as the return. Okay, and up next, let's discuss whether we can nest components. And the short answer is yes. And let's also see how we can do that. So if I go back to my index JS, um, let's say I decide that my component is going to be more complex. So I'll add a div. I'll say inside of the div heading two, and I'll call this John Doe. And then right below it, 
we're going to go with paragraph. This is my message. And then down the road, I decide that, you know what? These pieces are reusable. Or I just want to simplify this file. I don't want to have this heading to and paragraph. How I can set this value in a different component and then render that component? Well, we need to start by creating a component. And I'll purposely set up two arrow functions. One is going to be implicit return. So basically without the curlies and the other one is going to be with the curly braces, just to showcase that yes, of course, it is possible. So let's start here with const. So that's my first component person. And this is where I'll set up that implicit return, I'll say arrow function. And essentially what I want to return is this, I'm going to go with my heading two. So then let's copy and paste. And now let's set up that message. In this case, though, we will go without curly. So now we do need to provide explicitly that return. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Basically, we're not going to be adding anything here. So let me move this sucker up. Let me say return. And now of course, I want to change this, I want to grab. And I want to copy and paste. So I have three components. Now I have the greeting, I have the person as well as the message. So how we can nest components. Well, we simply need to reference the name. And again, same rules apply. That's why we go here with this capital case. And also, remember, we cannot just place them side by side. So we will have to set up some kind of parent. Now, in my case, that's div. Remember, you can go with some other element as far as HTML semantics, or you can go with react fragment. So for me, I'm just going to keep the div. And basically, we just want to reference, we want to go here with person. And then we also want to display the message. And yes, before you ask, we can nest another 50,000 components inside of these ones. So imagine you go here, you'll create more components, you'll nest them here, and then all of them are going to be displayed eventually in the greeting. And effectively, this is how our applications are going to look like. So we'll have that root one. So single root component, the convention is to name it app, but you don't have to. And inside of it, we nest the rest of our components. So all the components we need for our app. For example, inside of the app, we nest a page component, which contains more components, nav bar, sidebar and a header. Now, those components might or might not have their own nested components. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this. We inject a root component in the div with an ID of root in the index HTML, which is located in the public folder. And as a result, our app is nicely displayed in the browser, regardless, regardless whether it has five or 300 components. Okay, and up next, let me showcase a awesome extension for the browser, which effectively will allow us to see our component structure. So for that, I'm actually going to open up a new browser tab, just so you can see it on full screen, then we want to look for these three dots, more tools and then extensions. Now, in my case, of course, the extensions are you present, but since I want to showcase how we can get one, I'll remove it. Then we go over here, Chrome Web Store, and let's search for React Developer and then Tools. Get it over here. Yep, we want to add it, add extension. And once everything is in place, now let's navigate to a local host 3000. And once we do that, we can close this tab, then inspect, and you'll see this components tab. So once you install the extension, you'll have this one and now check it out. Now it does complain about the strict mode. So you'll see this 
warning over here. Don't worry about it. Everything works fine, and we'll discuss the strict mode a little bit later. So check it out. This is our root component, the greeting. Again, we haven't discussed the props and all that and functionality. Don't worry about it. For now, just focus on this. So we can clearly see our component structure. And this is super useful once your apps become big and complex. Since it's much easier to troubleshoot, you can literally pinpoint the component and then see what is happening inside. Again, the extension is React Developer Tools. And if you haven't installed it already, just go to Chrome Web Store and set it up on your browser. All right. And I think at this point, we have acquired enough knowledge to start working on our first project, the Amazon Best Sellers, effectively a list of best selling books. And of course, in the process, we'll cover more interesting React topics. For example, how to add CSS, how to handle images, what are the props, just to name a few. And our goal is to implement some of the features from this Amazon page. Now, of course, we're not gonna recreate the whole page, but the main features we'll try to recreate using React. And we're going to start actually with the structure. So in the index.js, I want you to create a book component, where technically you can call it whatever you want. And then in there, let's just set up three components. Now I can tell you right away that later we will refactor to one component, to only one book component. We're starting this way, just because I want to emphasize one more time. The way you set up the application is really up to you. There is no rule that says you have to do one way or the other way. If you want to create component for every single element, you can definitely do so. If you want to jam your entire application in one component, that's also an option. So a lot of times it really comes down to a preference. So first, we'll create three components. Notice effectively we're just returning some elements here. And then eventually we will refactor it. So I have the book component and there I have a few more components. And then I have book list component, which we actually render. So this is the one that we pass into a render. So let's set up this one and then we'll get the values from the Amazon. So first let me navigate to the index one. So at the moment I have this greeting and all that. I will need this. I'm going to go with const and let's start over here with book and list. So that's my component. Essentially, it's going to be a section. So let's set up a return over here. And for now, it's going to be an empty section. So there's not going to be anything in there. Then let's remove these two. And now let's set up that book component. So const book, that's the component. As far as return, we're going to go here with an article. So we're setting up the article for the book. And then inside of the book component, we'll render three more components. And also, in a process, I want to showcase that yes, essentially, we can nest as many levels deep as we want. So notice in here we have book list, then book is going to be rendered inside of it. And then inside of the book, we'll have three more components. And let's start, I guess, over here with an image. So I'm going to go here. And since we don't have the values yet, I'm going to provide the heading too. But eventually, of course, it's going to be a proper image element. So let me change this. And I'm going to go with heading two. And let's just say image place holder. Now, I'm purposely showing multiple ways how we can set up the components. So notice this is going to be implicit return. But we can also set up the explicit one. So first, let me change around and say that the second one is going to be title. And here we're looking for the heading two. So that doesn't change. We only want to change the content. And I'm just going to write here title. And then the last one is going to be the author. author. And in order to make it more interesting, let me just cut it out. Let me set up the curlies and let's go with return, as you can see. 
the result is exactly the same. We'll have some elements rendered on the screen. It really comes down to our preference. So it's not going to be a image placeholder. We'll type over here, author. Let's save it. And we want to move up. Now we want to render all three components. So let's start with image. Then we want to go with our, I believe what title over here. And then last one is going to be the author. And then in the book list, let's move up. And let's say that we want to render a book. For now, let's just render one book component, and then we'll worry about the rest of them. So let's save. And in here, I still have the greeting. So I want to change that one around. Let's go with book list. Once we save, check it out. So this is the result. Essentially, I have these three elements rendered on a screen. And we can definitely see that if we go to elements and notice here, this is the root. Like I said, this is going to be our entry point. And then I have the section and in there I have the article. And before we even get the values, let me showcase something really cool. So in react, if I just copy and paste, basically, if I set up more instances of this book component, notice, now, of course, they're right away rendered on the screen. And what's even more cool, if let's say I decide that, you know what, it's not going to be a book title. What if I want to go with title of the book? Can save it and check it out. All the component instances right away have that value. Again, really, really cool that we don't need to run around and change those values manually. Effectively, we just change it in one place and we're good to go. So we're done with the structure. Now let's go back to readme and see what we need to do. So essentially, you have a few options. You can go to your search engine and type Amazon best selling books, or you can follow this link. Now, of course, if by the time you're watching this the link doesn't work, I mean, the companies change their resources quite often. So if you navigate to this link, and it doesn't exist, then of course, you'll have to search for it. The reason why I'm providing the link is simply because that way you can work with the same exact list since Amazon has quite a lot of those lists out there. Now you'll still be able to follow along. Don't worry about it. I'm just saying just in case you want to work with the same exact list, I'm providing a link. And before we continue, let me make something extremely, extremely clear. You won't have to buy anything there. Again, you won't have to buy anything from Amazon. And second, this is not some kind of lame attempt to trick you into using an affiliate link. This is not an affiliate link. It's literally just the URL to the list that I'm using. I want to make this extremely clear. And essentially, we're just using it because I don't want to come up with these values. I want to provide the real values. So once I'm done with this boring rant, now let me navigate to my list. And again, you can actually copy and paste here, or you can click command and then follow the link. Just remember that if you have the same setup, it's going to open over here. So of course, that's why I'll grab this one, navigate, copy and paste. And unless by the time you're watching the video, Amazon has already removed the page, this is what you should see. Obviously, your values might be different, but the idea is going to be exactly the same. And effectively, this is where we want to grab those values. I want to start with image, then I want to get the title. And after that, I want to get the author. Now I'm going to open them because it's going to be easier to copy and paste the values. And let's start with an image. So essentially, here's what we want to do. We're going to go to copy image address. And once it's saved in the clipboard, let's navigate back to index.js and where we have the placeholder. Now let's go with that image tag. And then let's provide those values. So in here, we want to go with the source. And source is going to be equal to whatever URL we have in a clipboard. And then as far as the alternative, well, I'm going to provide the title for that. So in order to get the title, I already opened a book in a new tab, 
So let me navigate here. Now I'm not going to grab the whole thing. That's kind of a overkill. Let me just copy and paste here the title. And the same here with the heading two. And lastly, we want to get the author, which I believe the fastest way is just to copy like this. So let me provide here where I have the heading for. Let's save it. And yes, it's gigantic and all that. Don't worry. We'll add a little bit of CSS later. And essentially, we'll fix the issue. Again, the cool thing is that since we set up multiple book instances, you can right away see that they're rendered on the screen. And whatever changes we'll make in the individual components will right away be displayed on the screen. Now, we don't need that many book instances. So you know what, for now, why don't we just leave four, simply because we'll be setting up a grid layout pretty soon. So if you have the same result, we're good to go. And in the next video, we'll take a look how we can add CSS to our React project. Beautiful. At this point, we know how we can render HTML. But what about CSS? Because as you can see, I mean, it's cute to have this kind of list, but you probably agree with me that it does require some CSS. And essentially, it's not as difficult as one might think. Effectively, we just need to create a CSS file. Now, as always, name is really up to you. But I'm going to go with index.css since my JavaScript file is index.js. We want to set up the styles. And lastly, we want to import that in our index.js file. Now, I can tell you right away that for bigger projects, most likely you'll have a folder with CSS files, which again, is totally okay. You can definitely do so. You'll just have to change the path. If you want to set up the entire folder with a bunch of CSS files, you can definitely do so. They don't have to be separate files in the source. And as far as the logic, I just want to create a reset and then add to a body, fun family, background, and a color. Then we'll import and then we'll worry about the classes. So let's start over here. So I'm going to navigate to source again. If you want, you can create the folder. Just your path is going to change. I really want to emphasize that because I keep getting questions about it. So I want to answer them here. So let's start here with index CSS. As always, if you want to call this banana CSS, it's also a cool option. Let's go here with that reset. So margin, margin zero, padding zero, and box sizing equal to a border box. Border box, okay, beautiful. And then let's select the body. Now, of course, as you're looking at the browser, you won't see any changes. In order for those changes to take place, we do need to import. So first, let's just set up those styles. We're going to go here with font family, and I'm going to set it equal to a system font. Lately, that is actually my preference. Then let's go with background. And we're going to go with hashtag F1, F5, and F8. Okay, so that's the gray one. And then as far as the color, I'm going to go with hashtag 222. Let's save it. Like I said, the browser still displays the same list. And now let's navigate to index.js and we want to import that index CSS. Now later when we import JavaScript files, you'll see that we don't need to add extension. And for the most part, we'll say what we want to import, whether that is some kind of array or whether that is the component. When it comes to CSS, we want to grab the entire file and we must, 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 must provide the file extension. So since I have index CSS in the index JS, I want to go with import. And then, like I said, we need to go with the path. So this is our own asset. These are assets that are coming from the libraries. So when it comes to libraries, we don't need to provide a path. Libraries are installed. So we just need to provide the library name. Now, when it comes to our own assets, 
we need to provide a path to that asset. And it's always going to start with dot. Now, there might be two dots if we have to go one level up. But one dot means that we're in the same folder. So in the same folder, we go dot and then forward slash. And notice it right away offers me the test. Now, I don't want to test. Instead, what I want is index and then dot. And like I said, the entire file name, including the extension. With the JavaScript files, you won't have to do that. And the moment we save, we should see some changes and check it out. It looks like some changes were applied. Now, it's kind of hard to see, so let me navigate to the big screen. So notice, this is our giant image, and then we have some text, and this is the background. Now, if you want to take a look, as always, just go to Developer Tools, and you'll notice that we have some styles already. Okay, awesome. So now let's keep working. I want to style the book list, and I also want to style the book, my single component. And essentially, we just want to add the class. Now, of course, you can style in the index CSS like you normally would, let's say, if you want to select a section, but in most cases, you would use some kind of class. And we just need to remember that in React, there is no class. If I'm going to go here with some value, and if I'll save, if we navigate to the browser in the console, we should see invalid DOM property class. Did you mean class name? So yes, when it comes to React, if we want to add a class in the JSX, we need to go with class name, not just class. And once we do that, it's exactly the same as we normally would in HTML. Basically, we add the class and we're good to go. We add the styles and we don't need to worry about anything else. Just the name is a little bit different. And in here, I'm going to go with book list. So book list, and then the same I'll apply to the book. So let me copy and paste. I want to go to the article. And then instead of book list, it's going to be a book. And basically, I want to set up some kind of grid layout once we get to 768. And as far as the book, well, I just want to add some background, make sure that the image sits nicely in the card as well as add some styles to a heading two. So let's navigate back to index.css. First, let's just grab the book list. I'm going to set up the width to be 90% of the screen width. Then max width is going to be 1170. So it's always going to be at least 90% of the screen width, but it's never going to be bigger than 1170. I want to add some margin, top, bottom, five REMs. I want to place it in the center, so I'm going to go with auto. And then I'll right away display grid. And as far as the gap, for the rows and the columns, it's going to be two REMs. Again, the problem right now is the image. Since the size is quite big, that's why we have this look. So you know what? I'm actually going to skip a little bit, and I'm just going to say book. So now I'm selecting the article that has the class. And you know what, I'll right away add this IMG. So I'll select the image. And I'm just going to say that width should always be 100%. So now it will nicely fit in our card. And object fit is going to be equal to a cover. We save it. And notice now, of course, our project looks more presentable. Now back to the book list. Once we get to 768, I want to set up that three column layout. So in here, let's go with media, media, okay, screen, and we're going to add a min width. So let's go here with and and min width, and that is going to be equal to 768 pixels. So once we get to that screen size, we'll have that three column layout. So book list here. And then inside of it, let's go with grid template columns. That's the property repeat and three and one fraction. Let's save it. As you can see on a small screen, there's no difference. But once we get to the big screen, we have nice three column layout. And now let me just continue with the book. First, I want to add some background. And I'm going to go with the white one. 
So hashtag FFF. Then we want to go with border radius. And that is going to be equal to one REMs. Then we'll add a little bit of padding. In my case, I'm going to go with two REMs. And then text align center. So place everything in the center. We already have the image one. So we really need to focus on heading two. That's it. So book, heading two, and then margin top, one REM. And as far as the font size, I think I'm going to go with one REMs. And now what I can do is set up the zoom again to 175, since everything is nicely displayed in the browser. And again, if we take a look at the bigger browser window, we can also see a nice list. So that's how we can add the most basic CSS to our React project. We create a CSS file. Again, I'm going to repeat, yes. It can be index, it can be shake and bake CSS, whatever. If you want to set up the folder, the only difference is when you import, then of course you need to start with dot, since it's going to be in the same folder, then forward slash the folder name, and then the file. Effectively, we want to import everything. So later with JavaScript, you'll see how we're importing something specific from the file, whether that is component, whether that is a data. But with CSS, we grab everything. And we need to provide always, always a extension as well, which is not something we're going to have to do with the JavaScript files. And with this in place, now let's talk about the images in React. Okay. And once we know how we can apply CSS to our React project, now let's talk about images. And I can tell you right away that it's an optional video. Technically, if you don't want to follow along, you don't have to. But again, it's the case where I'm getting questions about it in the course Q&A. So I just thought that it's very useful if I showcase everything step by step. And essentially, when it comes to images, we have three options. We have external images that are hosted on a different server. Please keep something in mind. This image is hosted on a different server. So Amazon essentially is providing this asset. So we're not doing anything. We just take this URL and we provide it for our image tag. And you can definitely take this URL and you'll see that this is the image. So hopefully that is clear. That's our first option. So let's say when we'll be serving our data from our own database or getting some external API, if there's going to be an asset, for example, image asset, then there's always going to be a URL that points back to some kind of external server. So that's our first option. Pretty straightforward, correct? Just provide the URL and we're good to go. And after that, we have two options for local images. One in the public folder, which we're going to cover in this video. But since it's less performant, it's not something we're going to implement in our projects. And then we have local images in the source folder, which is a better solution for assets, since under the hood, they get optimized. So throughout the course, we'll stick with the source folder if we have local images. But since we haven't covered the imports and exports and all that, and since we'll have to utilize ES6 modules for that, for now, we'll just put it on hold. But since I want you to be aware of this option of public folder, even though it's not something we're going to implement since it's less performant, in this video, I'll show you how we can set it up. Again, I'm getting questions in course Q&A, so I might as well cover everything step by step. And essentially, the steps are following. We want to save the image. It can be any image, but of course, I'll use the same image. We want to create a images folder in public. Now, technically, you don't have to, again, create the folder. But since in most cases, you'll have multiple assets for your project, it kind of makes sense to set up the folder structure. As long as that image is in a public, it's going to be available. So keep in mind, technically, you don't have to have the images folder. And then we want to copy and paste the image we downloaded. We want to rename it. Now, that's totally optional, but in my case, I'll do that. 
And then in the source where we have the image tag, we want to replace the URL. So instead of the external one, we'll use the internal one. And in the process, you'll see that pretty much any asset we add to the public is right away publicly available. Hopefully that makes sense. So in my case, I know that I'm going to call this book one. And in the source notice, I'm going to go with forward slash images because it's in the folder. If it wouldn't be in the folder, then of course, I would just go with dot forward slash and then the file name and then book and the full extension. So let's try this one out. I'm going to navigate here. I believe I can actually get it from this source as well. But just to showcase that, of course, we can get it from the entire list. Let's navigate here. Notice the save image as option. And I'm going to go right away over here. And I'm going to say book and one. Let's save the file. Now it's on a desktop. I want to navigate to my desktop. I'm going to open up my project. Okay, then very important, we want to place this in a public so not in a source, the source option will cover later, we want to go with images, then we want to drag and drop this sucker here. And then this one over here. And once it's available, you'll actually notice if you take the URL. Now, again, in my case, the name is following. But if you use a different name, then of course, you need to use that one. If you take here this forward slash and add it to your localhost 3000, you'll see that right away it's available. So I have this localhost 3000. So that's the server that I'm working with. Notice if we copy and paste the full path, so images, and then book, and whatever extension, if I press here, notice this is going to be my image. So whatever we place in the public, right away is publicly available. And what that means is that we can also use it in our code. So now we just want to navigate back to index.js. And instead of this external URL, we want to go dot forward slash, then images, and then book one, on the extension. So essentially, whatever we place over there is immediately available in our code, as well as in the browser. Again, the reason why this is not a popular option is because these assets don't get optimized. So later when we'll place our assets in the source folder under the hood, they get optimized. And therefore, the end result is better, our application is faster. But yes, you also have an option to put your assets in the public, and then access them in a the code, or provide them in the browser. And lastly, I just want to showcase that if you go back to your project, and again, inspect the elements, you'll see now that the path, URL path actually goes back to our own server. And notice again, this is going to be the full path, localhost. So that's our server, then images, and then book one. So since the image, the asset is on the same server, we don't need to go with the full URL. Essentially, we just need to set up a path that is relative to our public folder. Hopefully it's clear. And up next, let's talk about CSS in JSX. All right. And once we're familiar how we can add styles using external style sheet, now let's take a look how we can add CSS in our JSX. And effectively, we just need to pick the element we want to apply our styles to. And then we need to go with style attribute. And we need to set it equal to the curly braces. And essentially, these curly braces just mean that we're going back to the JavaScript plan. And we'll discuss them in more detail in one of the following videos, when we cover the rules of JSX, basically, when we cover how we can add JavaScript to JSX. For now, just focus that you need to provide the curly braces. 
and then inside of it we need to provide a javascript object so please don't think that it's some kind of special react syntax where you need to go with these double curlies no effectively since we need to provide the object here that's why you have this result we always start with one curly braces and then at the end of the video i'll show you how we essentially can just pass the reference to the object now one gotcha about the object is that it's a javascript object what that means is that if you have a css property that has the hyphen you will have to capitalize and as far as the values they will have to be here as a string so let's try it out here i'm going to save let's navigate to index js and let's look for that heading four so like i said we go here with style notice automatically it's set up with the curly braces and here we provide that javascript object so let's start here with color and as far as the value again key value pairs and then the values are as strings so hashtag 617 and we want to go with d98 then we want to go with font size so let's add a comma not a semicolon we go with font size and that is equal to again quotation marks 0 0.75 rems by the way it looks like in the readme i'm missing the rem part so of course in your case that's not going to be the case anymore so let me save here and then we're looking for a third one and that is going to be margin and again we are not going with margin hyphen top we go here with margin top and we want to set it equal to 0 0.5 rems let's save it as you can see the styles were applied but one gotcha we need to be aware of I guess one more gotcha we need to be aware of at the end of the day these are inline styles so what that means general css rules apply so what am i talking about well if let's say you'll try to select the same heading four in css and try to change the properties that we already set up over here with the inline one it's not going to work so letter spacing, yeah, it's going to work since we don't have it over here. But as far as the color, if I try to go with red, it's not going to work. And in order to speed this up, I'm just going to copy. So we're going to go over here, copy and paste and notice. Yeah, the letter spacing changed, but not the color. Now, why am I telling you that is because later, as you're progressing with React, you'll most likely start working with external libraries. I don't know maybe a slider library or a modal library, whatever. And one thing to be aware of, those libraries do use inline styles here and there. Some quite often, some less. So keep in mind, if you'll wanna change some styles that the library provides, sometimes it's not going to be enough to just go to the CSS and change it. If the library is using inline styles, you'll have to figure out how you can modify those inline styles and only then you will be successful. So don't get frustrated if you install the library and you try to add your own styles, but it's not working. Always, always first check the elements. And if you see the inline styles, you know that you'll have to do more work. And lastly, I just want to mention that yes, there is an alternative. Remember, we're providing here a object. Now, we're writing JavaScript, correct? So what we can do? Well, we can create one. And we can create the object here. We can create it outside of the component. That doesn't really matter. And we can just provide the reference. Notice how the values don't change. Values exactly are the same. The only difference is that now, instead of passing that object directly, we just set up the reference. So let's try it out. I'm going to go to index.js. And this is the case where if you have, of course, the implicit return, you will have to refactor to explicit since I'm going to be setting up this object over here. So you won't be able to do that with a title. But since the author is right away set up as a explicit, I'm good to go. 
So let me go here and set up that long name. So const and then inline heading styles. And that is equal to my object. And effectively, I'll just cut it out here. I'll cut it out here, copy and paste. And then we go with inline heading styles. Now, the reason why I'm showing you that is because again, if you'll work with someone else's code, you might see either of these solutions, you might see the object passed in directly, or you might see them separately. And basically, this is the point that I want to make in this video. For the most part, there are multiple approaches available. So there is no right or wrong. If your preference is to set up the objects and pass them in this way, go ahead and do that. If not, if you want to pass them directly in the code, that's also an option. As long as the result is the same, it really comes down to your preference. Now, why we won't use the inline styles in this course, because if you ever work with inline styles, you know that they're somewhat of a pain. So yes, it's a good solution here and there. But in general, you'll want to stick with external style sheet, maybe some CSS libraries and all that. Because adding styles, of course, one by one to each element is somewhat painful. But please be aware of this option, because you might see that in someone else's code. All right, and up next, let's see how we can use JavaScript in JSX. So in the previous video, we covered CSS. Now let's talk about JavaScript. And before we continue, I want to refactor this to a single book component. And I'm not going to give you the entire speech one more time. Essentially, my preference is to set up a component with all of these elements. So this is exactly what I'm going to do. But yes, you can always split it up into more components. So I want to navigate back. And essentially, where I have the book, I'll remove all of them. And basically, I just want to grab the elements one by one. Of course, I'll remove the other ones. So let me take this one out. So this is going to be right after image. And I'm also not going to use this inline setup. Essentially, I'm going to add that code in the CSS. So let me take the heading four. I'll place right after heading two. I'll remove the style. And effectively, I just want to copy these styles and set it up in the index CSS. And in order to speed this up, I'm going to grab this code. As you can see, pretty much the same properties and values. I just don't want to spend time on typing them. So let me navigate back. I'll remove this one and copy and paste. And as far as the index.js, well, I want to remove all of this. So now I have book list with four book components, and then I have a book component. Now the only thing is that I need to remove this semicolon. Now let's talk about JSX. And like we already discussed in the previous video, if we add these curlies in JSX, that means we're going back to the JavaScript land. So essentially, we can use our vanilla JS logic inside of the curlies. Now one big gotcha is that the value must be an expression. So essentially, it needs to return a value. And of course, I'll show you the example. And I'll also show you what happens if we provide a statement. So there's a difference, expression returns a value statement does not. And let's just start by setting up the variables somewhere here. And I'm going to name this title. And effectively, where we have the heading two with the title, let's pass it in. So notice in here, we go back to the JavaScript. So we set up the curlies. And since we have the variable, we can directly access it. And you'll see what are the benefits. So back in the index JS. Let's go over here. And let's grab this value for the title. So let's cut it out. And I'll set it up over here. I'll say const title. And again, you can set it up inside of the component, or you can set it up outside of the component in the file, or you can set it up in a different file and then import it. We just haven't covered the ES6 modules yet. So let's set it equal to a string. So that doesn't change. And now instead of 
hard coding here in the heading two, we're going to go here with title and effectively whatever changes we apply right away will be displayed in the browser. So it's already somewhat dynamic. Now, of course, we're not getting the data from somewhere else from the external API, for example, and all that stuff, but we're already moving in the right direction. So when you think of dynamic, think of less hard coding. So that's the first. Then let's take a look how we can set up the author as well. So now let me take this value and just to showcase that it's still going to work. I'm going to go here and let's come up with a value author, copy and paste, and same deal. We go back to JavaScript land and we simply provide the variable in this case. Then let me show you some instances where this is going to fail, where basically if we'll set up a statement, it's not going to work. So first, let me go right after the heading four, and we're going to go with paragraph. So if we'll write a statement, and if we'll say, let x is, let's say, equal to six, pretty much right away, you'll get an error, and you'll get these squiggly lines. Again, we can only pass here an expression. And essentially, the expression returns a value. Now, this is a side note, but if we want to comment something out in JSX, we need to go with this syntax. And of course, there is a shortcut for that. So in my case, that is command and forward slash. But if you want to see in your operating system, go to edit. And notice it's going to be toggle line comment. So that's how we can comment out. And of course, once I do, notice I don't get the error. And let me showcase one more time with the new expression. So let's say if I have six plus six, this is going to work. Because again, this returns some kind of value. Hopefully that is clear. So every time we want to go back to a JavaScript, we just set up the curlies and we can start applying our logic. And lastly, let me just showcase that we can do more than just accessing the variables. Of course, when it comes to strings, we have a cool method by the name of two uppercase. So we can simply provide that we can invoke it. And as you can see, we don't get an error. Um, the author is now in uppercase. Now I'm going to clean up. Basically, I'll just leave these variables over here. And remove these ones. Just keep in mind that if you ever need a reference, you do have a readme. So let me remove this. Also this one as well. I also want to clean up this gibberish. And up next, let's talk about props in react. All right. And up next, let's talk about props and why they're so useful and also so powerful. First, let's start by doing a little bit of spring cleanup. Where essentially, I just want to set up three variables with all of the values. So for author, title, and image, and where I have the book component, I want to access them. So pretty much the same thing. Again, we're just not hard coding anymore. And yes, I'll place it above the book list. And you'll see in a few videos why. So let me move this sucker up first. Then I want to do the same thing with the author. And now let's set up that image one. So const const time g is equal to and let's just grab this string now, copy and paste. And now where I have the source, what do we do? We set up the curlies. So now we're back in JavaScript land and we provide the variable name. Awesome. Then the same we're going to do with alternative. So let's just provide here title. And before we go any further, let's discuss parameters and arguments. And as a side note, you can actually take this code, set it up anywhere in the index.js, and effectively it's going to run. So if I go and inspect the console, I should see job and developer. So in vanilla.js, for every function, we can provide parameters when we are setting up the function. And then when we invoke the function, we provide the arguments. And then of course, whatever logic we have in this case is just a log gets executed. Okay, hopefully we're clear on that. And now let me remove this code. So what does it have to do with react? Well, there also has to be some kind of way how we can 
pass the data down to our component. Because at the moment, yes, it's nice. Yes, we're using the variables and all that. But ideally, of course, you would want different books rendered in the browser. Correct? So at the moment, we're pretty much rendering the same. But we need to come up with a way how we can pass data, different data, to individual components. So we have the same structure, but the data is going to be different. And the way we do that is by using the props object. So every component we create gets automatically this props object, which essentially is the parameter. Now we can call this a shake and a bake. It's an awesome choice, but a common convention is calling this props. So again, it's provided right away by default. So we don't need to do anything. So instead of creating a component and then saying, yeah, there's going to be a param, it's right away provided. So React effectively injects that. So if I type here props, I know that this props will automatically be passed down to me. And now let's go with log. And we have a few places where we can log that. We can log it here in the function body, again, above the return. If you place anything after return, it's not going to run. Or we can do that directly here in the JSX. So we can go with console and log. Now I'll actually remove this one right away, but I just want to showcase. And you know what? There's going to be too many console logs. So I'll go back to two books for now. And then eventually we'll add more. So if you take a look at the console, you'll see four objects again. The reason why we have four because we have two console logs and we have two components. So if we do two times two, yes, we have four. And check it out. Now, for now, it's an empty object, but it's already a good start. That means that we'll be able to access something. Now, we have not provided that something. So we have an empty object, but it is an awesome start. And the way we provide those values is here. So again, props here when we set up the component, but then when we render the component, that's where we provide the props. And again, we'll start with the manual way where I can go here with job and then equals. And then if it's string, then we need to use the quotation mark. If it's a number or variable, or whatever, then we need to provide the curly. So in here, I can go with job developer. And as far as the second book, why don't we change things around? I'm going to say here, random title. And then the second one will be number. Like I said, when it comes to numbers, we need to use the curlies. If we have a string, then we just use quotation marks. And if let's say we want to provide here the variable, same deal, curlies, and then we can access it. For now, let's just use the number. I'm going to say 22. And the moment I save, like I said, I will remove this log. There's no need to overcomplicate things. Now what I see in the console, job developer, so this is an object, that's the props object. And then for the second one, I have title and number. Okay, so this is clear. Now, how we can access those values? Well, just like any regular object, it's an object, these are the properties, and these are the values. What do we normally do in JavaScript? We go with object dot property, correct? Same deal over here. Now, since these are extra props, basically, since we're just testing, I'm going to add more paragraphs and I'll copy and paste. Essentially, the most basic way we go here with the curlies. So we go back to the JavaScript land and we go with props job. Then we want to set up props. Again, we're referencing the same object. We go with title and then we go with props and a number. Let's save it and don't care about the console right now, but you'll notice that basically our components now have some extra values. Now, one important thing, if you don't provide the prop, even though in your structure you're accessing it, you'll have nothing there. So notice how the first component has the job prop with this value. I don't see it anywhere in my second component. Why? Well, because it's not over here. It's not present in the second component. So that's very important to remember. The prop will be only displayed 
if it's actually provided. So the first one doesn't get the title or number. Notice, nothing is rendered in the browser. Why? Well, because we don't provide them. So again, you'll have the structure, you'll provide the props, and then you'll be able to display them. If the prop is not provided, either you're not going to display anything or you'll get an error. Let's say if you're trying to access some kind of value that doesn't exist, please keep that in mind. So that should do it for the generic setup. Again, we provide here the prop name, then we provide the value. Now let's use the author title and image. So instead of the testing ones, now let's actually provide those values. So I'm going to remove all of these paragraphs. Let's save and then one by one, let's provide them. So what is the first value author? Now, as far as the prop name, does it have to match here? No, you can write banana. But when you're accessing, that's when you will have to go with props.banana. So this is the name, this is the value. And yes, a common, of course, convention is to use the same one, but it's not always possible. So we just go with author, author, curlies, we go back to JavaScript, and then we provide the variable. And the same thing over here, title is equal to title. And then lastly, what do we have? We have the image, same deal, we provide all of them. And in order to speed this up, I'll grab this, and I'll copy and paste. And once we have successfully set up all the props, now, of course, instead of accessing these variables directly, we need to go with props dot image props dot title and yes of course in the following videos we'll take a look how we can shorten this up but for now object property object property and effectively it matches whatever we're passing here so we want to go here with props dot title and then we want to go with props dot author once we save if everything is correct we'll have the same list but the difference right now, of course, that we are providing these values dynamically, which is really cool. But we also need to keep in mind that if we don't provide some specific prop, well, we're not going to render anything on a screen. Check it out. Since the second book component doesn't get the image, we just see the alternative. Hopefully that is clear. And in the next video, we'll take a look how we can make our setup more dynamic. All right. And once we're clear on the most straightforward setup, now let's make things more interesting and create two of those objects. Yes, we won't have totally dynamic setup yet. That is still coming where basically we'll just iterate over the list, grab the values and render everything on a screen. But at least we'll be moving in the right direction. So here's what I want you to do. First, create a object with the same three variables we already used in the previous one. So author, title, and image. Now create a object. In my case, I'm going to call this first book and set them up as properties. Then create a second object and essentially just go to Amazon and get those values. And don't worry about the local image. Just use the external one. It's going to be faster unless you really want to. Just keep in mind, eventually we'll still switch back to a local image option using source. So it doesn't really matter. And then we'll see how we can provide unique values based on our data. So let's start working on that. We're first in the index.js. I want to create two objects. I'm going to go here with const and then first book. That's the object. And then we want to grab all of those values. I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to just copy and paste. So I'm going to do it this way. So author, then we want to grab your title. That is equal to this one. And then lastly, I have IMG. And that is equal to this string value. We can remove the properties. And let's just add for sure that image. Hopefully it's clear that we need to provide all of the props. Okay, that's good. As you can see, we get an error since there are no properties anymore. Don't worry, we'll fix that in a second. So now we want to copy and paste. And let's come up with a different name. Of course, we can have 
two variables with the same name. Then let's navigate to our list. And I'm just going to look for some other random book. And as I said, this one actually is a very good book. Again, this is not some kind of Amazon promotion. I'm just saying it is a good book. So let me grab the title, I guess, first. Then we want to grab the author, by the way, select something. We want to take the title here. Provide so that's the author. And then lastly, we want to get that image. So I'm going to go with copy image address. And we just want to provide it here. So copy and paste. And now instead of accessing the variables, we're going to go with first book or the second book. So either of these objects, and we can probably put already two and two together, we'll use basically one object per component. And essentially, we just want to access those properties. So instead of author, I'm going to go here with the first book. And in order to speed this up, I'll just set up multiple cursors. In my case, that is with option and the mouse click. And I'll just say first book dot and then whatever property. And essentially, we want to repeat for a second component as well. So again, same deal. We use multiple cursors, second book, and then dot. Once we save, check it out. Now we have already a dynamic list. Again, it's not totally dynamic, but we're moving in the right direction. And if you take a look at our console log, you'll see the values that we're getting. So these are already different values. The structure is the same, but since we're providing different values to our props, the result that we see on a screen is also different. Structure is the same. The result is different since the values, the data that we're providing is different. All right. And up next, let's take a breather and let's discuss multiple approaches, how we can access props in the component. Um, before we continue, let me just make something extremely clear. There is no right or wrong. Again, I know you're probably sick of me saying this, but it really comes down to your preference. The reason why I'm showing multiple approaches is because I want you to be aware, just in case you see that in someone else's code. Also, in this video, we will highly, highly, highly lean on the, the structuring concept in vanilla JS. And if you're not familiar with the concept, or if you see a feature during the video that maybe is new to you, I suggest watching this video, the JS Nuggets playlist on my YouTube channel. And the link is over here. And in there, we cover everything in vanilla JS setup and in more detail. And in short, the structuring in vanilla JS just allows us to pull out the properties. So we don't need to reference the object anymore. And in the long run, it just saves us time. As far as the example, again, if you want to copy and paste, you can definitely do so. You can set it up in the index.js, but I'm just going to show you here in the readme that if we have an object with some kind of properties, instead of doing this, so the object name and then the property, we can just pull them out. So that's the, the structuring we need to reference, of course, the main object. And here we go with whatever properties we want to pull out. And then in rest of the code, we just need to reference these two. So we don't have to go anymore with the sum object and then dot name. And in our case, it just allows us to do this, where we have the props object. And instead of going props dot, props dot, props dot, we can simply go with props, pull out the properties that we know exist over there. Again, let me repeat one more time. You cannot magically access the prop if it's not there. So if you don't provide when you set up the component, it's not going to be there. Hopefully that is clear. And essentially, then we can just go with the property name. So let's try it out. Let me navigate here. I know that I'll access over there three props. So object with three properties, image, title, and author. 
and that is equal to a props object. So what do we need to do? Well, now we just need to remove all the prop instances. That's it. Let's save. And if everything is correct, the result is going to be exactly the same. The difference, well, we need to type less. We just reference these properties once and we're good to go. Now, alternatively, and this is something that I do discuss in the video. So again, if this is new to you, I strongly suggest referencing that video. We can also destructure in function parameters. So in our case, that's the props object. Now, keep in mind, though, once we do that, if you'll try to console log props, it's not going to be defined. So what am I talking about? Well, this is a function, right? And at the moment, we have props parameter. Now, since it's an object, we destructure it inside of the function body. Instead, I'm going to say, all right, I know that the object is going to be there. And I right away want to pull these properties out. Again, properties need to match exactly and everything. But essentially, we don't need to add this line of code. We can do directly here in the function parameters. Let's remove this, let's save and check it out. Again, everything still works. And like I mentioned, in the beginning of the video, it really comes down to your preference. You'll see some people who use this type of setup, and you'll see some that implement this one. And it really comes down to what is your preference? Which code makes the most sense to you? At the end of the day, they deliver the exact same result. Instead of using props dot props dot props dot, we just grab the prop and set it up in our JSX. Okay. And up next, let's discuss special prop in React called children, which provides access to everything we render between component tags. As a side note, the goal of this video is just to showcase the general concept of children prop. Since honestly, at least during the course, we'll only use it when we need to set up context API. So if by the end of the video, you're still iffy on some stuff, or just don't see a bunch of use cases for children prop, it's totally okay. We'll return to this concept when we cover context API. And essentially, let's imagine this scenario. What if for some reason, I want to render a paragraph and a button in one of the components? It doesn't really matter which one, just one of them. Well, you can say we can go to a book component. Let's add some dummy text. Let's also add a button. And let's just say, click me. Let's save. And everything is awesome. But of course, since we're adding it to the component, all the instances get the paragraph as well as the button. So what's the solution? Well, we could render it in between the tags. We just need to pick the component. So in my case, I'm going to go with the second one, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm working with the first one. I'm telling you the second one. So I want to do that with the first one. But again, it doesn't really matter which one. We just want to create a opening and closing tag. Then, and as I know, this is the incorrect syntax. We want to do it this way. And then place the paragraph and the button in between those tags. So let's get it out here. And let's set it up. And the moment I save, I actually don't see them in any of the components. So what's up with that? Well, you see, if we want to render something that is between the component tags, we need to use a special prop. And the name is children. Now, before we access the children, let me just make something really clear. Since we're already destructuring in the component, since we're accessing the object, we'll need to provide the prop over here. Now, if you still have this setup where you have props, you can log it and you'll see the children. And that's why I will switch to this one, to the second approach, just so you can see that one component has the props and the other one doesn't. Again, 
you can use either of these approaches. Just remember that children is going to be over here if you're destructuring right away in the parameters. So let me just showcase that. So we go here with the children prop and the name must be exact. So don't type here children like this. Don't say children's or whatever. No, it has to be children's. So this is an extremely important point. It's a special prop provided by React. So we cannot use whatever name we like. We have to use children. And if we want to render the children, we simply go with the curlies and then access the prop. Let's save it. And now you'll notice that the first one has the paragraph as well as the button. Now we can move this up and down as we like. So let's say if I want to place it on top, just render children first. Again, there's really no rule for it. Really depends on your setup. And now let me refactor it just so we can see basically a props. And that way I can showcase the children. So let me cut this one out. I'll say here const, copy and paste. Let's set it equal to props. Props over here and let's log it. So let's go over here with log and let's say props. And once I open up the developer tools and console, notice over here. So I have two objects, but the first one actually has this children. So notice special prop. Uh, and essentially, we just need to set it up in our JSX. Now the second one doesn't have that children prop. So as a result, it doesn't render anything. Wait, let me just showcase how it's going to look like on a big screen. So basically, we have these two cards. And optionally, if you want to set up your cards in a way that they're not stretching, we just need to add a little bit of CSS logic. So let's navigate to index CSS. We have book heading four. Again, I'm not going to keep that paragraph and a button, but just in case you want to keep it for your reference, we can add here margin one REM zero and 0 0.5. So that's for the paragraph. And then if you want all your cards to basically start at one point, and just end where the content ends. You can go here with align items and start. And essentially, or at least it should work, not align self, sorry, align and items and then start. And once you save notice, so essentially your cards are just gonna be spanning as much as the content instead of stretching. So by default, when it comes to CSS grid, it stretches all the items. So if this one has a bunch of content, then this one will also stretch like i said in my case i'm not going to keep it if you ever need a reference you can always find it in the readme so i'll leave i guess the props in such a way but i'll remove the children i'll move children over here uh, i'll keep the log because pretty often we use it and now let me remove the paragraph as well as the button so that's the general concept behind children which again essentially allows us to access everything we are rendering between the component tags. Okay, and now let's finally set up a proper list and iterate over it, which will be our actual setup in all the course projects and most likely in all your other projects as well. So yes, finally, we have arrived at the list, which is going to be our typical approach. As I said, now during this video, we'll utilize a Ray method called map. And if you're not familiar with it, please reference this JavaScript Nuggets video where I cover it in great detail. And essentially, we'll start with refactoring. First, I want to create an array. Uh, in my case, I'm going to call it books. And then let's remove everything from the book list. And after that, I'll show you an error that we're going to get if we try to render objects. So let's get cracking. I'm going to navigate back. I have two objects. Now I want to place them in the array. So I'm going to say const and books. So that's my array. And now let's place both of these objects in there. So we don't need the names anymore. Basically, we can just remove this and this. We can add right away comma. And we can remove this part. 
as well as the semicolon. So now I have my structure. Effectively, I have an array of items, and each item is that object. Now, also, we right away want to remove everything that we have in the book list. Otherwise, of course, we're going to get the error. And now let me showcase what happens if we try to render objects in React. So if I go with the curly, so I'm going back to JavaScript, and I'm going to say books. So I want to access the books variable. And then if we take a look at the console, we'll see these giant error messages. And essentially, here's the deal. In React, we cannot render objects directly in the JSX. And I'm purposely showing you this error because throughout your React journey, when you work with data, here and there you might see this error. So the first thing you want to do is double check the data that you're rendering. If you see objects are not valid as React child, blah, 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 that means you need to double check your data. Essentially, somewhere in your data, you have an object, and we cannot directly display it in JSX. Now, what's the solution? Well, eventually we'll use map method. We'll iterate over, pull out the properties, and one by one, basically pass them to a book component. But before we do that, let me just show you step by step how we can work with arrays in React. So first, let me just remove this error. Again, for the time being, we won't see anything on screen. And let's just create a basic array. Let's say const names. And that one is equal to, I don't know, John, Peter, and Susan. Why not? I'm not being particularly original, but hey, it's Thursday, and I think that regular names are good enough. If you want to go and shake and bake, Bobby Lee, of course you can do that. And if I'm going to go back to my book list, and if I'm going to change, and I'll say names, once I save, I can see that everything is nicely displayed on the screen. So we can definitely render array, but most likely you will agree with me that it would be nicer if we could wrap these values in some kind of HTML. Because essentially, at the moment, I just have here this string. So again, yes, I'm going to go back to the root. I'll take a look at the book list and notice. Effectively, I just have these string values. So how we can wrap this in some kind of element. So instead of displaying these strings, essentially, we'll display elements. Well, this is where the map method is going to come into play. So let me show you first in the readme. Basically, react method creates a new array from calling a function for every array element. So I have names array, I can use the map method. And I'm going to call a callback function for every item in the array. And this is going to return a new array. And eventually, we will wrap our items at the moment these strings in the heading one. So let's try this one out back in the index.js. I'm going to go here with const and then new names. Then let's set it equal to names map. So again, this returns a new array. We pass in the callback function. And essentially, the first parameter references the item. So if the item is going to be an object, it will reference the object. If the item is string, it's going to reference that string. And hopefully, we are on the same page. And since it's a parameter, we can name it whatever we want. In my case, I'm going to call this name. And yes, this is the case where you can call this a vegetable. As long as you reference it correctly, you'll be good to go. And before we do anything, let's just see what are those values. So I'll console log. And what do you know? I have John, Peter, and Susan. So those are the string values. And what's really cool that we can effectively just set up a return. And we want to return a HTML element wrapping that specific string. Now, of course, with objects, it's going to be a little bit different. But for now, we simply want to go here with return. And then whatever element you want, in my case, I'm going to go with heading one. And now I want to access it. 
So now I want to say, you know what, grab me this name parameter. And before we render anything, let me just showcase what is the value for new names. Let's save it. And in the console, you'll see a new array, which is, of course, awesome. And then check it out. Now I have those React elements. So essentially, instead of doing this manually, we iterate over the list, we wrap it in some kind of element, and we're good to go. And as a result, basically, we can just replace names with new names, save it. And what do you know? Now I actually have three heading ones with these values. And as you can see, this right away opens up a lot of doors because this truly is a dynamic setup. I have some kind of data, which is a list, and I can iterate over that list and return whatever HTML structure I want to see on a screen. Now, don't worry about this key prop. Effectively, we'll fix this warning in a few videos. Also, I want to mention that since we have this option to go back to JavaScript land, essentially, you can also take this code and right away write it over here. Remember, we're looking for expression. So we want to get some kind of value back. And essentially with map, this is what we're getting. So if you don't like setting up the new variable and then accessing it, you can do this directly. So essentially, we're still doing the same thing. The difference right now is that we're writing everything here inside of the component. Again, two flavors. There's no right or wrong. You can use either of these options. The result is going to be exactly the same. Again, we iterate over the list and we just wrap the elements in some kind of HTML structure. And once we are familiar with the basic setup, up next we'll take a look how we can do the same thing with our books array. Okay, and up next let's set up a proper list. And essentially what I mean by that is iterating over the books array and then for every item, eventually we'll return a component. So let's start by just navigating back to index.js and we wanna remove everything that has to do with names. Of course, you can keep it for your reference. Just keep in mind that it's already available in a readme, so it doesn't really matter. So again, let me go back to empty book list. And like I mentioned in the previous video, if you wanna set up a new variable and then render it in the book list, totally okay option. In my case, I'm gonna do it right away in the book list. Effectively, I'll iterate over and return that new array. So we wanna start here with books, then map. And again, we pass in the callback function. So yes, you'll see the syntax over and over and over and over again. And to tell you honestly, fetching data and rendering it on a screen is going to be your bread and butter when it comes to React applications. It's hard for me to imagine a project where you won't be doing at least one of them. So yes, this is the syntax you'll see over and over and over again. And don't worry, the more times you'll write this, the more familiar you'll be with the entire setup. So again, we have this callback function here and we just need to decide what we want to return. Because remember, when it comes to functions, by default, they return undefined, correct? So yes, explicitly, we need to set up a return. And for now, let's just go here, return, and then div. And just so you can see that pretty much everything works, even if we don't access values from the array. Let me just go here with heading one or heading two, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And let's just say item here. And you'll notice that actually everything works. So I have those items on the screen. Why? Well, because I have an array, with two items, we are iterating over here. And then for every item, this is what we return. So technically, we don't need to even access it. Now, it kind of makes sense, right? Since we're iterating over the list, we want to access those values. But technically, we don't have to. And now let's grab here this book. So this is what I'm going to do with my parameter. I'm going to name this a book. Just please keep in mind, we cannot pass it directly. So if I go here with book, and I'll do the same thing, 
I'll say book, I'll get the same error. Again, objects are not valid as a React child. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to pull out the properties. So we can either destructure them, or we can simply go with book dot title. And the reason why I logged it because I want you to see that we're iterating over and pretty much we're getting each object. So yes, if you have 200 of them, you'll have 200 logs, you'll access 200 items. And now effectively, we simply want to, like I said, access the property. Now eventually, of course, I will structure it and all that for now, I just want to showcase that if I go here with title, I'll have title in my heading twos. If I'll go with author, I'll get an author. Now for the image, of course, it's going to make sense if I set it up in different element, but hopefully you see where I'm going with this. What's next? Well, even though we can nicely return HTML elements directly in our callback function, let's also remember that we still have this book component. So why don't we put two and two together? So we have a book component that already has the HTML. And it's simply looking for these three things, image, title, and author. So if we go back to our callback function, and if we return book and pass in the values, it should work. Correct? So let's try it out. I'm going to go back to my return. I'm going to write here book. So I'm rendering now the book component. And for now, let's just pass them one by one. In the following videos, I'll show you how we can pass the entire object as well as how we can spread out the properties, which is my favorite way of passing in the props. But for now, let's just go one by one. And let's say over here, book. And then remember, all of these properties are over here. So above the return, we want to go with const, then set it equal to a book. So essentially, we are destructuring something that we covered already before. And we want to go with image, then title and author. And yes, I know that those properties are in there. So as far as the return, since I know that I need to pass them as props, what do we need to do? We just go here, image is equal to image, title is equal to title. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this. One by one, essentially, I just pass them in. And as a result, you'll see this cool setup, where again, we have structure in one place. We have a structure for the book component. And essentially, we just iterate over some data, some list, we pull out the properties out of the object. And then for every item, we return this component. And essentially, we get this awesome setup where now all our logic is here. And in order to render stuff on a screen, we simply need to iterate over. And for every item, we just need to return the component. All right, uh, next, let's get rid of that key prop warning in the console. And basically, every time you'll render a list of items in react, react wants to keep track of those items. So we need to provide a unique value and set it equal to a key prop. And typically, it's going to be an ID. And since we're creating this list ourselves, essentially, we'll go back and just add these two properties. Keep in mind that the property name doesn't have to be ID, just these values need to be unique. So if you call this vegan food truck, it's totally okay, as long as you provide unique values. And they don't have to be numbers. Essentially, you can turn this into a string of one and string of two. And hopefully, you see where I'm going with this. And lastly, normally, we'll be fetching data from some kind of external resource anyway. So those values, again, most likely IDs will be right away provided. And I'll talk about the indexes at the end of the video and why we should avoid that. So first, let's just go back to index.js. And we want to add those unique values again. 
not going to be particularly original. I'm just going to go with ID one and ID two. And yes, if you have 10 of them, then basically manually, you'll add this one, ID one and ID two in my case. Then we want to navigate and we want to set this key prop on the main return. So it's not going to work if we go here and set it equal to key and then the ID. Because this is the element that I'm returning when I'm iterating over the list. Keep that in mind. And the reason why I'm saying that, because I get these questions in course Q&A, where in some project, it's confusing where we should set the key. So always, always, always look for the place where you're iterating over the data. And then you want to set on the item that you're returning. Basically, if there's going to be this type of setup, so let me go back here and show that ID. If you have this type of setup, then add it on a div, not on a heading two. Hopefully that is clear. So let's go back over here. Now we know that in the book, we actually have the ID, correct? So we pull it out. And then just like they suggest in console, we just go with key and set it equal to an ID. And what do you know, the moment I save it, everything is fine. Now, as you're looking at someone else's code, you'll see this approach as well. Essentially, this just saves a little bit of time where in the map, the second parameter is the index. So you know that in JavaScript, arrays are zero index based, the first item is going to have the value of zero, then one and if you have 100 items, that means that you'll have those values from zero to 99. And technically, you can get away with passing this index into a key. Yes, you'll see this type of approach. In general, I don't advise doing that, even though you can get away with it, because it only works for the lists that you know will never change. So basically, if we'll have some kind of option to remove items from the list, then this is not going to work. Effectively, there's a high chance you'll get some bugs down the road. Now, if you know 100% that the list is not going to change, yes, you can cheat a little bit. But in general, I don't advise using such an approach. So that's how we can set up the key prop. We just need to set it equal to some kind of unique value that is in our data. Okay, and before we discuss events in React, let's take a look at two options how we can pass the entire object as props. So effectively, if we take a look at the index.js, everything is awesome. But what if, I don't know, we have 20 items in this particular object? We can see that technically we're doing double the work. I pull out all the items over here, and then I need to repeat the same steps. Or if you go with props.name, same deal in the component. So is there any way how we can simplify our life here when we're iterating over the list? And essentially, we have two options. We can pass the entire object as a prop, or we can use the spread operator, which essentially is the method that I prefer the most. But let's start by passing the entire object. So inside of the map method, instead of pulling them out one by one, here's alternative, I can simply go to my book component. And I can say book prop. So I need to come up with a name. And I'll name this exactly the same as my parameter. And I'll set it equal to my book object. However, once we save, we'll see nothing on screen. Why? Well, because remember, now props is an object, but inside of it, I have another object, I have a book object. So in order to pull these properties out, I have two options, I can go here with props dot book, or another one, if you're destructuring right away, in the function parameter, this is the syntax. Again, if you're not familiar with it, please watch the destructuring video that I shared previously in the readme. So essentially, I know that there is a object and I just pull these properties out. That's the syntax. Again, those are our two options. Either we 
just go with props dot and then whatever is the object or we can just structure it right here in the function parameters again essentially it just saves us here on getting these properties now we'll still need to get an id so this is the case where you can either pull it out or you can just say book and then whatever is that property and then of course in that case you can just remove all of them this is totally up to you and the method that i prefer the most is actually a little bit different where we can use the spread operator and again if you're not familiar with the spread operator i will give you the general overview but if you want to find out more info just please follow this link where i cover everything in great detail and essentially the spread operator so these three dots allow us to copy from the arrays or from the object so if you have friends and then if you want to create a new array you go here with dot 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 friends and then let's say you want to add a friend and if you log you'll see that effectively you have two arrays and again this is copying so this is not going to be passed as a reference and the same goes for the object if you have some object and then if you want to create a new one you go with dot 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 and you copy the properties from some object and then let's say you add another property and if you log you'll see that essentially you'll have a new object with all of these properties now in react here's what we can do if i have a object and if i want to pass all of those properties as props one by one i simply set up the curlies here and i go with dot 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 and then that object and once you log you'll see that all of them are effectively passed down as props so let's try this out and let me right away tell you that it's not going to access anything from the book so this line is going to effectively fail so let's go back to the book list and instead of setting this up as book equals the book simply want to go with curlies we want to go with dot 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 and when we want to pass in the object again this line is going to fail right now because we're trying to access properties that don't exist there is no book anymore so now we need to go back and let's just log and check it out so now one by one we pass those properties down including the id of course now we don't use it in a book but it's not a big deal so again this is totally up to you if you want to pass the entire object down as props you can definitely do so just come up with a property or you can spread out all of the values the end result is going to be exactly the same and it really comes down to your preference if you prefer the first way use that one if you prefer the second one the spread operator then of course go with that one now since i prefer the second option that's why in the course you'll most likely see me doing this the spread operator approach rendering a list with the help of components is awesome but of course it would be nicer if the user could interact with our application otherwise our app is somewhat boring so long story short our app needs to respond to events for example when the user clicks the button submits the form and the rest of the good stuff so up next let's talk about how we can handle events in react now let me right away bring the cold bucket of water and just say that all our examples will focus on logging stuff yes that's going to be the case simply because we have not covered what is state in react and what hook we use to control the state and therefore we really can't change what we currently see on a screen don't worry all of that is coming up now let's just focus on the main points and essentially if you're a little bit familiar with vanilla js you know that effectively the setup is following we have some kind of button form input whatever then we select that element and we can add event listener and I guess the most common or basic or however you want to say it is the click event so we have the event we pass the name and then we have the callback function in the callback function we can access the event object 
which contains a bunch of cool stuff. For example, the element we're selecting, what value is inside of it, and of course, a bunch of other things. And also, we can do something when that event takes place. And when it comes to React, essentially, the setup is extremely similar. We have an element, and of course, in our case, that element is located in the JSX, in the component. We have an event. And remember when we talked about the camel case? This is the time when we'll write on click instead of click, like we have been doing in vanilla JS. And then the callback function. Basically, a functionality we want to invoke when that event fires. Now, if you want to see all of the available events in React, you can follow this link. So let me copy this one just to showcase. But I strongly suggest not memorizing all of them because list is quite long. And essentially, if you'll ever need to use a specific event, you can always go there and get the exact syntax. The idea for all of them is the same. Again, element, event, and a function. And notice over here how basically we're passing in the reference. So we go back to a JavaScript land, we set up the curlies, and same how we reference the variable. Now we're referencing the function. And like I mentioned before, in all our examples, we'll invoke alert or log, just because we haven't covered how we can control what we can see on a screen. All of that is coming up. And I can also say that during the course, mostly we'll use these three. So on click, which responds to click events on submit, which fires off when the user submits the form and on change, which fires off when the user is providing value in the input. Again, I strongly, strongly suggest not memorizing all of them over here. I mean, in my opinion, it's a waste of your time. If you'll ever have some kind of specific use case, you can come back over here, you can get the exact name for that event, and you're good to go. Because again, the idea for all of them is going to be exactly the same. And once we have covered the general setup, now let's create event examples component, which I'm going to render above the books one. And the reason why I'm doing that is because eventually, we'll just have the books. So this one will stay for your reference. And of course, since you have the readme, I'll be able to remove the event examples. So in the event examples, we want to set up a section form with heading two. So some kind of title, I guess, input, and we want to go with the button with the on click. Now, let's not worry about these functions for now, as well as the name of the event over here, let's just set up the basic return. So essentially, let's just worry about the JSX we're returning. So let me navigate to index.js. And I think I'm going to do it right after the book list. Because like I just said, I am going to eventually remove it anyway. So why not? I'm going to go with const and then let's name this event examples. So that is going to be my component. Inside of it for now, let's just go with the return. Just so we can see that everything has been set up correctly. So let's go with heading one, and then I'll say events. Let's save that. And then we want to go back to the book list. And effectively, we want to do that before the books. So this is really up to you. If you want to set it up here in the bottom, that's also an option. But in my case, I'm going to go above, and I'm just going to access the event examples. Now, if you want to place them side by side in a book list, then of course, just remember that we need to use that react fragment or div or whatever, because there has to be one element that we're returning. And also keep in mind that I'm placing this in a section because there is already some CSS. So if you won't place it inside of the section, then effectively, it's just going to be hanging out here on the left top corner. So let me save it. I have here events. So 
I'm good to go. And as a quick side note, this is usually what I do. I mean, I'm not returning and hitting one each and every time, but I always like to set up my component so I know that definitely it's being rendered on a screen. There's no point to set up the entire logic and then start chasing some weird bugs. If, let's say, the initial setup was wrong. So in order to avoid chasing my own tail, I usually start by rendering something on a screen and then once I can clearly see that, I mean, the component setup is correct, then we can move on and start adding the logic over here. Hopefully this wasn't too long of the explanation. And now let's just set up that return. Where basically we want to go with another section. Then inside of the section, let's right away go with form. Now we don't need the action here. Usually if you go with them, it right away gives you an action. Just as a side note, as far as the heading two, we'll say typical form. And then we want to go with input for now. It's going to be a text input, but I just want to add a little bit of inline styles. So let's go with style. It's an object. And then let's say margin one REMs. Usually we won't do that. We won't add the inline styles, but this is the case where I thought it's a great example of using such approach. And then let's also go with name. And we'll set up the example just because I want to showcase something in the following videos. And as far as the value, I'm going to go with examples. So we know that in HTML, we can add name attributes to the inputs. And in the following videos, I'll show you how we can access them in react. And then right outside of the form, let's set up that button. As far as the value, I'm just going to go to click me. So we have our setup. And now let's just reiterate what I covered, I guess, five minutes ago, where basically we have these events. So if we want to respond to user typing something in the input, the event name is on change. And this is the case where we kind of just simply come up with our own names. Yes, they need to match exactly. And if we want to respond to click events, we simply go here with on click. And then we need to pass in the reference. So we need to set up those functions. Again, they can be inside of the component. They can be outside of the component. They can be coming from another file. That part is irrelevant. We just need to pass those functions as a reference. And then every time that event is going to fire, guess what? React is going to execute the functionality we have inside of the reference function. I'm not going to be particularly original I'm just going to say handle form input handle button click. Yes, in react world, this is somewhat typical, essentially to start the name with handle, but again, it's not a rule. So let's go back to index.js. Let's go above the return. And let's come up with those two functions. Now, of course, we can pass them interchangeably. As long as you have the reference function, you can pass the same one in the input as well as the button click, but most likely you will have some specific logic for the input or for the button click. So let's go here with handle form. Sorry, not for, but form input. For now, we're going to go with pretty basic arrow function and we'll simply go log and we'll say handle form input. Then we'll copy and paste and we'll just change some stuff around. So it's not going to be handle form input. We'll say handle button click. And instead of log, why don't we go with alert? Let's save that. And then, like I said, the event to handle form inputs is on change. We go to any input, in our case, this one, the text one, and we go with on change. So every time user is going to type something in the input, the event will fire. And yes, this functionality will be executed. So we go here with handle form input. So we pass the reference, and we want to do same thing here with the button. In this case, though, the event name is on click. What do we do? We pass here the reference handle button and click. Let's just make sure that the name is exact. And 
let me open up the dev tool since there's going to be some console logs as a side note you know what i think i can remove this sucker for now the props one if we'll need to use it later of course i uh, will uncomment it so let's try that out with the button check it out the moment i press i have handle form input and of course it's because i didn't change the name my apologies so in here we want to go with handle and then button click of course you can leave the same one but just so you can see that i'm not messing with you i'm going to go with click the correct one and of course we want to press ok ok and then let's click one more time handle button click awesome so we can see that this functionality works and the same is going to be with our input if i'm going to go here and start typing notice in the console i have these logs which means that again we're responding to the events and as a result of course our application is more dynamic and again you'll need three things you'll need an element you'll need an event and you can always find all of the events in react docs and lastly you need a reference to a function or a callback function that you're going to invoke once the event takes place or fires off remember in the last video when we discussed the events in vanilla js we covered that when we pass the callback function we have access to an event object and in that object we can find bunch of useful info and guess what we can do the same thing in react so every callback function so every function that we're referencing is going to have access to that event and since it's a parameter of course we can give it whatever name we want so you can go with e which is pretty popular you can go with event and always bananas is also an option and let's just log it in the input so we can see what values we're getting back and then we'll talk about the form submissions so as far as the handle form input i'm going to go here and we'll do a few logs in this video so let's start with an event and check it out in here we'll find a bunch of useful info now the ones that we'll use the most are event dot target dot name so target effectively is going to point back to an element in our case since we're logging it in the input yes it's pointing back to an input and then remember in the previous video we set up name is equal to an example and if we want to access that name we go with event dot target dot name and if we want to get the value we go with event dot target dot value and essentially this is going to allow us to collect the data from the input and again we're not going to cover the entire example because we haven't covered the state yet but just to showcase that it's actually a case let me go here with log and then event dot target essentially is going to be our input and then let's copy and paste and if you want of course you can write some additional text over here just so you can see which one is which but in my case i'm going to go with the first one name and then the second one value and again it's going to log once we provide some value in input and notice so the first one is my element the second one is the value that we provide for the name so of course if i'll change this around and if i'll say product and if i'm going to go back to an input and if i'll type some kind of letter now of course in a console i'll see the product and the third one is the actual value in the input and last one is the original log that we set up in the previous video so these two we'll use quite often throughout the course and also we'll use prevent default which is very useful when we have the form so if we want to respond to form submissions we just need to set up an event so we're going to go here with on submit and let's create that function as well so let me copy and paste and i'm going to rename it to handle form submission hopefully i'm spelling this correctly and for now let's just log something at least try to 
actually will fail. That's the whole purpose why we covered the event object. So let's go with form submitted. And then let's pass in the handle form submission. And once I save, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether we type something in the input or no, if we'll press enter, essentially return, we should see something in the browser, but we don't. So we can clearly see that something happened. Notice over here, we have this product, but we didn't see anything in the browser. And the reason for that is because the default behavior of the forms is to collect those values and essentially send it to some URL. Now, in this case, we don't want to do that. We want to handle the forms ourselves. And that's why we want to access the event again, same as with handle form input. We have right away access to it. And in there, there is a function called event dot and then prevent default. So this is also something that we use quite often. And effectively, this just means that we will handle those form submissions ourselves. And as you can see, now we can clearly see this log in the console. So each and every reference function is going to have access to event in there, we can find a bunch of useful things. But mostly we'll work with target, target.name, target.value, as well as event prevent default. Now, if for some weird reason, you still don't see the log, once you submit the form, don't panic. And just try this mouse click on the input, and then press enter, or return on the keyboard. Basically, we want to set focus on the input. And don't worry, in the following videos, we will add a button to submit the form, which actually is going to be our setup for the rest of the course. And in that case, we won't have to do all of these acrobatics. And before we continue, let's just take a small break. And let's discuss something that pops up quite often in the course Q and A. And that essentially is how we can handle form submissions in HTML. Again, please keep in mind that at the end of the day, we're still writing HTML, we're still writing CSS, and yes, JavaScript. And essentially, we have two options. If we set up a button with type submit in the form, we can also utilize that button. But keep in mind that the value has to be submit. So if it's just going to be a button, then it's not going to work. So let me just showcase what I'm talking about. I'm going to go back to index.js. And essentially, where I have the form first, let me move this sucker up over here. Let me add type and then equals to a button. And then let's copy and paste. And we're not going to have any on clicks over here. And instead of type button, we're going to go here with submit. And then instead of click me just so we can see which one is which, we're going to go with submit and I'll move it up. So let's save. I have this submit one. And you know what, just so it's not all over the place, I'll add the div and just wrap the button, the second one, the click one. And check it out. Now, of course, we can click and notice we nicely submitted the form. Why? Well, because we have on submit on the form. And we have the callback function. And of course, we prevent the default and you already know the rest of the stuff. Now, if I'll click this one, I'll have the alert. So if we have just type button, it's not going to submit the form. And please keep in mind, this is straight up HTML setup. That's effectively how it works. Now, if you do want to set up an event over here on this button, let's say you just don't like this on submit here in the form, you can definitely do so. And the logic is going to work exactly the same. But the event you want to set up over here is on click. So here's what I'm talking about. If for some reason you don't like this setup, you can remove 
but in here you're not going to write on submit so you're not going to go here on submit and then let's say pass in the value let me try that one notice over here copy and paste okay good notice right so it's not going to work you're going to get an error in order to properly submit this form we'll have to go here with on click because it's a button so we need to provide here on click and then again both of them work so we can submit the form with enter if i just go to an input and press return key or if i click the button and again both of them are in your readme so you can clearly see if you want to use the button go with on click if you're using the form just make sure this one is type submit because type button it's not going to work hopefully that is clear and now we can move on to the next topic and while we're still on the event topic let me throw you a mind grenade remember i believe two videos ago when we discussed the basic setup in vanilla js we use this example now what is happening over here i have here an anonymous callback function right now of course you can set up here the variable set it equal to a function or you can pass here directly arrow function which by default is anonymous the main point is that we can directly pass in anonymous function so do you think we can do that in react and of course the answer is yes so you'll also see this alternative approach where instead of setting up those functions here or in the file or in the separate file we pass the anonymous function directly so in my case of course i'm passing here the arrow function now please keep in mind we're not invoking it over here we just pass the function so of course this logic is going to run when well when we click on a button in this case so let's try it out i'm going to navigate back of course i keep repeating this but i just want to make it clear all of this code is available in the readme for your reference so i'll simply do this i'll remove and i don't think i'm going to worry about the on submit so let me remove it keep in mind that yes essentially it works the same way but instead of using reference i'm going to go with my arrow function and then whatever logic we want to do in our case what do we want to do we simply want to log yes for now we'll just be a little bit conservative so let's go here with console log and then say click me and of course we'll have an error because we don't have here the reference so let's do the same thing and i guess one of the major gotchas here is that we still have access to this event object so that doesn't change if i want to go with log and inside of it i want to go with event.target.value i'll still access whatever is in the input and yes it's still going to fire every time the user types something in the input again those things don't change but you'll see this shorter syntax is there a rule no if you want to use this one use this one if you want to set up the reference use that one mostly it depends on how much logic you have if let's say you have this input and you're just accessing the value quite often you'll see this approach if you have some kind of button click and then there's 20 lines of code theoretically you can set it up over here just keep in mind that you'll have to set up the curlies and all of that but i mean most realistically then you'll set up a reference function and now check it out both of them work exactly the same but effectively we just have less lines of code and since i'm enjoying mine grenades so much effectively throwing them at you let me throw another one and that is the simple fact that components are independent by default and if this at the moment sounds like okay well what's the big deal let me show you an example and um, after that i'll probably spend five minutes just raving about it and let's start i guess by removing the events again we cover the basics we'll return to events many times throughout the course it's 
one of the main features to any application if it's dynamic. So there's no need to keep that component here. It's always available in the readme and therefore I'm going to go to index and first I'll remove the reference and then I'll actually remove the component. And now let's try to set up an event in the book component. And it's going to be somewhat straightforward where I want to set up a function. I'll call this display title. If you want to practice on setting up anonymous callback functions, you can definitely do so. In my case, I'll have a reference. And I simply want to log a title. That's it. Not much. And of course, we do need to set up the event. We need to reference the function. And it kind of makes sense to have some kind of value in there as far as the value inside of the button. So let's start here. It doesn't really matter where you place it. I think I'm going to do it in between just because I have some margins. So let's go here with on click. For now, we don't have the function. So let me first just type display title. And then above it, let's go with that function const display title. And let's go here and log that. So I already have the log. So just so I can speed this up, I'll copy and paste. I'll uncommon this one. And we're going to go with title. So what am I logging here? A title prop, correct? So let's go here. Let's say display title. Let's save it. Let's find the button somewhere here. And check it out right away in the console. I see the same exact title that is displayed in a component. And guess what? If I click the same button in a second component, it does the same. Only this time, it references the title that is associated with the second component. And if you have done pretty much any work in vanilla JS, you know that you need to do quite a bit of acrobatics to get to that point. To essentially have some functionality directly point to that one specific item. And just to give you an example, let me show you one of the JavaScript projects that we we're working on in my course. I think it was this one, either the questions or the tabs. I think it was tabs. No, sorry, it was the questions. My bad, my bad. We go back, we're going for questions. And notice, I mean, it's not earth shattering functionality. Basically, we're just displaying some kind of content once we click on a tab. But trust me, in order to get to that point where each of these buttons only reference the specific item, it's not as easy as just setting up here the function and the button. So if you open up the developer tools, the sources tab, and more specifically app.js, you'll see that we're selecting all of the questions. We iterate over the questions as we're iterating we're selecting the button. And then essentially, we toggle the text inside of the function. Now again, there's multiple ways how you can set up the logic. We also cover the alternative. That's not the point. The point is that in vanilla JS, it doesn't come by default. You cannot just right away go to a specific element and say that the functionality is going to apply only to that element. You need to do more work. And that is not the case in React. So this is an extremely powerful concept, where essentially whatever functionality we'll have inside of the component, it's narrowed down to that component, where in vanilla JS, in order to have this type of functionality, you need to jump through the hoops. You need to do some acrobatics. In React, it comes by default. We don't need to do anything. Okay, and up next, let's talk about React data flow. And in the process, we'll cover what is prop drilling. And the first thing we need to keep in mind that in React, we can only pass the data down. So in our case, we can only pass data from book list to a book component. 
not other way around. And yes, if you have a component nested inside of the book component, and if you want to pass something from the book list all the way down to that component, you'll have to go through the book component. Of course, there are alternatives. So later on, we'll cover context API, we'll talk about Redux. And of course, you can use other state libraries for that as well. But by default, we can only pass the props down. And essentially, in the process, we're doing something called prop drilling. So let's just take a look at the example. And you'll see what I'm talking about. First, let's navigate to index.js. I don't need the title, but I will keep the button because we'll implement it in this example as well. It's not going to be a display title. We'll just say, click me. Doesn't really matter what you write over there. And then as far as the book list, let me come up with first variable. So const some value and I'll go with shake and bake and up next, let's set up a function. So hopefully it's clear that when it comes to this type of variable, effectively, we would just set up the prop, correct? Now, in this case, of course, we're iterating over the list and we're passing into a book. But let's say if I have, I don't know, some component over here, so some component, in order to pass it down, what would I do? Well, I would just pass it here as a prop, right? So I would say, some value is equal to some value. Name is uh, as always up to you, but I mean, in my case, I'm just going to go with the same name. So some value equals to some value. Hopefully that is clear. But what about if we have a function? So let's say, what if I have a function that has a name of display value? And in here, I'm accessing that variable in the component. So I'm accessing the variable that is in the book list component. Again, we're just going to be logging. We don't know how to control the state yet. So how do we pass this function down? Well, effectively, it's the same thing. We need to come up with a prop name, and we need to pass it as a value. Same deal. We're iterating over the book, and we have actually this book component. So I'll pass it here. Just keep in mind the same works with any component that you have in the JSX. So let me remove this one, because otherwise I'll get an error. Of course, there is no some component. And let me just go here with display value equals to display value. And how do we access it? And as I said, not of course, I'll have the error over here, because there's nothing in the on click. So for now, let's just deal with display value. And in order to access it, it's in the props. Again, if you want, you can log it. Sure. In my case, I already know that it's there. So I'm going to go with display value. So we grab the function. And again, we just pass it as a reference. That's it. That's all we have to do. And now if we open up the dev tools, we'll nicely see that we log shake and bake, and it's going to work the same in all of the components. And again, the main points are, we can only pass props down. So from the parent to the child. And effectively, it means that if you have really nested structure, you'll have to go through all of those components, which of course, can get annoying. And that's what prop drilling stands for. The annoying part of passing props literally down, I don't know, 10 components or five components or whatever. Now, at least in my opinion, passing the props from parent to child is not a prop drilling. Again, that comes down to preference. But in my opinion, that's totally okay if you have a parent and you pass it down to a child. However, if there is a grandchild, basically, if there is a child component inside of the book, and then you have to do the same thing, essentially, you don't use it in the book component, but you pass it down to whatever component in JSX. Yes, in that case, at least in my opinion, it becomes prop drilling. And we'll come back to this topic a little bit later when we discuss the alternatives when we discuss context API, uh, Redux and all that stuff. Again, 
this is just to give you a general info. And one last time, let me just repeat that in React, as far as the data flow, we can only pass props down from the parent to the child. Okay, and before we discuss ES6 modules in React applications, let's also cover more complex example. When we have a function in a component and we need to invoke it in the child. And as a side note, this is something that keeps tripping people up later in the course. So please pay a close attention. And in here, we'll start with a little challenge where essentially in the book list component, I want you to create a get book function. Now that get book function accepts ID as an argument and it finds a book. I can give you a hint, I'm going to use the find method. And if you're not familiar with that, you can reference this video in JavaScript nuggets. And we're not going to do anything. Basically, we want to grab the books, all right, we want to find the book that matches the ID that we're passing in, and we just want to log it, we want to log our result. Again, we don't know how to control the state yet. So don't worry about that part. Just set up the function, log the book that matches the ID that you passed in, and then pass that function down to a book component and try to invoke it on a button click. So essentially, just like in the last video, pass the function down, come up with whatever prop, destructure it, grab the ID, and try to invoke it. And most likely you'll hit a bug. And that essentially is the entire reason for this video. So first try to set it up yourself. And in the next video, I'll show you my solution for the get book function, and also two possible solutions for the bug that you might encounter. Okay, so let's get cracking. I'm going to navigate back for now I have this display value, I still know that I'm going to use the button. So I'll just remove the reference, as well as display value. The prop is also not going to be here. I don't need these values. And let's first come up with the function. So const get book, then it's going to be looking for the ID. And as far as the logic, I want to find a book. So I'm going to go with const book is equal to books dot find. So I'll use the find method. And in here we pass in the callback function. And we need to come up with the parameter in my case, I'm going to go with book. And I want to search in the array for the book whose ID matches this one. How can we do that? Well, we can go with book dot ID is equal to the ID that we're passing in. And then, like I said, we're not going to be controlling anything what we can see on a screen. But we do want to log the book. Again, I'm going to get this error. And you know what, it's probably annoying to some people. So I'll just remove it and I'll set it up from the scratch. So let's save it. Yep, everything works. All that is nice. Now we need to pass it down. Okay, same deal. We'll just go with get book is equal to our function get book. Awesome. Then this time, let's log it just so we can definitely see that it's there. So both of them get this function get book. All right, awesome. So let's grab it get book. Let's comment this one out for now. We already have the button. So we simply want to go with on click. And here comes the gotcha. So how are we going to invoke it? I mean, you can try to do this way. So get book here as a reference, click me undefined. Why it's undefined? Well, because it's looking for ID. Right? Okay, let's pass in the ID. Let's go here with get book, let's invoke it. And let's pass it in. So technically, what's missing here is the ID. All right, so I know it's there. I know it's in the props object. So let me just grab it. But now I have a different issue. So I have the logs. All this is nice. But it's not happening on a button click. Essentially, it happens when the application loads. Why? Because we have parentheses here. 
and in JavaScript, essentially, if we have a logic like this, where we have a function and then we invoke it, what happens? Well, we run the logic, right? So it's the same thing if I would go over here and if I would say, I don't know, two, for example, right? So in here, I'll pass in some kind of ID. I will get that book. So this is correct, but we need to keep in mind that this runs instantly. And the same thing happens over here. We're not running this when we invoke. This is not a reference anymore. And the reason why I'm being so annoying and I keep repeating this because again, later in the course, as our applications get more complex, this seems to be tripping a lot of people up. Yes, in JavaScript, once we set up the function, if we don't have it as a reference, if we have parentheses, we'll invoke it right away. And that's not what we want to do in this case. In this case, we don't want to do that. So in the following video, I'll show you two possible solutions. Okay, so we have tiny bug in the code. And the first option is to set up wrapper inside of the child component. So again, our main issue is that we are invoking this where we have the on click. So in that case, it runs instantly. What's the solution? Well, in the child, we can come up with a different function. In my case, I'm going to call this get single book. And we'll invoke the get book inside of the function. So now we can pass the get single book, and we're good to go. You'll see that everything is actually correct. So let me just, I guess, comment this one out. Just in case you ever need it for your reference. So get book, get book, all that is good. But instead of invoking it, we're going to go with const get single book. Again, if you want to name this get my groceries, that's also going to work. The main point is that we want to invoke get book and grab the ID. Again, this will get us the ID that belongs to that component as we're iterating over list again. In the second component, it's not going to get the ID from the first one. That's the beauty of React. And instead of going with get book, we're going to go with get single book. And what do you know? Now, of course, everything is going to work. So I'll save. And once I click, check it out. This actually gets me the book with an ID of one. And it references the book that is inside of the component, which is just awesome. And of course, I can keep clicking, and I'm going to be getting this book. So let me, I guess, clean out the console. And if I'll click on a second one, hopefully you see where I'm going with this. And yes, eventually, this is how we can remove items from the list. Now, the logic is going to be a little bit different, but the idea is going to be the same. Again, the main thing that I'm trying to showcase over here is that we need to pass a reference. We cannot invoke the function right away. And as far as the second option, it's a little bit more challenging, I guess, as far as the concept where I can pass the anonymous function. So think of it this way. The general idea doesn't change. I still pass the reference. I'm just not naming it here. I pass in the anonymous function, and then I invoke it. So let's go back to index. And instead of get single book, which is a valid approach. Again, this really comes down to your preference. The reason why I'm showing you both of them, because again, as you're going to be looking at someone else's project, you most likely see one of those approaches. So I just want you to be aware of them, where you can go get book and then pass the ID. Same deal. Here is a reference. And inside of the function, that's when we invoke the book and check it out. Once I click again, I get the correct value in the console. All right. And up next, let's talk about ES6 modules or a way for us to split up our application into multiple files and, of course, folders and have the ability to import and export the code which essentially helps us to organize our application. Because if we take a look at the index.js, I mean, everything is awesome. We have the list, we iterate over, we have the book component, and all of that is great. 
but you can probably imagine that as our application grows, this is not sustainable. I mean, we need to have some kind of way where we can split up the code, correct? Where we have separate functionalities in different places. And then if we need that, if we need the component or data or whatever, we just access it. And the way we do that is by using ES6 modules, which again are not unique to React. React just uses them. And if you have ever used Node before, in the previous versions of Node, they used to use only common JS. Now they also use ES6 modules. And again, it's the same principle. Just the syntax is a little bit different. And you'll see it's extremely straightforward. So first, I just want to remove all the get book logic. As always, it's available in the readme if you ever need a reference. So I don't need to get book and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to need the ID. My apologies if I will and if I'll have to rewrite. Hopefully you can forgive me. And I don't need the button. Okay, good. Let's remove that. And now, essentially, I want to come up with a file name. We have two flavors when it comes to imports and exports. We have a named one, and we have a default one. As always, you can use whichever you prefer. In most cases, what you'll see, if you have, let's say, a one component in the file, you'll do that as a default one. And if you have multiples, they will be named. Now, is it the only way how you can do that? No, but if I'll show you pretty much every flavor of import and export, this video is going to be two hours long. So we'll focus on two main ones, named export and default export. And the only thing we need to understand is that when we import with a named one, we need to use the same name. So name must, 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 must be the same. And with the default one, we can come up with whatever value we want. Literally, that's the main difference. So first, let's go to source and let's create books.js and book.js. So this is going to be for our component and this is going to be for our data. And then I want to remove books array from index.js and I want to add it to books.js. So let's try this one out. New file. I'm going to go with books.js. That's where I'll have my data. And yes, of course, I can name this data as well if I want. And I'm going to go with book JS. And let's start with the books array. So let's get the data away from the index. So let's clean up this file. So I want to cut it out and I want to place it in the books. And of course, the moment I save, I'll have big fat error. Why? Because books is not defined. Of course, I'm accessing it over here, but there is no books anymore. So in here, we have this array. And like I said, we have two flavors. And essentially with books, I'll show you both. And then with the book one, we'll just use the default one. So in here, I can go with export. Notice, I simply want to go with export and then whatever variable I'm exporting or function, or hopefully you see where I'm going with this. Now, again, there are a few different flavors to this, but we'll just stick with the most common ones. So we save over here and then back in the index, we need to repeat these steps. However, this is our own file. So this is where that path comes into play, where we go with import. And this is extremely, extremely important. We need to go with curlies, which means that we'll be getting a specific item, meaning the item we're exporting is exported as named export. So this needs to match exactly what I have in the file. Then from, and what do you know? I'm looking for the books. And remember, I told you when we covered CSS, with JavaScript files, we don't need to do that. Anymore. And the moment we save, check it out, everything works. Now, if I'm going to go here with carrot, banana, or whatever, Bob, it's not going to work. So this is exported as books. So anywhere, anywhere in your application, you need to access books. So that's a must. You cannot just willy nilly come up with a different name. So that's the first option we have. Let me go here with books. And like I said, I'll show you right away both of them, but we'll stick with the named one. Now, alternatively, here's what we can do. I can remove this export for now. And I could say export default. And then of course, I need to reference. 
the box. One thing we need to keep in mind that we can only have one default export per file. So you cannot have like 10 default exports. That's the whole point that you have one default export and the biggest difference is that in the index.js, we don't have any more this syntax. We simply need to go with import and pretty much we're saying we're importing anything. And this could be banana. And I just need to change it here, of course, right? So I need to go here with banana. And of course, everything works. So hopefully this gives you a good idea. Again, named and default. And the biggest difference is that with default, we actually can name it however we want in the index.js. And this is something that we talked about it before where you can technically set up a component with lowercase and export it, but when you import, you will still have to use the uppercase. So first, let me just go back to the name one. Export. We we'll use, like I said, the default one in the book component. Let's remove this. And then in the index.js, that's when we want to go back to the books. Little detour. My apologies. And now let's go with the component. The reason why I showed you both, I don't want you to think that you can only do default with a component. You can do with any data. So up next, let's take this sucker out. Let's remove. And we have book.js, copy and paste. And remember the extension that I used before? So the snippets one, check it out. I can, of course, create the component this way as well. And notice how I right away have that export default book. So now you know what that line of code is doing. So let me copy and paste again. And we're going to go with export, export default. And we're looking for the book component. Then we're going to navigate back. And we want to go with import and book from the book. Also, I want to right away mention that technically VS Code tries to provide the auto import. And when I say technically, because I mean, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work, but don't be surprised if, for example, you see me or some other instructor doing something like this, where I can go with book and then notice how right away sets up that component. Now, of course, I'm not passing anything in here and it's looking for those props and all that. But hopefully you see that, yes, I can type the component and Visual Studio Code is going to try to help me. And the reason why I say tries to help you, because here and there, it just fails. So let me remove this one. The import is in place. And as you can see, the logic still works. I still have my list and everything is correct. The difference right now is that I've nicely split up my code where the component is in one place. So if I ever need to come back, I can just navigate to a book.js. This is all the logic for this one. And you already know that we can add code, remove code, and right away, all the components are going to be affected. And the same goes with book.js. In few videos, we will cover how to set up local images in the source folder, which essentially is a better approach because there's some optimizations happening under the hood. So the result is better. And yes, all the work we're only going to do in books.js. So we won't have to run back to index.js. As long as the import is correct, we're good to go. Again, these are ES6 modules. They're not specific to React. You can use them in vanilla.js. You can use them in Node. And essentially, they help us to organize our application. All right, and now let's talk about how we can set up local images in the source folder, which essentially is a better option for setting up the assets. Because like I keep saying, when the React builds our production application, effectively, it optimizes those assets. So unlike the public one, where there's no optimization, we just dump the asset, and that's it. In this case, React is trying to help us. And essentially by optimizing those assets, the result is that our application 
is going to be faster. And in order to showcase how that works, I decided to add one more book to our array. And essentially, we're just going to utilize the ES6 modules we covered already in the previous video. So first, I want you to go back to Amazon. So find that link or get your own images, it doesn't really matter. And just get for the book one and two. So in my case, I have these two. So I'm going to go as save image as I think I'm going to place it on desktop. And I'm just going to go with book one. Then let me find the second one. I'll do the same thing. And now I just need to come up with the third one. This is probably going to be challenge, but I'm going to go with this one dad jokes, why not? So let's go here. And I'm going to go with book three. And before we navigate to a desktop, let me also get the data for this book. So let me open this one up. And basically, this is going to be a title and this is going to be an author. So let's navigate to the books. And like I said, we want to add the third one. So let me copy and paste. And let's just change the values around. So these ones, I'm going to get from the Amazon. For now, I just want to change the idea, which is going to be three. Then we want to get the title. And I think I'm just going to go with the short one here, title. And let's get the author. Oops, keeps running away from me. Let me set it up over here. And now let's deal with those images. So I have these three images on my desktop. The folder structure is definitely up to you. For a bigger project, you'll mostly have like assets and then images folder, the CSS folder, and hopefully you see where I'm going with this. For now, we'll just create a images and place it in the source, but it's a must, it has to be in the source. So even if the structure is more nested, make sure that the parent, the main directory is still within the source, please don't place it in the public, it's not going to work. So let's grab the folder. And then we just want to move all of these images over here. Once they're there, let's move them to the source, like I just said. And here's the deal. We simply want to import those images one by one. And yes, this is a downside. If you have 100 images, you'll have to do this one by one. For example, if you have images in a public, then of course, you can just reference it as dot forward slash and then whatever is the path. So keep in mind, yes, it is a little bit more annoying technically, because we need to do this one by one. But the results are going to be better. And essentially, we want to import, we want to come up with some kind of name, and we need to look for images and then the file name. And notice again, full path, basically extension included. And then notice over here, instead of the local one, or the external one for the image, what do we do? We simply pass in that variable. So one, two, and three in my case. So let me save this. I'm going to go to books. Again, like I said, we're not working anymore in index.js. We only need to focus on books.js. And one by one, let's grab them. Let's go over here and say import and img1 from, and now we're looking in the images and then book. And I believe it was one. And this was the extension. So now we want to copy and paste. And then I want to set up multiple cursors. And let's just change these values. So this is going to be book two and book three. And like I said, one by one, we'll just change it. We'll say IMG one, IMG two and IMG three. IMG two. And last one is going to be IMG three. Once we save, we should have a list of three books. And as you can see, images work as expected. Again, the main benefit of such approach, not just for images, again, we're covering images, keep in mind, it goes for all the assets, is that they get optimized when react, or more specifically create react app, 
the tool that we're using builds out our production ready application. And as a result, our applications are faster. Okay, and before we set up a production ready application and deploy it online, so everyone can see our awesome project, let's work on two challenges. And the first one is following, I want to set up numbers, just like they have in Amazon. Now, please don't worry about the CSS. The main goal is to figure out how we can get the correct number for the book. So if I have a list, each value represents whether it's the first one, second one, and hopefully you see where I'm going with this. And I just want to display those numbers. Again, I'll show you the CSS, it's actually very simple and all that. But for now, just worry about getting that number somewhere here in the component. And also we'll set up the title. That's going to be our second challenge. And for both of them, pretty much. If you want to work on that independently, once I'm done explaining the challenge, just stop the video, try to accomplish it yourself. And once you're ready to compare the results, just resume the video. Now you don't have to, you can simply just watch and code along with me. And basically, like I said, I want to set up those numbers. So I can see which item this is in the list, whether it's the first one, second one, or third one. Don't worry about the CSS. And I'll give you a tiny, tiny hint. I'm going to use index for this. Again, I'm not using index for the key. I'm using it to get the value. So I can clearly display whether it's the first book, second, or third. Again, if you want to work on this independently, please stop the video right now and resume once you're ready to compare the results. I'm going to go to index.js and then the second parameter in map method is the index. So we can reference it here. I'm going to go with index and I'm going to come up with a different prop name. Of course, I can go with index index, but I'm just going to go with number and then index. All right, good. Then let's go to a book JS. So now we navigate to a book component, and we want to grab that number, correct? We're going to go here. And remember, arrays in JavaScript are zero indexed based. What does that mean? That means that if I'm going to go here with log and number, I'll nicely see zero, one and two, which is awesome but it doesn't really match exactly, correct? So it should be one, two, three. What's the solution? Well, we can just add plus one. And in my case, I'm going to place that in a span. So right after the author, I'm going to go with span, I'll add a class, just because I'll add the styles in a second. And then we can go here like this, number plus one, which effectively will get us the right number. And the reason why you see everything displayed because of course, I already added the CSS and so my apologies. Let me just remove this one for now. I was already working on that. We'll set that one up in a second. If you have the same setup, you should see number all the way after the author. And also I want to showcase that once we go back to a JavaScript land, of course, we can use the template literals as well. So let's say in my case, I want to add that hashtag in front of it. So in order to do that, I'm going to go here with the template literals. And then remember, in a template literal in order to access the variable, we need to go with dollar sign, and then the curlies keep in mind that is a JavaScript syntax. We are back here in JavaScript land. So we just need to follow the same rules. I'll start here with the hashtag. And then I'll go with dollar sign, and then the curlies. So again, I'm accessing the same number, I'm still adding plus one, the difference is that I just nicely added this hashtag. That's it. And then as far as the CSS, we want to go to index CSS, I want to make book relative because the span with the value of number is going to be absolute. So in order to control the absolute, we need to set up the parent as relative, then let's keep moving. And we're going to go with number, 
I said position, absolute, then I want to go with top zero left is also going to be zero. And we have font size padding. And I'm just going to add those border radiuses. Since I'm using the border radius for entire card, I just decided that it's a good idea to do the same thing for the span. So padding is going to be 0 0.75 RMs, then font size one. After that, we have border and I don't want to go with border radius, because essentially, this is going to apply all around. And it's hard to see because we don't have any background. So let's say here red. Notice, I mean, it doesn't look as good as when we go with border top, and we're going to go with left radius. So only the left side, and I also decided to do the right side. Now you don't have to. So let's copy and paste. This is going to be bottom, and then right. Let's save that. Okay, awesome. And now let's just add some background colors. And this one I actually got from the Amazon. So it's not really a secret, you can just go there, pick the color. And it's going to spit back this one most likely. And let's just go with color and set it equal to a white. And with that, we're done with this challenge. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And in next video, we'll work on the title challenge. All right, and up next, let's work on the title challenge. Just like the previous challenge, CSS is optional. Don't worry about the CSS. The main goal is to set up an element with some kind of title. And that element needs to sit on top of our box. Same deal if you want to work on it independently, please stop the video and resume once you're ready to compare the results. And essentially, I'm going to go back to index.js. And in here, I guess the biggest gotcha is that we cannot return to adjacent elements, correct? So if I'm gonna do something like this, it's not going to work. What's the solution? Well, we need to come up with a parent. One option for parent is what? It is react dot fragment, or we can have a shortcut like a so. So let me move this sucker down. And then let's come up with that value. So I'm gonna call this Amazon. And best sellers. And like I said, CSS is optional, but I'll still add it somewhere there. It doesn't really matter where. Normally I place it as I'm adding the item, but in this case, I'll somewhere in the bottom. I'm just going to go with heading one and text align, text align center, then margin top. I'm going to go with four REMs. And then lastly, let's go with capitalized. So text transform, and let's set it equal to a capitalized. And then also, I want you to change the title in the public one. So remember, there is this index HTML where we can change the title, come up with the value, and just change it. So in my case, I have react tutorial at the end, I want best sellers or something along those lines. Let me open this one up, public, Index HTML, remember, this is where our entire application lives. And then we want to find the title. Instead of React tutorial, we'll go with best sellers. And with this in place, we are done with the challenge. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And in the following videos, we'll build a production ready application and deploy it on Netlify. Okay. And up next, let's work on the production application. So you see, this is our development environment, which works really awesome. We can right away see the results in the browser and all that. But when we want to deploy the application, the setup needs to be different. Essentially, we're not going to have the source and then public and all that. And in order to set up that production application so we can deploy it on any provider, we need to stop the server. And also, we just need to take a peek in the package JSON. Remember, initially, I showed you the scripts. So these are our commands. So start is the development server, a build one is the one that builds that production ready application. And in order to run it, I'm going to clear the terminal and 
command is clear. We go with npm and then we add this run and build. npm run build. And what you'll notice once we run the command, create React app is going to be busy building our application. And once everything is done, there's going to be an extra folder, a build folder. And this is where our production ready application is going to live. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take most likely Oh no, <laughs> as I was saying, it actually finished it. So notice this build folder right now. And check it out. This is our production ready application. And if you'll take a look at it, you'll notice that it has a bunch of static assets. So a bunch of HTML, CSS, JavaScript and all that. So again, we don't have any more this source one. This is only while we're developing. Once we run npm run build, this is the production ready application. And effectively, we can use this build folder with pretty much any provider that you pick. In our case, we're going to go with Netlify, but you don't have to. Again, if you use some other provider, it's going to work the same way, just like you normally would with the HTML project or vanilla JS project. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this. Once we run npm build, we can get this build folder that we can use with any of the hosting providers. As far as the hosting, like I said already 50,000 times in a previous video, you can use your provider. But since I use Netlify during the course, we'll use this one. Now, let me be very clear. They're not sponsoring this video. They're not sponsoring the course. I'm not paid to say this. I just enjoy the service. They do offer generous free tier. So essentially, the only thing you need to do is sign up. That's it. You'll have to provide your email and you're good to go. And once you sign up for account, just log in. And this is going to be your dashboard. Then you want to go for a new site. And of course, if you just opened up, you're not going to see the sites. But since I'm using this already for quite a while, I have a bunch of sites in here. You want to look for add new site. And we'll start with deploy manually. Yes, with the later projects, we will take a look at the GitHub option. But for now, Let's just go with deploy manually. And essentially, we just want to look for that build one. So let's go to tutorial and let's grab this build folder. Yep, we want to upload. The process is going to be pretty fast. And once Netlify is done processing the files, we will have our site live. And if you click on this link, you'll see our awesome project. One last thing that I want to mention in this video, if you want to change the site name, you just need to navigate here to a site settings. Let's say you're not happy with this generic name, go to change site name, and you need to provide whatever value you want. Now keep in mind, unless you add the custom domain, it's always going to have this Netlify that app, which in my opinion is not a big deal, but just in case you don't want to. So yes, you'll effectively need to use the search engine to figure out how you can set up a custom domain, which by the way, is not hard, but we're not going to cover in this course because this is a react course. And if the name is already taken, let's say if I'm going to go with react, of course, I'm going to have this error. So just keep that in mind. In my case, I'm going to go with the react course and fundamentals. Hopefully that is not taken, but you never know. Yep everything works. Like I said, this is the link now that we can share. And anyone who visits this link, is going to see our awesome application. Now, this is it for react fundamentals. Hopefully everyone enjoy this section. And I'll see you in the next one. All right, we're pretty much done with react fundamentals. And before we start discussing advanced react topics, let's quickly cover all the files in the source folder that create react app provides by default. And I'll also show you which files I typically remove when I start a new react project with create react app. Technically, this video is optional. So if you don't feel like following along, feel free to move on to the next video. 
if you however do want to follow along i suggest installing new create react app instance and remember the command was following first we want to navigate to where we will set up the project so in my case that is going to be desktop and then we want to type npx create react app at latest and then the app name so type this command and resume the video once all the dependencies have been installed and once the install is complete just open up the project in your text editor and you don't have to bother with npm start since essentially we'll spend most of this video in the source folder so just open up the project in text editor and then crack open the source folder if we navigate to index.js you'll see that the setup is almost almost the same so we have imports for react and react dom we also have here import for index css now of course if we navigate there we can see that the code is a little bit different and again the general idea is that essentially this is where you set up your global styles or maybe all the styles again it really depends on your application then we have app component which i'm going to talk about in a second we also have this one so the report web vitals and essentially if you're interested in learning more they provide detailed info in the comments now in our case we're not going to implement that so here's what we can do we can simplify we can remove this code and we can also remove this import so that's done then what's happening here with app.js well you see unlike the react fundamentals where if i remember correctly we ended up with a book list component which was in the index.js a common convention is to set up that root component as a app and set it up in a separate file basically we have app.js so this is our root component this is where all our components are going to meet and it's sitting in a separate file and convention is to call this app and most likely i don't have to say that you can call this orange and everything is still going to work as long as the imports are correct so again it's just a convention and basically if we navigate here in the app.js you'll see that they import the logo so this is what we can see over here on the screen and since we're already familiar how the es6 modules work of course we're familiar with this code and then rest of the return now we'll start from the very scratch so i'll remove the logo actually i'll delete the file in a second as well and as far as the return well let's just go here with simple heading one and let's say backroads app backroads and app let's save it because i still want to talk about the app css but while we're still in the index.js one last thing that i want to mention notice here how in the render not only we have the app so that's the root component again the exact same setup how we had in react fundamentals the difference of course is the component instead of book list now we have app but it's also wrapped here in this strict mode and essentially strict mode is a tool for highlighting potential problems in application it activates additional checks and warnings for its descendants now it only runs in development so it's not going to impact your production build and one gotcha is that in development it renders twice and i'll showcase that in a second don't worry now if you want you can remove please keep that in mind it is an option if for some reason you don't like the warnings you don't like the fact that it renders twice you can always remove this component and just to show guys that if i go back to app.js somewhere here and if i go with console log and if i'll say hello you'll notice that the moment we save basically it runs twice that's something that we need to keep in mind so again once we refresh notice essentially we have two hellos in the console and again it's because we have strict mode wrapping our app component our root component however it is not going to affect 
the production. So once we ship this to production, the strict mode is not going to affect our application. Now, notice here how we have import for app CSS. So essentially we have two files. We have index CSS and we have app CSS. And you can already see that essentially we can split up our CSS code. So instead of jamming our entire CSS logic in one file, we can split it up. For example, you create a component and you right away set up a CSS file with the corresponding logic. Now, one gotcha we need to be aware of. All of this is still going in the same pile. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say if in the index CSS, I have a code for heading one, and I'm not gonna be particularly original, and I'm just gonna say here, color red. If we navigate back, of course, everything works. Now, if we go to app CSS, the thing is, it's not going to be isolated by default. Basically, it's not going to be scoped to just this app JS. Essentially, whatever logic we're gonna add here in the app CSS, it's gonna get added to whatever logic we have in the index file or any other CSS file. And again, just to showcase that, effectively we'll remove this component altogether in a second, but for now, let me just go here with heading one. And again, we need to go with color and I'm gonna go with blue. And once we go there, actually, this overwrites wherever I have in the, the index CSS. So yes, you can definitely set up the files and split up the logic. However, keep in mind one thing, you'll still need to be careful as you're setting up the CSS. Now, of course, there are solutions for that, something that we're gonna cover in this course. For example, I am a huge fan of CSS in JS, more specifically styled components, and that's why I will cover in this course that solve this problem. But right out of the box, yes, you can nicely split up your CSS code, but please keep in mind that you'll have to be careful because all of that CSS code ends up in one place. So hopefully that is clear. It's not scoped by default to a certain component. All right, I think we covered everything. So now let me just remove this log. Let me also remove the import. We won't need that. And essentially we'll just delete a bunch of files. We won't need them. So let's start here with app CSS. We'll also remove test. So this is if you wanna set up tests, which we're not gonna do. But then we also wanna select the logo. We don't need the logo. This one, as well as setup tests. So you should only see, once you're done with delete, app.js, index.css, and index.js. So let me remove, and yep, now I have, again, index.js. This is where we inject our JavaScript logic into index.html in the public one, and the app.js is our root component. Okay, and up next, let's switch to Vite. Basically, instead of create React app, we're going to use different tool to scaffold and develop our React project. Now, I really don't wanna to spend too much time on discussing benefits of Vite. If you're interested in learning more, there are plenty of YouTube videos and blog posts that cover that. And as a side note, they also cover that in the docs just click on why Vite tab. In short, at this point, Vite is much faster than Create React App, and right out of the box, it provides tons of great features. And as a result, we get way better dev experience. Now, if you're wondering why we covered Create React App in the first place, effectively why we did not start with Vite right away, well, there are two reasons. First, there's still plenty of code examples that use Create React App. So in my opinion, it's useful to know the general layout and commands. Second, more importantly, I really want you to get comfortable writing React code in any environment. You see, 
once you start working for a company or switch to one of the React frameworks, for example, Next.js, the dev environment will be different. Yes, you'll still write the same React code, but folders and commands, they will be different in each environment. And therefore, it's important for us to get comfortable working in different setups. With that said, once we cover V8 setup, you'll see that the general idea is pretty much the same. It's just here and there. The implementation is tiny bit different. Okay, and in order to get started with Beat project, we first want to navigate to the docs, and the URL is www.beatjs.dev. Again, URL is www.beatjs.dev. Then we want to go with get started, continue scrolling, and we're going to go with template. Now, I'm assuming you're using the latest node version. So if you don't, if your NPM version is less than seven, then of course, use this command. But since I'm assuming that most people who are watching have the NPM greater than seven, that's why I'm going to go with this command. So we're looking for NPM create Vite at latest, then we need to provide the name. And then we have two sets of dashes template. And as you can see, they provide a bunch of templates. We have for vanilla JS, for Vue, Svelte, and all that. Now we're looking for the React one. So essentially, we just need to structure this command. So let me navigate back. I'm going to massively zoom in. Again, in my case, I'm going to create that project in the desktop. Of course, it's really up to you where you want to do that. And now let me carefully grab this command. So I'll take everything up to a template. First, I'm going to change the name. It's not going to be my view app. It's actually going to be a React app. And then as far as the template, we want to go with space and then type React or copy and paste React. That's really up to you. As you can see, you'll right away get the project. So that's the cool thing. Again, I did not stop the video or anything like that. We right away get the project. And now we just want to spin it up. So first, Let's just open up the text editor. Then I'm going to drag and drop. And you'll see that the setup is very, very similar to the Create React app. And first, let's just navigate to the package JSON. And you'll notice that the command we're looking for is npm run dev. So this is going to spin up the dev server. And before we can do that, we want to install the dependencies. So we go here with npm install. So this might take a little bit, but trust me, it's definitely going to be much faster than create react app. And then we want to go with npm run dev again, instead of npm start, we go with npm run dev. And also, the local host is going to be different. So yes, we'll still have the react application. And we'll take a look at the code in a second and all that. But the local host is going to be 5173. So up until now, we have been using localhost 3000, but now it's going to be 5173. And before we take a look at the application, I just want to quickly mention, if you're interested in basically the info that I'm providing, if you want to keep that as a notes, it's actually located in the fundamentals all the way at the end of the readme. So after all the fundamental stuff, over here, you'll find info on create react app, as well as beat. So I guess our project is up and running at localhost 5173. So why don't we navigate over there, just to see what we have. And yes, probably during this video, it's going to be annoying to some people that I'll just keep repeating that as you can see, the setup is extremely similar, because that's the main point that I'm trying to get across. Even though we're switching to a different tool, the setup is going to be extremely, extremely similar. So we install dependencies. If we want to run the project, we go with npm run dev. As you can see here at the top, we have node modules. What do we have over there? Those are dependencies. As far as the differences, we must, must, must name our files JSX. So in Create React app, we can name the file js or jsx in vite the rule is 
JSX. So if you'll name your file JS and then start setting up the component, yes, Vite will complain. So that's the first difference. We must use JSX extension in the Vite. Now, second, you'll notice that even though the public folder is there and the idea is exactly the same, whatever we place over here is publicly available, there is no index HTML. So in here, the index HTML is sitting in a root. Again, the idea is exactly the same. Notice we still have the div with an idea root. So this is where our application effectively is going to live. We can still change the title over here. So for example, I can say react project. And now of course, once I save, this is what I'll have here in a tab. So that part doesn't change only the location. And once we're done with index HTML, now let's discuss main JSX. So unlike create react app where we used index JS in beat project, we need to use main JSX. And yes, as you can see, the code is extremely similar to the index JS in create react app. So the idea is exactly the same. We just need to use main JSX. And as you can see, we're importing the app. So this is still going to be our root component. Now, the only thing that we haven't seen is the use state, something that we're going to cover in a few videos. But if, for example, I go here and change the JSX, you'll see that I'll have the same result in the browser. So let me go here. I'll remove everything. And we go with heading one and I'll say our first beat project and check it out once we save. Of course, this is what we'll have on the screen. So again, the idea doesn't change. We still import the logo the same way because notice now the assets is sitting in source. So this is the public one. This is where we have all the assets that are publicly available. However, within the project, when we're going to be importing those assets, they're nicely tucked away in this assets folder in the source. And this should look already familiar since we did cover the ES6 modules and all that. And the rest of it, it's pretty much the same. Again, don't focus on this one. We'll cover this hook in pretty much a few videos. So don't worry about that. We also have app CSS where basically we have all the styles and also the index CSS. And we did cover differences when we discussed the folder structure in create react app. So I'm not going to repeat that. And lastly, I just want to mention that if we want to build the application, we go with npm run build, which again is going to create that production ready application. And let's try it out npm run and build. And in this case, it's going to be sitting here in the dist folder. So unlike create react app, which creates build folder, we have dist folder. Same deal. We can take this folder, drag and drop in Netlify, and we're good to go. And yes, if you use continuous deployment, the idea is going to be exactly the same. And as a side note, Netlify right away picks it up. So if you go with Vite, right away it will say, hey, do you want to use the dist folder and do you want to use this command? So again, the general idea is exactly the same whether it's the imports, whether it's the root component, the index HTML and all that. So that is not going to change. Only difference is that this tool is much better. So our dev experience is just going to be awesome compared to create React app. Awesome. And once we're comfortable with React fundamentals, as well as Vite setup, let's finally discuss advanced React topics. So in the following videos, we're going to cover things like React hooks, conditional rendering, fetching data, forms, context API, and a bunch of other cool things. I also prepared quite a few challenges just so we can apply our knowledge right away. And hopefully that way, by the time you're done with the section, 
you'll be able to apply the concepts while you work on your own applications. So if possible, try not to rush through the content since such approach very rarely leads to long-term results. In order to follow along, you'll need some assets and they're located in the same GitHub repo. So my profile, and then you're looking for React course version three. And even if you already downloaded the repo, I suggest repeating that step since that way you'll get the very latest version. You see, as I'm recording, I tend to update some stuff. For example, read me. So once I'm here, I'm going to go for download zip option. Then I'm going to navigate back, look for downloads, crack it open, open up the directory. And then we want to grab the advanced react folder. So it's up to you. You can work in a main folder, but I always prefer to work in a separate folder. Then I want to open up the text editor and right away I'll set it side by side with the browser. Again, this is going to be the case where I'm going to choose this option. So let me set them side by side. And basically you'll notice that it's a pretty typical beat project. We just have here some assets and of course I'll discuss them in more detail in a second. For now, I simply want you to navigate to the readme and in here effectively you're looking for these commands now if you can run them in your operating system in such matter awesome if not then just run them separately so i want to open up the integrated terminal i'll make this one bigger and then we're going to go with npm install and you know what i'll just run them separately just so you can see that everything works so we have npm install, so we install dependencies, and then we want to go with npm run and dev. And essentially, this again is going to open up the project on localhost 5173. And yep, we should see a heading two with advanced React. And rest of the info essentially is going to be located in tutorial markdown file. So this is just a general readme how we can spin up the project and all that. In tutorial, you'll find effectively all of the info we're going to cover in the following videos. And as far as our workflow, like I mentioned before, this is a traditional Vt application. I just removed some boilerplate and provided some assets like CSS and data and all that, just so we can work on more meaningful examples. And for that, I do need some assets. I also removed the strict mode just so we don't have a bunch of logs. So remember strict mode was adding that extra log and while we're working and essentially exploring stuff, I don't want to have too many logs. So if you'll take a look at the main JSX, you'll see that essentially everything is the same. There's just no strict mode. In the index CSS, you'll find all of the CSS. We're going to use data. This is going to be some data that we're going to use in examples app JSX. So this is going to be our root component. Then we also have some assets here. Again, something that we're going to use during the examples. And there's also public, which by the way, we're not going to use. And of course, there's node modules, which are our dependencies. Now, if we again navigate back to tutorial, you'll see that basically we have this tutorial directory. And in here we have a bunch of folders. So it starts with use state all the way to user doer. And I'm actually working on more topics right now. So probably by the time you install this, you'll see more folders. And essentially the idea is following each folder is going to have final and a star. So we will do our work in a star folder. So in there you'll find some files. And it really depends. Sometimes there's going to be just a structure for component. And sometimes I'll provide already some stuff. So yes, sometimes we'll code pretty much everything from scratch. But if we already have covered that topic, and if I just want to provide some extra info on that, then yes, you'll find already some code in the star. And of course, 
if this doesn't make any sense right now, you'll see as we start working on the examples. And then in the final, you can find the complete source code. So this one you can use for two examples. Let's say if you want to compare your code to mine, or you simply want to see how the feature looks like once it's done. Since again, I will be setting up some challenges. So if you want to take a peek, how it effectively runs in the browser, then just set up the file. And the way we set up the file is following. So in the app.js, essentially, we'll just import that file and then we'll render it over here. Again, you can render both. You can render starter and the final. This is really up to you, but you'll definitely need to get that starter. So pretty much every lecture is gonna have its own starter. So you'll have to import that and set it up over here in the app JSX. And then if you wanna see the final folder, again, it could be any file, just navigate to tutorial. In this case, you're looking for the final one and then whatever file you want. And the reason why you have here this container is simply for some basic styling. So notice how it's nicely sitting in the center. It has some padding and all that. Technically, if you don't want to, you can just remove it and everything's still going to work. And just to showcase, let me just navigate to, let's say, app JSX. Let me move up. Now, the component name is really up to you. I'm just going to go with star and final because it just makes a little bit more sense. So I'm going to go here with import starter. So that's going to be my component name and then from. And then for now, let me just navigate to tutorial. Then just as a example, I'm going to go to, let's say, use ref. So that's going to be seven and then starter, like I said. And in there, we only have one file. So we grab this one. And for now, let me just remove that heading too. Then let's go with starter. And then let me close the component. So once I save, notice I'll have some code already. So essentially the idea is that we're going to go to that file. So that is 07 use ref, blah, 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 blah. Over here, starter. And essentially this is where we'll start setting up the logic. And the same is going to work for all of the files. And like I said, if you want to see, let's say how the complete code looks like, you can simply take, and you know what, let me close the sidebar. I'll copy and paste over here. And once I'm done with that, I'm just going to rename since we cannot use the same name, correct? So I'm going to go here with final. And let's also look in the final folder. So let's change things around. And let's look in a different folder, just so you don't think that I'm messing with you. I'm just going to go to, I don't know, maybe use effect. Or you know what, let me go to use state. I'll show you a nice list. So let me go to use state. Again, we're looking for final. We're looking for use array. So that's my final. And then as an example, I'll save it here. And then notice we'll have a list and we can remove some items. We can clear them and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully this is clear. Effectively, before each video, I'm going to show you which file we want to import. So let's say the first one is tutorial, your state star, and then error example. So we want to import that in the app JSX. We want to render it, and then we want to navigate to that file and start setting up the code together. And again, if you want to look at any of the final ones, just import the file and render it somewhere here in the app JSX. And effectively, my workflow is going to be following. I'll simply keep changing the file name. So let's say if I have this tutorial right now, I just go with forward slash use state. And again, I know that all my examples are going to start with starter. And then I'm just going to be changing files. So pretty much, you can leave the setup here as it is. You're just changing the path. That's it. That's all you have to do. Unless you want to take a look at the final one, then of course, I already showed you what to do. So let me go to the arrow example. That's the one where we'll start. And notice in this one, we just have a heading two. So in here, we basically will code everything from scratch. Now, a few more things I want to mention. There will be some challenges. Like I said, 
just so we can right away apply our knowledge. So if you keep scrolling, notice you were here, you'll have the first setup challenge. So in the beginning of each video where we have the challenge, effectively, I'll just read it to you. I'll try to explain as best as I can. I might show you the final one just so you can see how it looks like. Again, I'm not going to show you the code, but I'm going to show you how effectively the feature is supposed to act. And if you want, you can work on a challenge. Now, some of them are purposely essentially made to fail. So you'll work on a challenge and I'll right away tell you, hey, you most likely hit this bug because I want you to have a real world experience what triggers the bug. And that way it's going to be easier to remember the possible solutions as well. And one last thing that I want to mention, yes, in the beginning, our examples are going to be with numbers and buttons, just because we need to start with something. Yes, of course, as we progress with the topics, I purposely chose already more complex examples, just so it's not all the time numbers and buttons. But the first few videos, yes, we'll have to utilize numbers and buttons just so we can see the workings of React. Hopefully everything is clear. If not, utilize the course Q&A. And in the next video, we're going to start working on our first example, the error example. Okay. And let's start by taking a look why we need a use state hook in the first place, which by the way, we're going to cover in the next lecture. And essentially, we'll right away start with the challenge. So I want you to navigate to the file, basically a component and create a count variable. Display the value in JSX, add a button and try to increase the value. Now I can tell you right away that it's not going to work. Basically, you won't see the latest changes in the browser. So I don't suggest trying like 10 different options. Just basically try the most obvious one and then resume the video. And yes, I'm not going to be extremely annoying. And I'm just going to say this once. If you want to work on those challenges, just pause the video, try to set it up and then resume once you're ready to compare the results. So let me just go to app JSX. Let me check that I'm getting the right component. Again, we're looking in the tutorial. We will start with zero one year state star and then the arrow example. So let me navigate over here, close. And somewhere here, I'm going to create my count variable. So I'm going to go with let count is equal to zero. Beautiful. Then I want to display that value somewhere. And since at the moment I have heading two, and we know that we cannot return adjacent elements, I'm going to turn this into a div. Then we're going to set up a heading two with the actual value. So here I want to display the count. Let me save. And I see the zero. So technically this is already a good start. Then we want to set up the button. Right away type is equal to a button. Then we'll set up the unclick. If you want the arrow function, you can definitely do so. In my case, I'll set up the reference and I'll just say increase or increment, whatever your heart desires. And now let's set up that function. Let's go over here. Let's say const handle click. Basically in here, you want to go with count. Count is equal to count plus one, correct? And let me right away even console log and you'll see that technically everything works, but we won't say anything in the browser. Sorry for the spoiler. So let's go here. Let's save. We have the button. By the way, if you want to add a little bit of styles, you can go here with class name. And you can go with button again, this is coming from global styles. And check it out. Everything is awesome. But as I'm clicking the button, nothing is happening. And actually, if I take a look at the console, I can see that my logic works. So this is technically correct. I am updating this value, but nothing is happening. Why is that? Well, because we're not triggering the re-render something we're going to do with use state hook. So even though this logic is awesome in vanilla JS land, it's not going to work in react. 
If we want to see the latest changes displayed in the browser in React, we need to set up a state value and we need to trigger a re-render. And in the next video, we're going to cover how we can do that using use state hook. All right, so how we can achieve our previous functionality in React? Well, we need to use a hook, basically a function that React provides, and the name is use state. As a quick side note, during this video, we'll heavily rely on the structuring array principle. And if you need to jog your memory or if you're not familiar at all with this concept, I cover this in great detail in this JavaScript nugget video. And essentially, I just want to double check that I'm importing correct components. So notice now I switch to use state basics. So that's the second file. And if we navigate here, this is what we will see. And effectively, we want to import from React the use state hook. Now we have multiple flavors. We can do it this way. So notice this is going to be a named import. So unlike, let's say, React, this is written like this. Now we're actually looking for the curlies. And we go here with use state. And this is coming from React. Now I believe VS Code is going to try to help us. So if you type here, use state notice, you'll right away get the import. Now, alternatively, whatever logic we're going to set up in a component, you can also type it this way. You can just import React and then go with React dot and then use state. Just as a side note, this is also going to work. So once we have the use state hook, like I said, it's a function. We want to invoke that function and we want to pass in the default value. And let's start from the very scratch, let's just invoke it in a log, just so you can see that whatever I'm telling actually is true. So let me save it, let me invoke it. And you know what, I'll clean the console, and I'll just refresh. And notice over here, like I said, we have function, we invoke it, we'll need to pass here the default value. And we get back two things, we get an array with undefined, and we also have the function. So this is going to be our state value which we're going to change with the second argument with a function. And this also is going to be preserved between the renders. And don't worry if the render, re-render and all that sounds kind of fuzzy. Actually, we'll spend the next video discussing them in greater detail. So we have use state hook, and this is where we need to pass in that default value. That's why we have right now undefined. So if I'm going to type here, Bob, yep, this is going to be my value. If I'm going to type here one, then of course, you can already guess that I'll have the value over here one. So this is going to be my default value. And of course, you can pass here array, the object and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully that is clear. Now let's discuss how we can access these values. Now, the fastest way is to use array the structuring, but just to kind of prove the point that I'm not making this up, I'll access them one by one. So let me comment this one out. Let me just copy and paste and let me assign to some kind of value. So in here, I'm going to say that this is equal to hello. Again, we can change these values as we want. There's really no difference. And you know what? I'll actually remove this log. I don't need it anymore. I'll log the value. So let me go here with const and this is equal to a value. And then since we're getting back the array, we can do it this way where I'm accessing the first item. Hopefully that is clear. So if I go here with value, you'll see over here that it's actually hello. So whatever default value that I'm passing, and if I'll copy and paste in here, and if I'll say func, which actually stands for function, let me copy and paste here as well. And let's just log the function. So two things, the default value and the function that controls that value. Now, why array destructuring is technically better? Well, because we can use a one liner. So let me comment this one out. Then let's keep on moving and notice over here, I can simply go with const, then I'm destructuring right away out items. So in my case, I'm going to go with count and set count. Now, as far as naming, it is a convention to go with set count, basically, whatever is the variable name. So if you have name here, then convention is to go with set name, but you don't have to. 
And I'll talk about some other conventions as well. For example, for Booleans and all that. Then we want to go with use state and we want to pass in that value. Like I said, we can pass in the string, we can pass in the array, we can pass in number, whatever you want to pass in. This is going to be the default value. And this is going to be the function that controls it. Again, the reason why we went the long route is because maybe some people are not familiar with the syntax, which is totally okay. The first time I saw this, so I was also like, hey, uh, what's happening over here? So basically, we're just destructuring these values. If you don't like the syntax, you can always use this one. But my guess is you'll stick with this one. And then in here, let's pass in that initial value. In our case, what is that? Well, we want to go with zero, correct? So this is where we're going to start. Then let's quickly, again, set up that button. I know that this is a little bit of repetition, but since we just started working in JSX, I think it's going to be a good practice. So let's go over here with heading four. Then we're going to go with you clicked and then let's grab the actual count. So notice, I'm not accessing some random variable. I'm actually looking for a count one. So the one that I'm setting up with use state. And I'll just say times here. Then we want to set up our button. So the same deal type is equal to button. Then class name, just so we have a little bit of CSS. And now let's also again set up that on click. And we want to set up the function. So in here, we want to go with const and let's call this handle click. And inside of that function, what do we want to do? Well, we want to invoke the set count, right? So we're going to go here with set count. And before we pass the value, I just want to mention something very important. When we invoke set count, technically, we can pass here anything. So if I'll pass here a string of Bob, yes, instead of number, this will turn into a string of Bob. Just something to be aware of. Now, of course, in our case, we will increase the count. But this is a very important gotcha, and I see this a lot in the course Q&A. So I'll reference the handle click over here. And then as far as the count, what do we want to do? Well, we want to go with count and then plus one. That kind of makes sense, right? So let's save it. And by the way, I didn't add anything in a button. Let's say click me. And now, of course, we'll see that in the browser. And also, if you log, you'll see that count is nicely increasing. So again, let me remove everything here and check it out. It's really cool that now we're triggering that re-render. So every time we'll update this value using the function, the handler function, we will also trigger a re-render. So unlike the previous example where we were just updating the value, we didn't see anything. Now you can clearly see that everything works. And also what's really awesome, use state preserves this value between the renders. Now I'm not going to do this right now since we have tons of examples coming up, but let's say if you were to set up another button and set up another callback function that increases that value, you'll see that this one will stay the same between the renders. So it's not going to go back to zero. And again, let me just emphasize one more time that we can pass here anything. So we need to be very careful. I could go here with, let's say, set count. And I'll pass in the pants, because why not? So let me set up my pants here and check it out. I start nicely here with zero. Everything's beautiful. And then I have you clicked pants times, which is great, but probably not something you were expecting. So those are the basics of you state. Again, it's a function that we get back from React. It returns an array with two elements, the current state value and a function that we can use to update the state value. And in the function, we want to pass in the default value, basically whatever we will set up in the state, whether that is a string, number, array, and blah, 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 blah. And then every time we'll update that, we will trigger the re-render. And the cool thing is we'll see the latest changes in the browser. And also that value will be preserved between those re-renders. So if you have six use state values, 
And if you update one of them, the rest of them will stay as they are. So they're not going to go back to zero. So those are the basics of use state. And up next, let's talk about renders, re-renders, and all that cool stuff. All right, and um, before we continue, let's discuss two important buzzwords, render and re-render. So essentially, when it comes to initial render, it happens the first time that the component tree is rendered to the DOM. Basically, it happens when the application loads. So this. Now, there's another use case when we toggle the component. But we haven't covered conditional rendering yet. So for now, don't worry about it. We'll come back to it once we actually cover conditional rendering. For now, just remember that essentially when our application loads, that's when the initial render of the component takes place. And this is also called mounting. So we mount the component, initial render happens, and yes, later we'll also learn how we can unmount the component. Now, when it comes to re-renders, they happen when the component's state or props change. So remember our previous example, what we were doing? We were changing the state value, correct? And as a result, we were re-rendering our component. And essentially we can re-render component also when the parent element re-renders. Again, something that we'll run into quite a few times during tutorials. So once that happens, I'll just say, hey, remember we talked about it for now. Just remember, if you'll change the state or props or the parent re-renders, that's when essentially re-render takes place. Hopefully this is clear. And before we discuss the general rules of hooks. I just want to change it back to correct one. So it's not going to be pants. And I want to stress one more time that let's say if I'm going to come up with another state value, I'm going to say set name. If you don't want to import your state, and if you already have react, keep in mind, you'll have to import react here, then you can go this way. Now, this used to be more popular when we had to import React for every component. We don't have to do that anymore. So notice both of them effectively do the same thing. It's just previously we needed to import React, and that's why it was somewhat convenient just to avoid importing your state. But since we don't have to import React, I mean, I don't see the difference right now. You can either use use state or you can import React. Just keep in mind that both of them pretty much do the same thing. And with this in place, now let's talk about the general rules of hooks. Awesome. And now let's quickly discuss the general rules of hooks. So all the hooks, the ones we get from React as well as our custom one, yes, later we'll build our own custom hooks. They need to start with use. So every time you see use, and then some kind of name. Just remember, it's a hook. So effectively, all the hooks rules apply. Now, in order to work with a hook, component must be uppercase. And this is something we already discussed at the very, 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 very beginning when we talked about React fundamentals. Now, also, we need to invoke the hook inside of the component body. So if I'll try to do this over here, use state and then I don't know, provide something. Again, it doesn't really matter what. I'm just going to say here, hello, blah, 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 invalid hook call. So hooks can be only called inside blah, 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 something that I just mentioned. So that's something important to keep in mind. Also, don't call hooks conditionally. And again, this is the topic that I'll showcase once we are familiar with conditional rendering, because at the moment, I fully understand if you're looking at it, you're like, what do you mean by that? And essentially, long story short, you don't want to place, for example, a hook inside of the if condition. So don't do it like this. Don't say if, and again, same deal, set up the use state, for example, this is not going to work. 
regardless whether this condition is true or not. This is not allowed. So hooks all the time need to be called in the same order. And lastly, set functions don't update the state immediately. And again, this is something we'll discuss later. Essentially, don't expect the synchronous behavior. So for example, if I go here and log the count, you'll see that actually I'm going to be accessing the old value. Notice, even though this is one, the value in the console is zero. Again, something we're going to discuss for now. Just focus on the main ones. It has to start with use component must be uppercase. And we want to invoke it inside of the function, basically component body. Not bad, not bad. I think we are somewhat familiar with use state and hooks in general. So why don't we set up a state value with array and in the process, we'll work on the little challenge. So you'll need to go to zero three use state array, basically imported, of course, in app JSX, and then navigate to the file in there, I want you to import data. And don't worry, I'll show you where the data is located. But then I want you to set up state value. And the default is going to be the data you're importing. Now it's going to be a list. And I want you to render that in the browser. Again, something we already covered, how we can access the value, iterate over and then display the results in the browser. Now don't worry about CSS. Again, that is totally irrelevant. If you can set up the logic, it's going to be already an awesome result. And then once you can render the list in the browser, this is an extra challenge, I want you to create two functions, one that clears the entire list. And second one, which removes the single item from the list and just to showcase what we're looking for. And you know, what? by the way, before the data is sitting over here. So if you navigate to the root, you'll see data JS. And in here we have this array. So this is what I want you to import in that component. And then first render it in the browser. Now as far as our final result, let me just copy and paste here. I'm gonna call this final Again, make sure that you, of course, import the correct component. And in here, I just want to change this to final. And let's also take a look what we have. So essentially, this should be your result. Like I said, don't worry about the CSS. Effectively, you just want to render the name, the button, and also a button to clear all the items. So if you click, you remove that specific person from the list, if you click on clear items, obviously, we are removing all of them. And once you're done, resume with the videos. So let me first start by doing a bit of spring cleaning. We won't need that. And then or you know what, I will actually leave. So I'm not going to render that component, but I'll leave this one just in case. Next time I need to access some final component, I already have the code. I just need to change the path. And then we want to navigate to use state array in the starter over here. And essentially, let's start by getting the data. Let's jog our memory how we can do that using ES6 modules. So in here, we want to go with import. Now this is a named one. So we go with data, I already know, that's the name. And notice, we right away have the correct suggestion where it is located. And then second, I know I'm going to be setting up the state value. And just to hammer this home, I will set up my state value with react dot use state. And then pretty much for the rest of the course, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to import use state. So first, let's go here with import. And we want to look for react. Okay, that's awesome. And then let's go with const and that is equal to people. So this is what I'm going to be setting up and then set people. So one is the state value. And then the second one is the function that controls it. And let's go over here with react dot. So react dot and then 
we're looking for use state. And what is default value? Well, pass in the data. And now we wanna essentially set up our return. So at the moment we have heading two, instead we're gonna have a div and we're going to iterate over. So I'll say people map. And just so you don't think that I'm making this up, I'm just gonna go with return and you know what, for now, let's just go with heading four and let's call this item. What I'm interested is the person. Why? Well, because that's gonna give me access to this object. So if I navigate to data, check it out. So I have here ID and name. So this is what I'm going to log over here. So log, and let's look for the person. Let's save. Notice we have four items. Okay, that's awesome. And also, I'll see over here the object. Now we do have the warning, each child, and all that stuff. Don't worry, we'll fix that in a second. So why don't we pull out both of those properties? We'll say over here, ID, and the person. And that is equal to our person, right? Or I'm sorry, this is not person, this is name, my bad. So we pull these ones out. I don't think we need a log anymore. Let me just leave it here for your reference. And then let's go with our div. And we right away want to set up the key. So let's set it up here over here. Key, and that is equal to my ID. And then inside of it, we want to go with heading four. And let's just render the name. And if everything is correct, we shouldn't see any warnings in the browser. And we have nicely rendered our list in the browser. So that's the first step. And up next, we're going to work on removing the items from the list. All right, so now let's complete the functionality. And as a quick side note, during this video, at least, I will rely heavily on filter method. And if you want to find out more info, you can just follow this URL where I cover everything in great detail. So let's navigate back to our example. And essentially, I want to set up two functions. One is going to be for removing all the items. And the second one is going to be for removing a single item. So let's start with that one. So remove item. For now, I'm not going to pass anything in even though eventually, yes, we'll pass in the parameter. And I mean, if you want, you can set up the log, but I think in order to speed this up, I'll just copy and paste and I'll say clear all items. So that's my second function. Then we want to set up two buttons. So we want to set up a button right here in a div. And also we want to set up a button that clears all the values. And that one is going to be outside of the curlies since I'm not going to set it in the list. So first, I guess let's just start with some HTML elements, I'm gonna go with button type, that is going to be equal to a button, I'm not gonna add any classes, it's going to be pretty basic, we can nicely see the buttons. And now let's also set up that clear all. So let's go here button, same deal, type is equal to a button, then let's add a little bit of styles, just because I want a margin. So I'm gonna go with margin top and that is equal to two REMs. On click is coming up and now let's go with clear items. And now let's go back to our tasks. So essentially this one and as I said, I don't actually need to add here class name and then that is equal to a BTN. So this one we want to use to remove all the items, correct? So what do we need to do? Well we have people and set people. Currently, it's equal to what to our data array, how we can remove all items? Well, we can set people equal to an empty array by just using set people. So if I go with clear all items, and I say set people, and set it equal to an empty array, I'll remove automatically all the items. And since we're updating the state value, we will trigger what we will trigger re render. And of course, as a result, 
we'll see the latest changes in the browser. So let's go over here, let's say on click, that's the event. And now we just want to pass the reference. So let's say clear all um, items. Let's save that. Let's test it out. Yep, we remove all the items from the list. Now, just so we are aware, remember, we can pass here the arrow function as well. So just for your reference, we can do it this way, we can go with arrow function, and then set people invoke and pass in the value. Again, this is very, very important concept. And yes, I'm getting quite a few questions in the course Q and A. Both of them achieve the same result. So keep in mind, if you see this code, essentially, it's just a shorter version of this one. And as far as the remove item, well, let's think about it. So we have IDs, correct? So those are unique to each item. Now how we can remove a specific item from array? Well, we can use a filter method, where I'm going to grab the ID, whatever it is, one, two, three, four, and essentially, we'll just remove that one item whose ID matches. And then we'll set the people equal to that new array. So let's try this one out. First, again, I just want to emphasize the point that each item will right away have that unique value when it invokes the remove item. So let's say here, I'm going to go with ID parameter and log an ID. And if I go back to the div that I'm returning, notice over here, if I go with on click, and first of all, if I want to invoke remove item right away, I do need to set up the arrow function first. And I'm not going to go back to this topic. We literally spent like I believe three videos on that in the fundamentals. So if you are a little bit confused, please go back and rewatch those videos. So remove item, I'll pass in the ID. And you'll see nicely, once you click on remove, that each item basically has that unique ID. So whatever we'll pass over here is going to be unique to that item. So like I said, what can we do? Well, we can create new array, so const new people. That is equal to what? Well, filter returns a new array, right? So we go with state value, then we go here with filter, and then we need to pass in the callback function. Now in a callback function, I'll reference each item as a person, and I'll say, if the person ID does not match, then return. Basically, filter is looking for a flag. And if it matches, then it's going to return. In this case, if the ID doesn't match, then it's going to return that person to a new people. If it does match, then essentially, it's going to exclude it. So we go here with set people, and we set it equal to a new people. That's it. That's all we have to do. Let's comment this one out and notice how one by one, basically, we can remove the items from the array. And if you're wondering, can we pass this entire logic directly in set people? The answer is yes. So you can also do something like this, Just grab this line, don't set up the variable, and right away pass in the functionality. Remember, this returns a new array at the end of the day. So yes, this will also work. Notice I can nicely remove john. So that's how we can set up a state value as an array, and right away make it dynamic by just adding a few buttons, as well as the functionality. And as you can see, we are basically relying on all the concepts we cover in fundamentals. The difference? Well, now we're using this one line of code, we're basically using the use state, which allows us to change that value. And every time we change the value, we trigger what? We trigger re render. And as a result, we see the latest changes in the browser. Okay, and up next, let's work on setting up the state value as an object. And before we do anything, let's just see why that would be useful in the first place. Just like we did, for example, with use state. And also in the process, 
we'll right away utilize whatever we learned in the previous lessons. So here's what I want you to do. Navigate to starter, and then you're looking for use state object. And you know what, let me grab quickly that file here, just so you have it for your reference in the readme over here. And you're looking for zero four. And I believe the name was use state object over here. So you want to import that, of course, in the app JSX, you want to navigate to that file. And you want to set up three state values. In my case, it's going to be name, age, and let's say a hobby. Set up all of them with use state, basically one by one, render them, and then create a button. And every time the user clicks the button, invoke a function, which updates all three state values. So as a result, once you click the button, different person is going to be displayed in the browser. So let's say these are my default values. Peter, age is 24, and Peter enjoys reading books. Now, once I click on show John, I'll have John, 28, and John enjoys screaming at the computer. And once we have this one in place, we'll refactor to object, just so you can see the actual use case. So let's navigate to the object one in the star. And you know what, pretty sure I can just comment this one out for now. And uh, I want to go to that file over here. And I already have the use state. So I already imported for you. And effectively, you want to set up those state values. So one by one, so const, let's go in here with name, set name and that is equal to use state and whatever is the default one. Like I said, in my case, it's going to be Peter, I'll right away, copy and paste. And we want to change some things around where this is not going to be name, it's going to be age. We'll go with set age. And this one is going to be number. So let's go with 24. Then we want to go with that hobby. So hobby, and then set hobby. And that one will be equal to, well, I guess, let's go with reading books, because that is really nice. So say read books, awesome. Then let's render that. And this is the case where I'm going to use the fragment. Just so we can jog our memory how we can do that. So that's my fragment. And then heading three, let's go with name, copy and paste. And effectively, I want to set up the rest of them. So one, two, and after that, we'll have the button. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go with heading for here? First one name, second one, age. And let's add enjoys. Otherwise, scream at the computer might be a bit confusing. So let's say here hobby. And let's right away set up that button. So let's save. Okay, we have initial value. And basically, we want to go here with button. Then we want to go with class name BTN. And we want to add on click. And Let's set up a function. So in here, let's go with const display person. First, let's just set up the structure and then we'll worry about the actual logic. So let's say here, display person and I'm going to write here show john since I know that's what I'm going to be doing. So let's say okay, we have the button and then it's pretty straightforward. If I want to change all of these three values, yes, this is what I'll have to do one by one. I'll go with set and name. What is the name? Well, that is going to be John and you can probably or guess the other ones. So age, as well as the hobby. So we simply need to change here, age. And this one will be, for example, 28. And then lastly, we have set hobby. And this is where I'll type scream at the computer. So scream at the computer. Okay, good. Now we need to change this one to a hobby, of course. And like I said, it's very straightforward. You have 15 values over here. If you have this type of setup where each value has its own handler function, essentially, you'll have to call them one by one. And therefore, in the next video, we'll take a look at the object example. Okay, and 
before we refactor our example to one state value, which is going to be an object, why don't we do a little quiz? So remember when we discussed use state, I mentioned that pretty much every time we'll update the state value, we'll trigger re-render. Now, in this example, we have three handler functions. So $10,000 question, do you think we're going to trigger three re-renders? Or it's going to be only one? And if you guessed only one, you're absolutely correct. You see, behind the scenes, React is using technique called auto batching to effectively group the updates. So what that means in our example, even though we have three handler functions, it's only going to trigger one re-render. Now, prior to React 18, there were actually some instances where yes, such a code, basically when we have multiple handler functions would trigger three re-renders, but that's not the case anymore with React 18. So in React 18, pretty much every time you'll have multiple handler functions, yes, it will trigger only one re-render. Beautiful. So our functionality works. Technically, everything is fine, but we can save some lines of code if we refactor this to an object. And of course, it's going to make even more sense if you have more state values. What do you think is easier to have one object that has, let's say, 10 properties or to have 10 state values? Again, it depends on the use case, of course. If you have a use case for 10 separate values, then of course, don't just randomly group them together. But let's say alert example. What is usually in the alert? Well, you want to know whether it's going to be displayed. So basically, there's going to be a Boolean value, true or false. You probably also want to know whether it's going to be danger or success, whether it's going to be some red alert or it's going to be green. And you also probably want to change the text. So that's a perfect example where actually you don't have to set them up one by one. You can just group them together in one object. So here's what I want to do. I want to go with const and I'm going to call this person and set person. Now this is going to be equal to my use state. Here we'll pass in my object. And as far as the properties, well, we'll use the same ones. We'll say name is equal to Peter. And then let's copy and paste one, two, and Let's just change these values around as well. So we're going to go here with age. That will be equal to 24. Yep, you're exactly correct. And then lastly, we have our hobby. So we go here with hobby. And we go with read books. Now we can remove all these use states. We won't need them anymore. And we also don't need to call them one by one. So now I can go with one function, which is set person, and I just need to provide the object. And here I'll say John first, then age 28, and then I'll say the hobby is equal to scream at the computer. And once I save, I actually get an error. Why? Well, because remember, now our state is an object. So we can either destructure it over here, one by one, just grab the properties or we need to go with person person dot name then we're looking for person dot age and then lastly of course we have person and hobby correct so let's do that let's save and now everything should work so once i click check it out now i have the new values now be aware of the gotchas remember we can pass whatever value in the set function. So even though this is an object, I can pass the string. And what do you think is going to happen? Well, our application is going to somewhat break because there is no more object. So let's try this one out. First, I'll copy and paste, or I'm sorry, I'll comment this one out, my bad. So we'll go here with set person. 
and then let's say shake and bake. And what do you know? The moment I save, the moment I click, I have nothing rendered. Why? Well, again, there is no object anymore. So I simply have the enjoys. These ones, they're undefined. So that's the first thing to be aware of. Second, you can also overwrite by just providing one property or two, basically not all of the properties. So in this example, we provided all of the properties. So it was kind of hard to mess it up. But what if I go here and say set person and I just say, you know what? I want to change the name. I don't want to change the other ones. I just want to change the name. Well, now I'll only have a object with a value of Susan. So let's go here. Let's click and check it out again. The other ones, they're not there anymore because this is the new state value. This is the object. Now a way around it is effectively to just copy the properties from the state. So first let's just copy and paste. Let's uncomment this one. And first we want to copy all the values. And then we just need to decide which ones we want to overwrite. So I'm grabbing all of the properties with all of the values. And if I just want to overwrite one of them, I say name is equal and whatever value. So in this case, Susan. So now everything is going to work. We'll still preserve those current values. So if I click over here, notice it changes to Susan. Hopefully this is clear. Again, it's not a solution for every use case. Of course, there's going to be use cases where you will have multiple state values, but this is a nifty approach. If you can effectively group together the state values, since it's just going to save you time on setting up the logic. Again, be aware of the gotchas. It's very easy to overwrite the value and then run around like a headless chicken and look for the bug. Okay. Um, before we wrap up your state and move on to the next topic, let's also cover set function gotcha, which by the way, we already touched upon. And um, let's take a look at the fix and a good use case for using the fix. And first, let's just set up a trivial challenge. Let's go to the file, use state gotcha in the star, all that, and set up the state value. So again, practice on setting up the use state, create a button. Like I said, in the beginning, we'll have these buttons. Don't worry. In the next examples, we'll start making more complex setups, add functionality to increase by one and log the state value right after the set function and see what is going to be the result. So again, let me just double check. Yep. And here I'm in use state. Okay. That's awesome. And then in the gotcha, first I want to get the use state here. So let me try the auto import. Yep. That works as far as the initial value. I'm going to go with zero and then value and the function. Well, I'm not going to be particularly original and I'm just going to go with set value. So that is equal to my use state. Okay. Awesome. After that, we want to right away, create that handle click since I know that it's going to be there. So handle click, that's my function. And in here, I just want to set up increase by one. So it's going to be equal to set value. And let's go with value plus one. So the gotcha is not here. Again, this is going to work as expected. Then let's navigate to our JSX. We want to change this around. It's not going to be a heading two. It's going to be a heading one with our value. So that is going to be correct here. And then let's also set up that button. Type is equal to a button. A button here. Then let's add a class name. Class name will be equal to BTN. And let's say increase. And let's also not forget about the handle click. So on click is equal to handle click. So once we have this on in place, like I said, the gotcha is not in this setup. So this is going to work. What I want you to keep in mind that this is not going to happen synchronously. 
So if you log here the value, this won't be already the new value. Notice, once I refresh, once I start clicking, this is one behind. So here I have the seven, and actually in a console, I have a six. And again, the problem is gonna be if you have some kind of functionality that relies on that latest value. And in the following video, we'll see how we can get that latest value, which basically is the most recent state update. All right, so now that we know set function is not going to be synchronous, now let's look at the solution. You see, there's another way how we can update the state, and that is using the function approach. So instead of passing the new state value, like we have been doing for the last whatever videos, we can actually pass in the function and as a first parameter by default, we get the current state. Now, since this is a parameter, yes, Bobby Lee or Joe Coy is an awesome name, but a more common convention is to call this current state, previous state, old state, whatever. I mean, again, you can name this banana, it's still going to work. And yes, it's by default provided by React. It effectively just provides whatever you have currently in a state. So in this case, it would provide that number right before the update. And then in here, we just need to set up the functionality where essentially we must return something. And this is one of the gotchas with this approach. If you don't return anything, it will right away fail. Why? Well, because there is no value anymore. It's now going to be undefined. Remember, in JavaScript functions return by default, what? They return undefined. So you must return that value. And whatever you're going to return from that function, that is going to be the new value. So let's try this one out. Where essentially, I'm going to remove this one. We'll pass in the function. Yes, this is what we're doing. We're passing function into the set value. That's the approach. And like I said, if you simply just leave it the way it is, this is going to be undefined. Now, I do want to showcase that we'll access the state value. And again, in my case, I'm going to call this current state. So this is the state right before the update. Hopefully that is clear. And yes, the reason why I'm being so annoying and repeating that this is provided by React, because this is also one of those things that I see a lot in course Q&A. Yes, we're not doing anything. Right out of the gate, React just provides that value. So let's go here with current state and... I'm purposely returning nothing, just so you can see that essentially the functionality is not going to work. Notice we get back undefined. Now we did get the correct zero over here, right? So if we have some kind of functionality that relies on that latest value, we need to use this approach. Now, since I'm recording this in tutorial, I'm gonna be more explicit. Keep in mind that of course you can simply return that new value. In my case though, I'm gonna go with const, then I'll say new state is equal to, and then I'm just gonna go with current state and then plus one. And now let's just go with the return and new state. And I'm not gonna log the new state. Hopefully it's clear that yes, it's going to be latest value. So we go over here and notice everything still works. Only in this case, we access that very latest value. And in the following video, We'll take a look at a nice example where such approach makes a lot of sense. Now, before you ask, do you have to set up set functions every time with function? I mean, it's really up to you. There's gonna be some instances where you definitely need to do that, something we're gonna cover in the next video, but should you go back and now refactor every set function instance to this one? No. I mean, if it works with just a regular approach where you pass in the new value, you can definitely leave it. Some people use function for everything. That's pretty much their preference. There's nothing wrong with that, but there is no clear rule that you always, always have to use this one. Again, there's gonna be some instances where you must use it, otherwise the functionality is not going to work. But if you're just changing, I don't know, a list to an empty list, no, you don't have to pass in the function. You can just pass in the new value. All right, and now let's take a look at the good use case 
where we need to use function approach. And for that, for now, I'm just going to remove this one. We'll set everything from scratch. And let's imagine that we want to invoke the functionality in some time. And for that, we are going to use the set time on. And essentially, if you just pass here the set time on, you'll see that the functionality won't work as expected. So let's try this one out. I'm going to navigate back, let's say set time on. So now, effectively, I want to change that value in some time, let's say three seconds. As we know, we need to pass here the callback function first, and then the second in how long, like I said, in my example, it's going to be three seconds. And then let's simply go with set value. And then let's type value plus one. Now, what is our expectation? First of all, well, our expectation is that every time we will click the button, let's say five times, this is going to be invoked. So set timeout is going to be invoked. And then after three seconds, we're going to get that latest value plus one. So if I clicked five times, my expectation is that I'm going to see over here, value five, correct? Are we on the same page? Hopefully we are. So let's refresh and one, two, three, four, five. And the value did change in three seconds, but it's definitely not five. And I can click all day long and the same thing is going to happen. And if you don't believe me, we can set up a log over here. Otherwise, you might be thinking, okay, he's just not clicking the button. So click the button. Let's try one more time. Apologies if you find this annoying. One, two, three, four, five. And I should see over here five. Yep. So this is correct. I did click it five times. But again, the value does not change. Now, why is that happening? Well, you see, in our callback function, when we invoke set value, we're not grabbing the latest value. We are grabbing the value that is within these three seconds. So essentially what I'm saying, let's imagine that I'm going to click the button 100 times in those three seconds. All of them will reference this value of zero. And only once we switch, then the value is going to become two. So again, regardless of how many times I click, I'm not updating that value right away or here. I'm just saying, yep, please update that value. But I'm all the time using that old value. Hopefully that is clear. Again, you can click five more times or six or whatever. Again, if that happened within those three seconds, it's all the time going to be using the value right before we invoke the callback function first time. Hopefully that is clear. Now, what is the solution? Now we know how we can use the function approach, right? So we can pass in the function again, we have access right now to the latest the current state value, which by the way, will increase as we're clicking on a button. And then we just return the new state value. So in this case, I'm going to say current and state. And we want to go with return. And let's go with current state plus one. And now you'll see that our functionality works. Where essentially, again, if I refresh, and if I click, whatever times, in those three seconds, I'll nicely increase the state value by the amount of times I clicked on a button. Hopefully it's clear. We're pretty much done with use state. And we are ready to move on to our next topic. And up next, let's talk about another important hook called use effect. And we're going to start just like the other examples. Basically, in the app JSX, we want to navigate this time to zero to use effect, we're looking for the star, and we're going to go with code example. And just like with use state, the first thing we're going to do is to understand why do we need a use effect in the first place. And in order to do that, basically, we'll take a look how the code inside of the component runs. So let's navigate to that file, you should see on the screen something like this value equals to zero, and a button. So let me navigate over here. 
and this shouldn't look too foreign. So we have over here use state, we import that, we set up the value, set value, use state. And then of course I have JSX. And what do you know? I'm updating the value. And again, the gotcha is not over here. Now let's talk about how the code runs inside of the component. So let's say if I set up a function and I'm gonna call this say hello. So const say and hello. So that is equal to my function. And inside of the function, what do you know? I just simply want to set up some console log. I want to go with log and hello there. A million dollar question. Again, we're doing the quiz. Yes, you got that right. So previous time we went for $10,000 question. Why don't we go for a million this time? So million dollar question. If I have a function over here and if I invoke it, and as a side note, Yes, the function declaration can be somewhere else. For example, it can be in different file, or it can be above the component. My question is, if I invoke this function inside of the component, how often do you think it's going to run? And possible choices. We have initial render, basically when the component mounts, like so. So once I refresh, only then, the function is going to execute. So then I have after every render, and as I note, you can already kind of see that it's definitely happening when the component mounts. Then we have after every render, and then we have, I don't know, randomly after every third render. And if you guessed that it's actually happening after every render, you are absolutely correct. Basically the initial render, which again happens when the component mounts, in this case, when we load the application, let's say when we refresh the browser and all that, and also every time we re-render, because what are we doing over here? Remember with use state, every time we'll change the value, we will re-render, correct? So let's try this one out. Notice I start clicking, and what do you know? In the console, I have a bunch of hello there's. Now, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a fact. That's how it works. If you have some kind of function here that is being invoked, and for example, this declaration, yes, it's gonna be set up pretty much from scratch every time. So every time we'll re-render, React is gonna create this function. And also, if you invoke the function, it will run the code. Now, when do we need to be careful well, when we update the state, why? Because we can trigger infinite loop. So let me showcase that. I'm gonna add comment here, so be careful. You will have infinite loop. Now, how can we have infinite loop? If we update the state value inside of this function. So let's go over here with set value, and then I'm gonna go with value plus one. And before we run it, let's discuss why we're gonna have the infinite loop. Well, let's think about it. So we have initial render. This is where we set up the state value. And also we set up the function and we invoke it. Now, inside of the function, what do we do? We trigger re-render, correct? We go with value plus one. So when we re-render, again, we do the same thing. We create a state value and we set up the function inside of the function we do what we update the state value and hopefully you see where i'm going with this so hopefully this is clear and uh, now let me just save the file and you'll right away see a bunch of errors in console so again just be careful yes there are going to be times when you will set up a function here actually by the end of the section i'll share a resource where you'll see that react is somewhat pushing for it instead of using a bunch of use effects to use functions like this. But again, there are nuances. We need to be mindful when we set up such functions. There's nothing wrong with setting them up. The gotcha is you don't wanna update the state in such a fashion because yes, you will have an infinite loop. And that's why in the next video, we'll cover use effect and how use effect helps us to run code 
conditionally in our application. Basically, we'll be able to choose when do we want to run certain code inside of our component. All right, so now let's get familiar with use effect hook. So in the app.js, I'm importing, or I guess app.jsx, I'm importing the second one, use effect basics, and you'll notice that pretty much it's the same starting point. So if I go here, yes, I have the same function, I have the log. Now in this case, I'm not updating the state value, and I also have my state value and a button. And essentially when it comes to use effect hook in React, it allows us to perform side effect in the function component. Now, there is no need for urban dictionary, basically any work outside of the component. And if at the moment it doesn't make any sense, trust me, it's going to be more useful if we cover some examples. Essentially, it's things like subscriptions, fetching data. Fetching data is, by the way, very popular. Or let's say if we want to directly update the DOM, remember in vanilla JS, we can select the DOM nodes with things like query selector and all that. This is where you would do that. We also can set up some event listeners and timers and all that kind of stuff. We'll pretty much cover all of these examples. So please just be patient. And essentially when it comes to use effect hook, we import use effect. It's looking for two arguments. The second one is optional and the first one is the callback function. And effectively, whatever you have inside of that callback function is going to run. Now by default, by default, it runs after every render, which means pretty much initial render and re-renders. But there's a caveat where we can provide the dependency array. And somewhat important, we cannot return a promise from the callback function. So let's tackle all of those things. First, we want to import use effect from React. What do we do? We simply go with use, and then the name is use effect. Like I said, hook starts with use. So all the hooks, our hooks, React hooks, they will start with use. Okay, that is clear. Then let's go, I guess, pass, say hello, and let's just go with use effect. Like I said, it's looking for two arguments. The first one is going to be the callback function, which is going to be invoked. Well, that depends what we have in dependency array. By default, it's going to be invoked after every render. So let's try this one out. Let's go here with a function. Again, you can pass the reference. You can pass here the arrow function. That is really up to you. And let's go here with log. And I'm going to say hello from an use effect. And what you'll notice that we have a few hello there. So let me refresh. Basically, I want to start from the scratch. And you'll also see hello from use effect. And basically, every time we'll click, we'll have both of those logs. And as you're looking at it, you're like, well, wait a minute, pal. We were supposed to fix this issue. Why you are showing us the use effect? Well, remember, this is the default behavior. So by default, it runs on each render. However, there's a second argument that we can pass which technically isn't optional, but I mean, quite often you'll pass that argument and that is the dependency array. And if we set up the dependency array empty, then it's only going to run on the initial render. So let's try this one out. Like I said, second argument. So we go here with comma and then we pass in the dependency array. So now once I save, check it out, you'll see that, yes, we have the initial render and all that. Everything is beautiful. But once we click the button, actually, you won't see the second log in the console. So notice over here, I only have the hello there. However, the log in the use effect only runs in the initial render. That's it. So that's the biggest difference. If we have just the plain function or we invoke the function inside of the component, yes, it's going to run on initial render and on every re-render. However, with use effect, we can start controlling when this functionality runs. Now, lastly, I just want to mention that from this function, we don't want to return a promise. So later on, we'll be setting up functionality to fetch data and a 
pretty common approach is to go with a sync, right? So we set up our function to be a sync, and then we can await for something, fetch, axios, whatever. Now we cannot do that with use effect because there's a special thing that we are returning from this use effect, something we're going to cover, a cleanup function. And remember, a sync functions, what do they return? Do I need to do another quiz or no? I think no. So I'm just going to tell it to you. A sync functions return promise. So if we set up this function as a sync, it will return a promise. And use effect is not okay with that. Now, keep in mind, within the callback function, I can still set up a synchronous function and invoke it. So if I go here with some func, um, I set it up as a sync and basically have the await keyword inside of it. And again, just for sake of it, I'm going to go with fetch and I'm not going to provide anything. And if I invoke some func, this is okay. You just don't want to set up the first argument the callback function that we're providing as a sync. And don't worry, once we start fetching data, most likely I'll come back and discuss this particular thing one more time. So now let me just remove that. Let's save. And hopefully it's clear that we have use effect hook. We import that from React. We invoke it and we provide a few things. We provide a callback function, which is going to be invoked pretty much after every render, unless we provide here a dependency array. In that case, if we have dependency array, and if it's empty, the functionality inside of the use effect is only going to run once, only when the component mounts on the initial render, unlike the regular function, which is going to be declared and invoked on initial render and also on every re-render. Okay, and up next, let's talk about dependency array and how we can have multiple use effects in our application. So in the app.js, we wanna navigate to zero, three and multiple effects. And once we navigate to this file, you'll see use state, you'll see use effect and essentially two state values. This is the case where I didn't see the point of creating all of this from scratch. There's only so many times when creating a button and a state value is useful. And notice over here, we have two heading ones in the JSX with two buttons. And guess what? Pretty much every time we'll click, we'll update that state value. And let's start with the simple fact that, yes, you can have as many use effects in your component as you want. So pretty much you can set up a use effect for every smallest feature. Now, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And again, I'm going to return to the point that at the very end of the section, I'll show you a very useful resource, which is going to cover all of these cases in more detail. So please be patient for now. Just remember, just because you can have like 10 use effects in your component doesn't mean that you should do that. And essentially, if I go here with the first use effect, if I uncomment, we'll see that basically, once I refresh, there is initial load, right? So this is where we'll have that console log and all that. And then pretty much every time we'll update the state values, I mean, we'll see nothing in the console. And the same deal, we can set up another use effect that also is going to run only when the application loads. And again, I can keep clicking all day long, and I'll only see those two logs in the console. So that covers multiple use effects. Yes, you can have them in the component. Doesn't mean that you can only have one use effect. Now, also, let's talk about this dependency array. Notice how when it's empty, it only runs when the component mounts, correct? But we can provide values over here. So if I'm going to go here with value, which essentially is my first one, you'll notice that not only this use effect runs when the component mounts, and again, for that, I'll have to refresh, but also when we update this value. So this is already very powerful, where not only this functionality is invoked on the mount, but also when we're clicking on the first button. However, it's not going to happen if we click on the second one. 
it's only going to happen if I add the second value over here. Yes, at that point, we'll have a log when we click on the first one, as well as the second one. And as you can see, this is very powerful stuff, since I can have one use effect for one value, and then the second one is going to be for the second one. And you can probably already guess that the first one is only going to show up if we click over here. And then the second one is going to be when we click on a second button. And of course, you're not limited to the amount of values you can pass over here. You can start with empty dependency array, and then you can have three, five, or whatever. So that, again, really depends on situation. Just keep in mind a few things. First, you can have multiple use effects. Again, I'm not saying you should, but you can. And then the second one is the dependency array where we can pass multiple values and every time that value is going to change we will invoke the functionality inside of the callback function one more time and once we're familiar with the use effect basics why don't we work on a little challenge where essentially i want you to fetch some github users from the url and render them on the screen now, before we continue, let me just mention that during this video, I will use Fetch API. And yes, I'm fully aware that there's a library called Axios. And in fact, we will use it later on in the course. We'll have tutorial. And then for more complex projects, we'll definitely use Axios. And if you're not a fan of Fetch, you can definitely install Axios and use it. But in my opinion, for simple examples, Fetch is good enough. Now, if you're not familiar with Fetch at all, then I suggest utilizing this link. Effectively, this is the JS Nuggets video where I cover Fetch API from scratch. And as far as the challenge, we want to go to app JSX. We want to get the star from zero for Fetch data. And essentially, in there, we want to set up the state and set up the use effect. And as far as the users, the default value is going to be empty array. Then set up a use effect, but make sure that it only runs on initial render. Keep in mind that the URL I provided, it has some rate limits. So if you'll just be randomly testing out stuff by omitting the dependency array, well, you'll exceed that limit and you'll basically have to wait to work on the challenge. Then in the callback function in the use effect, create a function which performs fetch functionality and use the url i provided in the star file now you can go with dot then or async that's really up to you so either you can set up the async function or since fetch returns a promise you can go with dot then and for now i suggest just logging so if you're somewhat confused just try to set up fetch functionality and log them Nothing more. Just log the users. If you can log the users, you're already in good shape. Now, if you want to challenge yourself more, then set up users equal to a result. Just remember that fetch returns a promise. We need to go with dot then, and then we need to return dot JSON in order to get the data. And I want to set that result from dot JSON equal to my users the state value, and then I want to iterate over the list and basically display them. Now, I don't suggest worrying about CSS. It doesn't really matter. You can show them in any way you want. Effectively, I just want to show the profile, the link to the profile, as well as their image. That's it. And a tiny hint, if you don't want to deal with big images, and if you don't want to set them up in CSS, just add inline style for that image and set up the width for, I don't know, 50 pixels or something along those lines. Again, go to the file, try to set up the logic. If you can log, that's already a awesome start. And once you're ready to compare the results, continue with the videos. Beautiful. So now let's start working on a challenge. I'll comment out the final one in the app JSX, just so it's not in the way. And we want to navigate to fetch data. And 
you can either use auto import or you can go basically with import and then those two values. I'll try to use the auto import. I'm going to go with use state. Yep. That's what we're getting from react. And like I said, I'll set it equal to a users and the default value here is going to be an empty array. So I'm going to go with users and then set users. Now that is equal to my use state. And as far as my default value, I'm going to provide empty array. After that, let's set up that use effect. So let's go here and say use effect. Notice we have nice auto import. And I pretty much always start just by logging stuff because I don't want to set up the functionality. And then it turns out that, I don't know, I'm invoking it the wrong way or something along those lines. So I'm going to go here with log and I'm going to say hello. Let's save it. And let me check. Yep, I have nice hello in the console. And again, please, 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 please add over here the empty dependency array. Otherwise, you'll pretty much have to wait to work on the challenge. You'll right away exceed the rate limit. And you'll have to wait, I believe, like 15 minutes or something along those lines. So once we have the use effect, what do we want to do? Well, we want to fetch data from this URL, correct? And like I said, we don't want to set up this function as async because, for example, in my case, I'm going to use async await. So I want to set up the fetching function as async. But we cannot do that with the callback function. That's not allowed. What we can do, though, is to set up a sync function inside. So I'm going to remove the hello and I'm going to come up with a function. I'll call this fetch data. This is going to be my async function. And I'm not going to provide the URL here. I'm just going to say empty parameters and all that. And I'm going to start by just awaiting for fetch. So response that is equal to await and then fetch and let's provide the URL. Like I said, effectively, this is going to return a promise. And I want to turn this into a JSON. So I'm going to go here with const users and that is equal to await. And then we want to go with response and then dot and then JSON like so we want to save that. And like I said, we just want to start by logging stuff. So in here, I'm going to say users. And if in a console, I'll nicely see the users that are coming from this URL, we're good to go. Now, what's the problem? Well, I'm not invoking it, correct? So I'm going to go here with fetch and then data and check it out. Once I refresh, notice now I have all my users. Now, when it comes to a sync functionality, it's a good practice to set this up in try catch, just in case you have any errors. Now, I can tell you right away that when it comes to fetch, it doesn't treat 404 as an error. So unlike the Axios, which essentially is going to run the code inside of the catch, if you have 404, that's not the case with the fetch one. That's kind of a gotcha. So First, let me just cut this one out over here. I'll place this one inside of the try and I'm just going to log the error. But again, if you'll go here and change the URL, for example, to users, you'll see that basically the error is not going to run. So we'll go here with error. And then again, let me go here with users. And then notice, yes, we do have an error, but it's actually called in line 13. So we're not invoking the catch one over here. Just again, something to keep in mind. Because for example, Axios, if you have 404, yes, then the functionality is going to be invoked in the catch. That's just a tiny side note. So once I have the users, what I can do, well, we can set our users equal to whatever users we're getting back, correct? So why don't we do this? I'm going to go with set users equals to the users. And of course, now I do need to fix the URL. Let's save it over here. And if you want, you can actually go to a big browser and let's test out the state value. So let me navigate to the big browser. I'm going to go with the new tab and all that. And I want to paste that 5173. And if we inspect again, we can take a look at the console if we're logging or we can simply go with components. Then we have the fetch data and notice I have the use effect. So I have my function and I also have my state value. So if we're successful, this is what we're going to see. We'll have this array of users 
in the state. And like I said, that's why the React Dev Tools are so powerful because you can right away pretty much get the info. Okay, that's good. Now let me remove all these errors and all that. I don't think they're useful. And now let's just worry how we'll render them. So let's navigate to the JSX and we'll start by setting up the section. So I guess I'm just gonna remove this one. There's no need here. So section, then inside of this section, I'm gonna go with heading three. And let's just come up with some kind of value. So GitHub and users, let's save that. And then we wanna go with an ordered list and actually I already set up the CSS in the CSS file. So if you'll navigate to index CSS, and if you look for users, you'll see that basically there is already some CSS attached to it. And essentially this is what you can use if you want. Again, the CSS part is really irrelevant. The main point of this challenge was to set up the logic. So let's go here with an ordered list. Let's right away add a class of users. And then inside of that an ordered list, I wanna iterate over. So I'm gonna go here with users, then I'm gonna go with map. So we're mapping over and I'll reference each and every item as a user. Now, for now, let's just return the list item with some kind of value. And why I'm doing that, because I wanna log and show you what is inside of the user. So let's go here with return list item, and I'm just gonna say item. Again, there's gonna be a warning, don't worry about it. And yes, I already have a little bit of CSS over there. But if we log, we should see what properties we have inside of that user. So let me scroll up. I mean, all of them are gonna be the same, but I'm gonna start with the first one and check it out. So we have the avatar URL. Effectively, this is where we can get the picture. We also have the login. That is gonna be the user account. And we have HTML URL, which leads back to the profile. And also we have a ID. Why do we need ID? Well, because we have the key, correct? So what we can do, we can pull out those properties. So I can say here const, and then ID, then login, then avatar and underscore URL, HTML underscore URL, and all of that is equal to my user. And then as far as the return, well, now let's provide the key. That's the first thing. So in here we'll go with ID. And then as far as the item, I wanna place the image and I wanna set up the div. Again, if you don't wanna use my CSS, I just suggest adding the inline for the image. Otherwise they're gonna be pretty big as far as I remember. So image, now for the source, we wanna go here with avatar URL. Alternative, I'm just gonna provide the login. That's kind of a shortcut in here. And then right after that, we wanna go with div. And then inside of the div, we're gonna go with heading five. And we'll display the name. So let's go here with login. And then lastly, let's set up that link that navigates back. And if you're interested in the CSS again, please just reference the index CSS. You'll see essentially the styles that I added. They're not that many. So let's go here and let's go for HTML URL. And then inside of the link, let's just say profile. Let's save that and this is what we should see on the screen. Essentially a list of GitHub users. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the challenge and I'll see you in the next video. All right, as you can see in the readme, technically our next topic should be use effect cleanup function. However, We'll actually skip this and the following use effect topic and come back to them once we're done with conditional rendering. If you're wondering why are we hopping like that, simply because use effect cleanup function is somewhat tricky topic. So in this course iteration, I decided to use different example in the hopes that it will help students to understand the main concepts better. And since in the example, we're going to toggle component, we first need to cover conditional rendering. Yes, I also prefer to cover everything step-by-step, step, essentially in order. 
but in this case, I did not see any other option. So again, let me repeat, we will skip use effect cleanup function for now and come back to it once we're done with our next main topic, conditional rendering. And next, let's talk about conditional rendering in React. And in short, in the following videos, we'll learn how to control what is displayed in the browser based on some condition. And let's just start with multiple returns. So as far as the setup in the app JSX, you should import starter from 03. Yep, we're switching the folders, and then starter and then 01 multiple returns. And effectively, once you navigate to the file, you should see just the heading two with two imports for use effect and use state. And as far as the topic, it's actually not controversial or anything new. Let's think about it. In vanilla JS, we can set up multiple returns in a function. So if I have a function, say hello, that is looking for the name parameter. If name exists, I can go with early return. I can say, you know what? The function is going to return hello and then whatever is the name. Now, if the name is not provided, then of course it will bypass the safe condition and then we'll return whatever we type here in the bottom. Now, just keep in mind that by default, JavaScript functions return undefined. So if you're not going to return anything, then basically it's just going to return undefined. So if let's say we invoke the say hello with the parameter, if we provide the argument, then it's going to be hello and then whatever the argument. If not, then it's going to be hello there. Now, since our components are functions, can we do the same in React? And you can probably already guess that the answer is yes. And effectively in this file, here's the setup. We have use effect and use state. So why don't we set up a state value? And I'm going to call my state value is loading. So that's a tiny side note where a convention is to call Boolean values is and then whatever is that Boolean value. So if it's loading, then is loading. And then the function is set is loading. Again, it's a convention. So taco and burrito is also a good approach, but most likely a lot of times you'll see this type of approach. So I'm going to go with is loading and then we're going to go with set is loading. So that's the function that controls it and we'll set it equal to use state. And the default value is going to be true over here. And essentially it's a Boolean. So we can flip it like a switch true to false and false to true. And then let's keep on moving. Why don't we set up a condition? So I do have my return, which essentially just says heading two with multiple returns basics. However, I can go here with if, and I can say if is loading, basically my state value. If this is true, then I want to return something else. So I'm going to go here with heading two, and we're going to go with loading, and then dot, dot, dot. Now, before you ask, yes, essentially, if you want, you can return entire application over here. I'm just showing heading two, but you can place here 10,000 divs and whatever functionality you want and check it out. Now, since this is true, we actually return this heading two. So we don't even get to this return. And that's how early returns work in JavaScript functions. If this condition is true, then we return whatever we have inside of the curlies. And now the next question is, can we make this dynamic? Because at this point, it's like, okay, I can go here and I type false. And of course, everything is going to work. But I mean, in the real application, you kind of want to change this programmatically, correct? And the answer again is yes. Now, in our case, we'll just tinker with set timeout. But in the following examples, I'll show you how we can actually do that. If let's say we fetch data for now, we'll just basically pretend that we're fetching data. So I'm going to go here with use effect. 
I'll provide here my callback function. And I'll say that I only want to run it once when the component mounts. And then let's set up set timeout. And inside of the set timeout, we again need to provide a function that's going to be invoked and then in how long. And in here, I'm going to go with 3000, basically three seconds. So those are milliseconds. And I'm just going to add comment here done fetching data. Again, this is going to be a pretty common example for using multiple returns. That's why I keep referencing fetching the data. So let's go here with set is loading and let's set it equal to false. And what you'll notice once you save, basically the way it's going to work while we're loading, while we're getting some kind of data, we'll display something to the user. So user knows, hey, things are happening. User is not looking at just blank screen. And then once we're good to go, then we'll display basically the JSX we want to show to the user. And once we're familiar with the basics, why don't we work on another challenge? And effectively, we want to implement multiple returns when we fetch data, which again, is most common use case for using the use effect. And that's why, of course, we're implementing multiple returns with the fetching data example. So back in the app JSX, you should import starter from the zero to multiple returns fetch data. And then if you navigate to the file, this is what you'll see. Use effect in your state imported and then the URL that I want you to use. And then as far as the challenge, first practice on setting up the state values. So for now, practice on a user. My default value is going to be null for the user. And then fetch data from the URL. Again, you should do that, of course, in use effect and all that. And I'm not going to provide any more details. That's the challenge. And again, for now, just log the result. If you want, of course, you can set up the state value and render something on a screen. But if you see the user object in a the console, then you're already in good shape. So let me navigate back to the component. And effectively, like I said, the first thing that I want to do is set up that state value. I'm going to go with const and then user and then set user. That's my function that is going to be equal to use state. And like I said, by default, I want to provide value null. So nothing is going to be there. And now let's set up that use effect. So use effect in here. Let's provide a callback function. And let's just make sure that we invoke this again only when the component loads. So we don't want to basically run this use effect after every re-render. And up next, I want to set up that function. So I'm going to go with fetch user is equal to a sync. That's the function. And then we're going to set up the functionality where I'll right away place everything in the try and catch. And as far as the catch, I'm just going to go with error in here. And then when it comes to try, now let's again, get the response back first. And that is equal to await. So we're waiting, then fetch, we'll provide the URL. And let's right away turn this basically into a JSON. So const and then user is equal to await again, then response and JSON. Let's invoke this. Like I said, if you want, you can set user equal to user. For now, I just want to log this. I want to see whether everything is working as I expected. So notice over here at the moment, I don't see anything. Um, and of course, the reason why nothing is happening because I keep forgetting to invoke the function over here. So let me go with fetch user and now check it out. In the console, I should see the info about the user. And as you can see, this is just more info compared to when we fetched data. And in the following videos, we'll set up multiple returns and also We'll set up a proper JSX. Now, before we continue, you know what? Let me just go over here and then comment this one out. So essentially, we can set this one up together. Okay, and now let's put two and two together. Effectively, we know how we can work with multiple returns. And the reason why we want to use them with fetch data, because essentially, you'll have 
three states. You have the loading one, when we are waiting for data arrive. Because keep in mind, when it comes to fetching data, it's asynchronous. So it doesn't happen instantly. Then second, there might be an error. So I don't know, maybe the values were not correctly provided. Maybe the network doesn't work. I mean, whatever. There could be all kinds of errors. And then the last one is the success. And essentially, we go through those states. Those are our options. And therefore, in the state, we actually want to set up two more Booleans for loading and for error. And then depending on the values, we want to display more JSX. So let's start working on that. Where first, I want to navigate back to the component and let's set up those state values again. The convention is to go with is and then the name. Technically, you don't have to. So if I'm going to go here with is loading and then set is loading. And you know what? By default, I'm going to set it equal to true. And then I'll do the same thing with error. Now, this one by default will be false. So let's set it back to false. And then as far as these values, let's go error. And we want to also change it over here. Let's save it. And then let's keep on moving. Before we set the user, why don't we set up two conditions? So one is going to be for loading and one if we have an error. Now, please, placement here is important. So if you'll place the loading after the actual JSX you want to return, then it's not going to make sense because loading is going to be first and JavaScript effectively reads everything top to bottom. So if you'll have return before the loading condition, then essentially you'll all the time display the JSX and that's not what we want. So make sure that you set the loading first. So the whole point of this rant is that the placement is extremely important. And then let's go here with the return and we want to provide whatever value. So in my case, it's going to be, again, the heading two with loading and dot, dot, dot. And now let's do the same thing with an error. Now keep in mind, since this is true, we'll right away hit this condition. So this is what we'll return. And error basically is going to be displayed only when we set this one to false. So we bypass that condition and this one to true. Again, something very important to keep in mind. And I keep getting these questions all the time in course Q&A. That's why I'm spending more time on that. So let's go over here with loading. And instead of that, we'll just go with there was an error. Let's save this. And for now, we'll right away have the loading. Why? Well, because this is equal to true. Then let's navigate back to our fetch user. And let's go through the logic. So we start over here fetching. We display loading. Okay, everything is awesome. Now, what do we want to do when we get back to user? Well, we want to set our state value, right? That kind of makes sense. So let's go over here. Let's go with set user. And now this one is equal to a user. Okay, beautiful. And then right after these conditions, the try and catch, we want to essentially set loading to false because we're done loading. So at that point, we have only two options. Either there was an error, we didn't get the data, or if everything was successful, then of course we want to display the user. Again, it starts with loading. Loading is true. And then once we're done with loading, then we only have two options. And that's why right after the catch, I want to go with set is loading and we'll set it equal to false. Now let's move up here and let's take a look at the error. So if something goes wrong, basically this should get triggered, right? But again, the gotcha with fetch that it's not going to do it. If let's say the resource doesn't exist, let's say 404. And this is something that we'll cover in following videos. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'm just going to say that yes, we'll set here set is error and we'll set it equal to true. But you'll see that it doesn't work with all the errors. Again, with Axios, yes, this is going to be the case. This will be 
always in the catch, but not with the fetch. Something important to keep in mind. So now notice, first we're loading, and then we have fetch data. Now, the loading one is going to be very quick, by the way, because again, we're working locally on all that. So of course, it's going to happen instantly. Once we set up the return, yes, I'll navigate to a bigger browser and I'll slow down the network just so you can see that it's definitely there. So once I have the user in my state, what we can do, well, we can navigate down here and essentially return something, display the user we were actually fetching. And here I'm going to go with div. I'm going to set up first the image. And this is the case where I said that basically I want to go with inline styles just because I know that it's going to be massive and I don't want to spend my time in the CSS. So this is a good use case, in my opinion, for the inline ones. That's why I'll go here with width 150 pixels. And I'm going to add a little bit of border radius here. So as you can see, I actually have the error. Make sure that you have proper JavaScript syntax. Basically, we need a comma over here. And we're going to set it equal to, I don't know, 25 pixels. Now, at the moment, we don't see anything because, of course, we need to provide those values. And essentially, for the image, I want to go again with that avatar, I believe. Yep. So we go here with user and avatar. Now, keep in mind the reason why we'll have to go with user dot, user dot, user dot is because now we have an object. So this essentially is the object that's in our state. So I have a user object. And now in order to access those properties, we either can destructure it, something we'll do later, because there's one gotcha I want to show you, or we can go with the object, which in my case is user, and then the property. Again, the avatar should be somewhere over here. It's probably first one. Yep, notice over here, that's the avatar. Then as far as the alternative, I'll provide the name here. So let's go here with user, and then avatar underscore URL. As far as the alternative, we're going to go with user and then name. And then we just want to provide, again, name in heading to company and a bio. So we have an image, then we want to go over here with user and then name. And then after the name, we're going to go with heading four works at then again, let's grab the curlies. We'll go with user and then company. And then at the very end, we have the paragraph with basically a bio. So user and then bio. Let's save this and check it out. Now we have nicely fetched a GitHub user. So now let me just grab this URL and let me set it up on a bigger browser window just so you can see how basically everything works. So let me open this one up in new tab, copy and paste, everything's awesome. And essentially, let me slow down the network. And we can do that if we navigate to the DevTools, we're looking for the network one. And notice over here, I'm actually using fast 3G. That's why I was wondering why it took so long in the use effect example. So well, so actually, I was all the time using that. Never mind. And uh, notice, basically, if we go with regular, it it's going to load right away. However, if I'm going to change it to, let's say, fast 3G, you'll notice that first we'll get the loading. That's going to be displayed on the screen. So we'll have loading dot, 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 dot. And then we basically get the user. So that's our setup. And up next, let's talk about the fetch errors. Not bad, not bad. We can nicely fetch data in our application. We can display multiple returns. So user is aware of what's happening in our application. However, before we move on to the next topic, I also want to discuss fetch errors gotcha. Now, if you're not interested, if you're like, I'm always going to use Axios and all that, feel free to skip this video. Technically, this is optional. By the way, let me add that over here. I mean, if you don't want to follow along, you don't have to. Essentially, when it comes to fetch, unlike the Axios, it doesn't consider, for example, 400 or 500 to be an error. Instead, essentially, it treats that as a successful request. Now, why does that matter? Let's go back to our component. And let's try to mess with the URL. So first, let me just mess up the domain. And the moment I do that, notice right away, I have error displayed. 
So this is going to be the error response. So this is going to trigger the sketch block with fetch. However, if I'm going to change this around, and if I'll add the S over here, and basically if I'll refresh, now I'll have this works at. So as you can see, there is an error, but it's not actually handled in here. Again, why is that happening? Because fetch doesn't consider this 404 as an error. Effectively, we do have the successful response over here. It's just not the user we're looking for. And the way around that is essentially to look for the OK property. If you go over here and if you log the, I'm going to go with the response. Notice we have the response and then the value is true for OK. However, again, if we'll have here 404, and hopefully I'm not going to run out of the requests while I'm showing that. Check it out over here. This is now false. So what we can do in the success block, we can check for that response. And if it is an error, we can set again the state value. So let me first, I guess, just navigate to a try block. And notice over here where we have the user. So I don't want to get the JSON if we're not successful. So right after the response, we can set up a condition. And I'm going to say over here, if response is not true, that's what that exclamation point means. So if the response that we're getting back is not okay, if this Boolean effectively is false, here's what I want to do. I want to go with set is error. I want to set it equal to true. So now we'll display which return this one over here. Correct. And then after that, we do want to set again, loading is false because I want to return from this function. What I don't want to do is keep reading. I don't want to go with response JSON. So I want to return. However, I also want to set loading to false. So this is where we need to do technically double the work where I'm going to go up, I'm going to copy and paste and now check it out. I have true for error, loading is false. And then I'm returning from this function. What it means that JavaScript is not going to read rest of the code, because again, I don't want JavaScript to go with response JSON. Why? Well, because I'm not getting back to user. What's the point of turning the error into a JSON? So let me go here and remove the log. Let's save that. And now notice how we nicely have is error, even though technically fetch doesn't trigger the catch block. So that's the fetch error gotcha I want you to be aware of. And up next, we're going to return to the topic why order matters when we are setting up multiple returns. Beautiful. And up next, why don't we come back to something we already discussed before that order matters? And why don't we work on a little challenge? And if I can ask you something, please don't dismiss this topic. This is literally the most discussed question in course QA because we do implement that feature later on in the projects and all that. And this seems to be tripping up a lot of people. That's why I purposely in this course iteration recording a video in tutorial, just so we can cover this in great detail. And essentially the challenge is following. I want you to destructure properties. So instead of user dot user dot user dot in JSX, destructure them out of the user and access them directly. And I'm purposely not telling you where you should do that because you might or might not encounter the bug. And effectively, that's the whole purpose of the video. So let's start working on that. I'm going to go back to my file. Let's keep on moving. And again, the idea is that I don't want to go with user, user, user. I just want to grab the properties and nicely display them in the JSX. So what we can do, well, we can go above the return and then one by one, pull them out, right? So I can go with avatar URL, then name, then company. And I believe I also have the bio in there. And that is going to be equal to what? That is going to be equal to my user. So my state value. And now, of course, instead of user dot user dot user dot, I can simply select and then remove those instances. So let's go over here. And it looks like I messed it up over here a little bit. 
that's okay. Let me save. And if you refresh and everything still works, we are in good shape. Now, what's the purpose of this video? Well, if you're going to go above the loading, and I'm purposely going to place it over here just so you can clearly see the values. But again, typical question is this one. If you place before these conditions, why we have the error. So let me move this sucker up all the way over here by user, and then let's save. And what you'll notice that we right away have big fat error in the console. And JavaScript is complaining. It says, I cannot destructure property from the user since this is null. So very, very important to keep in mind. If you have those multiple returns, if you're destructuring something, you need to do that after the conditions. Because keep in mind, this is still null. So as JavaScript is basically reading the code, okay, user is null, let's keep on moving. And even before we have hit the loading or error and all that, you right away start destructuring them from the null. And that's not going to work. There's a reason why we have those conditions. So only when we bypass both of these conditions, we will have that user. I mean, if there's an error, then of course we'll return this one. We're not even going to get to that line. So essentially we'll have the early return because if there is an error, then there is no user. This is still null. And again, this is not controversial. In the readme, I left some code examples where this is null and we cannot pull properties out of null. But this doesn't change. We right away basically just try to read properties out of the null, not out of the object. Now, after returns, after the is loading and, and the error, yes, at that point, we set user. So at that point, we should have the user object in the state. And at that point, it's great. You can definitely do so. This is going to work for sure. But before that, nope. And again, let me just emphasize this by showing you a few vanilla JS examples, because I was hoping that this is going to help you. So if you have some object, you have a property there with some kind of value, I mean, you can always go object.name. Okay, that's awesome. We can get the string. Now, what we can also do is simply go some object, and then let's say that we messed up the property, that it's not there. This is still going to work. JavaScript is going to be like, okay, that property doesn't exist. However, we cannot do this. We cannot say, hey, this is null, and then I'm going to pull something out of the null. JavaScript will scream, yell, and complain. We cannot do that. And also, the same thing is going to work with arrays. And the reason why I'm showing you arrays example, because in one of the projects, this is what we do. We fetch a list, but I only want to display the first item. And what do I need to do? Well, I need to go with random list or whatever array you have, and then grab the first one. However, again, in the beginning, this is empty. So this will return undefined. How can there be a first item in the array if the array is empty? So again, if we're going to go here with random list, when this is just empty, and then pull out the property, let's imagine I'm trying to access some kind of property from the first item. Not cool at all. JavaScript will scream, yell, and complain. Now, if you're familiar with optional chaining, of course, you can make a good argument. Well, we can avoid all those things. And yes, you're right. A bunch of times you will actually avoid those errors if you use such approach. And we'll definitely cover optional chaining later on in this tutorial because it is a very important concept however the biggest takeaway from this video is that order matters and that's why you have the error because the object is still null so essentially it's whatever is the default value so now let me go back over here and then let me move this sucker all the way where I have the return. And now, of course, everything is going to work. Again, we'll have no errors. All right. And before we discuss one of the rules of hooks, let's also quickly cover the location of the fetch function. So as you're looking at this component, 
probably one of the questions you have is following. Can we just move this fetch user outside of the user effect or maybe into a different file? And as far as different file, yes, you can do that for sure. But just keep in mind that we're actually invoking functions from this component. So in that case, of course, you need to pass them as parameters, correct? Basically set up the parameters and pass them as argument. But as far as moving this in to a function body, yes, basically component body, it's an option. So what I could do here, cut it out, and then call it into a use effect. Notice copy and paste, and everything is going to work. Now, it doesn't do that in feet. However, in create react app, if you do that, essentially, there's going to be a ES lint rule that's going to complain that you need to provide the fetch user as a dependency. And I want to tell you right away, not to do that. Why? Well, because we'll have ourselves a problem. So we'll have our initial render where we'll set up the state values and all that. And during initial render, what do we do over here? we invoke fetch data. Now, what is fetch data doing? It's updating the state value. We already know that. So we will trigger the re-render. So when the re-render happens, this gets created from the scratch. And essentially, as far as this dependency array is concerned, it's value changed. So what happens here? Again, we fetch data. And again, this probably is going to be easier if I showcase that over here. Now, you don't have to do that because I believe you'll use up all your requests. Notice I have 403 right now. Basically, I used up all my searches. So yeah, for sure, don't do that. Now I have, there was an error, right? And effectively, the reason why we have that is because we have this infinite loop. So my suggestion for now, if you're placing the function outside of the use effect, for now, just ignore the ESLint warning you get in the console again. You're not going to have it with Vite, but if you're using, let's say, a Create React app, that's going to be the case. And later, when we discuss use callback, I'll show you two approaches, how essentially we can make ESLint happy and have the function here and also pass it here as a dependency. Okay, and next, let's return to one of the rules of the hooks. And as a side note, if you don't want to follow along with this video, you don't have to. So in my case, yes, I will import the file and all that. But basically, I just want to showcase a few things. And the reason why I set up the file, just so you can have it for your reference. So long story short, if you don't feel like it, you can just sit back and relax and watch me struggle. So if I navigate to the file, the 03 hooks rule, you'll notice that I have a use state and use effect. I have some kind of condition again. This is just a random value and the Boolean value is true. So remember when we discussed hooks, one of the rules was don't call hooks conditionally. So this is not going to work. You cannot place a hook inside of the if condition. Hooks need to be called in the same order. And just to show you another example, which sometimes gets discussed in the course q a let me first comment this one out and then uncomment the second one so notice over here i have the early return now this again is not something you want to do you don't want to place use effect after this condition because keep in mind if you're returning that's it we stop reading the code so effectively we call the use effect conditionally and Vite is not going to throw you a bunch of errors, but if you use, for example, create React app, you'll have a bunch of warnings and errors in the console and all that. So again, just a few things to keep in mind. Don't place the hook inside of the if condition, and also be careful if you have multiple returns. Basically, if you have JSX return based on some condition, don't place use effect after them. Make sure that use effect is always before those conditions. And then, yes, of course, you can set up tons of multiple returns. So that is still okay. But you don't want to call this one conditionally. It's not going to work.
Okay, and up next, let's quickly discuss truthy and falsy values as well as short circuit evaluation in JavaScript because we'll heavily rely on these topics in the following videos. Now, I can tell you right away that if you're familiar with these topics, feel free to skip this video. I'll just quickly cover the major things we need to be aware of. Again, the whole purpose is we'll use that in React, and I really want to make sure that we're all on the same page. If you're familiar with these concepts, then feel free to skip that. And effectively, in JavaScript, we have falsy and truthy values, and it's going to be easier to remember the falsy ones, and those are false, zero, empty string, null, undefined, and not a number. With that said, do you have to sit here and memorize them? No, just don't be surprised when we use, for example, empty string in our conditions. Just remember that it is falsy. Now, why do we care about that? Well, because truthy and falsy values can be evaluated in the condition. So we can set up a condition not with just true and false, the Boolean value. If let's say I have hello, and as a quick side note, so these are the falsy ones and all the other ones are truthy. That's why it's gonna be easier to remember the falsy ones. So falsy ones will evaluate in the condition to false and truthy ones will evaluate to true. So again, back to your example, if you have these values, so X, Y, and Z, and the first one is a string, a valid string, second one is an empty one, and third one is a zero. For the first one, if you'll set it up in the condition, actually you'll see in the console, X is truthy. So this evaluates the true. Again, instead of a Boolean, this is a string with some kind of value. Now, when it comes to a second and third, if you'll run this code, you'll actually see in a console that it evaluates to false. So in the console, you'll see y is falsy. Now, why do we care about that? Because we also have short circuit evaluation. And essentially, it just allows us to write code in more concise way. And we can do that by using and operator and or operator. And as far as the AND operator, it returns the first operand, basically this value over here, if it is falsy, or the second one, if the first one is truthy. So let's just back up a little bit, and let's start everything from scratch. So this one is zero, what it is, it is falsy, correct? And this one is what? It's truthy, because it's essentially a integer that is not zero. Now, if we have this AND operator, then basically, if this one is falsy, it will be returned. So if you have two of them, and the first one is falsy, then that's the one that's gonna be returned from this expression. Now, if it's the other way around, if you have truthy as the first one, then it will return regardless the second value. Something to keep in mind. And when it comes to OR operator, it returns the first operand if it is truthy, or the second operand if the first one is falsy. So as you can see, it's the other way around. If we have example of, again, zero and one, since this is falsy, the second one is going to be returned. So opposite of AND operator. And if this is truthy, then the first one is going to be returned. Hopefully that is clear. And again, the reason why we quickly covered both of them is because we will use them in our React setup. And as far as function examples, since we're working with functions, if I have function display name, and if I'm looking for the argument of name, if it is provided, then of course I'll have the argument because in the return, I have a short circuit operator. I have the or one. And remember, if this one is falsy, basically if we don't provide it, then it's right away gonna return the second value. Now, if this one is true, then it's going to return the first value again. Let's double check. If the first one is falsy, 
second one will be returned. If it's truthy, then the first one is going to be right away returned. Hopefully we're on the same page. And up next, let's see how we can set up such functionality in our React components. Beautiful. And once we have jogged our memory on the short circuit evaluation as well as truthy and falsy values in JavaScript, now let's try to set them up in React. And we'll right away start with the challenge where basically I want you to navigate to this file and I want you to create two state values. One is going to be truthy and one is going to be falsy. And then in the JSX, I want you to set up both conditions for each operator. So try two of them with falsy. So or and 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 the same goes for truthy. And a tiny hint, you want to do that in the curlies in the JSX. So let's start working on that. Basically, in the app JS, I have a starter. And at the moment, I'm rendering this file. Okay, that's good. That's an awesome start. Now let me navigate over there. As you can see, I just have use state import. And now let's set up those two state values. Now you can go with Boolean. That's definitely an option, but I'm just going to go with empty string and string with some kind of value. So those are going to be my ones. I'm going to go over here and say falsy. Now let's create that value. So text and set text. And that is equal to use state. And like I said, we'll start with the falsy one. Then I'm going to copy and paste. So let me select both of these lines over here. And this is going to be truthy. So truthy over here. And as far as the name, I'm going to go with name and set name. Set name. And in here, as far as the default one, I'll go with Susan. Okay, that's awesome. So now let's navigate to JSX. And let's go over here with div. And before we type anything, let's just refresh our memory that in a JSX, we cannot do something like this. I cannot set up here a if condition, if and then something. This is not going to work. So we'll have some kind of condition regardless of the value. We'll get right away an error, something to keep in mind. So let me set this one up in a separate line. And let me just add that value just so it stays for your reference. So let's go over here and let's say it won't work. Won't work over here. And let me comment this one up. And since we cannot use if conditions in JSX, but we obviously still want to display stuff based on some condition, that's exactly why we need to understand how short circuit operators work in React. And now let's keep on moving. And effectively, I want to set up four heading fours. And in there again, I'll have both conditions. So let me start with the first one. And I'll say falsy. And this is going to be or example. Let me set up a colon, then I'm going to go with the curlies. And I'm looking for a text. So that's my falsy value. And I'm going to use my or operator. So now you have to guess which one is going to be displayed. Is it going to be the text one, basically empty string or is it going to be a hello world? And once I save, I have hello world. Why? Well, because with or operator, if this is going to be falsy, then it's going to display the second value. So now let me copy and paste. And like I said, I want to set up four of them. So this is going to be and, and then this will be truthy. So now let me select both of them. And I'll say truthy. And this one will be and. And in here, effectively, I just want to change the operator. And once I save notice, now I have empty string. So this is how it's going to work in React. Again, it's the same as in JavaScript. If we have falsy and we have and, then effectively we display the first one. So now let's just change this around where it's not going to be text. Essentially, I want to go with name. And you'll see that we have opposite behavior where if this is or, then we'll display the first one. However, if we have the and one, then of course we'll display the second one. So if this is truthy, then we right away display the second value. And lastly, I just want to mention that of course, we're not 
limited to just set up this functionality in the JSX directly. I can also do something like this, where I'm gonna go with const and then code example, and that one is equal to whichever value I want. So again, I'm gonna use the same one where I'm gonna go with text and then hello world, and then we can render it right away in the JSX, just showing you multiple options that you have. Let me save that. And of course, since this is falsy again, we have or operator, so we display the second value. That should do it for general concepts. Uh, up next, let's look at the most common examples. Okay, and once we're familiar with the general concepts, now let's take a look at some examples. So in the app JSX, I want you to import 0, 5, and then the examples. And as far as the component, notice over here, we have a few more values. And basically, we still have the empty string, still have some kind of text, also a user, and we also have a Boolean value. And effectively, when it comes to or, quite often it is used to display some kind of default value. So let's say if I navigate here, and if I set up a div, and then inside of that div, I want to go with some kind of heading two. Imagine this. I have some kind of value. In this case, I'm going to go with text. And if that value doesn't exist, then I want to go with some kind of default one. Now, if you're wondering like why value wouldn't exist, well, keep in mind that quite often we'll be getting stuff from the API. And it's not guaranteed that for all the items, that property is actually going to be there. So this is very useful where you can be like, okay, try to set this property. If not, then use the default value. And of course, let's go with name here and you'll see that if the value is there, then of course we'll display the value. So that is a pretty common approach for or operator in React. Now, when it comes to and, it's a little bit different where instead of text, you essentially control what elements are gonna be displayed. Now I'm gonna show you both examples where we use the elements as well as the components. Just keep in mind that both of them effectively work exactly the same way. So if I go here and right after text, I'm just gonna go with the curlies and I'll say, if text evaluates to true, what do I wanna do? Well, then I wanna return a div with two heading twos. So let's go over here and let's say, div, close the div here. And then inside of the div, we want to go with those two heading twos. In one, I'm going to display the name. So I'm going to go over here, and I'll say heading two, whatever, and return. And then right after that, we want to go with heading two, and I'm going to access the name over here. And notice once I save, I don't see anything. Why? Well, because this is false, correct? So this one is an empty one. And as a result, we don't return anything. Basically, we have nothing in the browser. And that's something important to keep in mind where in this case, there's always gonna be that heading two tag. However, if we use and operator, and basically we set up whatever we wanna return, you'll actually notice that there is no div with those heading twos. It just doesn't exist. So we only have this heading two with default value. We don't have that second div. Now, of course, if this is gonna be truthy, if we'll add just, let's say even one character, you'll right away notice that first of all, since we have the or operator here, it's gonna display this one. And when it comes to text, well, now since this evaluates to true, now we actually render div with those two heading twos. And of course, we access the name here as well. So those are pretty common approaches where again, we use or inside of the element, if we wanna display some kind of default one and we use and to control effectively what we return. Now, of course, this is going to be dynamic. At the moment, we're just hard coding, but normally this is going to be dynamic. So let me set it back here to an empty string. And again, notice how we're not returning anything. And before I show you the component example, let's also cover that we can use the not operator. So at the moment, this is falsy, right? That's why we don't display anything. However, if I stick a not operator in front of it, you'll see that actually everything is displayed. 
Now, if you're not familiar with not operator in README, essentially you'll find code examples for vanilla JS. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I want to move on with React topics. But again, if you need to jog your memory on the not operator, please utilize the README where you'll find the vanilla JS examples. And of course, it's going to be easier to understand. So essentially, if I just stick here, the exclamation point in front of it, I'm good to go. I'm actually displaying this. Why? Well, because by default, essentially, this is palsy. However, with not operator, I'm looking for the opposite value. So now this is truthy. And I display it over here. Again, something important to keep in mind. So I'll copy and paste, I'll remove this one. And I'll just comment this one out over here, just so we don't have too many. And as always, you can reference the readme as well. And now, since we're familiar, how we can use the and operator to return some elements, why don't we also take a look how we can do the same thing with components. So below my first component, I want to go with second one, I'm going to go with const and then I'll just say some component. Now, I know that I'll pass the prop. So I'll write away the structure it. And essentially, I'm going to be looking for the name prop. So let's go over here. And then as far as the return, we'll do the same thing. It's just now we'll return from the component. So if I go with the return, then space, and I'll cheat a little bit, and I'm just going to copy and paste. So that's going to be my component. Let me scroll up over here. And I guess I'll do after not. So I'll set up over here a logic where essentially, if the value is true, then I want to return that component. And in this case, I'm going to be looking for the user, just to use a more complex example. So notice user set user use state and this is an object. And of course, this will evaluate to true. So now let's scroll down. And let's say over here that if the user exists, only then I want to display the component. So I'll say over here some component, and then I want to pass in that name prop. Now what is it going to be equal to? Well, I'm going to go with name equals to user dot name, and then I want to close over here the component. And as you can see now in the browser, we have john, because that's the value over here. Again, both of them do exactly the same thing. So either you can return a bunch of elements, or you can set it up here in the component. And also, please keep in mind that like I keep saying, this is going to be dynamic. So essentially, you'll try to fetch the user from the database. If the user exists, then I want to display some kind of component with the values that represent that user. And if it doesn't exist, let's say if the API or database returns that this is null, what do you know, we're not displaying that component altogether. Hopefully that is clear. And up next, I also want to show you how we can use ternary operator in JSX. Okay, and while we're still on the topic of conditional rendering examples, why don't we also quickly cover ternary operator? Because this is also something that you'll see quite often in JSX. And just to jog your memory, effectively in JavaScript, we have this option to check for condition. And if it's true, then we return the first expression. If not, then we return the second one. And the way it's going to work in JSX, first, I want to navigate back to the same file. So again, we're not changing the files in here, we'll work in the same one. First, I'll start with some kind of divider. And I'm going to go with heading two, and I'll just say ternary operator. And then in here, why don't we add a little bit of CSS, and I'm just going to add some margin top bottom. And left and right, I'll keep it zero. So one REMs and then a zero. And after that, I want to render the button. So let's go with button. Let's add a little bit of styles here. So I'll say here, class name, and then that one is equal to BTN. And then inside of the button, I'm going to check for is editing. And if is editing is true, then as far as the content is going to be edit. And if not, it's going to be add. So let's go over here. And let's say is editing. And then we want to set up the question mark here. And then the first value is going to be if it's true. So if is editing is true, then we'll display edit. If not, 
then we'll go with add. Let's save that. And now, of course, since this is false, that's why we go with add. Now, if we'll change this to true, you'll see right away that the text actually is added. And not to sound like a broken record, but of course, normally this is going to be dynamic. So if I go back over here to false, then I'll have add. And I also want to showcase how we can use the ternary operator to return elements, just like we covered with and operator. So this is one option where we just check if the value is true, and then we return the component. But we can also use ternary operator. And essentially, if it's true, then we return one set of elements or the components. And if it's false, then of course, we return other set of elements. And in here again, I'm going to check for user. So I set up the curlies, I'll go here with my ternary operator. And let's start with a div. And again, just to speed this up, I'm going to grab this value over here. So let me go here, we want to copy and paste. Yep, this is what we want to do. Now, I'm not going to probably return two of them. You know what, I'm just going to go here with heading four. And then inside of it, I'll say hello there and user. So what am I doing over here? Well, since I have a user object, if it's true, if it's not null, then of course, I'll display div with the username. Now, if it is false, then I'm going to go with colon over here. And basically, I'll just say, hey, you need to log in. So there is no user. So in order to do that, I'm just going to change here heading two. I'm not going to be looking for a user because now I know that this is false, of course. And then I'll just say, please log in. And you'll notice that right away we have hello there, user John. And if we change this to null again, then of course I'll have please log in. So let me go back to John. And we successfully covered the most common examples. I know that last few videos were probably a little bit tedious because we were just flipping the values from true to false. And that's why up next, I want to work on two challenges where you'll be able to utilize this knowledge. All right. And first, I want to work on the toggle challenge. So in the app GSX, import this file 06 toggle challenge. This is what you'll see on the screen. And as far as the challenge, I want you to create a state value. And in this case, I'm going to go with Boolean. Please keep in mind that of course, you can set up a different value. Again, we're talking about truthy and falsy. Just to make it easier, I'm going to go with Boolean. So then in the JSX, we want to return a button and a component or element. So for sure, return a button. And then after the button, set up some kind of element or a component. That's really up to you. In my example, I'm going to use the component, but of course, you can use the element as well. And then when the user clicks the button, toggle the state value, this sucker over here. And then based on that value, conditionally render component element. And I want to right away tell you that there's multiple ways how we can set this up. So again, if your logic works, do whatever makes the most sense to you. Now, as far as my setup, first of all, I want to navigate to the file. So I'm going to go to toggle challenge, we want to grab the use state. Again, I'm going to go with auto import. So I'm going to go with use state. Let's grab that one. And it's going to be false by default. Now, as far as the name, I'm going to go with show alert, and then comma and then set show alert. Now that is equal to, of course, my value. Okay, good. Let's save that. And like I said, now we want to set up that button. So in here, I'm going to go with div. And first is going to be my button. So btn, blah, 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 class name btn. And then on click. For now, let's not worry about it. I just want to showcase how it's going to look like. So I have my toggle button. And like I said, after that, if you want to set up elements or element, you can definitely do so. In my case, I'm going to set up the alert just so I can showcase some classes that we have in CSS. So in here, if I go with alert component, and then as far as the return, if I go with, let's say div, return, and then div, let's add class names. So we have two of them alert, which basically adds the general styles. 
And then I also have alert danger, which essentially just adds some colors and all that kind of stuff. So let me close it here and let me say hello world. Let me save this. And now I want to go up where I have the toggle challenge and I want to just display the alert for now. And this is what we're going to see on the screen. Now, awesome. Up next, I want to actually toggle this value. So first of all, let's come up with the function. And in my case, that's going to be toggle alert. So I'm going to call this toggle alert. That's my function. And then before I set up the functionality, I want to actually invoke it every time we click. So remember, it was on click. And then we want to go with toggle and alert. And as far as the functionality, well, we want to toggle the state value, right? And like I said, there's multiple ways how we can set this up. At the end of the video, I'll show you a shortcut. But for now, we can simply do it this way, where I'm going to check what is the value of show alert. Basically, if this is true, then I want to go with set show alert and I'll set it equal to false. And very important, we want to go here with the return. Why? Well, because I'm going to be setting up logic after my condition. And if I don't add the return, then basically it's going to hit this functionality as well, because that's how JavaScript is reading the code. So let me go here with true and notice. So if this is true, I want to set it equal to false. If not, then basically we'll just skip this condition and we'll set it equal to true. So this is awesome. But of course, alert is always going to be displayed. We also need to implement right now our and operator, correct? So I'm going to go with show alert. If this is true, then what do I want to do? Well, that's when I want to display that alert. So let me save it over here. And notice, once I click, this is of course now true. And I display the alert. Once I click one more time, then of course it's false. And I don't display the alert. And as far as the shortcut, let me keep scrolling. And notice over here, this not operator. So essentially we can just make it a one liner where instead of setting up the entire function and all that, I can just pass here the arrow function and I can say set show alert and then not. So the opposite value of the current value of show alert. So if it's true, then set it equal to false. And if it's false, then set it equal to true. Hopefully that is clear. So I'm going to navigate back again. I'm going to comment this one out just so it stays for your reference. And now let's do that one liner where basically we will go here with my arrow function and then we'll just say set show alert and set it to the opposite value. Let's save that and then notice our functionality still works. Everything is awesome. We still add that alert component if this is true. However, now we have less lines of code. All right, and up next, I want to work on the user challenge. So essentially in the app JSX, we want to import this one, the 07 user challenge. And as far as the challenge, we want to set up the state value. In my case, I'm going to go with user and default value is going to be null. Then I want you to create two functions, one login function that sets the user equal to a object with a name property. So you simply want to set it equal to object that name property and some kind of value. Again, that value is totally up to you. And then we also want to set up a logout button. And for that, we'll need a logout functionality. And in there, I want you to set user equal to a null. So set it back to the default value, which is null. And then in the JSX, use the ternary operator to display two different setups. So if the user exists, we want to go with hello there and then try to get the username. Because remember, we're setting the user equal to an object with the name property. And also, I want to display the logout button. So if the user has already logged in, I don't want to display the login button. That doesn't make sense. I want to display the logout button. And then if it's false, if the user is false, I want to go with heading four and please log in and a login button. So let's start working on this challenge. First, I'm going to go with const. And like I said, in my case, I'm going to go with user and then set user. That is equal to my use and then state. So that's imported. And we're going to go with null. That's going to be the default value. And right 
out of the gate. Let's set up those functions. So const login, and that one is equal to a function here. And then I want to go with set user, and I want to set it equal to an object. So name, and in my case, I'm going to go with vegan food truck, because why not? And then I also want to add here a comment where normally connect to DB or API. So essentially, you're not going to be hard coding this. Normally, you'll connect to the database. If everything is correct, if it's the right password and an email and all that, you'll get back the credentials for the user. And that's where you'll set it in a state value. Now, if it's not, then of course, nothing's going to happen, you'll display probably some kind of error message. But hopefully this is clear. So of course, in this example, we're basically hard coding, we're saying, yeah, once we log in, everything is going to be fine. But it's not always the case. And of course, later in the course, we will connect to a database, and we'll check what's happening. And if everything is correct, that's when we set the user. But again, the main idea is going to be exactly the same. You have that flag, the user basically, and if it exists, it's awesome, I want to display it. If not, then I want to go with a logout one. Hopefully that's clear. Copy and paste. I don't need a comment here. I can set it up as null as well. Null. And I want to call it logout here. Let's save this. And now let's work on the JSX. So first I want to display a div. Then instead of the div, I want to set up right away JSX. And I want to go with user. So essentially, I'm checking that user value. And remember, I have two options. If it's true, it's one thing. If not, then it's something else. So let's start if it's true. And again, yes, you can set up a component over here. So if you want to work on the challenge more, you can set up these returns as separate components. So in here, let's go with div. I'm going to set it up as heading four. Remember, in this case, user exists. So we can simply go with hello there. And we can try to access the username. Now, if it's null, then it's not going to make sense, correct? So user dot name, okay, that's awesome. And as far as the button, well, like I keep saying, we're not going to display the login one. We want to display the opposite one. Which one is that? Well, that's the logout one. So let's go with button class name btn. Okay, that's beautiful on click. And now let's go with our logout button. And the same goes for the text. So log out here. Let's save it. And we'll have an error. Don't worry, we'll fix that in a second. Essentially, we want to grab here this div. And we want to copy and paste. Now, in here, we're working with opposite values, correct? So we're going to go here with please log in, and we want to change the button. So this is going to be a login button over here as well as here. Let's save that and check it out. Now we have div with these values. And the moment we'll click, we'll actually flip it. So notice this is what we have right now in our browser, right? So these are the elements we're returning. However, once we click, check it out. Now we're returning different values. So now we have hello there, vegan food truck. So essentially, we're displaying that the user has logged in successfully. And now he or she has an option to log out. And once we log out, of course, we have the previous screen, the heading four with please log in. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the challenge. And I'll see you in the next video. All right. And now let's go back and discuss use effect cleanup function and why it's useful. So yes, once we're done with conditional rendering, we'll actually go back to zero to use effect and take a look at the cleanup function. And you'll see in a second why. And let's start with the challenge. So I want you to create a state value. And in the JSX set up a button which toggles the state and based on that condition, return a second component. Now, that's a totally simple return, you don't need to worry about returning 10,000 elements, literally, it can be a heading two. Now what's important in the second component, create a use effect and run it only on initial render. And remember, in order to do that, we needed to use a second argument. 
in the use effect. And once you have the example in place, then we'll discuss why we have such interesting behavior. So again, we're looking for use effect star and then zero five cleanup function. That's what I have in the app JSX. And then as far as the file, first, let's just go with some kind of state value. So in my case, I'm going to call this toggle const and then toggle set toggle and that is equal to use use state and by default let's set it equal to false then after that let's set up that return so right away go with return and i'm going to remove the heading too and i'll go with div instead and then in here let's create that button then we're going to go with class name and then btn we also want to right away add on click and let's pass in the arrow function as far as the logic will go with set toggle and we'll use that not operator so set it equal to the opposite value and then in here i want to set up some kind of text and i'm going to go with toggle component let's save that yep i have the button everything's awesome so now let's set up another component and based on that state value let's toggle it so in here i'm going to go with const and then random component Again, the entire gotcha is the result you'll see in the console. So that's the most important one. First, for now, let's just go in a random component and let's go with heading one and we'll say hello there. Hello there. Now we already know that, of course, we can toggle it, correct? So if I go here and if I'll say toggle and based on that value, if it's true, then I want to return the random component. If not, then nothing is going to be displayed. So we're expecting this behavior, correct? All of that is good. So now we're putting two and two together where we can use conditional rendering, we can display the component, but also keep in mind that in any component we can set up the use effect, correct? So let's try it out. We're gonna go here with use effect. So we pass it here. And then remember, like I said, we have two arguments. We have the function, that's first, and then we have the dependency array. Now, as far as the function here, we're gonna go with some kind of log. We'll say, hmm, that's interesting. And you'll see in a second why. So, hmm, this is interesting. Okay, good, let's save it. And now, million dollar question. Yes, we're going back to the quiz. How often do you think this is going to show up? So remember, use effect, it has the, dependency array and technically this is empty so two options either it's going to show up only once when the component renders or there's actually a gotcha and we'll see it more often so let's try it out i'm gonna go over here and check it out every time i click i actually have this behavior now before we continue why is this happening well remember long 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 time ago we discussed the render and re-render correct so let's go with i don't know initial render maybe this way i'll be able to find it yep over here remember we discussed the initial render and re-renders and i said that for time being let's think of initial render when basically the application loads so that's when we render, for example, this sucker over here, the cleanup function. However, when we start toggling the component, essentially we mount and unmount the component. And during the mount, we repeat initial render. So of course, the functionality inside of the use effect will run, even though the dependency array is empty. So notice, now I'm displaying the hello there. That's the initial render. And yes, if there's going to be some kind of logic inside of the random component, of course it will re-render if you'll have the use state. But my main point in this video is to showcase that just because we're used to use effect just running once when the application loads, it's not going to be the case if you're displaying the component conditionally. Because in that case, that initial render is going to happen every time you basically mount and unmount, mount and unmount. And this is why 
the cleanup function, which we're going to discuss in the next video, is going to be useful. Just don't be surprised if you have some kind of component that is being mounted and unmounted. And even though you do have this dependency array as empty, the functionality inside of the use effect, which in this case is just a simple console log, keeps running every time we basically show the component. Again, it's not a good or a bad thing. In the following videos, we'll take a look at a few examples. And when it becomes a problem, just something very important to keep in mind that, yes, you have this initial render when the application loads, but for components that are being displayed conditionally, actually it's going to happen when you also mount the component. Okay, so hopefully it is clear. When we're toggling the component, when we're mounting and unmounting component, the use effect, even though it has empty dependency array, is going to run every time we show the component, basically every time we mount the component, unlike in this example, the cleanup function, which is only going to be mounted once. Now, this is just a fact. When it becomes an issue, well, if we have some kind of functionality that essentially just keeps on running. Now, I picked two examples, the set interval and the event listeners. Keep in mind that, of course, there are other use cases. And essentially, the main point of these videos is just to showcase how we need to be careful when we are toggling the component. If we have some kind of functionality that might possibly lead to an issue, that's when we need to go back and set up the cleanup function. Please keep in mind, you won't need to set up cleanup function for every use effect, but yes, in some instances, it's a good practice. Now, when it comes to set interval, basically it comes from vanilla JS, just like the event listeners. And essentially we go here with set interval. We want to pass in the function we want to invoke and then essentially the interval. So in my case, I'm going to go with one second and I'm not going to be too dramatic. I'm just going to pass here the log. I'm going to say hello from interval. And what do you think right now is going to happen? So if I toggle the component I have is interesting. Okay. That's what I expected, but I also have this hello from interval. So that's the functionality. Now where it becomes really interesting is when we actually untoggle the component. Notice how this just keeps running, even though the component is not displayed. And again, this can lead to some serious issues. Let's imagine you're subscribing to some kind of service and essentially you still have this running in the background, even though the component is not displayed anymore. And what's even more interesting, the more times I'm going to click, the faster it's going to go because now I'll have more set intervals. Now, what is the solution? Well, it's a cleanup function and the syntax is a little bit funky. So just bear with me. We want to go here with return and we want to return a function. And then whatever is within this function is going to be invoked. And I'll showcase when it's actually invoked. And that's the reason why we don't want to set this one up as a sync, like so. Because React is expecting that if you're returning something, you're actually returning a function. Now, when it comes to set interval, it actually returns an ID. So in here, I can go to const and then whatever the variable. And then in order to clear this interval, we want to go with special method. It's called clear interval. And we want to pass in that ID. Again, this is just for interval, but effectively, yes. When you have a cleanup function, what you want to do is essentially just to clean up whatever functionality you have over here. So if you're subscribing to some kind of service, you want to unsubscribe. Otherwise it's going to be running in the background. And now notice something interesting where basically I'll click, I'll have the hello from interval, but the moment I hide, that's it. The interval is not running anymore and I can click all the time, but you'll see that essentially it's not going to be running if the component is not displayed. Now, when this one runs and this one is a little bit tricky, where basically if I go here with log, and if I say render, and you know what, let's clean out these logs for now. Let me comment them out. You'll see that, of course, when it runs well, initial render, right? 
So this one, we're not toggling only when we mount the component, basically when the application loads, that's when we essentially render this component, the cleanup function. Now, if we go here inside of the cleanup function, and if we type log, and we'll say cleanup, you'll see that essentially it runs after this render and before the use effect. So that's how we can clean up after ourselves. So let's refresh one more time, initial render. Then once we click, what happens? Well, we re-render this component, right? Because we change the state value. And now check it out. Once I'll click again, I'll re-render and I'll clean it up. So notice I have another re-render because again, we flipped the value and then I have the cleanup. So essentially it runs after the render and before the use effect. So in our case, basically when the component unmounts, that's when we run it. Hopefully that is clear. Again, this is a function we want to return. We want to set up here some kind of functionality and we want to do that in order to clean up whatever we have in the use effect, just so it doesn't run in the background. Okay. And now let's take a look at another example. And in this case, we're going to use event listeners. Again, something that is coming from vanilla JS and essentially the way the event listeners work in vanilla JavaScript, we just go with the element. In this case, I'm going to go with window and then we add the listener and then whatever event we want to listen for. So in this case, I'm looking for the scroll one. And then we want to pass in the callback function. So essentially this callback function is going to be invoked every time this event fires. And in our example, we want to go over here. We want to set up the function inside of the use effect and all that. And then we want to attach that listener on the window. And then we'll see some interesting behavior. And of course, after that, we will clean this up because that's the main point of these videos. So let's start over here by just removing everything. And let's come up with that some funk again, doesn't really matter what happens in here. Uh, and therefore, I'll basically leave it blank. That's irrelevant over here. So I'm just going to say here some logic. And then now let's go with window. Again, in React, we do have access to the window object. We go with add event listener. We're listening for scroll. And basically, we go with comma and then some funk. So this is going to be invoked. So let's again click and refresh and all that. Let me click over here. Notice we have the render. Okay, that's what we expect. What we don't expect, probably is if we go to a bigger browser window, and if we check the event listeners in tabs, and if we refresh, basically see over here that we have quite a few event listeners. So let's go over here, notice how I toggle the component. And once I refresh, I have here the scroll. And now notice how many I have over here. So essentially, every time I toggle the component, I'm actually attaching that event listener on a window. And again, eventually this can lead to an issue. Now, some students have complained that they don't see that. And every time I go and double check in my browser, I can still see it. Again, you're looking for event listeners, and then you want to refresh and you want to check how every time you'll toggle the component, essentially the value is going to increase over here. So you'll have more event listeners. Now, if you don't see that again, just trust me that that's the behavior. So now let me navigate back and let's see how we can fix that issue. And again, we want to go here with return a function and we want to go with window. Then the method name is remove event listener. And in here we want to pass in the scroll, then comma, and then we want to pass the same function. So in this case, it's going to be some function. And now you'll notice that once I refresh, once I toggle the component and refresh, yep, I have one. So that's fine. But then once I hide the component and refresh notice, I don't have any more of that scroll event. And effectively, that's how we can use the cleanup function in a use effect. Not bad, not bad. We're pretty much done with use effect as well as conditional rendering for that matter. But before I let you go, 
let me share one particularly useful resource, which is from React Docs, and it essentially covers use effect alternatives. Now, before you start yelling at the screen, yes, there are still use cases for use effect. So no, we did not waste our time on learning use effect, especially if you consider how much code out there is still using use effect. Now, since the article is quite extensive, I'm just going to give you a general gist. You see, when the React hooks came out, I believe it was version 16, developers started using use effect for pretty much everything. And as a side note, yes, I was one of those developers as well, so I'm not casting any shade. However, such approach basically to have use effect on top of use effect can potentially lead to clunky code, basically hard to read and manage, as well as some performance issues. So in this article, the React team is simply encouraging the community to consider alternatives before jamming yet another use effect in the component. And if I may make a suggestion, try to find some free time to skim through this resource. Again, you don't have to go line by line. Take a look at the general ideas. And the next time when you want to set up a use effect, just come back to it and see whether there is a better alternative. Quite often, you'll be able to achieve the same functionality by adding logic straight in the JSX or by setting up an extra function in the component. Lastly, one major use case for use effect used to be data fetching, something we already covered in the previous videos. However, as I'm recording this course iteration, at this point in time, there are some great libraries, for example, React Query, which actually allow us to fetch data with just one line of code. So basically without doing too much work, we already can use less use effect instances in our applications. As you can see in the code example, we simply install the library, use a custom hook, and right away get back data, error, loading, and a bunch of other useful stuff about our request. What's more, such libraries also take care of things like caching and synchronization. So it's no surprise that they are gaining popularity with the speed of light, especially for bigger projects with bunch of requests. And yes, as a side note, we will build a project later on in the course with React Query. Now, does that mean that you have to use such library in a small project where you have only a few get requests? No. I probably wouldn't do that. Just something to think about when you start working on your own projects. Simply be mindful and consider alternatives. All right, and up next, let's talk about the project structure. Essentially, I just want to showcase a few ways how we can structure our project. Because while we're working on somewhat small projects, this type of approach where you set up the components folder or whatever you want to name this folder and then set up all your components there is awesome. But as your project grows and you have a need for more files, you might want to implement a different approach. And effectively, we're going to work in the 04 project structure. We'll work in the star one. And as you can see, at the moment, it's empty. And also in the app.js, I'm not importing anything. So JSX is empty, I just have the container. And effectively, one way how we can set up the structure for our project is by setting up every component as a folder. So let's imagine that we have some kind of navbar component, and instead of just setting it up as component, I want to set it up as a folder, and in there I'll actually have the CSS file. Now. The goal here is following. Essentially, as our project grows, we might want to keep all the files that are associated with that component in one folder. And in turn, it's just easier. 
you don't have to run around your project and look for CSS files, the test files, and all that. You know that, hey, this is a component, and these are all the files that are associated with that component. So let's try this one out, and in the process, we'll take a look at multiple approaches. So in here, I'm going to go to Starter. I'm going to go to a new folder, and let's just call this Navbar. And in here, we'll just set up some example component. Again, it's really irrelevant what we have over there. So I'm just going to go with navbar JSX. Let's create the component. I think I'm going to change it to heading like so. And then I'll create empty CSS file. Again, it's irrelevant what we have over there. Just want to showcase the example. So I'll go here with navbar and then CSS. And of course, if you want to test it out, you can set up the CSS over here and you can import in navbar. I'm not going to do that. Then I want to go back to app JSX and I want to import that component. Again, the goal of this setup is essentially to keep all the files that are associated with that component in one place. In this case, it's just navbar CSS, but of course there's other things that you can keep over there. And in the app JSX, if we want to grab this component, we simply go with the name of the component and we use the auto import and check it out. Now, of course, I have the nav bar displayed on the screen. And again, all the files that are associated with this particular component are located in one place. But here's the gotcha. Notice this one. We have nav bar and then nav bar. And this is somewhat annoying. Where essentially, yes, I have a nice folder, but I don't want to keep using two names here one after another, which essentially are the same. And one solution for that is to create here index. So we're going to go here with index.js. And basically, we can set up the logic here in the index.js. So for time being, I'll just copy and paste because we will change our logic in a second. For now, I just want to showcase that. If let's say I go to index.js, and then if I go back to my app one, I can omit that nav bar. Now I do need to fix the extension. My apologies. I keep forgetting with Vite that we need to go with JSX. So let me save here and now check it out. I have the nav bar. So essentially we save that one word here. So instead of nav bar, nav bar, since this is a node project, it's essentially a node thing where if you have index in the folder, that's going to be used as an entry point. So whatever you have over here, is going to be right away exported. So in our example, we don't need to look for a specific file. We can just say, okay, so get me the navbar folder, aka the navbar component. Now, what is the issue with this setup? Well, if you have tons of files, effectively it just becomes a bunch of indexes. So it's very hard to navigate around your tabs. So let me show you a way how we can have our cake and eat it too. Basically, we won't have to use that navbar navbar, and we also won't have a bunch of these indexes over here. So I have the navbar component, and I have the index.jsx. What I can do in index.jsx, I can import the navbar and then export it as default. The way it's going to look like, we're going to go over here, export, and then default, and we're looking from, and since it's in the same folder, we just look for the navbar. And if I navigate back to the app JSX, first of all, if I want to do something in the navbar, well, I'll be using this tab, right? So this is my component, and I'm just using index to export that component. And here, nothing changes. So if I want to grab the navbar component, then of course, I'm just looking for the folder. And as you can see, everything still works. So we have no issues. So that's how we can set up essentially a folder for every component and few ways how we can use index.js to simplify our workflow. Now, let me stress something. It doesn't mean that now you have to use this kind of setup for every project. Again, this only makes sense if your project is big and you need some kind of structure to navigate around the project. All right, and up next, let's take a look at another approach where we can set up named exports. 
And this is definitely something we're going to use during the course. But again, I want to stress something. This only makes sense if you have a bunch of components in the folder. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. And effectively, we'll definitely use this one when we're going to work with React Router. Because in that case, you have quite a few pages. And it just makes easier if you set up such named exports. So first, we want to navigate to the star. And we want to create another folder. And in this case, let's call this pages. Now, inside of the pages, what we want to do, we want to create two pages, the home page and the about page. And little spoiler alert, when we're talking about pages in React, essentially, we're just talking about the components. So I'm just going to create here home JSX. I just need to remind myself all the time that I need to go with JSX. So we want to set this one up. This is going to be our home page. And then we want to do the same thing with about. So about and then JSX. Same deal, we want to create that. This is going to be our about page. And if we navigate back to app JSX, I mean, everything is awesome. We'll be able to access the pages, same deal. We go here and then we also want to go with about. So this doesn't change. But notice how we're getting quite a few lines of code over here. And imagine if you have 10 pages. So essentially, every time you want to use all of them, you'll have like, I don't know, 20 lines of code or something like that. And there's a way how we can simplify this. So first, let me remove this navbar. We're not going to need that. And back in our pages, we can create another index JSX. So remember, that's going to be our entry point over here. And we can import the components from this directory. So essentially, we can do like this, I can go with home. So I'm importing home. And I also want to do the same thing for about like so. So I'm going to go with about. And then from the index, I want to export that. So I'm going to go with export. And I'm going to go with home and about. And essentially, if you have 20 components, this is what you'll do. You'll import all of them in the index JSX and you'll export them. And the beauty here is that if I go back to app JSX, I don't have to provide the path for every component. I can do like this. Let me remove. Now, these ones are named exports. So the names need to match. That's something important. So in here, I do need to go with home and I do need to go with about. If you'll go here with contact or whatever, it's not going to work. So first, let me just showcase how this works. And then we'll take a look at the error example as well. So now let me remove home. Because notice now we're looking for that index. And check it out, everything still works. So essentially, if you have 20 components, you can nicely import them effectively in one line of code. No, I mean, the path is a little bit longer. So it's technically two, but hopefully you see where I'm going with this. So instead of using the import for every component, we're going to import all of them together. Again, we set up index JSX in that folder. That's going to be the entry point. And one by one, we grab those components and then we export them. But again, keep in mind, if you're going to do here like this, if you'll say, hey, get me the contact. What do you think is going to happen? Well, we'll have big fat error, right? So if we'll save, notice it says, well, there is no named export contact. That's just something to keep in mind. Now, you can set up the aliases and all that. I'm not going to go as deep in these examples. We'll just stick with the ones that we just covered. So this is a nice way how we can group all of our components together and export them as named exports. Okay, and lastly, let me showcase how we can export group of components. So this is going to be a little bit different. And also a very useful extension, Glean, and maybe less useful to some people, but to me also very useful, a code spell checker. So first, let's start with example directory, where we'll take a look at how we can export as a group. First, I want to navigate to app JSX, I want to clean this up. So I'm going to remove the existing ones. Then we want to navigate back to the star, we'll create another folder. And in this case, the folder name is going to be example. 
example in here let's create two more components so i'll call this first component and second as always jsx jsx so let's create that component i think i'm gonna go with heading two just so we can see it better so first component okay awesome and then we want to do the same thing here with the second one so second and component jsx okay beautiful let's create that awesome and then let's change it to a heading two so another way how we can export from this example essentially i can set up a index and i can import all of these ones what i have in the example in the jsx now why that would be beneficial well let's imagine you have some kind of component that is using for example five other components again instead of those components being just scattered around your project if you know that you'll definitely use those five components inside of that one component well it kind of makes sense you set up index jsx you just import all of them and you're good to go so just to showcase that we can go new file again remember yes index jsx or js is going to be the main entry point so at the moment we create that file yep as far as the paths and all that it's going to point to this example and in here we simply want to create a component and let's call this i don't know example why not so let me select all of them and we're going to call this example we'll also rename this and then we want to import those two components so we want to go here with the first component and second component and you know what i think it's going to make more sense if i'll place a div over here and then one by one i'll add both of those components so first component close it here and then second component as well so auto import second component awesome let's save that and it looks like i forgot to change it over here so we need to go with example and now we simply want to go back to app jsx and we want to grab that example folder so let's go here example and check it out now we'll have example and first and second component again something that has a very specific use case you don't have to do that for every project but here and there it's somewhat nifty and that's why i decided to add it to tutorial and now let's take a look at those two extensions like promised so first of all this one somewhat straightforward but extremely extremely useful for me the code spell checker and it's somewhat self-explanatory it just checks for spelling errors and this is very useful especially if you're following along because it will right away notify you if your name is off now it's not looking for the error it's just going to say hey listen the spelling here is incorrect and why i'm telling you that because quite often i see students sharing their code and i can see that the problem is that they used the wrong name in the first place let's say there's some kind of spelling error and then later on they use the correct one and then things don't work so i think it's going to be easier if i showcase that let's imagine that in here i'll have some kind of function so i'm going to go with const and then handle and change now everything is awesome but let's imagine that as i was adding this function instead of handle i went like this so I'll right away have this blue squiggly line which is going to tell me hey listen i mean technically there's nothing wrong with your code but you should probably check this does this really make sense as i know this is super useful for me because i'm the worst speller ever and then i also want to showcase the glean extension and what's really cool about this extension we can pretty much take elements we want to set up as component and right away create a file so let's imagine the scenario in the app i have some kind of element let's say div and inside of it i'm gonna have a heading three and i'm gonna say hello world now if i want to set up a separate component what is normally the path well i need to create a component somewhere here right and then i need to grab the elements and then copy and paste and it's much faster with glean so effectively i can select the elements i want to extract i want to click on a light bulb and check it out we have this option extract component to file we click we need to pick the directory 
In my case, I'm going to go with source, keep in mind, but of course, you can go with tutorial, for example. I'm just picking the easy option, and then we're going to go here with test, so the file name. And I'm going to go with JSX. And notice how right away, not only it sets up the component, not only it imports it, but it also right away sets up the component file as well. And what's really cool, it even provides the props, which is super nifty. If, for example, you're iterating over the list and then you're passing in some props into the elements, you can essentially right away set it up as a component and extract it. Again, super, super useful extension. We save it over here and notice the result did not change. However, this is much faster. And effectively, this concludes the project structure section. And up next, I want to talk about how we can leverage JavaScript in React. All right. And up next, let's talk about how we can leverage JavaScript, basically how we can use JavaScript to fix issues if the data is missing. And if you're a little bit confused on this entire topic, don't worry, as we're going to be working through the examples, you'll see what I'm talking about. First, notice over here that in the app, I'm not importing that. And I'm doing that on a purpose because we'll set up everything from the scratch. So let's navigate to tutorial. And we'll right away start with the challenge. And as you can see, the further we get in tutorial, the more challenges we have. Because now I want you to utilize everything that we have learned so far. And in this video, or more precisely in this section, so most likely in the following video, we'll rely heavily on optional chaining. And if you're not familiar with this topic, please utilize this JavaScript Nuggets video. Now I do have the info also in the readme. So if you don't feel like watching the video, you can just scroll down in the readme as well. So first, I want you to navigate to 05 leverage JavaScript, and you're looking for the starter. And in there, we basically want to set up the component. Now, before we set up the component, I just want you to navigate to data JS and take a look. We have this people array. So this is what we're going to be importing into a list one. So whenever I say people, just think of this array. And as you can see in here, we basically have list of objects and each object represents the person. And the gotcha here is that some objects have the properties, for example, nickname and the images URL and some don't. And before you wonder why is that the setup? Because this is, I wouldn't say quite typical, but don't be surprised if you work with an API. And that's the case. Again, I'm not saying that every API has this issue where basically the data is missing, but you will run into some instances where essentially, yes, some items have certain properties and some don't. And also it happens quite often when you work with headless CMSs, essentially a nice graphical interface where you can add your own data. And for some weird reason, let's say you forgot to add that data. And that quite often happens with the images. Trust me on this one for sure. And if you're wondering why we have this weird nested structure, again, when it comes to images, don't be surprised if you actually see this in the real world. It's not as flat as you might expect. So you're not going to have a bunch of items with just, okay, name, nickname, and image. No. When it comes to real APIs, yes, you have this nested, sometimes weird structure. So the sooner we get comfortable with that, the better it's going to be in the long run. So hopefully this is clear. Hopefully you haven't turned off since I was just ranting here about the array. And now let's navigate back. So effectively, this is the challenge. We want to create a new component. I'm going to call this list, call this, I don't know, orange, still going to work. And in the list, I want to import the people array again from the data I just showed you. And I just want you to iterate over and render a name. That's it. Let's just start very simply. We'll display the name. Now, once everything is correct, once you can see the name in the browser, 
after that, I want to set this one up in a separate component, basically what we're returning. And this is a good use case to try Glean extension. Now you don't have to, but I will. I'll just showcase how the extension works. And then in the person, try to render all three properties. And I'm sorry, this is a mistake. We're not going to be looking for a sister. We're going to be looking for the image. So initially, when I was building this example, I used sister. But in fact, we're looking for the image. And as far as your question, do I effectively need to get this URL? Yes, you're absolutely correct. So in order to show the image, you have to figure out how to access the URL, which is quite nested, as you can see. And if everything is correct, yes, there will be a bug. Effectively, that's the point of these videos to show you how we can avoid such bugs. So try to work on a challenge. And whenever you're ready to compare the results, resume with the videos. Okay, so let's start cracking. First, I want to navigate to the star, and I'm going to create that list. So as you can see, the star is empty. And I simply want to go list J S X. In here, let's grab the data. So we're looking for people array in the data. And I'm pretty sure it's going to give me an auto import. So I just want to set up the list first. And then inside of it, I want to iterate over data. So where I have the div, I'll simply go with an expression. And I'll try to type people. And if everything is correct, I should see them. Yep. As you can see, everything works nicely. Now I have the people. Okay, that's good. It's going to be an array. So I do want to iterate over. So let's go here with map. And I'll reference each and every item as a person. And then as far as the return, like I said, simply for now, we want to go with person that name, because that's the property that all of the items have. As a quick side note, when it comes to key, you can actually use the name in this case as well. So remember all this time I've been showing you following approach where if you have the div or whatever element you want to return, and if this is where we're iterating, we want to go with key, of course, and then we want to go with that unique one. So up to this point, all the time we have been using the ID. Keep in mind that in this case, let's imagine that we don't have the ID over here. We still have the name. And at least in this case, since I have four items, all of them are unique. So yes, you don't always have to go with ID, but it's going to be somewhat common because with the case of ID, it's always going to be unique. So in here, I set up the key, it's going to be equal to person ID. And then I want to render that I want to go with person dot name. Let's save it. Now I want to navigate back to app JSX. I think I'm just going to do it right after the heading two because why not. And in here, I'm looking for the list. And again, I'll rely on the auto import. And like I said, if everything is correct, this is what we should see on the screen. Great start. And now let's navigate back to the list and now try to set up this one as a separate component. Now, if you want, you can create the file yourself and all that, or you can utilize the extension I showcased, I believe in the previous section. Basically, which one was that? This one over here, the project structure. So I want to hover over it. I'm looking for that light bulb. And I want to go here with extract component to the file. And in here, we just need to look for the correct path. You need to make sure that this is the one that we click. Okay, awesome. We want to create a new file. And we want to come up with a name. So in my case, I'm going to call this person and then J S X. And check it out. Again, we right away have the import, we right away have the component. And then if you check the person, notice, we right away have the prop set up as well. Now, as you can see, there are some issues here. So basically, either I'll have to pass the person from the list. Or in my case, since I'm going to be spreading out, I'm actually gonna remove these values over here. So it's not perfect, but at least it gets us halfway, correct? So let's just navigate back and in here. Essentially, again, I want to set up that key. So I guess this is the case where I can just simply grab this one over here, person, and 
like I said, we can use the name over here, like so. And then after that, I want to pass the entire person. So I'm going to be spreading out all of the properties. We can most likely save, I believe. And then back in the person. I'm not going to be accessing person in such a way. I'm going to go one by one. So I'm going to go with name. Then I'm also looking for nickname. That's the second property that I want to showcase. And I also want to get that URL. Now, in order to access that URL, what I'll have to do, well, I'm going to go with images, correct? Since that's the array over here. And for now, let's just leave it the way it is. And let's decide what are we going to be returning. So in here, there's going to be a div. And let's just try it out with a name because, like I said, there's going to be a bug. So eventually, we'll have an error. So for now, let me just see whether everything works. Yep. So I can nicely display the name. Now let's go with nickname. So right after that, we want to go with paragraph. And I'm going to come up with whatever value. So nickname. And as I say, note, this is not what I wanted to do. So let me just take this one out. And then I'll place it here before the curlies. And now let me access the property. And we already have a little bit of issue where notice only the stud muffin is displayed since only Bob has this particular property. And again, this is something that we're going to fix in the following video. And when we'll definitely get a bug is when we'll try to get the image. Now I'll purposely access it above since it's just going to save me essentially setting up the whole thing in the JSX. So if I have a bunch of nested properties, essentially that is my preference where I do it above the JSX. Keep in mind that of course you can do it in the JSX as well. As far as the alternative, I'm going to go here with name. And I'm sorry, I forgot to actually mention a tiny suggestion. You probably want to go with the small width, my bad. So let's go here. So if you have massive images, just add inline styles like I'm doing right now. So we're looking for 50 pixels. And now let me grab that image. So let's go over here, const. I'm going to call this IMG. And what do we want to do? Well, we want to go with images, correct? That's the array over here. And I'm looking for the first item. And in there, I'll have the small. So that's the object itself. And then in there, I have the URL. So one by one, let's navigate there. Again, we're looking for the first item. Then I want to grab the small object in there. I'll have the URL property, and that is going to be equal to my image. And let's try to access it over here. And like I said, we'll have big fat error. So in the following videos, we'll work on these errors, and we'll see how we can leverage straight up JavaScript to fix it and have something displayed on screen. And before we cover the solution, let me just quickly mention that in the readme, you'll find info on default values, and also the optional chaining. So both features will implement in this video. And if you want to find out more info, if you're not familiar with them, you can always utilize the readme. So back in the person, Let's start with the nickname. That's going to be a little bit easier. So let me just comment out the image just so we don't have that massive error. And notice over here, we still have it because, of course, I am also accessing the image over here. So I'll have to do it in two places. Let's comment this one out. And for now, let me just remove those messages. And as far as the nickname, what is the issue? Well, again, not all of them have that property. What's the solution? Well, one of the solutions is obviously to use the or operator, just like we covered in conditional rendering, correct? So I can go here and say shake and bake. And what do you know? Now all of them have at least some kind of value. Okay, that's good. But we can also utilize the fact that when it comes to functions in JavaScript, we can provide right away a default value. So if you're setting up a function, and you're passing in the parameter, you can also provide a default value just in case it's not provided. So in here, I know that I'm going to be looking for the nickname. However, if it doesn't exist, what can we do? Well, we can set it equal to shake 
and bake. And what do you know? Now the result is going to be exactly the same. Again, this is just straight up JavaScript, something that you can utilize as you're setting up your React components. Now the second one is sort of the same. The problem again we're having in here, if we comment out, we have that annoying error, which essentially says, hey, you cannot access the properties from nothing. Why? Well, because if we go back again, only the third item has the images. So if I'm trying to do this for Bob, Peter, and all that, it's not going to work. So what we can do? Well, we can do it the long way. So bear with me. I'll show you basically what we were doing before the optional chaining. And then I'll show you effectively why optional chaining is so cool. And the way it worked before, we simply needed to repeat bunch of and operators. So in here, I'm going to go with image. And I don't think I'm going to leave this one for your reference. I don't think there's any need. So first I go with images. And I'll say, listen, if the images exist, then look for the first one. So essentially, I'm using the and one. Now, if there is a first one, then I'll look for small. So essentially, one by one, you just keep repeating them. So what I'm saying here is if images exist, get me the first one. Now, if the first one exists, then get me the small property. So in here, I just want to take this, copy and paste. And yep, I want to say, hey, if it's there, then grab me the small one. And you can probably already guess that, yes, in order to get the URL, what do we need to do? We need to copy and paste. And then we need to just chain essentially here this U R L like so. So we grab it here and notice how we nicely don't have the error. So essentially if I refresh, I'll see no errors in the console. And also the one that has the image is going to have that in the JSX as well. So once we save, notice I have person displayed. Now rest of them don't have it. So that's something that we need to work on. But at least the one that has the image, well, I'm nicely rendering that in the JSX. And essentially, let's first worry about how we can shorten this code. And then we'll worry about how we can display at least something in the browser. So first, yes, this is awesome. But I mean, it would be nicer if we could just get it done in less lines of code, essentially less characters. And the way we can do that is by using optional chaining in JavaScript. So in here we go with const and then again, IMG. And if you're wondering, this code is going to be again, located in the readme. So you can always reference it. So we want to go here with images and then we just go with question mark. And if the property exists, basically, if it's not null, then everything is good. If not, then we'll right away just get undefined. This is also awesome where we don't have that annoying, hey, you cannot get properties out of null. So essentially what I'm saying here, if images exist, awesome, get me the first one. If that exists, then get me small. If that exists, then actually get me the URL. Now, this is great, but it doesn't solve the issue where at the moment, notice only one of them has the image. And it's probably a nicer setup if you have at least some kind of default image, correct? And in order to do that, we'll actually need to look at the assets. And you'll see that I provided some SVG. And yes, basically, this is something that you'll need to set up manually yourself. Whether that is in the cloud Mary, whether that is locally, you'll need somewhere a default image. So in my case, that's the default avatar in the assets. So now let's navigate back to the person and we want to import that. Now, please keep in mind that we're sitting in a source. So we need to import, we need to name the variable, and then we need to provide the path. So in this case, I'm going to go with this one. I'll call this avatar and then from and now let's go one level up, then two levels up, 
three levels up we're looking in the assets and we want to go with default and then avatar and then svg and now we can utilize the or operator where i can say hey listen check for images check for the first one check for small and uh, url and if it's there awesome return this one if not well just set it equal to my default avatar and what do you know now we have a list and if the item doesn't have the image at least we display something now quite often as you're looking at the optional chaining code you'll see this approach as well where essentially let me comment this one out and you'll see this one and effectively this operator let me go back to readme i left it here for your reference so it's this one that's the operator you're looking for now i'm not going to go into great detail what's the difference they're extremely similar and uh, if you're interested then please utilize the search engine again instead of the or you'll see these two question marks and that's this operator and if you want to find out more info just please go to your favorite search engine and pretty much we're done with the challenge as you can see we can utilize straight up javascript to essentially fix the potential bugs that we might encounter once we start working with APIs. And I know that some of you think this is totally weird example. There's no way there would be such structure and then there's no way that properties would be missing. I mean, he's totally making this up. And again, I don't wanna be a bearer of bad news. And I'm not saying that every API is gonna have the issues, but once you start working with external APIs, just be prepared that structure might not be what you expect. It's gonna be pretty nested. I can tell you that right from the get-go. And also here and there, properties are gonna be missing. So if you ever see in a console JavaScript complaining that it cannot access certain property, right away think ding, 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 ding. There's a property missing. So even though I'm expecting something back from the API and I'm trying to render it here, well, it's not coming through. And as far as suggestions, my always suggestion is to limit the amount of items you're rendering. So if I hit this bug, yes, one by one, effectively I comment out the stuff and then I go back and check which value is missing. So normally I would log the person back here in the list and then I would go over where potentially that property might be missing. Just to showcase that if we go here with log and person, we'll right away see that only some of them have those values. Now, of course, this is somewhat simple example where I right away can see that, but normally this is the place where at least I can start working on the problem because this is gonna give me at least the idea of what data I'm getting back. Awesome. And next, let's talk about forms in React. And we're going to start working in this folder. So we're going to go to 06 forms and we'll start with the first file. However, since I want the examples to look somewhat nice, we'll spend the first video just by setting up the form with some classes and labels and all that. Now, if you're not interested in doing that, just navigate to the README, look for controlled inputs, and basically copy and paste this content. So this component, copy and paste, and set it up in the controlled inputs. Essentially, that's gonna be the first step. Now, don't worry, we're not gonna do that pretty much for every file. I believe we have over here five of them. So essentially, in the next videos, we'll just reuse this nice looking form. So first I wanna to navigate to app JSX. Like I said, we're looking for 06 forms, then starter, and then controlled inputs. So that's what I have on the screen. Now let's navigate over here. And effectively, we just wanna set up a form. And if you're wondering where the classes are coming from that I'm about to use, well, they're located over here. So if you look here in this file, let's say if we search for class of form you'll see these styles and then same goes for label input 
and all that. So if you're interested, of course, you can navigate over there and see what styles I'm setting up. So let's go over here in the controlled inputs. We'll remove the heading two and effectively we're going to return a form. We'll add right away a class of form as well. Inside of it, let's place a heading four and let's say controlled input. So that's going to be our first topic. After that, I want to set up a div with a class of form row. And you can think of it as a divider. So it's just going to add some nice margin. So let's go here with div. Let's add a class of form row. And then inside of it, first, let's set up a label. Again, it's just a HTML thing. And notice over here, it's going to give this HTML four. So that's the HTML attribute by the name of four. And you add that to the label. And then once you click on the label, then it nicely sets the input in the focus. And you'll see once we set it up how it works. So in here, we want to provide the ID. So whatever ID we're about to set up on the input. So I know that my one is going to be named. So of course, I'm going to set this one up as name. Then we want to type the text inside of the label. And you know what? There's one thing missing, and that is the class. And for that, we want to go with form and label. So then we want to go with that input. And we'll start with the most basic one, the text input. So let's go over here. Let's look for text name for now. Let's leave it blank because I want to show you what is going to be the use case. So for now, let's not worry about it. But yes, eventually we will use it. And in here we want to go with name. So again, these two need to match. And in React, it's HTML4. In normal HTML, it's going to be just a four attribute. And we do want to add here a class. So we'll go with class name, and that is going to be form input. Let's save it. And this is what we should see on the screen. And again, if these two match, then basically what happens, notice, once you click on a label, it nicely sets the focus for the input. And since I also want to set up one for password or email, sorry, password is coming up. For now, let's just go with email and we want to change those values. So everywhere where I have the name, I'll set it up as email. And as far as type, yes, it's also going to be an email. So let me select over here. Let me go to email. Let's save that. Okay, we have the second input. And lastly, let's just add that submit button as well. So for that, we want to go with button, then we want to go with type and submit. And in here, let's go with class name BTN, again, global button class. And then we want to go with BTN block, which just stretches that button to the size of the container in this case form. And as far as the text, I'm going to go with submit. Let's save that. And we're pretty much good to go. So this is going to be our setup for the remaining videos in this section. And of course, in the next video, we'll set up the functionality. For now, we just have a good looking form. Okay, and now let's start working on controlled inputs. And essentially, when you hear controlled inputs, just think that there's going to be a state value. Now it can be one value, which represents all of the inputs, something we're going to cover a little bit later, or it can be a case where each input is going to have a state value that is associated with that input. And as you're changing the value in the input, you're automatically also changing the value in the state. And then in turn, the input shows the state value. And if this is somewhat confusing, just think of it this way. Basically, whatever we're going to be typing, this is going to be added to the state value. And then whenever you're ready to submit the form, you can just grab that state value and do whatever you need to do whether that is to post some data on a server or to set up some kind of functionality. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this. So if this sounds a little bit confusing, again, just bear with me. Basically, like I said, we want to start by setting up state values. And in this case, we'll do a state value for each input. Later, yes, we'll combine all of them in one. So for that, we just need to go with use state. And since I have name and email, it kind of makes sense if I name my state values the same, correct? So I'm going to go here with name, and then set name, and that is going to be equal to use 
and state. So that's what we want to set it up over here. And we'll start with an empty string because this is what we have in the input. And then we want to change it around where this is not going to be name. It will be email. And then we're looking for set an email. So this is our initial setup. And then we want to set up a function that is actually going to be invoked every time the user is going to type something in the input. And remember, in the React Fundamentals, we covered that the event that we want to add to the input is on change. So as the user is going to be typing something in the input, we will invoke the callback function, which of course we need to set up first. So let's go here and let's say const and then handle, handle, change. That's going to be my function. And remember that we right away have access to the event object here. And for now, let's just leave it blank. And then when it comes to input, if we want to set up controlled input, on each input, we need to add two things. We need to add a value. And this needs to be basically equal to that state value. So I'm going to go over here with name. And second one is that on change. And yes, both of them need to be there. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So in here, I'm going to go with on change. And then I want to pass in the callback function, correct? So I'll go with handle change and save it. Now, the last thing that we want to do is to set up the functionality. And if you remember in React Fundamentals, I said that we have access to the event object. And from there, we can get tons of cool things. The two most important ones, I guess the ones that we're going to use the most in the course are event.target.name and event.target.value. Now, for now, we don't have the name, and I'll showcase that basically we'll get an empty string, but we'll definitely get the value. So let's go over here. Let's say log. And we want to go with event.target.name, copy and paste, and we also want to set up the value. And for this, I'll actually move to the bigger browser window because I do definitely want to showcase the state. So this is going to be the form on a bigger browser window. And if we inspect the components, we right away see the controlled inputs. Okay, awesome. Notice our two state values. So they do exist. And then as I'm going to be typing, I'm going to get two things. First one is going to be empty because there is no name set on the input. However, second one is going to represent whatever the user has typed. Now notice something interesting though. We're not persisting this value in input. So this will always stay empty string. Why? Well, take a look. Because our state value is an empty string. So when we're setting up controlled inputs, that's why we need all of those things. We need a state value. We need both of those attributes on the input. We need the value as well as the on change. And in the callback function, this is where we'll update the state value. How we can do that? Well, we can use set name, correct? And again, keep in mind, this is going to be empty if there is no name attribute. And later we'll set up the name attribute and we'll use it. But I definitely want to showcase that if there is no name attribute, then I mean, it's just going to be empty. So I'll leave these ones for your reference. And here's what I want to do. I want to go with set name and then I want to grab whatever I have in the value. So let's invoke that and let's say event.target.value. And now the interesting thing is going to happen. So we have the state value, we have the on change, and as the user is typing, we'll be setting the state value equal to whatever is in the input. And then in turn, we'll use that value here to display it in the form. So check it out here. And I think again, I'm going to use the bigger browser window just so you can see that we're definitely updating that state value. Now check it out. Essentially, whatever I have in the form gets here as a state value. And that's why I can see that in the form as well. So hopefully this makes sense. Okay, so that should do it for the first controlled input. But what about the second one? What about the email? Because as you can see at this point, we're just updating the name. So if I'll add this handle change to the email, I mean, it's not going to work. Even though I can add the email as a value 
to the input. I mean, in here I have set name, not set email. So what are our options? Well, we can set up another function. So let's say we can rename this so it's not generic. I can say handle name change. And then for the email, of course, I'm going to go with handle email change. Or we can use the arrow function. And effectively, this is totally up to you. If you have more logic, then of course, it makes sense that you set it up here as a separate function. However, if you're just passing event.target.value, then we also have this option where instead of the handle change, which by the way, you can always find it in the readme. And therefore, just so it's cleaner, I'm going to remove what we can do here is set up our arrow function. Remember, we do need to grab the event. So that doesn't change. And then invoke set name directly here. So I can go here with email dot target dot value. And you guessed it correct. For all the inputs, we basically need to repeat these two steps. We need to set up the value. I mean, considering that you already have the state value, we need to set up the value, and we need to set up the on change. And then in the on change, we just go with set and then whatever is the name of the input. So let's go here. Let's keep on moving. This is going to be my input. I want to copy and paste again. These are different values. So it's not going to be name, it's going to be email. And the function is also going to be email. Let's save that. And again, let's navigate to the big browser window. And if I'll type over here, let's say some kind of dummy email doesn't look like it works here. Maybe it just needs a little nudge. Let me try right now, John. And as you can see, now everything works. So now both of them are controlled inputs. And essentially, our workflow is going to be, we'll set up value and on change. And then we'll set up the on submit as well. So let's navigate where we have the state values. And let's just add a on submit on the form. And let's create a handle submit. So I just need to create that function. Handle submit and hopefully you remember from the fundamentals that again, we have access to the event object. And in here, the first thing we want to do is prevent the default behavior. So we invoke prevent default. And then we can do something again. At the moment, we're not going to do anything in this video. But technically, this is where you post to the server where you do something with the value. So I'll say do something. And essentially, we just want to access both of the values. So in my case, I'm just going to log it. So I'm going to say name and email. And once I save, notice how I can nicely type so John and then John at Gmail. And once I click on submit and check the console, notice I have both of the values. I have the John as well as the email. So essentially, that's how we can set up controlled inputs in React. Beautiful. And once we're familiar with controlled inputs, why don't we work on a small challenge? And first, what I want you to do, if you haven't done that already, go to app JSX and look for zero to user challenge. And this is what you should see on a screen. Basically, I prepared a form. Now, I didn't set up any functionality. Again, it's just a straight up form. You'll have to do all of the work. And as you can see, in this case, we're just using one input. That's it. That's pretty much the only difference. And as far as the challenge, well, it's following. So first, create a controlled input. And in my case, I'm going to call this name and you'll see why it actually makes sense. Then set up on submit, basically for now, just a placeholder. Don't worry about the logic yet. If you can log that user has submitted the form, basically, if you have prevented the default and all that, you're in good shape. So first, set up those two things. Then I want you to import data array from data. And just to jog our memory. So we're here. So this is what we want to get. We want to get this data array. And that's why we'll go with name input, because this is the property we have in the object. 
And once you have successfully imported the data, set up another state value. And in my case, I'm going to call this users and set the array as a default value. And I'm purposely being somewhat vague because we have covered all of these things already. And then I want you to iterate over the list and display right after the form. So if we navigate to the user challenge, notice this comment over here. So this is where I want you to display the users that are in the array. Again, don't worry about the CSS. If you can see the name correctly displayed in a browser, you're in good shape. And at the very end, we want to set up following functionality. When the user submits the form, add a new person to the list. Now, if you find this one easy, you can work on extra challenge where I want you to add a button to whatever we're returning, basically the item, and set up the functionality to remove the user from the list. So if you're interested, work on this challenge. And once you're ready to compare the results, resume with the videos. Okay, so let's get cracking. First, I'm going to navigate to the user challenge. And I'll create those state values. Basically, I know that I'll have two of them. So while I'm setting up one, I might as well set up the second one. So name and then set name and that is equal to use uh, state. Let's pass in the empty value first, copy and paste. And like I said, in my case, I'm going to go with users set. And also I want to do it over here. Now for now, since I haven't imported anything, let me just set it up as an empty array. Let's save this. And now I want to set up that controlled input. So I need to look for my input. And then in here, remember value that is equal to the state value. And then the second one is the on change. And this is going to be equal to our arrow function. We'll grab the event object and we'll go with set name and we'll pass in the event dot target and then the value. So now we have our controlled input. Next, I want to set up just the log when we submit the form. So in here, notice Vt is pretty quick. Basically, the moment you type the value, it spits back this error. Don't worry. You don't have it. Everything is correct. And like I was saying, we want to set up that handle submit. So let's go over here and I'm going to call this handle submit. I'm going to get the object. Yes, the event object more precisely. And here, let's start with prevent the default. And I'm going to go with just log. I'll say form form submitted. Okay, good. And now let's navigate to the form. And then let's set up on submit. Beautiful. And let's pass in the handle submit. Let's save that. And if everything is correct, we should see form submitted. Awesome. And once we have this set up in place, now let's grab that data. So let me try here whether I can actually do it. Data. And uh, nope, that doesn't give me anything. Okay, let's grab it from the file. So import data, and then from and now we need to go quite a few levels up. So one, two, and then this should be coming from the data. Let me just double check quickly. So data data. Yep, that's the correct one. Probably not the best naming. But as I was setting up, that's the one that I used. So this is going to be our default value for the users. And now let's navigate over here, where we render. And then like I said, right after form, we're going to go with users. And now let's iterate over those users and simply return a div. Since we potentially might set up a button, Again, that is totally up to you. But in my case, I'll try to do that at least. And then users map. So we're iterating over and then this should be already very familiar. We have done that quite a few times during the course. And that's why I keep pushing for you to set it up on your own. Because we have covered that you just need to practice. That's it. There's no real secret. And as far as the return, I'm going to go here with div. And then let's set up the key. This is where we're iterating over. So I'm going to go with user ID because I know that's in my array, in the object more precisely. And then as far as the value, well, like I said, let's not overcomplicate things. 
we're just going to go with user and then name. And let's save, and this is what we should see on screen. So here's our task. And you know what? Let me make this one as heading two so it stands out. Now, every time the user submits the form, essentially we want to add a new user to our array. So this basically is the main challenge. And effectively, we can do it this way. So first I have the handle submit, correct? Now I need to grab the value of the name. But here's the thing. User might try to submit the form basically without entering anything. And this is normally where we would display the alert or some kind of toast or whatever that all the values need to be submitted. But in this case, we'll simply return from this function. So the most basic check is following. I can say if, and if there is no name, if you want, of course, you can log stuff. That's totally up to you. But in my case, I'm just going to go with return. And you'll notice that if the user tries to submit the form with empty values, I'll have nothing in a console. So again, this stresses the point that we're not going to get to this line. JavaScript is going to keep on reading, and this is the early return. JavaScript is going to be, okay, this actually matches. There's no value in here. So I'm just going to return from this function. That's the most basic check again for the empty value. And yes, before you ask, if you have multiple values, let's say name, email, password, and all that, then basically you go with or, and then again, you check. So we go with this not operator and we say, if it meets the condition, then we're not essentially doing anything. We're just returning from the function. So that's the first step. Now, the second one, if there's actually some value, so let's say if the user types something and I click notice form submitted, now I want to construct that user. And this is the case where, yes, basically, I'll have to create a new object on the fly and I'll have to add it to my existing array. So let's start over here. Let's say that there is some kind of value. First thing we need to do is set up that ID. Now, of course, you can hard code somehow, but one neat trick while you're basically working on some simple application like this one, you can just use some helpers. And in this case, I'm going to use date.now. Again, this is not for serious projects. In that case, of course, it's going to be more complex. But also keep in mind one thing that normally you're communicating with database anyway, and database is responsible for setting up those IDs. So this is just for practice, where since I know that my user has both ID and name, I just manually need to create that ID. Because name, of course, is going to be provided by this input. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's go here with const and then fake ID. And like I said, I'm just going to use date.now. But please don't use that in any serious project. And if you want, you can log. Essentially, those are going to be milliseconds from, I believe, 1970 or something along those lines. So if we go over here and if we type, check it out. Notice this is going to be my value again. Just something nifty that we can use while we're working on this project. So let me just comment this one out for your reference, if you want. And then now let's construct that user. So we're going to go here with const new user, and that is equal to an object. So I have two properties. First one is going to be ID, which is going to be equal to fake ID. And then the second one is name. Now, where is the name coming from? Well, it's coming from the state, correct? Over here. And we only get to this functionality if there's some value in the input. If not, then we won't even get to it. And now let's construct that new array, the one that we will set up using set users. So in here, let's go with const, and then I'll call this updated users. And then that one is equal to, first I wanna spread out all of these values because I'll be adding to this array. Again, I don't wanna overwrite that. Keep in mind, we can pass here whatever we want. So if you'll just simply place new user in the set users, you'll set your array now equal to an object. That's not what we want to do. We want to spread out. So we want to copy all of the current values from the users, and then we want to add the new one. So I'll say here, new user, and we'll use this updated users and set it as our new value. So we'll go set users and we'll pass in updated users. And lastly, it kind of makes sense if we clean out the input, right? 
otherwise it's just going to stay there and the way we do that is simply by typing set name again same function whatever we have over there and we just provide the empty value now i don't think we need any more of this one we can remove and now check it out essentially as i'm going to be submitting something this is going to be my new user and then if user tries to submit with empty values nothing happens however if we do provide the value and if i say bob then check it out if i take a look at my browser i have bob over here and input is also nicely set to an empty string and just for kicks as far as the extra challenge now let's also set up those buttons and let's remove the user if the button is clicked so first we want to navigate where we have the return that's why i set up the div and we're going to go with button and i'll just type remove in here we're going to go with on click and eventually we'll set up some logic for now we'll simply go and empty arrow function just so we don't have the error and i'm also going to add the class name and i'm going to say btn so that's going to be my generic button class and now let's move up and set up that functionality where essentially I'm going to call this remove user. It's going to be looking for one thing and one thing only. It's going to be looking for the ID. And as far as the logic, I want to use filter again and essentially return only the items whose ID does not match whatever I'm passing in. So again, I'm going to call this updated users. And in this case, I'm going to speed this up a little bit by just copying and pasting. So this is going to be the same. However, I'm not gonna spread out values this way. I know that filter returns a new one, so I can simply say users and then filter. And as far as the callback function, I'll call this person and I'll say if the person ID, person ID doesn't match, then return. If it doesn't match the ID that we're passing in. However, if the ID matches, then that person is not going to be returned. And of course, again, we set users equal to this new value. And now we just navigate down here where we have the arrow function. And essentially we want to go with the remove user and we'll grab the user ID. We'll say user dot ID. Let's save this. And now one by one, I can remove them. So that concludes the entire challenge. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next video. Okay, and up next, let's talk about how we can set up one state value for multiple inputs. And before we begin, let me just stress something. It's not something that you have to do if you have multiple inputs, so it's not a requirement. However, you'll see this quite often. And therefore, I think it's important that you know how to set it up and basically the logic behind it. Also, during this video, we'll heavily rely on dynamic object keys. And if you need to jog your memory on that, please utilize this JS Nuggets video. So first we want to navigate to app JSX. We want to make sure that we're sitting in the zero three multiple inputs. And then let's navigate to the file. So in here, we want to set up one state value which is going to represent all of the inputs. So at the moment, notice, instead of just name and email, I also have the password. So instead of setting up three state values, I'll set up one. How we can do that? Well, we can create that state value as an object, correct? So let's go with use state. This is going to be my object, and I just need to come up with the properties. Now, before we do that, why don't we also come up with a name? So in my case, that is going to be user and set user. So that is going to be my set function. So as you can see, nothing changes. That part still stays the same. The difference right now is that we'll have an object and basically each input, we can set it up as a property in here. So we'll have name, I'll also have the email, and I'll also have the password. And as far as my default values, they will be empty string. If you wanna go with some different value, of course, that is totally up to you. So now I have the user and now let's think about it. In order to set up the input, we will have to have a function, correct? So why don't we create that? 
And the beauty here is that we can use only one function. Since we have only one state value as an object, we can also set up only one function. So I can say handle change. And hopefully you see that it kind of saves us a little bit of time if we have multiple inputs. So again, we only have one state value and we'll only have one function. So that's basically the benefit of such approach. And now once I have the function, let's not worry about any logic in here. I will navigate to all of the inputs and here's what we wanna do. We wanna set up the value, however, in this case, it's not equal to the state value. It is equal to a state value, which is a user and then dot and then the property. And in this case, of course, it is name. And as far as the function, well, we go here with on change and we set it equal to our handle change. And effectively, we wanna repeat that for all of the inputs. Again, we have name, email, as well as the password. So let's change it here to email. And let me grab this one more time and copy and paste. So of course, now the state value is going to be a password. All right, awesome. Now let's decide how we can access the actual value. Because if I'm going to go over here, if I'm going to say E, and first, let's just log E dot target and value, you'll see that everything is correct. But we don't know which input we're referencing here as far as the target again, let me remove this one. And then notice, yeah, everything is awesome. I mean, I can see whatever letters I'm typing. And of course, the reason why we don't see anything in the form is because we're not updating anything. So the state values stay empty. However, the big problem here is that I don't know which input am I typing here. So yeah, I have S, but what is it? Name, email, password. And therefore we need to use the name attribute. Remember at the very, very beginning of this section, I covered that we can also access the event dot target dot name. And of course that needs to be here in the input as well. And therefore I'm gonna go here with name and I'll set it equal to name. Why? Well, because that's my state value basically. So this is always the funny one when you show in the example, because it's like name equals to name. Yeah, that's effectively my property. Now it's probably going to make more sense here with an email because now name will be equal to email and you guessed it correctly. We need to do the same thing for the password. So this is a must. If you have such setup where you have one state value and it's an object, yes, you will need to use this type of approach. You'll definitely need the name. As you saw before, when we had two inputs and we used straight up functions, the state functions, you don't have to do that. I mean, you can always add the name, but it's not a requirement. In this case, since we have one function, yeah, this is what we need to do. So let's go here with log and let's say event.target. And yes, this will reference basically whatever input the user is typing in. So notice, this is name, and then this is the value. The same is gonna be for email, and you guessed it for the password. Again, we see nothing yet in a browser because we're not updating, but this is already an awesome start. So we have the name and we have the value. So here's what we wanna do. We wanna take this name and we wanna update that specific property here in the object with what? With this value. How we can do that? Well, this is the interesting part. We need to use the following logic. First of all, we go with set user. So that's our set function. Then remember, we have multiple values. So I cannot simply go with name and then whatever. This is going to effectively remove these two if I use such approach. So that's not gonna work. What we can do? Solution is dot, 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 and then user. So essentially, I wanna spread out again, all of the existing values first, because I'll be overriding only one at a time, right? I'll be typing in one input at a time. And after that, we wanna dynamically update the property in the state and set it equal to value. So first, let me set up the code, and then I'll try to 
explain as best as I can, because again, this is something that pops up quite often in the course Q and A, where I'm going to go with these square brackets. I'll pass in event dot target dot name, and please keep in mind that this value will be either name, email, or password in this case. So of course, if you have 15 of them, then it's going to be one of those 15. So this will reference whatever we have here in the name. And what happens, it will access dynamically this property in the object. That's why it's so important that they are the same, that essentially you have the properties in the object and they match exactly what you have over here. Because otherwise, if this value, for example, is names, and you'll try to set it in the object, it's not going to work. So make sure that they match exactly whatever you have in the object. So we're accessing dynamically this property, and we'll set it equal to what? Well, we have here the value, right? So we'll go with event dot target, and then a dot value. Let me save, and like I promised, I will come back to this one. Don't worry. And now let's go over here and notice we nicely type, and I still have those logs. I don't think I need them. Let me navigate to the big browser. And let's see, we should see the state value as well. Nope. Looks like I need to refresh here as far as Vite. Let me try multiple inputs notice. So now my state is an object. And as I'm typing, I'm actually providing values over here for the name, for the email and password. And like I said, yeah, this triggers a bunch of questions in course Q&A. So as far as my explanation, well, let's think about it. If I'm going to go over here, and if I'm going to just hard code one of the properties, if I'll say name, like so, in any input I'm going to type, I'll be just updating the name. So let's try this one out. Notice, I can save over here. And basically notice how it's essentially just typing a value over here, even though we're typing in this input. And the reason why we see nothing in these ones, well, because these ones are still empty. Correct. So even though I'm typing in the correct input, as far as the value, it's showing up here in a name, because I'm hard coding here. And the same is going to work for password, the email and all that. That's why we need to set this one dynamic. So this will be dynamic depending on what, depending what we have here. So if it's name, then this will dynamically access the property in the object that is name. If it's email, and it's email, hopefully you see where I'm going with this. And that's why we go here with event, target, and name. Now, of course, if you have already some experience with dynamic object keys, then this should look very familiar. Again, the reason for that is because we have multiple properties, we have multiple inputs, but we have one function. And therefore, every time the user types something in one of the inputs, I want to check two things. Not only I want to get the value, but I also want to get the property. And I want to access that property. And I want to set it equal to whatever value I have in the input. And as far as the handle submit, let's set it up here. Let's say on submit in this case, let's come up with the function name. And I'll submit. And you know what I think I'm just going to copy and paste, I think it's going to be faster. So handle, not change. We're looking for submit, we do want to get the object, we do want to prevent the default. And instead of setting the user, I simply want to log it. And again, the only gotcha right now is that it's a state value. So once I type here, and of course, since this is an email field, we will have to uh, the at one, and let's go with mail.com and check it out. The moment I press submit, now I have the object in the console. So essentially, the rest of the logic is the same, whatever you want to do after that. So yes, of course, you'll check for empty values, then you'll set up some kind of functionality. And a common approach is then to clear the values. So this doesn't change. The only difference that right now we have an object. And while we're still in a row, let's also cover a few other input options. More specifically, I'll show you the gotcha when it comes to checkboxes. 
And we'll also take a look how we can display the select input, basically when we have a list of options. So in the app JSX, grab the starter from zero for other inputs, and this is what you should see on the screen. Essentially a form with few labels and a submit button. So first, let's go to the file where we're looking for other inputs in the star, and this is going to be our entry point. And let's start by setting up two state values. And let's start with shipping, which essentially is going to be our Boolean value. So here, let's go with const and then shipping and set shipping. And we'll set it equal to use state. And by default, it's going to be false. And then we want to navigate to our form. And we're looking for this one, the first form row, where we have the free shipping in the label. And in here, let's set up the input first, it's not going to be equal to type text, we actually want to go with checkbox. And since Emmet right away spits out this name one, we might as well provide that. So we're not going to use it in this example. But normally, if you would, you would type whatever is the state value over here. And then when it comes to Eddie, same deal, we're going to go with shipping. Let me save and now notice, we have our own little checkbox over here. After that, let's set up the on change. And also, let's create the function. Now, unlike the input, the typical text or email on password, we actually want to go with checked. And we want to set it equal to that state value. So unlike the value equals to the state value, now we go with checked. So let's go here, first, checked, and that is equal to my state value, which again, is a Boolean. And then when it comes to function, first, we need to create one. So let me go over here. And in my case, I'm going to call this handle shipping. So that's my function, I'll be looking for the event object. And as far as the logic, first, let's just log event dot target dot checked. So that's the one that we're going to use not event dot target that value. Because notice we don't have the value in here, we have the checked. So let's go here, let's say event dot target and checked. And I'll right away use the value that's coming back. And I'll set it equal to my shipping in the state. So in here, I'll say set shipping and set it equal to that value. And essentially, it's going to be either true or false, depending whether you have clicked on it or not. And the very last thing we want to do over here is to set up on change and set it equal to the handle shipping. Let's save this again, we'll have this warning in the console. But basically, you'll notice that every time we click on the checkbox, we'll get back the value. And we're setting that in the state. And I guess the major gotcha about the checkbox is that we want to use the checked instead of the value. And when it comes to select input, essentially, it's a list of options. So normally, you'll have some kind of list again, typically, it's going to be dynamic. So it's going to be coming from the API. And you want to render them inside of the select input, and you'll set them up as option element. And then in state, there's going to be that one value that represents whatever the user has selected. So first, we need to create a state value. And here, just be careful, because I named the state value framework. And the list is frameworks. And you don't want to mix them. Basically, when we want to display the options, we want to iterate over frameworks. But when we want to provide the value, we want to look for framework. And I'll remind you that once we get there. So frame work, and that is going to be equal to set framework. So let me copy and paste and I just want to change it to a uppercase. And as far as the default value, this is totally up to you. I'm going to go with react, since that's the first item here in this list. But of course, you can set any of these values. Let's also create the function because we'll need it. So for now, copy and paste so we can speed this up. We won't actually use the checked one. 
So of course I can remove. We won't set up the logic for now. We'll simply go with handle and then let's call this frame work. Let's save that. And after that, we want to set up the select input where we have the label for the framework. So let's go here with select. Again, Emmet is going to spit right away name and ID. So we might as well provide those values. So in here, let's just write framework. So again, this is very important. We are now referencing the state value, not the list. We'll work with the list in a second. So set it equal to framework. And as far as the options, this is where we want to iterate over the list. So first, let's display them. And then we'll add the value as well as the on change. So let's start over here. We effectively want to iterate over the framework. So we set up here the curlies, we go with frameworks, then dot map. So we're mapping over. And then as far as the value, I'm going to reference this as a framework, framework. And as far as the return, we want to go with keyword. And then we're looking for the option. Then since we have a list, yes, we still need to provide the key. And in this case, we don't have the ID. However, those names are unique. So I'm going to go with framework. So essentially, I'm referencing the parameter. And then inside of the option, this is where I want to showcase one of those options. So let me save and notice that everything is correct. However, nothing is going to happen. So essentially, yes, we're changing this. But if we navigate to the big screen, you'll see that I'm not changing that state value, because we haven't set up the logic yet. So technically, this is view. But of course, in the state, I still have the react. And it's very similar to typical input. So we don't need to go here with checked. That was only for the checkbox. Again, we go with value, we go with framework. Very, very important, not frameworks, but framework. And as far as the on change, well, we want to provide our handle framework, correct? Let's provide this function. And as far as the functionality, we simply want to go with set framework, and it's going to be located again, in event dot target value. So if you're wondering, can we pass directly the arrow function like we have been doing? Yes, absolutely. I just thought since we have handle shipping here, we might as well set up another one. So we go with framework, and then we look for event dot target, and then the value. Let's save that. And now, if I navigate to the big screen, we should see that we're also successfully changing the state value. So that's how we can work with checkboxes, as well as select inputs in react. Okay. And um, as a very last thing in the section, I want to show you a very nifty alternative to controlled inputs. You see, we can also submit the form with uncontrolled inputs, basically without referencing the state value. Now in the following section, I'll show you an example of how we can do that using use ref hook. But in this video, I'll show you how we can accomplish the same task with form data API, which in my opinion is a better approach. If you have more than one input, as far as form data API, it's coming from vanilla JS. And effectively, it's a interface that allows us to construct a set of key value pairs representing the form fields and their values. And if this sounds somewhat funky, don't worry, as we're going to be working through the example, you'll see what I mean. Now, if you're not familiar with form data API, or you just want to get more info on it, please reference this JS nuggets video, where I cover form data API in greater detail, effectively, Form data API has quite a few methods on it. And since I don't want this video to be half an hour long, I'll just show you the most common ones. So first, let's just go to app JSX. Notice over here, I have the starter. I'm looking for 05 form data. And once you navigate, you'll see that we have a state value. So essentially, it doesn't do anything. I'm just going to use it to showcase something. 
We also have right away handle submit on the form and we prevent a default. Hopefully we are clear why we need that. And then we have three inputs. So we have the name one, the email, as well as the password. And as you can see, I messed up over here. So that should be a password. I already provided the IDs and I also provided the names. And this is very important. When you work with form data, it's a must to have a name that effectively represents that input. So if you do decide to work with form data, just don't forget about the name. It's very easy to do that. And then your functionality is not going to work. And as far as the setup, let's start with this. Let's get on the same page that if I go to handle submit, and if I log not event.target, but if I log event.current target, this will point to what? This will actually point to a form. So if I go to console and if I submit notice, this returns a form element. And as far as the difference, so the event.target refers to the DOM element that triggers an event. However, the current target refers to the DOM element that event listener is listening on. So in simple English, in our case, since the event, our on submit is set on a form, sure enough, event.current target returns our form element. Now, why is that useful? Because in vanilla JS, there's form data API, which is just a cool setup, how we can directly access the inputs we have, as well as the values. So in this case, I can go with const and I'll call this form data and I'll set it equal to new form data. And one gotcha, don't call the component form data. Essentially, you'll have an error. That's why I named this uncontrolled inputs, not form data, because essentially React is going to think that you're referencing the component. And once we have the new form data, it's looking for that form. That's why we want to go with event.current target. So we go here with event and current target. And let's just see what we get back. So let me move this sucker down. And I'm going to go with form data. Now, don't be surprised if you see this in the console. So don't freak out. Essentially, everything is correct. It just works a little bit differently. So the first time I started working with form data, I was like, well, wait a minute. Did I pass the correct target? Because I don't see anything. Don't worry. In order to access the values, we have few approaches. We can use the get method on this form data. So for example, if I want to get the name, I'm going to go here with name. I'm going to set up some kind of variable. We go with form data and we go with get and then whatever is the name. So again, that's why it's important. Whatever is this value over here. So if I'm going to go with name, you can probably already guess what we're going to be getting back. Correct. So let's try something else. Why don't we try, let's say email. I'm going to go here, email. And yes, of course, that input needs to be there. And if I log this, I'll actually see the value once we submit the form. So if I'll type here, John and at Gmail, once I submit, check it out. I'll have this value over here. So we have a few options. Like I said, I'm not going to cover each and every method. If you want to find out more about form data, please reference that video. But in this instance, what we can do one by one, we can grab the email, password, and name. Yes, that's definitely one option. However, there's a little bit better option where we can transform this into an object directly. And the way we do that, we use object dot from entries, which again is essentially a method that we get from vanilla JS, because what we need to keep in mind that this form data actually is an array of arrays. And just so you don't think that I'm making this up, let me go over here where I have the log. And let me go with spread operator. I'm going to go dot, dot, dot. And then we're looking for form data dot. And I'm going to go with entries just so you can see both of them. But then let me save, let me refresh, and I'll have to provide the values again. 
So in this case, I'm going to go with John. John over here as well. And then lastly, we want to go here with some kind of password. And once we click, like I said, what we're getting back from form data entries, and as a side note, you can find all of these methods over here. Notice it has quite a few of them. And that's why I said that we're not going to cover all of them. I can spread out the entries and I'll have this array of arrays. So this is going to be the name of the input. And then this is going to be the value. And even though this is nice, most likely you'll want the object. For example, if you want to submit this data to a server, how we can do that? Well, first of all, let me comment these ones out. As always, all of this functionality is available already in the readme. And let me go here with const and I'll call this new user. And I'll set it equal to object dot again, this is coming from vanilla JS. Basically, it's not provided by react, it's just JavaScript. And effectively object dot from entries turns an array of arrays data structure into a object with key value pairs. And you can find a vanilla JS code example in the readme. And in here we pass in the form data. And what you'll see as a result, we'll have this new user now. So once I click, check it out. Now I have an object with all of these values. And the kicker here is that I can send it to a server, I can do some kind of functionality, and all that cool stuff. Again, the main point of this video is that we don't always have to set up those controlled inputs if we don't want to. For example, we can use form data, pass in the form, as long as we have the names and all that, we're good to go. We can set up the functionality here in the handle submit. So please don't think that you always, always, always have to set up controlled inputs. It really depends on your preference and pretty much the application you have. In some instances, you'll do that and some you'll be like, Nope, I actually want to go with form data. And lastly, let's look at one major gotcha. So we did something with this user data. We're good to go. Now we want to clear out the values. You see, if we just re render, those values are going to stay over here. And that's why we have over here the state value, the set value. So just to showcase that I'm going to go with set value. And I'm going to go with value plus one. And essentially, what you'll notice that even though we re render correctly, because remember, we're updating the state value, these are going to stay. And as far as the values, just so we can save a little bit of time, I'm just going to type some gibberish ones. I don't think it makes any sense to type anything meaningful. Let's click and notice we did update the state value. It's actually happening, everything is correct. However, these ones stay in the input. And if you want to clear the values, you want to go with event dot current target. And then the method name is reset. So we save this one. And now notice, pretty much the moment I will submit. Basically, I'll do something with the data. And as a quick sign out, of course, you would check for empty values. So in that case, either you would get them one by one, or in the vanilla JS video, I actually show you how to do that by iterating over array, which is just less lines of code. And then once we click on submit, notice how we nicely clear the values. And again, don't think that they always stay empty. Again, if we provide over here, something in the inputs, notice again, we'll have the new values here, as far as the new user. And we also nicely clear out the inputs. Awesome. And up next, let's cover use ref hook. It's a lot like use state. So it preserves the value between the renders. But the difference is that updating use ref does not trigger re render. So remember, when we work with use state, every time we update the value, we trigger re render. Now, it's not the case with use ref. Very often use ref is used to access DOM nodes, but there are some other nifty use cases as well. 
course, it really depends on the projects you're going to be working on. But at least in my experience, since I don't use useRef to access form inputs, useRef is not something I use in every project. But once in a while, there's a very specific use case where useRef is the right tool for the job. We're going to start just like with the other examples where essentially we want to look for 07 useRef star and then 01 useRef basics. And of course, I want to import that in the app JSX and I want to navigate to that file. And notice over here, I already have the state value. I have handle submit that just prevents the default. And I have the form as well as the heading one with the button. And as I'm clicking, I'm increasing the value here. And you'll see why we have this kind of setup in a second. So essentially, if we want to start working with user ref, just like the other hooks, we want to import that from react, and we want to come up with a name. So in this case, we're not looking for an array of values, we're just looking for one value. So I'm going to go here const, and then we just come up with a name. So in my case, I'm going to call this container. As a quick side note, I actually like to think of user ref value as a container. Again, that's just my mental model. And we want to go here with use ref. So that's the hook. And then we want to pass in that default value. So in my case, I'm going to start with null, but keep in mind, you can pass here whatever you want. And then if we log, you'll notice something interesting. If I log the container, and if I take a look at the dev tools, you'll see that it is an object and it has the current property. And the current property is equal to that null. So current property is always going to be equal to whatever you set here as a default value. And yes, React behind the scenes is going to set this one up as object. So notice we did not do anything. Basically, we just set up the user ref and this is what the React return. Now, once we have this one in place, essentially, we have two ways how we can set this value. Because of course, you don't want to always keep it as null. One way we can set it ourselves, basically using some kind of functionality, which is going to be actually our second example, or you can use this container and set it equal to any of the DOM nodes. Now, in our example, yes, we will use the input because it's somewhat common, but keep in mind, you don't have to. I mean, you can set it equal to any DOM nodes. And if I remember correctly, in the project, we're actually going to use the nav bar just so we have multiple examples. But yes, this is pretty typical to set it equal to an input. If you remember when we talked about controlled inputs and form data API in the previous section, I mentioned that there's another way how we can use uncontrolled inputs. And essentially that is using use ref hook. So once I'm done with my long speech and all that, Here's what we want to do. We want to find the element. Again, in my case, that is going to be the input. And we're going to go with the ref. So that's the attribute we want to use. And we want to set it equal to what? Well, we want to set it equal to ref container. So whatever you created with the use ref. Now, we don't see anything because, of course, this is essentially the initial render, correct? So in order to see our actual value, we need to set up the use effect. So in here, I'm going to go with use effect. And then we'll pass in the function. Now I don't care about the dependency array, I just want to showcase that essentially, once our initial render takes place, we run this use effect, and in there we'll see a different picture. So in here, we're going to see a ref container that actually has this input. Again, something important to keep in mind that Yes, we have two ways how we can set up the user ref. We can either set it equal to any of the DOM nodes. And the reason why we see that right now, because this runs after initial render, correct? And this one is happening during the initial render. That's the difference. And we can also, for example, set it ourselves. Again, that is going to be our second example. And once current is equal to our DOM node, what can we do? Well, pretty much anything. Once we get the DOM node, I mean, sky's the limit. 
for example, I can grab the value. And this one, of course, I'll do it in handle submit. So again, this was just a showcase that after the initial render, now in the ref container, we'll have access to that input, but we'll actually use it over here in the handle submit. So in here, effectively, we want to grab the value by using value property. Again, this is just coming from Vanilla.js. So if I'm going to go over here in the handle submit, and if I'm going to take a look at the value, it will actually give me whatever is typed in the input. So if I'm going to go here with const name and ref container, then current, again, I'm accessing the property. And since the property is an input, basically I can run with value. Again, this is coming from Vanilla.js. You access the DOM node, and if it's an input, you can actually run dot value. And effectively, this is just going to get us whatever the user has typed in. And then again, we can do something about it. Now that's something in our case is simply going to be logging the name. So notice this essentially is null. Let me comment out. We have quite a few logs here, but then if I type something and if I press submit, check it out. Now I'm getting this value. So this is how we can set up again, uncontrolled inputs using use ref. So that's the first example we're going to look at. And in the following video, we'll take a look how we can use use ref to avoid running some functionality on the initial render. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. Okay, and now let's take a look at our second example, where we will change the value of use ref. And we're going to start just like the first one, where essentially, I want to create a value with use ref. And in this case, I'm going to call is mounted, and I'll set it equal to use ref. And just like before, I want to provide some kind of default value. And in my case, I'm going to go with false. Again, I probably don't need to say that now is mounted, essentially is an object in there, there's a current property. And that one is equal to a false. Now, I also probably don't need to remind you that if I have here a use effect, and if I add here, dependency array, and if I provide here a value, basically, the state value over here, every time I'll click on a button, guess what, essentially, the functionality inside of this use effect is going to run, correct. So let's kill two birds at the same time, I'm going to go with is mounted. And let's save and notice pretty much every time I'll click, I'll have this current is equal to false. And once we have established this, why don't we talk about a very specific use case? What if I don't want to run certain functionality after initial render? So I do want to run it after that every time the value changes, but not on the initial render. Again, this is not probably something that you're going to use in every project. But here and there, this is a nifty solution, where essentially, you can just avoid running some functionality after that initial render. And the way we do that, we essentially check this value. And if this one is false, we set it equal to true. And then after that, every time this value changes, this is equal already to true. And then the functionality is going to run. Now one gotcha though, don't check is mounted, because this will always be an object. So this will be true, we need to check for the current property. And if you're someone if you on that, let me showcase what I'm talking about. So inside of the use effect, first of all, I think I can remove this one, I can set up the if condition. And I can say, if is mounted current, is false, then don't run basically return from the use effect. So in here, I can say is mounted and current. Again, don't check for is mounted, because it is an object. So essentially, it's going to be true. I'm checking for the current property, which in the beginning is false. And if that's the case, then I want to go with is mounted. So notice now I'm actually changing that value myself. I'll set it equal to true, and then I'm going to return. So true, and then I return. And after that if condition, 
I actually want to set up that functionality. Now, again, in my case, that functionality is simply going to be log and then re-render like so. But let's take a look. What is the result? So notice I refresh and there's nothing in the console. And I'll only see something in the console once actually I'm changing this value. So essentially what we're doing, we're avoiding to run whatever functionality after initial render. Again, not something that you'll do in every project, but once in a while you might hit this use case. And lastly, I just want to showcase how we can set up nice focus around our input. And since we're not triggering re-render, we won't have this infinite loop. So I have rest container, which essentially is pointing to my input, correct? So I can set up a use effect. Instead of the use effect, I'm going to pass in the function. And then since I know that I'm accessing container, then current, so that's my input. In vanilla.js, we also have this focus. We just invoke it. Again, this is not reacting, this is vanilla.js. And check it out, basically the moment I'll refresh, I'll have this focus around the input. And what's really cool, that since use ref does not trigger re-render, essentially you won't have this infinite loop like you would if, for example, you would be using use effect without the dependency array and then updating the state value. Hopefully that is clear. And we can move on to the next topic. Okay, and up next, let's see how we can create our own custom hooks. And custom hooks are great for abstracting some functionality, basically to have less lines of code in the component. And as a result, it's going to be easier to manage our component. And also, once we have custom hook, we can bring it from project to project, which of course speeds up our workflow. Now, rule of thumb, quite often, use effect logic is a great option for custom hook. And lastly, all the hooks rules apply to our custom hooks. For example, they do need to start with use. As far as the setup in the app, JSX, look for zero, eight custom hooks, star, and then zero, one toggle. So we'll start with somewhat basic example, and then we'll work on the fetch one. And once you navigate here in the component, you can see that I'm using use state. I have show, set show, default value is false. And then every time I click on a button, what do you know? I'm toggling the component. And essentially, if I have, for example, three, four, five, or whatever components that have this kind of functionality, the toggle functionality, I can set up a pretty simple custom hook where first we're going to navigate to the starter. I'm going to go with new file and let's go with use. Again, this will have to start with use, so we might as well right away set it up. And I'm going to go with toggle. And in this case, we can go with JS. Now, if you want, of course, you can set up JSX, but in my case, I'm going to go with JS. And essentially, the way it's going to work, we'll just take this functionality and return from that custom hook. So first, let me grab this just so it's faster. Then let's come up with the function. Again, we need to go to use. And in this case, I'm going to go toggle here. Then I know that I'm going to be looking for some kind of default value. And that's why I'll use this as a parameter. I'll say default and then value. And of course, I'll pass that value when I invoke the custom hook. And in here, as far as the logic, it's pretty much the same. I want to have show and set show, and I want to pass this default value. So let's go back over here and we'll cut it out, copy and paste. And instead of false, I'll actually go with default and then value. Now, I also want to set up the toggle function, the one that I'm invoking here. And I'm going to go with const toggle. Let me close the sidebar. As far as the functionality, same deal. Basically, I want to go with set show and then the opposite value, whatever it is. And then from this use toggle, we have multiple options. If you want, you can return an array. So you can go here and say return. And then the first value can be show. And then the second one is toggle. So notice basically we're making a use state. 
just a little bit more complex. So in here, I also have the toggle function. So hopefully it's clear. So we have the state value, but I'm just adding this extra function. So now I'm returning this and then back in the toggle, I can access it the same way. I can go use toggle and then the first value and the second value. Now I actually prefer returning this as an object. It just fits better my mental model where I know that there's going to be some properties there and I just want to access them. Now, this is totally up to you. If you want, you can set it up as an array. And then of course we want to export that. So I'm going to go here with export default. And then we're looking for use and then toggle. That's what we're exporting. And now back in the toggle one, instead of state, we don't need the state anymore. We want to import the use and then toggle. And I'll rely on my auto imports. Remember, we do need to provide the default value. Either that's true or false. And just so you can see that it works, I'll actually go with true. And then remember, we are returning the object, correct? And as far as the properties, what do we have over there? Well, we have show and we have the toggle. So now this stays the same. This doesn't change. But here where I have the on click, basically I have the toggle. Notice the moment I save, right away see the component. Why? Well, because the default value is true. And then the functionality still works. I purposely picked a very basic example. Of course, as you're looking at it, you're like, well, I mean, are we really saving time? Again, it really depends. If you have 10 components that use the same toggle functionality, yeah, this is very nifty. And in the following example, you'll truly see the power of the custom hooks. Again, this is just to showcase the main setup. Yes, we can use here use state. Yes, we can use use effect, whatever hook you want. So make sure that you start with use. And then when you actually invoke the hook, if you have some default value, you need to pass it in. So for example, if I flip it to false, notice now I don't see the component on the initial render, but if I go back to true, this is still going to work. So again, I refresh and I'm good to go. So that's the basic setup. And in the following video, we'll try to do the same thing with our fetch functionality. Okay. And once we're familiar with the fundamentals of custom hooks, why don't we cover more complex example? And um, here's the challenge. In the app JSX, import zero to fetch data. So it's in the same folder just a more complex example. And once you navigate there, remember, this is essentially a component that is fetching a GitHub user. And now let's try to set up a custom hook. So effectively, we want to move away pretty much most of the logic. So try to come up with that custom hook. And a hint, Hook should return is loading is error and user, and it should take URL as a parameter. So again, if you're interested, try to set it up. And once you're ready to compare the results, resume with the video. Effectively, like I mentioned, use effect quite often is a good use case for the custom hook. Notice all these lines of code. It would be nice if we could just move it to a separate file. And effectively, we'll have less lines of code, and it's going to be easier to grasp the functionality once you come back, I don't know, in two days, three days, or I don't know, a half a year. And the way we can do that, we can set up the custom hook. So let's navigate back to the starter. I'm going to go with use, and I'll set up two examples. First one is going to be use fetch person. This is going to be kind of a specific case, and then I'll show you how we can make this more generic basically how we can have a custom hook for any data. So let's start over here. I'll say fetch person JS, and then let's create that function first. So let's go here with const use fetch and then user or person, sorry. I mean, it can also be a user, of course, correct. Then we want to set up the function body. And first, let's just take a look at our component. So I have is loading is error and user, all of these three state values. 
can we move them to a custom hook? Yes, of course, because essentially what's happening here, we just set up a use effect and eventually we get back the user or of course, if there is an error. So let's try that. First, I guess let's grab these imports and I'll right away basically cut them out. We won't use them in this file. Set it over here. Then we pretty much want to take the whole thing. Yep, it's that drastic. So I want to first take these state values, set it up over here, set up the function, and then we want to grab the use effect. This whole thing over here. Let's cut it out as well and copy and paste. Like I said, this hook is going to be looking for that URL. Now, of course, if you know that you're going to be using the same URL, you can hard code in the use fetch person. But if you want to make it more dynamic, set up the parameter. So in here, I'll say, whenever I invoke use fetch person, I'm going to be looking for that URL. And of course, in this case, it's this GitHub one. And then we're pretty much done. We just want to return all of these three values. Yes. Effectively, it's that simple. Remember the use toggle in the component? What did we do? Well, we invoked it, correct? So initially, is loading is going to be true. Then we're going to invoke the use effect only after the initial render. And here we have all of this logic where we'll grab the URL, which matches the parameter, we'll fetch the data. If there's an error, we'll return an error. If not, then we'll return a user. So essentially, yes, it's that simple. And here, let's just go with return. And we want to go with is loading. Again, if you want, you can return an array, but especially if I have like three values, that's definitely a good use case for a object in my opinion. Let's go here. And then we also want to return a user. And then we want to navigate back to fetch data. And essentially in here, we just want to go use fetch. For some reason, it's not importing. That's fine. Let's just pass in the URL. And remember, this one is returning three things. Is loading, is error, and if there is a user, correct? So we go here, we set it equal to, and then we just check for is loading. Same goes for is error. And then we have the user. And now million dollar question, which one is easier to read? If you have use fetch person or you have all of these lines of code. And as a side note, the reason why nothing worked, actually I didn't export that, my bad. So I'm gonna go here with export default and then use fetch person. Let's do this and then back in the fetch data. Of course, we wanna import that. So I'm gonna go here with use fetch and I'll cheat a little bit where I'll grab the import, but I'll remove this line of code because otherwise I'm going to get the error. So now everything should work again. Notice we have nice loading one. If there's an error, we'll get an error and eventually we get the user. So that's how we can set up a custom hook with more complex example. And as a side note, whenever you'll start working with React query or other fetching libraries, the setup is going to be extremely similar. That's why I thought that it's very important for us to understand how fetching works with use effect. Of course, those libraries do way more than just this. They do caching and all kinds of cool things, but the idea is going to be the same. You're going to get some kind of custom hook from the library. That hook is going to be looking for some parameters. And of course, it depends on the library, what parameters the hook is looking for. And essentially, you'll get back bunch of useful info about the request and you can use that info to set up conditions to access the data and all of that cool stuff and lastly as far as the custom hooks let me show you how we can make our function more generic basically our use fetch person because i mean chances are we'll probably want to fetch more than just a user for example, we want to fetch an array or something along those lines. So again, the functionality pretty much is going to stay the same. We'll just change some names and what we're returning from the function. And as a result, we'll be able to use the custom fetch hook with pretty much any data, not just with a 
user object. So let's try this one out where first I want to navigate to the star. I'll create a new file and I'll call this use fetch. Pretty generic, correct? And then pretty much I want to take the whole thing one by one. We'll just change some values. So copy and paste over here. And instead of user, why don't we call this data? I think that's pretty generic, correct? So data and set data. And as far as default value, I'll still keep it as a null. Then we want to change around the name. It's not going to be fetch user. I'll actually call this fetch data. And I just need to remind myself that pretty much everywhere where I have fetch user, I want to also rename it to a fetch data. So fetch data here, and then we also invoke it. Now, I don't have user anymore. I have the data. So instead of user from this hook, I'm returning a data. And then lastly, notice over here, as far as the response, I'm calling this a user. Well, we can come up with response. So that's going to be pretty generic where I'm going to go with set data and I'll set it equal to response. Now let's save it. We want to navigate to fetch data and let me double check. Yep. Of course I have a mess up here. It's not fetch person. I'm going to go with use and then fetch and same over here. Now, technically this should work because the export is default, but I'm going to rename that. And then back in the fetch data, instead of use person, I'll remove this and we want to set it from the scratch where I'm going to go with use and then fetch. And we still want to pass in the URL. Now you're probably wondering, okay, but what about the user? Since that's what we're using in this component. Well, we're not getting back any more user. This is actually data. So we have two options. You can remove the user and go with data, but then just keep in mind that everywhere where you have reference to a user, you also need to use data, or you can simply add an alias. Again, a JavaScript thing where I'm saying, yeah, I want to grab the data out of the use fetch. However, in this component, I'm going to call this a user. That's it. Notice everything still works. Well, in this case, we have the generic one, which effectively we can take from project to project. And then every time we want to get some data, we just invoke the use fetch, pass in the URL. And if everything's correct, we have no errors. Once we're done loading, we'll get back the data. And up next, let's discuss context API. And we're going to start actually with a challenge where I want you to see the pain of prop drilling and the challenge is following. First, you want to navigate to the star in zero nine context API and create three components, create navbar JSX, then nav links, which you want to nest inside of the navbar and then user container which you want to nest inside of the navlinks one. So yes, I don't want you to nest user container and navlinks inside of the navbar. No, our use case is going to be navbar component, which basically is our parent. Then the child is navlinks. And then the user container is nested inside of the navlinks. So essentially we have this three level structure. Now, after that, once you have the basic setup in place, I want you to import navbar JSX in the app JSX. Now, as far as my solution, I'm going to remove the container just so it looks like a navbar because I have all that padding in the container and all that, and it doesn't look very good if I place that navbar. But you don't have to do that. And also, don't worry about the CSS. The main goal of this challenge is to work on a logic. If your example doesn't look exactly like mine, don't worry about it. Again, we're just focusing on the functionality. So once you have that nested structure, then in the nav bar, I want you to set up a user state value. The default is going to be an object with some kind of name property. Again, whatever you want to place over here, as well as the logout function that sets the user back to null. Now, I want to pass both of them down to a user container. And just to give you a hint, yes, you will have to pass 
those values through the nav links. Now in the user container, I want you to display user as well as the button. And then once the user clicks the button, I want to set it equal to null. Now there's an extra challenge. You can also use conditional rendering. And basically, if the user is null, then you can display please login. Notice over here, that's the final example. But again, this is an extra challenge. Our main focus is to get both of these values down from the nav bar to a user component. And once you're ready to compare the results, resume with the videos. Okay, so let's start working on a challenge. First, I want to navigate to that folder. So again, we're looking for context. We're not looking for the final one. We'll start working the star and we want to set up those components. Let's start with the main one. So navbar JSX. Let's set up the component. Okay, awesome. And then we want to do the same thing for the nav links as well as the what was the name? I believe I named it user container. Yep, that's the one. So let's continue. I'm going to go with nav links JSX again, create the component. Okay, awesome. And then lastly, we want to create that user container, user container JSX again, set up the component, let's save. Now, remember, we have nested structure. So I want to go to nav bar and first grab the nav links. So in the nav bar, I will add a class here of nav bar just for styles. So I'll say here nav. Let's add the CSS and the class is nav bar. And then in here, inside of the nav bar, I'll have the heading five with some kind of logo. So in this case, I'll go with context API. And then I also want to grab those nav links. So let's set up that component and we want to import them like so. Let's save. Now I don't see anything because of course in here I'm importing the complete one. So now I right away want to go, I guess, to the app JSX and want to grab the nav bar from the star. So again, we'll have two of them. And like I said, I'm not placing anything inside of the container. And since I still want to showcase the final one, I think I'm going to go with the react fragment. So I'm going to go here with star. Then it's not coming from the final. It's actually coming from the star. And then let me set up that fragment first. And then inside of the fragment, we'll place a final. So that's going to be on the top. And then we'll have the star. Let's save it. And I actually get the error because in the final one, I'm looking for context. And of course, at the moment, there is no context. Now, if you're wondering about the folder structure, notice the final one, there's going to be two examples. There's going to be a prop drilling, which is the one that we're going to be working on right now. So if you ever want to compare the results, look for prop drilling, and then there's going to be the context one. So that's going to be our complete example with context API. So in here, I need to change the path where it's not going to be context. It's actually going to be a star and then nav bar. Let me save it. This should do it. And now notice. So I have context API. That's my logo. And I have the nav links. So up next, I want to go to a nav links and I want to set up the logic as well. And in here, it's going to be a div with nav container. And then inside of it, we'll have an ordered list with nav links and then the user container. So I guess let's start by setting up that div. We do want to add a class of nav container. And then let's go with that unordered list. So this is where we'll display those links. So unordered list, then let's call this nav links. And in here, list item. And I'm just going to go with an href. And for the time being, I'm just going to pass in the hashtag. So we're not going to go anywhere. And then let's copy and paste. And this one is going to be about. Now, after the unordered list, I want to display that user container. So again, let's use the auto imports. Let's grab the user container. And now notice I have the links and I also have the user container. And before we 
set up any kind of logic in the user container, I want to set up those values in the nav bar. And effectively, I want to set up the state value, the user, and I also want to get the logout one. So let's go over here. Let me close the sidebar. I'm going to go with use state. Like I said, the default value is going to be that object. In my case, the name will be Bob. So name is equal to a Bob. Now, what are we getting back? Well, we want to get back the array, the user, and set user. Now, we also want to set up right away what? The logout one. So const logout. And as far as the function in here, we want to go with set user and set it back to no. And like I said, the main challenge here is to get both user and logout down to a user container. So not just to the nav links, but the user container. How we can do that? Well, since we can only pass props down, we go to a nav links and we come up with a prop. So I'm going to go with user is equal to user and then logout is equal to a logout. Let's save that. Now we want to go to a nav links. And essentially, yes, even though we're not using any of these props in the nav links component, we'll have to grab them and we'll have to pass them down to a user container. So it's not an official name, but effectively it's called prop drilling, where you're passing through the components that are actually not using those props, because again, we can only pass props down. And as you can see, in this case, we only have what? Three levels. Basically, we have parent, child, and let's call it grandchild. But it's pretty normal in the application to have five, six, or whatever levels. So probably your next question is, are we going to have to do that? Well, yeah. If we're not using the state libraries or the context API, which we're going to cover in the following videos, essentially, that's the setup. There's no way around it. So let's go back over here. Let's say that I'm going to be looking for a user and a logout. And yep, the same deal. I want to go with user is equal to a user. And I probably don't have to say that. Of course, you can name this prop differently, but I just find it convenient if we go with the same name. So I'm going to go with logout is equal to a logout. And then in the user container, this is finally where we're going to use them. So again, same deal. We go with user. And we want to set up the logout. And now let's work on pretty straightforward JSX where I'm going to set up a div. I'm going to add a class name of user container. And then inside of it, for now, I'm not going to render anything conditionally. I'll just say, hey, grab me the user and also set up a logout button. So I'm going to have a paragraph with hello there, comma. Then let's grab the user. And remember the property is name. And then right after the paragraph, we will set up a button. So button class name is going to be a button. And then on click, it's going to be equal to our logout one. So logout here. And as far as the text, let's just go with logout. Let's save. And notice I have Bob. And once I click, I actually set this equal to null. Now, I'm going to have an error here because once the user essentially is null, then of course we cannot access the name property. And in order to avoid this error, remember we have the optional chaining where I can say, hey, listen, if the user exists, then grab the name. If not, then just return undefined. So now notice once I click, hello there, and basically I have nothing there because the value is undefined. And I also want to add to uppercase, just to showcase that we can use multiple optional chaining operators. And I'm going to go with two upper and case here. Let's save it. So I'm saying if there's a user, grab the name. If there's a name, then set it to an uppercase. So now once I refresh, notice I have Bob. And then again, once I click, I have nothing. And then lastly, let's set up that conditional rendering where if the user exists, then of course, I want to provide the paragraph and the button. However, if there's no user, I simply want to go with please login. 
And for that, I'll first set up a paragraph. I'll say, please log in. And then above both of them, for now, I'm going to go user. And remember, we go with question mark. And then we have two options. So first, if it's true, we return something. And then if it's false. So let's start here by cutting this out. But there's another gotcha. If you copy and paste, there's actually going to be an error. Because notice we have effectively two adjacent elements and we can only return one. Now, the way around that is again, either to set up a div or we can go with a fragment, copy and paste, and now everything works. And then in here, since I'm returning only one, cut it out and I can set it up. So now notice, since the user is null, I have login, or once I have the user, I have their hello there, Bob. And once I click, now essentially I log out the user. Now, pretty much most of the functionality we already covered at some point during the fundamentals and tutorial. Like I mentioned already previously, the main reason for this challenge was to give you a first-hand experience of such nested structure. So if you do have a component, a parent, and you have the nested structure where you have some kind of child and that child has child on its own and you want to pass something down from the parent to let's say grandparent let's call it that then you will have to pass the props through all of the components even though technically this component is not using any of these two props all right and now let's take a look how we can use context api which is provided by react to essentially solve our issue like I mentioned already in a previous video, if you want to see the exact example we just completed, look for prop drilling. So in the context one, you'll actually see the setup, which we're going to work on right now. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that, because I'll remove essentially the user and logout from the nav links, as well as the nav bar and user container. So we'll start from the scratch. So keep in mind that you ever need a reference it's right over here in the final so one by one let's remove them because that's not how we're going to pass them down so let's remove over here let's save then we want to do the same thing in the now links effectively we're looking for a way to bypass this one or multiple components that we have sitting in between the main one the parent and then whichever component wants to use those values so let's remove this and I'll probably have an error right now. So you know what? Let me just return something else for now. Again, we'll remove this. I just don't want React to start looking for the user value and all that. Let's just go with return and we'll go with hello world. Let's save it. We should be good to go. Now, how we can pass those values down without doing the prop drilling? Well, like I said, we need to use context API. Now there's multiple ways how again we can invoke this. If you have React imported, you can go with React and then create context. But again, you'll have to import React, of course. Notice once I save, I'll have big fat error because React is not defined, just like with use state. Or we can right away import that, correct? So since we already have use state, we can go with create context. And essentially in the parent, we want to invoke that create context. And this is going to return two things. It's going to return a provider component and a consumer component. However, since there is a use context hook, I mean, there's really no need for the consumer. However, we will use the provider. So first, I want to go above the nav bar and I'll right away export since eventually we will import the context i'm about to create in the user container that's why i right away go with export and then const and come up with a name and since we're working in the nav bar i mean kind of makes sense if i name this nav bar context and that one is going to be equal to create context we can pass in the default value but we're not going to do that and essentially once we invoke this we get back a bunch of useful stuff and we can log that one here so if we go here with context, 
we should see a bunch of cool things in a console. Let me just clean it out. Notice, essentially, this is what we're getting back, but our main interest is in this provider. That's what we definitely want to get. Again, we used to use consumer, but now use context hook, which we're about to cover actually replaced it. So there's no need for it anymore. And basically, if we go here with dot notice, I have these options and the provider is what we're looking for. So we want to grab that provider and go to a main parent, basically, the component, which is going to provide those values. And we want to wrap the return in that provider. So we go to our nav bar. And as I said, I think I can just move this. And then we want to wrap our nav in the nav bar context. That's the name dot and then the provider. Now, what's really cool that provider has a value prop. And essentially, whatever you'll pass over here, you'll have access anywhere in that tree. Again, we have three components, but please keep in mind, you can have a setup with 15 components. So anywhere in that component tree, you'll have access to this value. Now, you can simply go here with hello, and you'll be able to pass it. However, as you're looking at it, you're probably thinking, well, what's the use case of hello? I mean, it's nice that I can access it in the user container, but that's not what I'm looking for. And you're absolutely correct. So here's what we can do. We can turn this value into an object. So please keep in mind, this is not a special syntax. Again, I'm just simply going back to a JavaScript land and I'll set it up as an object. That's it. This is not a special syntax for double curlies. I keep getting these questions in the course Q&A. So I really want to stress that. I simply want to set up an object. And if you want to make it more readable, you can set it up over here. You can create an object and then pass it directly here in a value. If that's easier for you to read. Now, I'm not going to do that, but just an option. So I have an object. And now notice, effectively, I can pass both of them down here in this object as properties. We can say user is equal to user and a logout is equal to a logout. Let's save that. And now we need to go to a user container and notice how we're nicely bypassing the nav links and we want to grab those values. And for that, we'll need two things. We'll need a nav bar context. That's why we're exporting. And also we'll need a use context hook from the React. So let's navigate to a user container. And in here, let's import both of those things, the use context, as well as nav bar context. So I'm going to go for now above the return again, I don't want to get the error. And essentially, we want to go with use context hook, which is a special hook, which is looking for that context. Again, this is coming from react, just like use state use effect and all that. And we want to pass in that nav bar context or whatever context you have. So the one that's in the parent, whatever you create over here, you export, and then the use context is going to be looking for that. So in here, I can go with nav bar and context. And since my auto imports are working, we're good to go. Now, what is this returning? Well, let's go back to a nav bar. What are we setting up over here? An object, correct? So let's try this one out. I'm going to come up with a variable and I'll set it equal to a value. And you'll notice nicely in the console that we have access to that object. So I have user with the name property as well as the logout one. So in my JSX, I can either go with dot and then grab the logout or user, or we can do the structuring, right? So instead of grabbing the value, I'll say, yep. I know for sure that I'm getting back the object. So let's go here with user and then the logout. And now, of course, I simply want to return hello world and everything is going to work like peaches. And again, the main goal here is to bypass the nav links. Notice nav links is not getting any props. It's not passing any props. I'm getting everything directly here in the user container and my functionality still works. And since we just covered custom hooks, 
why don't we put our knowledge to a good use? So notice in the user container, we are getting use context and we're getting that navbar context. And essentially in any component all throughout your application, I mean, in this case, of course, it needs to be nested inside of the navbar, but in the following videos, I'll show you how we can set up a global context. Hopefully that is clear pretty much anywhere where I want to use that. Yes, I'll have to grab these two things. I'll have to grab the use context as well as the navbar context. Now, this is a good use case for a custom hook. So instead of these two imports, I can set up one custom hook and then just import that. So back in the navbar, I first want to come up with a name. In my case, I'm going to call this use app context, but sky's the limit. So let me add here custom hook. And then effectively, we want to export that because same deal, we will use it. So const and then call it use. So notice we're still using the use. So that doesn't change. Otherwise, the stuff is not going to work. Use app context. That's my function. And what do I want to do from this function? I simply want to return use context, which I'm importing over here, and the navbar context. So effectively, this line over here. So first, let me navigate back. I'll remove both of them from this user container, just so you can see that I'm not messing with you. Let me go to a navbar. Copy and paste. We don't, of course, need a navbar context, but we will need this use context in the navbar one. And as far as the logic, we just want to invoke this use context once, and we want to provide the navbar context. So I'm going to go with use context, and then I'll provide navbar context. So now I want to save. And again, keep in mind we're exporting this. So now in the user container, I can replace this use context with use and then app context. Now, please keep in mind that there's also one in the final. So don't grab that one. Just set up this one over here. Let's save it. And then notice how our functionality still works. And if you're looking at it and you're like, well, this just saved us one line of code. Keep in mind when you use context globally, again, something that we're going to cover in the next video, you'll be accessing that context quite a few times. And then it's much easier to just use one hook instead of importing the use context as well as that particular context each and every time you want to access it in the component. Okay. Um, now let's see how we can set up a global context. Basically how we can provide some data to all components in our application. Now for this one, I will create a new application just because I want to set up everything from scratch. And if you want to access my final application, basically the application I'm about to create, I will add it to the main repo in the Z assets folder. So as I'm recording this video, of course, that folder does not exist. But by the time you're watching the video, just go to the main repo, effectively where you got the advanced react and then the last folder should be there. And the name is going to be Z assets. And in there, you'll find this application. Now, if you're interested, you can also try to set it up yourself, in the global context. And here are the steps. I'm going to create a new application with feet. And we're going to go with npm create and blah, 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 blah. Then we'll install dependencies and run npm run dev to spin up the dev server in the source, create a context JSX file and set up two things, a global context with create context and a component, which I'm going to name app context with one state value. Now, from the app context, return a global context dot provider, the component, and then wrap the entire application, which we're going to do in the main JSX. And there's going to be a gotcha. Effectively, we'll have to jog our memory on the children prop. So if you're struggling to set this up, this is totally fine. Now, once we have wrapped our entire application, then we want to set up a custom hook. 
so we don't have to import two of those things when we want to access the context and then just try it in app JSX. There's going to be app JSX and in there just try to log whatever you have in the value prop in the global context provider. And if you can see some value, that means that it's going to work everywhere in our application. So let's get cracking. And I think I'm just going to copy and paste. There's no need for you to watch me how I type this. So I'm just going to go with CD desktop. And let me massively zoom in, copy and paste again, npm create beat latest, then global context. That's the name of the application dash dash or hyphen hyphen space dash dash template. And then we want to go with react one. So once that is done, I'm going to open up a new window because I might want to showcase something in readme. And this is again, totally optional but I'll set them side by side. So there's my browser. That's my text editor. Let me open up the integrated terminal. We want to go with npm install. And we also want to go with npm start or I'm sorry, it's not create react app, we want to go with npm run dev. And I know I already have said this quite a few times. But if both of those commands don't work, one after another, just run them separately, the result is going to be exactly the same. And once I open up 5173, this is what we should see on screen. And since we're now familiar with the use state, this shouldn't look very foreign. We have count, set count, use state. And what do you know, every time I click on a button, I'm increasing the count. So now let's set up that global context. Please do that in a source. So don't do it in a public or the node modules. Let's create a new file here. And I'm going to call this context. So new file. Let's go with context and JSX. And first, I guess let's set up that global one. So first, let's go with const. I'm not going to export that because there's going to be a global hook, basically a custom hook that's going to set up everything. So I'm going to go with global context, and that is equal to create context. And we just want to invoke that. That's the first step. After that, we want to set up the component, which we're going to return from this file. And I'm going to call this app context. That's going to be my function here. As far as what we're returning, well, we're going to return a global context dot provider. Correct. So let's go with return keyword. And then let's set up that global context dot provider. And for now, we don't have anything in there. So we're not going to set up the value. And as far as what are we going to set up in between the component tags? Well, that's the gotcha that we're going to discuss in a second. So for now, don't return anything. And of course, we do want to export that. So export default. And we're looking for app, app context. Okay, good. Before we set up the value, why don't we also create the actual state value? In my case, simply going to be name and set name. And as far as the default value, I'm going to go with Peter. Okay, good. And then remember, there was a special prop on this provider, and the name was value. I do want to pass in the object in here. And inside of the object, there's going to be a name property, and also a set name property. Let's save that. Now both of them are effectively passed down. But of course, we haven't wrapped our entire application, correct. And as a side note, I don't know whether I covered this before. But in ES6, essentially, we can do the shortcut. So if you're looking at it and you're like, I don't understand how are we passing here name equals to name? Well, if we have this kind of setup, where the property name is basically equal to a variable and the same over here. So set name is equal to set name, we can shorten this up. Again, if you have this kind of setup, then essentially, you can shorten this up and just type one. In this case, name and set name. Okay, good. 
we have covered that. So now let's navigate to the main JSX because we want to wrap our entire application, effectively our app component, and it's located over here. So unlike the nav bar, where effectively we imported a nav links and then the user container inside of the nav links, now we want to wrap our entire application. So we're not going to import, for example, app over here. No, we want to go to main JSX. We want to import our app context. So the import is in place. And now this is really up to you. If you don't want the strict mode, if you don't want those extra logs and all that, you can simply remove it or just place the app context within the strict mode. Just please don't wrap the React strict mode in the app context. That's not going to make sense. So we want to go here. We want to set up a app context. And yes, I'm basically creating a new component. And I'll just remove this one over here. So now we're good to go. But there's one gotcha. The moment we save, we're going to see nothing on the screen. And if you're wondering why is that happening? Well, remember long, 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 long time ago, we talked about the children prop. I believe it was all the way back in the fundamentals. And at the moment, if we take a look at the context, notice we have nothing in here. So of course I can type here context and everything's going to be fine. It's going to be displayed on the screen, but essentially that's not the goal. So I want to grab that app component. And then since all my components are going to meet over here in the app, I want to wrap it in the provider. And as a result, all my components are going to have access to, in this case, name and set name. How we can do that? Well, I kind of already gave you a hint. Since app right now is within the component tags, now we want to go back to context. And essentially, we want to access the children. We have a few ways we can go here with props. And then instead of the silly context, I can set up curlies and we can go to props dot children or of course we can just shorten this up and set up the structuring and as you can see the moment i save everything's correct so now everything is going to work again this is totally up to you if you want to go with props in my case i'm going to go with children here and then i can remove the props as well before we go to app jsx let's also set up that custom hook. In this case, I'm going to export it right away and I'll call it use global context. That's my custom hook. As far as the functionality, I want to invoke use context. So please be careful. Most likely VS code will try to invoke the same one, the use global context. We don't want to do that. Essentially, we want to go with use context, which is coming from React. Again, this is a special hook that is looking for one thing and one thing only. It's looking for the context you want access to. In this case, it's going to be a global context. Since we're exporting this, I can nicely hop over to app JSX. I know that I'm getting back the object, correct? So I'm just going to go here, const, and destructure it right away. I'm not going to look for set name. Hopefully it's clear that I'll have access to both of them. And that is going to be equal to my huge global context and I just invoke it. And just to showcase that everything works, I'm going to log name. So if I go right now to my dev tools, I'll see Peter, which means that any component that is going to be in the app where basically all our components meet, it will have access and not only those components, but if I have any components inside of those components. So hopefully that is clear. This is how we can set up a global context using context API. And also hopefully you see how useful is our custom hook, where now we don't need to do those two imports in every file. Essentially, we just grab the use global context and we're good to go. Okay. And next let's cover use reducer hook. And essentially you could think of use reducer as a light version of Redux, one of the most famous state management libraries out there. So here's the deal. As your application grows in size, it's going to be very hard to manage everything with just 
use state, especially if you have multiple developers working on the project. That's where state management libraries like Redux come into play, since they provide much needed structure and set of rules, which in a perfect world leads to less bugs and easier code management. The problem with such libraries is that they require quite a bit of boilerplate code and some time to get used to the terminology. So React released use reducer hook. And I like to think of use reducer as a middle ground between using full blown state library and just using use state. Now, a few more things before we begin exploring user reducer. First, don't get frustrated if some of this stuff looks foreign and weird. It's perfectly normal. It simply takes time and few projects to get used to use reducer or any state management library for that matter. Second, because I have to introduce quite a few new weird sounding terms like dispatch and reducer and the action, I purposely picked the example we already worked on. And we'll just refactor it to use reducer. Hopefully that way it's going to be easier to grasp all of the funky use reducer terminology. And lastly, please don't think that from now on you only have to use use reducer or even more drastic, refactor all your existing apps to use Reducer. It's a tool that has a very specific purpose. And as you work on the bigger projects, you'll definitely notice when there's need for it. Basically, when it's a good time to implement Use Reducer or completely switch your app to state management library like Redux Toolkit. Okay. And as far as the setup, we're looking for folder 10, user reducer. We want to grab the star and we're looking for user reducer. And essentially, if you take a look at the file and folder structure, you'll see that we have only one file. So I want you to grab that starter in the app JSX. For now, I have commented it out because I want to showcase something. So essentially, grab the starter. And if you navigate to the file, you'll notice that it's one of the projects we worked on before. And effectively, we covered that in use state when we talked about the arrays. So this is the same exact example where we're importing the data. We set this using use state. So that's our default one. And then we display all the people. And then we have an option to remove specific person or clear the list. Like I said, I purposely picked this example because I think it's going to be easier to grasp all of the use reducer concepts since you don't need to worry about this functionality. We already covered it before. And let's start with a tiny challenge. I want you to add to this one a reset functionality. Now, don't worry, we're not going to do that right away with use reducer. We'll simply do it by just adding a function. And in that function, essentially, I want to set back the state to an array. And once you have the function, I want you to set up a button. And once the user clicks the button, then we set basically the empty array to all of the items. And I want you to render that button conditionally. A hint you'll most likely use the ternary operator. So notice two options, either I remove them one by one. And once I have the clear list, I have now reset button, which essentially sets it back to all of the items, or we can simply clear it and the same deal. The moment I have empty list, I want to have a reset button, which essentially sets it back to our default people array. So first, let's work on that and then we'll implement user reducer. Essentially, I just wanted to add a little bit more functionality, just so it's more interesting when we cover use reducer. Okay, I'm done with my big speech. Let me navigate here, use reducer. Hopefully I'm in the correct one. Yep, it's in the star. And essentially, let me just set up the function. I think it's gonna be faster if I just copy and paste. 
I'm looking for the function name, which usually is the most hardest thing in the programming. So let's go here with a reset list. And instead of empty array, what do I need to do? Well, I already have the data, correct? So I just pass here. This is an empty one. This just resets to our original array. And then we want to keep on moving, keep on moving. I have this button. Now I need to set up a functionality where once the list is empty, I'll display one button. And if I have some values, then I'll have the clear one. How do we do that? Well, we go here with the curlies and what is going to be our condition, people and length. Correct? Let me double check. Yep. That's my state value. So don't set this as data. That's a little bit different. That's our original array. And here we're looking for people. And I'll say if it's less than one, I have two options. What is my first one? Well, that's a reset one, correct? Because this is the one that is displayed if it's less than one, then I want to reset. And I'll work on that one in a second. And now let me check if this is false. Basically, if I have some items, I want to display this button. So let me cut this one out. Okay, good. That's my first one. And basically, I'll use the same structure. So I'll just copy and paste over here. I just need to change some values around where the text inside of the button is not going to be clear, it's going to be reset. And instead of clearing the list, what do we need to do? Yep, it's correct, we need to go with reset. So now check it out. Again, two options. I think I'll pick this one just because it's faster. And notice now I can reset. Now, of course, I'm showing this because I already have the complete application in my app.js. My apologies. Notice here I have the star. I will, I guess, remove the final. There's no need. Hopefully I didn't make some egregious errors. Let me save. Notice that the result is exactly the same. So that's already a good start. I can remove. Yep. I can reset and I can also clear. So that was the first challenge. And up next, we'll get to know use reducer. All right. So now let's refactor our application to use reducer. Since there are going to be multiple steps, of course, we're not going to do that in one video. But let's just do a basic setup. And right out of the get go, I can say that most likely, this video is going to be the most difficult one. Because unfortunately, I'll have to throw multiple terms at you right out of the gate. Unfortunately, there's no other way. In order just to create that setup, I need to provide you values. And yes, they have funky names. So my apologies. And if something sounds weird, my best suggestion is just to rewatch the video a few times. And hopefully by doing so, you'll understand the stuff better. Now, eventually we'll remove this one. But since I don't want to have some massive errors on the screen, since I think it might get distracting. For now, I'll just leave this one over here. Again, eventually this is going to be gone. What I do want to do for now is just comment out this functionality, because we'll move this one to a reducer, a function we're about to create. So it's not going to be sitting here anyway. And I don't want that functionality to run. So let's just comment this one out. So as the user clicks any of the buttons, nothing should happen. And that's exactly what I want. So in order to get started with use reducer, first, we need to grab the hook, correct? So we go over here. Now, of course, we can do the auto import and all that. But why don't we change this around and just say use reducer again, all of this is coming from react. Now, when it comes to use state, what do we pass in? We pass in the default state, correct? Now, with use reducer, it's a little bit more complex, we need to pass in two things, we need to pass in a default state, and we need to provide a reducer effectively a function that is going to manipulate the state. Like I said, right away, many funky terms. Now keep in mind that it's just a convention to call this reducer, you can call this banana pudding, it's totally fine. But yes, most likely you'll always see the reducer. So let's start working on that. I'm going to go to use reducer, I invoke the hook. And yes, eventually we'll set up the values that we're getting back for now. Let's just worry what we need to pass in. Like I said, two things, a reducer function, and a default state. 
So first, let's come up with that function. I'm going to go with const then. You simply want to create a empty arrow function. That's all you need to do. The hardest part probably is going to be coming up with a name. That's why I'll stick with convention and I'll just say reducer, not a vegan food truck. So reducer here. And for now, let's just try it with empty one. I'm not sure maybe we'll right away have to pass in the state, but let me just try with an empty one. So this is an empty function. That's our reducer. This is where we'll control essentially our entire state. So we need to pass this one first. So then we need to pass in the default state. Now, default state can be anything. However, in my case, it's just going to be an object with a people property, which is going to be equal to the data. So pretty much whatever we have over here. But yes, normally you have multiple things in there. You can have, is the modal open? Have you fetched the data? Is it loading and all that kind of stuff? And while we're working on a project, you'll definitely see that. For now, let's just start very simply and create that default state. So I'm going to go here with const and you know what? I think I'm just going to move this one up because pretty much once we set up that default state, there's not going to be much work in there. But reducer, yes, will do quite a few things in there. So let me just move this one up default state. So that's the second thing you'll always, always need to provide. And of course, keep in mind one thing, just because initially you add people doesn't mean that you cannot add later, for example, is loading. So as your application grows, essentially, you just keep adding these items in a default state. That's how it works. So don't worry that pretty much prior to setting up your whole application, you need to right away come up with a state. No, keep in mind, you can keep adding things. That's perfectly fine. And all of them eventually will be over here as our default state. So let's pass it. I'm going to go with default state. And we're pretty much done with this part. So now let's move on the other side of the equation over here. Remember with use state, what did we get back? A people and set people, right? So a state value and a function. It's very similar with use reducer. However, we're getting back a state and we're getting back a dispatch. So the main idea is the same, but the implementation is a little bit different. So let's try this one out. I'm going to go with const. Yes, it's still an array, but this time it's not just one state value. This is our entire state. So if I'll have 50 values in here, yep, it's going to be represented here in the state. Now, again, in my case, I only have people, but I want to stress one more time. You can have a bunch of values and all of them will be represented here with this state. Now, since this is an object, how we can access things in our application? Well, state dot, state dot, state dot. Hopefully that is clear. Now, the second thing is the dispatch. So we're going to go here with dispatch. Again, this is a naming convention. A Bobo is also a nice alternative. And yes, this function is updating the state. But here's the biggest gotcha. Here's the biggest difference between use state and the use reducer. When we talk about dispatch, we'll have to do this somewhat funny uh, syntax where let me keep moving and show you that. So when it comes to dispatch, we'll need to do this. We'll basically go dispatch, we'll invoke it like so, and then we'll pass the type in. Now, all of that is coming up. I'm just showing you that Essentially, the idea is the same. Yes, we are updating the state. However, this is not happening directly. So remember with set people or any of the set functions in use state, we just invoke them and this immediately changed the value of people. That's not how it works with user reducer. So that's where that structure comes into play. You cannot just willy nilly come in here and start updating the state. No, what you'll do, you'll dispatch, you'll pass in the action, basically what you want to do. And then it's going to go through the reducer. And then whatever we get back here from the reducer, it's going to be our new state. So yes, multiple steps and multiple new terms. Like I said, this is probably going to be the hardest video because I just have to cover these things. Unfortunately, there's no way I can show you a user reducer setup without talking about them. That's not going to make sense. 
So let me try this. I might need to pass in state. I kind of want to leave it for later videos, but if I'll get some bugs, of course, we'll have to at least talk about it a little bit. So this is going to be our initial setup. Now we can bravely take this one out. So we won't need it anymore. That's it. We can remove it. And then remember, we have people now. Do we have a state value now? Well, not really, right? So what do we have? We have state and in there I have the people. So let's keep on moving. And you know what? I'll just log so you can see the state. But since again, I don't want to have some unnecessary errors, I can tell you right away that in the state we have the people. And now instead of accessing the people directly, we're grabbing the state. So here's the deal. As far as access, yes, we still do the good old state value. And then since this is an object, we're grabbing some particular property. But the update is not going to be like this. You're not going to go, hey, um, let's update the people array in the state. Let's create new people and set state.people equal to that. No, that's not how it's going to work. We'll have to use the dispatch. It's going to go through the reducer and all that shebang. So let's keep on moving. And in here, I also have people and I just want to add state. Again, let me see whether we're getting back the error. If we don't return state, we might. So let me save. And if everything is correct, then I will talk about these suckers in the next video the state and action that we need to pass in. And nope, everything seems to be working. And check it out. So this is my state object. And this is my array, correct? So state object, I have people. And now everywhere in my application, I basically grab these values, whatever they are. Again, in our case, it's just the people, but there can be more things in there. So that's the general setup for use reducer. And in the following videos, of course, we'll start talking about how we can update this state because it's nice to have a default state, but obviously we want to implement some functionality. Okay, we have the initial setup in place. Up next, let's talk about how we can implement some functionality. And like I already probably mentioned 10,000 times in a previous video, essentially when it comes to use reducer or again, since it's a Redux light, effectively the same functionality works in Redux. You want to dispatch something called action, and that action is going to be handled here in the reducer. And then whatever gets returned from the reducer is going to be the new state. So here's the deal. By default, this function, whatever we set over here, whether that is a vegan food truck or banana pudding or bobo, or whatever, it gets two things. It gets state. So that is the state right before the update and the action. Basically, what are we trying to do? And since those are parameters, we simply go to state. Again, just a convention and an action. Okay, hopefully we're clear on that. And now let's see how we can change something in that state. Basically, how we can implement some functionality. Because what we need to understand, it was the same deal over here. When we, for example, remove the item, we just change the state value. And essentially, we want to do it over here as well. We just don't want to do it directly. You want to do it through the reducer. And you can pick any of the functions. I think I'll start with clear list because in my opinion, it's going to be the easiest one to grasp. And essentially, if we want to update something, if we want to change that state value, we go here with dispatch. And like I said, we have this somewhat funky syntax where we invoke the dispatch, but dispatch is looking for an object and we must, 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 must provide type over here, type property. Yes, you just have to do that. I didn't make that one up. And as far as the type, it's equal to a string. So I can say here, do something, or I can type whatever string value I want and I'll handle that in the reducer. Now a convention is to use all uppercase and actually assign a variable to this one. I'll show you in a separate video why we want to assign a variable. For now, let's just stick with convention. And what are we doing over here? We are clearing the list, right? So yes, essentially, I would go with clear and then list. 
this is just a convention. You can write it in camel case, you can write it all in lower case. That's totally up to you. Just remember that you'll have to handle that here in the reducer. So whichever option you pick, just stick with it. Otherwise, it's going to be very confusing. And don't be surprised if you are working on a bigger project with other developers and you'll see this syntax. Yes, this is pretty common. So essentially what I'm saying, I want to clear a list. So now this patch is like, okay, reducer, now you handle that. I did my work. I dispatched an action. So back in a reducer, like I said, we have two things. We have the state and we have the action. So state is going to be the state before the update. So once we're done with this function, there's going to be a new state value. Please keep that in mind. And the way we handle that, let's just first log two things. State, or you know what, let's start with an action just to showcase what we have. So notice here, right? So I have my array. Now, once I click, there's a big fat error, and we'll talk about it, why we have nothing on a screen. But for now, let's just focus on this one. So notice here, I have the clear list in line nine. So this is what I'm getting. That's my action. Now, why we have this whole thing, not just type, well, because we can provide more data in here. And you'll see that in a second, once essentially we need to remove a person. So we'll add more things over here. But if we just log this action, this is going to be the object that we're passing in. Now, what are we interested in? Well, we want to get the type, correct? Because we'll do something with that type. That's the one that screams, hey, I want to do something. Now, why do we have this massive error? Well, whatever we're going to return from the reducer is going to be that new state value. So notice this line 27 here, our state. Why is it undefined? Well, because reducer, basically a function by default returns undefined. So this underscores the point. Whatever you'll return here from this reducer will be that state value. So check it out. I can go here with return and I can say shake and bake. Now, I'll still most likely have the error once I click the clear again. Once I save, technically everything is fine, but check it out. I'll have the same error. And again, we can scroll down and we can see that nothing works. Why? Because again, line 28, shake and bake is my people property somewhere in a shake and bake. And of course, the answer is no. So here's what we want to do. First of all, we'll talk about the default returns in a second. But for now, let me just get rid of it. And I'll also remove the console log here. In the reducer, essentially one by one, we'll check for these actions. Yes. If you're wondering, do we have to do this manually? That's correct. That's the setup. We go here with if. Now, quite often you'll see this switch operator used. I actually don't like that approach. Again, switch is an alternative to a bunch of if statements. I actually find if statements more readable. So we go here with if. And then I want to check for action. And remember, the type is the property, correct? So we go with type, and I want to check whether it is equal to. Now, what am I passing here? Clear list. So what do I need to set here? Same deal. Yep, that's correct. So we'll take it here, copy and paste. And that's why I'm saying you can come up with whatever string value you want over here. Just make sure that you use the same one in the reducer. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And then we need to set up the functionality. So whatever we will return from this is going to be my new state value. So how our functionality is going to look like? Well, we'll go with the return because we want to return something. And essentially, I want to spread out the current state values. Why? Well, because even though I'm clearing the list, keep in mind that if I have is loading over here, and let's set it equal to false. What do you think is going to happen if I'll just return empty array? Yes, as far as the people array, my functionality is going to work. But keep in mind, if I'm not going to include this is loading, then essentially a reducer is going to return a new state and that is loading is going to be gone. So just like previously, effectively we want to spread out or copy the current state values. 
So this is the current state before this update, and we want to spread them out. We want to copy them. So now we're also passing this is loading. Otherwise, it's going to be gone. And then we want to overwrite. Then I want to go with, okay, what is going to be the new value of the people? Well, we want to set it equal to an empty array, correct? So we go here with people and check it out. It's not different to what we have already in a clear list. We're just doing that in a reducer. And I really want to stress that point. That's why I picked this particular example. So now let me save it. Let me clear out the console. I have a bunch of errors in there. And now everything should work. Where again, in clear list, we dispatch a specific action called clear list. And then in the reducer, we handle that. I check for action type. I grab the current state, whatever it is. Of course, now we have the default one, but keep in mind that as we add more functionality, of course, it's going to update itself. So the state is going to be the current state before that particular action. And then we return a new value. This is our new state. This is what we'll see. So now let me clear and check it out. Notice everything works here. So there was no error. And notice this is my new state now. So initially I had four items and now I have zero. However, notice how nicely we still keep the is loading. So we did not lose this one over here. So essentially that's the general setup when we want to update something in the state. With dispatch, we need to provide a type, which is going to be our action. We need to tell what we're going to do. And then in the reducer, we handle that type. And whatever we return from the reducer is going to be our new state value. Okay, and before we set up rest of the functionality, let's just talk about the conventions. And first, let's start with actions. Like I already previously mentioned, it can be any string you want. But in order to avoid some weird typos, a convention is to set this one up as a variable. And then you're just avoiding some silly bugs. Just to showcase that if we go back to our, our application, notice in here, I have clear list, but what if in the reducer, I mistyped, and I said, clear lists. Now, do these ones match? And the answer, of course, is no. So now what happens when I clear the list? Well, I'll have big fat error, because we are right now returning undefined. That's the default one, since we're not hitting this condition, correct. And a way around that is effectively to set up variables that have the same name. So if you have clear list, yes, the variable name is also going to be clear list. So why don't we right away set up those variables? We have only three pieces of functionality. So it's going to be pretty quick. I'm going to go with clear list. And that is one is equal to my clear and underscore list. Then I want to do the same for reset, something we're going to work on in the next video. So reset list. Now that one is equal to reset and underscore list. And then lastly, I have remove item. So again, const and remove item. And at the very end of this section, We'll actually set it up in a separate file and we'll import that because that is a pretty typical setup since you're not going to handle everything in just one file. So remove underscore and then item. And now where I'm checking in the reducer as well as in the clear list where I'm dispatching, instead of passing this string directly, I go with clear list. That's my variable which holds string. So this just omits some weird bugs. Let's save this. Let's first double check. We don't want any bugs here. Yep, we can nicely do so. And uh, now let's talk about the state that we're returning from reducer. You see, what if I go to a reset list, something we're going to work on in a second, and just pass some random stuff. Now, this could be because I just haven't created yet the functionality in the reducer to handle that dispatch, or I just 
for some weird reason access the wrong variable. What if I do something along the lines of type and then something? Again, we'll have big fat error, correct? Because we're not handling it here. And essentially we have two approaches. Just to showcase, bam, this is what we'll get. We only have clear list over here. And you can always return a state like so. So I have a bunch of conditions I'll check for reset list, I'll check for remove item and all that. Now, if the action type does not match any of my conditions, I'll simply return a state. So notice, I clear, that should definitely work. And once I reset, technically nothing happens. I'm just returning a state, which was right before the update. And since we did not perform any update, I just return state and call it a day. Now, this is a valid approach. However, how are we going to know if we have a bug? So alternatively, you can actually throw error. And this is very useful because it right away tells you like, something's wrong with your application, you need to check it. And the way we do that, and I think I'm just going to leave this one for your reference just in case. So return state. And the way we throw the error, we go throw new error. Again, this is a JavaScript thing. We're not making this up just because we are in React. Then I'll set up a template string and you'll see in a second why. So I'll say no matching. And essentially, I'll look for the action type action and then type. So I'll access it. And I'll just add here a text action and type. Let's save this. And like I already said, probably 20,000 times, effectively, this just helps me. If I see this, I know that, listen, somewhere, I'm dispatching an action that I'm not handling it. So it's very useful. Notice reset, bam. And at least I can go to console and I can be like, no matching something action type. So let me double check the action that I'm dispatching. So essentially, those are the conventions when it comes to actions, as well as how we handle an action that we're not catching in the reducer. All right. And once we're familiar with the fundamentals, now let's work on a small challenge where you can try to reset the list yourself. So set up a dispatch and handle the action in the reducer. And once you're ready to compare the results, resume with the video. So I'm going to navigate to use reducer. Basically, I'm looking for reset the list instead of something. I'll use my variable. And what is that? Well, that is reset list. Awesome. I'm pretty sure I can remove this one as well as the previous one here. And then let's just scroll up. And inside of the reducer, right after my clear list, I'll set up the reset one. Now, please keep in mind, in this case, order does not matter if I place it before or after clear list. I simply want to check again for action. And I think in order to speed this up, I'll just copy and paste. We're not checking for clear list. We want to go with reset. So now notice how nice it is that we have that variable, which right away grabs me that string. And instead of returning empty, I'll just set it equal to data. That's all we have to do. Again, let's refresh so we don't have the errors in the console. And let's just try it out. Yep, it's empty. And once we click on reset, we set it back to data array. Okay, and we also want to do that with the remove person, our last piece of functionality. And again, if you want to set it up yourself, set up a dispatch and then handle that action in the reducer. A tiny hint, as far as ID, you want to pass it as an extra property in the object, the one that you're passing into a dispatch. So let's get cracking. I'm going to navigate to use reducer. I'm looking for a remove item. And in here we want to go with dispatch. We want to invoke it. We want to pass in the type. And in this case, I'm looking for remove item, comma. And you can definitely pass here the ID, like so. You can go with ID equals to any, because keep in mind that 
if you don't pass the ID, how are you, are you going to know which item you want to remove? I mean, remove item. Okay, but which one? So you can set up the condition, you can even return a state, but it's not going to make sense if you don't have access to that specific ID. And you can pass it like so ID equals to an ID. However, the convention is to call this property a payload, set it equal to an object, even though you're passing in one property, yep, set it up as an object, and then pass the ID, the name, whatever. So let me just showcase the convention. We go with payload. That's our second property. It is an object. Yep. And then in here we go with ID and then equals to an ID. So now let's navigate up. And in the reducer right after reset list, I want to come up with another condition. I'll say if action type. And in this case, I'm looking for remove item. If that is the case, what do I want to do? Well, first, let's just start by returning a state. And I want to showcase where we have that ID right now. So I'm going to go log and then I'm just going to look for action. Let me save. And then you can click on any of them and check it out. You'll see here remove item and then you'll see the payload. So in order to grab that ID, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, my spelling and notice this is even with the extension. So just imagine how well air quotes I'm doing without it. So this is a payload, my bad. And let me save it again. Basically, we want to go with payload and then dot. And then the ID. That's what we have to do. So type is remove item and then the payload over here. So now let's navigate to that condition. And the setup is going to be pretty much the same. I'm going to go with people filter. Right. So of course, I'll have to access it using state. I'm going to get back the new people. And in here, instead of ID, I'll say action, payload, and ID. And of course, I can destructure it. So let me take this one up. There's no need to set it from the scratch. Again, the difference right now is that people is in the state. So we go here with state.people. And the second thing, this ID is located in the action dot payload dot and then the ID. And like I just said before, of course, you can destructure it above. You can look for ID, which is located in the action payload. And as far as what we're returning, well, instead of state, we're going to go with dot 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 state. So we return all of the properties. And then let's set people equal to our new array, which is going to be new people. And that's it. That's all we have to do. Now, again, let me clear, we have a bunch of things in here. It doesn't look like I have any more logs. Pretty sure I can remove this one. And our functionality should work. Check it out. I have the list, I can clear it, I can reset, and I can move them one by one. We get to an empty array, and we set it back to, I believe, four items. Okay, and lastly, in the use reducer section, I want to show you the approach we use as our application grows. Basically, as we're getting more and more actions, and we handle them in the reducer, it's not going to be easy to keep it in one file. As you can see, it's getting hard to read. And therefore, we just essentially split it up. Of course, in our case, we have only three actions. So this is only going to make sense if you're getting more actions. But still, the structure is going to be exactly the same. And if you want, you can work on it yourself. Essentially, create a new file. I'm going to call this actions.js. And in this case, since we're not going to be creating a component, we can get away with just JS. I think this is too much. And then you want to set up all the actions from the use reducer in there, and you want to export them. And of course, you want to import them in the use reducer, since you'll still need to use them, you just want to keep them in a separate place. And as I said, no, this is not reducer. This is actions like so. Well, then you also want to do the same thing with the reducer. 
copy and paste the logic in that file and then keep in mind that you'll still need an actions so yes you'll have import for actions in two places in use reducer as well as the reducer js and then lastly from the reducer js export reducer and then import it in the use reducer so let's get cracking i'm gonna go with new file i'll call this actions js beautiful and then the second one is going to be reducer js as far as the actions i think it's going to be more straightforward where in the reducer i just want to grab them here copy and paste and we simply want to add those exports since we'll use them in the use reducer as well as the reducer so now if we go back to a use reducer we want to go above the default state remember we have a bunch of things right now coming from the file and one by one we can just access them so clear list first one then reset list and then lastly we have remove item so all of them are coming from the actions and if everything is correct then the functionality is still going to work so that's the first step we separate the actions now let's do the same thing with reducer and just so we can speed this up i can tell you right away that we'll need those actions in the reducer so copy and paste yep that's going to be the setup pretty much for every action that you have you'll need to import it most likely in two places where you dispatch it and also in the reducer that's quite typical setup so let's go with our reducer right now take this one out copy and paste and then we want to export so export default and then reducer beautiful let's save that and then back in the user reducer we also want to import the reducer and i'm going to try to do the auto import let's see whether that works yep so i can nicely grab my reducer and like i just said if everything still works which by the way it doesn't the data is not defined ah you see something really interesting that i forgot to mention of course we also want to grab the data in the reducer right now since we are using it over here so let me add that one to a readme where i have the reducer import actions import data so let's go back to i guess user reducer first let's copy this one since it's in the same folder we don't need to change the path simply you want to copy and paste and now everything should work so let's try this one out i can clear i can reset and i can remove them one by one so those are the fundamentals of user reducer and now we're ready to move on to the next topic okay and up next let's see how we can test and improve the performance of our react applications now before we begin few disclaimers react is fast by default so all the techniques we are going to discuss in the following videos make way more sense when you are working on a bigger application not a small to do list type of application also please keep in mind that i purposely picked simple and straightforward examples just so we can spend all of our time and energy on the performance topics okay and at the very beginning of our react performance journey let's see what exact issue we're trying to solve so first in the app jsx navigate to this folder so tutorial 11 performance starter 01 and lower state and once you get there you'll see that it's a pretty typical application i have here index jsx this is where my components meet in this case it's just a list and also there's a person component now in the index jsx i have two state values one is people which is using data which is coming from our data file as the default one and i also have the count and the initial value is zero so at the top i have the button and below it i have a list component where i'm passing in the people prop 
you can probably already guess that in the list, I'm just going to iterate over it and return a person component. And in a person component, I simply render a name. And in here, I have a console log. That's it. I mean, it's not a magical application. So here's what I want to show you, though. What's really interesting that every time I will click on a button and I'll increase the count, my person component will re-render. So at the moment, you're looking at the console, and you can see, okay, I have four renders. Well, that makes sense. I have four people in the array. I can clearly see that on the screen. However, what we probably don't expect is this. Notice every time I click, I'm getting more renders. Now, is it the end of the world in this application? Absolutely not. Again, these are just example applications where we're trying to take a look at the issue and what solutions we have. However, in a bigger application, if you have a component tree of whatever, 60 components, yeah, that is an issue if you're basically re-rendering for nothing. You're just changing one value here in the lower state component, and then your entire tree constantly just re-renders. Now, before we take a look at the tools and solutions and all that, let's discuss why is that happening. So if we navigate back to a readme file, you'll see that when we covered re-renders, I mentioned this. Component re-renders when the state or props change, correct? But if you take a look at the setup right now, you are probably wondering, okay, but nothing changes over here. So the people stay the same, as well as the person stays the same, right? Whatever I'm passing in the list, it's not changing. It's pretty much the same thing. I'm just passing in that person object. So there's another reason why components re-render. And that is when the parent element re-renders. So what's happening here in the index.jsx every time we update the count, what do we do? We trigger re-render, correct? We covered that when we talked about use state, the set function. And what happens? The list, which is a child, also re-renders. Once the list re-renders, what's happening with person component? It also re-renders. And before we take a look at the tools, let me also quickly cover something that has been popping up in a course Q&A, and essentially is this. Setting up a use effect is not going to solve our issue. So let me navigate here. Notice this use effect. Let me save and refresh. Yep, I have now two console logs, four for render and four for this log inside of the use effect. And technically, as I'm clicking, I only see the render. However, this doesn't stop the component from re-rendering. Essentially, the only thing we're doing we're invoking whatever functionality we have here in the use effect when the initial render takes place. But the component itself still keeps re-rendering. So yes, it's a solution if you have some kind of function that you don't want to trigger each and every time the component re-renders. However, it's not going to solve the issue of person component re-rendering just because the parent component re-rendered. And if you still don't believe me in the next video, we'll cover tools and then you'll definitely see what I'm talking about. And before we take a look at our first solution, let's see how we can utilize React DevTools to measure the performance of our application. Needless to say that my assumption is that you already have installed the React DevTools. So if you haven't yet, please reference the React fundamentals part where I covered the install step by step. And once we install the tools, we'll get these nice tabs in the DevTools, the components, and the profiler. And throughout the course, we have been looking at the components. However, in this section, we'll spend a lot of time in the profiler. And before we navigate to the profiler, let's also discuss something very important. If I navigate to my extensions, while I'm developing, I can see that the React developer tools have that red icon. And once I click on it, 
notice it right away tells me that the page is using development build of React. And something important to keep in mind, by default, while we're developing, our application is going to be slower because React is doing extra checks. So don't be surprised if your development application is slower. Again, that is happening for a reason, and that is happening by default. So for example, if I navigate to one of the projects we worked on during the course, and notice this is a hosted URL, and if I'll check, I'll see that this one is actually blue. And this is also something very important to keep in mind. You don't want to ship your development application to production. So you don't want to host your development application. Why? Well, because it's not meant for production. So whenever you want to push this up to production, make sure that is actual production ready application. Hopefully I make myself clear. And once we navigate back, now let's go to a profiler. And before we even look at anything, let me just show you my setup. So we're all on the same page. So once I click over here, notice as far as the general, I'm using the dark theme, but of course, you can switch to light or auto or whatever. Then as far as density, I went with comfortable, I just like that they're spanning all across. And this one is very nifty, this checkbox. And you'll see in a second why basically, every time I'll do something is just going to highlight the components that are re rendering. Then we have debugging. In here, I have first two checkboxes. And then when it comes to components, I'm just expanding the tree by default. And I don't think I changed anything in here. I have this setup. And then for the profiler, I just have record why each component rendered while profiling. And essentially, if we want to take a look what's happening in our application, we just go to this button, notice the start profiling, it's going to turn red, and then start doing something in the application. And like I mentioned before, I like that option, where it highlights pretty much all the components that are re rendering. And I'm going to use this ranked, I just prefer this setup better. But of course, you can also use this one. And effectively, you can see that, okay, my application loads, right, I expect all of them to render, then on every button click, notice, all of my components re rendered, and it even nicely tells me why the parent component rendered. So what happens, all the items in my list are re rendering, pretty much I clicked 13 times and same scenario. Now, of course, the times are going to be different and all that. But that's not the main point. The main point is that all my components are re rendering just because I'm changing one value in the state. And in the upcoming videos, we'll cover possible solutions to such problem. Okay, and what's our first possible solution? Well, we can lower the state. In other words, I could just move the state variable as well as the button to a separate component. Let's think about it. Do we really need this count over here in the lower state? I mean, I'm just showing it in a button. So simply, I could create a different component, let's call it counter, move all of the logic over there. And then just import that in the lower state. And as a result, yes, we will be updating that state value, but that is not going to trigger re renders in the lower state. So let's try this one out. When navigate to the starter, we want to create a new file. And we'll call this counter JSX. And once I'm here, I'm just going to create that new component. And then basically, we want to jump back to index JSX and grab the values. I guess let's start with our return. And in this case, I can just cut everything out. But that is not going to be the case with the import. So make sure that you leave that use state import because in the index, we're still using it. Correct. So this one just copy. Let me set it up above the counter. Let's go over here, copy and paste. And then in here, I just want to grab this count one. So this one again, we're cutting it out, set it up over here in the counter. And then lastly, we want to 
go back to the index and we want to set up that counter component. So counter component, let's save that. And now let's use the dev tools that we covered in the previous video. So now let me navigate back. Let me refresh. That's always a good starting point. And then let me again record. Notice I'm starting profiling. And I can right away see that only my box is being highlighted, which essentially is a good thing. That means that only this counter component is re rendering, however, not the rest of the list. And let me stop over here and notice all this time only the counter is rendering, right? So that's my initial render. And then all of these times I'm clicking on a button, only the counter is basically re rendering. Why? Well, because state changed. Notice why this rendered? Well, hook one changed, which effectively is our name. Now, million dollar question, are you going to be able to do that in all the instances? Of course not. But this is definitely something I want you to consider before you grab the memos and use callbacks and all that. There are going to be instances where you can simply just split up the logic. So instead of jamming everything in one component and then having those unnecessary re-renders, essentially, the moment you move the logic to a separate component, that's not going to be the case anymore. So notice now I only have four rendered and I still have, of course, the use effect code. So that's the first solution to our issue. We can simply lower the state, right? So we can just set up separate component and add all of the logic in there. So that way we're not going to be triggering these unnecessary re-renders. Okay. And once we're familiar with the concept, now let's work on a small challenge. So first in the app JSX, change the folder. So now you want to get the starter from the second one. And once you navigate there, you'll see that there is index JSX. There's also a list. So the same deal and the person. Now the logic works just fine. If I go here and say, Bob, it's going to be nicely added to the list. However, notice as I'm typing stuff in the input, all of my components, again, are having that flashing border around them. Why? Well, because we are re-rendering those components. So I want you to fix that, just like we covered in the previous video. So navigate to index JSX and decide what do you need to move to a separate component to avoid this issue. And I can give you a tiny hint. Once you set up the entire functionality, you'll also need to fix the add person. So that's the only place where you'll actually have to change your functionality a little bit. So try working on that. And then once you're ready to compare the results, resume with the video. So first, let me just navigate over there. That's my index. Let me just double check. That's the correct index one. And once we're here, let's just establish why is this happening? Well, I have the form, correct? I have the value and on change. And in there, I have a name state value. So every time I'm going to be updating that state value, I will trigger what? A re render. So what happens with a list and a person? They also get re rendered. So first, we always need to look what is causing the issue. In this case, it is the name one. Now, million dollar question, can we move name into a separate component? Basically, can I set up a form in a separate component? And of course, the answer is yes. I'll just have to move some functionality as well. And lastly, I will have to pass in the add person down to a form. So this one, we still want to keep it here because we're working with the list. However, we'll have to provide a parameter because add person won't have access to the name state value. And you'll see in a second what I mean. So first we find what is causing the issue. It's this name state value. And now we just want to set it up in a separate component. So let's navigate here. I'm going to go with new file. We want to go with form JSX. Then here, let's create that component. That's my form. I'm exporting. All of that is awesome. And then one by one, let's 
grab everything that we need. So I'll start here with my return. So we won't need it over here. Cut it out. Copy and paste in a form. Okay, awesome. Then as far as the logic, like I just said, add person will stay here. I mean, I'm working with the list. It makes sense for this function to be in the lower state component. However, I do want to grab this one and I'll submit. And I also want to set up that state value, correct? So let's cut this one out. And we will also need that use state. So back in my index, I just want to copy this one. So I want to navigate here, copy and paste, and now everything is nice. Now, the only thing that's missing is that add person. However, like I already said, I believe two times. Now, add person does not have access to this name anymore. So what do we do? Well, we just pass it as a parameter. We just say name here. That's it. And you nicely saw how it was crossed out. Essentially, add person doesn't have access to the name unless we provide that as a parameter. So in here, we want to go first with the form. So form component, like so. We grab the form and we want to add that person, correct? So add person is equal to add person. We pass the prop. We can save it here. Now it's going to complain and all that. Don't worry about it. Back in the form, we want to grab add person. And now everything is fine. We just need to pass in the name. So we go here with the name. That's it. That's all we have to do. And essentially, I want to clean out my console. And now notice how nicely as I'm typing only my form lights up. Why? Well, because we're not triggering those re-renders anymore. That's it. We're only working with the form. And of course, once we submit, yeah, of course, we're updating the entire list. So there's going to be a re-render. That's exactly what we want. Once we create that new list, I do want to re-render the list as well as the person. But I don't want to do that while I'm typing stuff in the input. Okay. So we know how we can push the state down. Awesome. But it's not going to be possible in every instance. So there's going to be times when, yes, you basically need to have that state value, but you still want to avoid those re-renders. And in order to do that, we can use a React memo function. Now, please don't confuse it with use memo, which we're going to cover in a few videos. Essentially, this is a memo function that is coming from React. I want you to start by navigating to this folder. So 03 hooks in the app JSX. And essentially, once you navigate here, you'll see that we have our first example where as I'm clicking on a button, I'm increasing the count, which in turn re-renders the component, which in turn re-renders the list as well as the person component. And if I need to have this state value here, there's nothing I can do. I cannot just move it to a separate component. We can pass the component, the list component in this case, through the memo one. Basically, we go and look at the tree of our components and essentially decide that, hey, if I stop this list from re-rendering, what's going to happen? Well, the person also won't re-render. And the way we do that, we simply navigate to a specific component. In this case, again, it's a list. So you would look at the component tree. And then we want to get that memo function from React. As with the rest of the functions, we have a few flavors. We can go the react.memo and then pass the component. Let me add here component. So component here. Or I can just grab the memo function. And effectively, it returns a memoized component. In simple English, it just means that now the component will check whether the props have changed. And if they haven't, which again is happening right now with our people, the people prop is not changing. We're just re-rendering the lower state component. And if that's the case, if the props haven't changed, well, then the component won't re-render. Let me go to a list. 
So now let me go above my list and I'm going to go with memo. And that is coming from the react. And effectively, where we have the export, we simply want to wrap the list in the memo. So essentially, we invoke the memo, and we pass down the list. And as a result, notice once I refresh, only the component, the parent component lights up, because that's where we're setting up those state values. And if you don't believe me, let me navigate to the bigger browser window. I will refresh and all that. Let's start from the scratch and check it out. Notice over here, I'm increasing the count. All of that is good. Once I stop, notice only the lower state re-rendered. So rest of them, the list and each person component, they didn't re-render because props did not change. So essentially lists stayed the same. And as a result, we did not trigger those unnecessary re-renders. Okay. And once we have established that memo function is awesome, now let me throw you a mine grenade. What if we have a remove person function? And keep in mind, it totally makes sense to set this function in this component. Why? Well, because the list is here. So let's set up this function, remove person, Pretty much the logic is going to be following. We'll grab the ID and we'll only return items whose ID does not match. And then we'll set the array, the people array equal to that new value. And then we want to pass it down because, of course, I want to invoke it in the person component. Now, in my case, I will copy and paste since we have done that quite a few times during the course. I really don't see the point of setting this up from the scratch. So let me go back to index, copy and paste. And then we want to pass it down to a person, like I said. So we're going to go to remove person is equal to remove person. Okay, beautiful. Then I'll copy and paste right away because we want to do the same thing in a list. We just need to remember that we need to structure it here as well, of course. So remove person. And then let me save the index. And then back in the person. I want to actually grab two things. I want to grab the remove person. And I also want to grab the ID. And then right after the heading four, I'm going to go with button. I'm not going to set up any classes. You can definitely do so if you want. I'm just going to go with on click. And this is going to be equal to my arrow function. And here let's go with remove person. And let's pass in the ID. Now, everything is awesome. And by the way, everything is not awesome because I did forget to add some kind of value here and I'll just say remove. So now everything is awesome. However, we'll probably notice something interesting. Every time I'll click on remove, I'll be re-rendering. So this is something we expect. Okay, we're changing the list. So of course, it's going to re-render. Okay, but what about this? What about count? We have a memo, right? So this shouldn't be happening. I mean, we established in the previous video that memo is checking for those props. And if they haven't changed, well, then the component doesn't re-render. And we saw that in a previous video, that was the case. However, we added this function. And now even without going to the performance tab, I can clearly see that these ones are also re-rendering. So why is that happening? You see, memo is doing its job. Everything is fine with a memo. We don't need to pass some kind of extra argument or anything like that. The problem is this function. If you remember, all the way back when we covered, tum, 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 let me find this use effect, the first one, code example, what did I say? I said that this function is going to be created from the scratch, correct? And it's also going to be invoked if you're invoking it here. So every time the component is going to re-render, two things are happening. This function gets created from the scratch. So in our case, that's remove person. And in here, we also invoked it. Now, we're not doing that in the component here, but we are creating this function from scratch every time the state gets updated. And here's the thing. 
as far as JavaScript is concerned, this prop has changed. So every time we click on a count button, we re-render the component, correct? And every time we re-render, we create that function from the scratch, the remove person. So now in the list component, yes, this value is not changing. This one pretty much stays the same. So memo fix that. However, when it comes to remove person, since it gets created from the scratch each and every time, JavaScript thinks that, yeah, the prop changed. And we can actually go to a DevTools and we can see that. So let me first go to a profiler record and now check it out. I'll click. I can clearly see that they are re-rendering and we'll nicely see that the reason for that is because props changed. So notice it even says the remove person changed. That's why the list is re-rendering, even though it's the same function. And therefore, in the next video, we'll cover a huge callback hook, which actually helps us to solve this issue. Okay, so how we can fix this mine grenade issue? Well, we can use use callback hook, which in React allows us to memoize a function or basically remember the function. It takes two arguments. The first one is the function you want to memoize. So of course, in our case, that is going to be remove person. And the second one is the array of dependencies. And we're already familiar with array of dependencies because we have worked with it when we used use effect hook, correct? So it only creates that function if the value in dependency array changes. So for example, if it's empty, if it's nothing there, then of course, it's only going to create that function the first time the component renders, basically when the initial mount takes place. So let's try this one out. We're gonna navigate to index.js. And as a side note, I suggest pausing the video and try to set it up yourself. In the readme, you can find the syntax that you need to use. Just try to implement this in our component. And effectively, we wanna grab the hook. It's called use callback. And then where we have the function, now I wanna pass this function into a use callback. So that's gonna be my first argument. And the second one is gonna be that dependency array. So first, let me navigate here. Let me push this one down and I'll say use callback. And first, I'll just pass empty dependency array, just so you can see one major gotcha. So now this is empty. Now this is happening only when the component mounts. Let me cut this one out and we pass this one in. So it still removes the person. All of that is good. It's just now we're creating it only once, only the first time when the component renders. So now check it out. Once I click count, I don't have those unnecessary re-renders and we can actually double check that. If we again navigate to the profiler, record over here, it looks like I need to refresh. Yep, I start recording and notice only the component re-renders, not the person one. So let me stop it over here and check it out. Everything is awesome. However, I said that there's a gotcha. So everything is beautiful. Use callback, creates this function only once, but you'll notice that our functionality doesn't quite work. Notice I basically removed one person. After that, I get stuck and just keep flipping these values. And the reason for that is following. You see, when we create this function, basically this is the list that we're working with. So once we remove that first person, we actually change that value, correct? Initially it was four and now it's three, but we still keep using that old value. And I think it's going to be very useful if we log it. So let me go with console log and let me set up people and you'll see what I'm talking about. So let me refresh over here. Function gets created. Okay, I don't see anything because I'm not invoking it, but check it out. Once I click, I have four items over here, right? But then the next time I still have the four items and that's where the issue is. 
functionality is not going to work because we're pretty much all the time just working with the initial array. But since we're moving items, of course, our array is changing the people state value. So long story short, this is why we want to pass the people as dependency. So pretty much every time we'll change the people array, we also want to generate this function from the scratch. So there's going to be instances where you just create this once. Basically, you'll have empty dependency array. And yes, there's going to be instances where you do need to provide some values in the dependency array. Otherwise, as you can see, our functionality went bananas. So now let me save and let's test it out. Notice our functionality works. And yes, we do re-render the person. That's totally expected because we're actually updating the people state value. However, the person is not going to be re-rendering if we're clicking on account. So now notice as I'm clicking on account, everything stays the same. And if you still don't believe me, we can go back to our favorite profiler, record, and check it out. I will only have that main component over here. I won't have the person re-rendering just because I'm updating the count value. Again, we did that with use callback hook, which takes two arguments. First, we want to pass in the function we want to memorize or essentially remember. And then the second one is the dependency array. Okay, and once we're familiar with use callback hook, now let's see a pretty typical use case for it. And for that, we're actually going to navigate away from the performance one. And we're looking for the final one in the use effect. Technically, this video is optional. If you're not interested, you can just watch and don't switch the directories. So essentially, remember when we fetch the users, in the use effect zero for fetch data, I did mention that essentially we don't want to set the fetch data outside of the use effect and then pass it in dependency array, which Vite doesn't complain about. But if you're working with Create React app, you'll see this ES lint wording. Now, I'm not going to place it in dependency array because I don't want to basically run out of my requests. However, I will cut this one out from the use effect. Let me copy and paste. So that's my fetch data. Notice once I run, everything's still awesome. Everything still works. But like I just said, normally with Create React App, you'll get that warning in the console. Now that is not an error, but it is a warning. The reason why we don't want to pass fetch data directly in the use effect same deal, because this one gets created from the scratch. So essentially, you'll have that infinite loop. However, since now we know how to work with use callback, here's what we can do. I can go here with comma, use callback, and essentially, just set up this functionality over here. So let's try this one out. I'm going to go to use callback. In this case, it's an empty dependency array. So I don't want to pass anything in here. Got this one, copy and paste, and we're good to go. Let me save it. Notice the functionality still works. And in this case, I can nicely add fetch data to dependency array, because now this fetch data will only be generated once when the component mounts during the initial render. And while we're on a topic of use callback, why don't we also cover use memo? which is very similar. The difference is that use memo memoizes the value that we're getting back from the function. So essentially, again, it remembers that value. Now, in this example, I'll just show you with slow function. But later on, of course, we'll use it to debounce some functionality. So in one of the complex projects, essentially, there's going to be a input, and we'll use use memo to debounce some functionality, basically to run some functionality later. Now, why am I telling you that? Just so you don't think that we can only use for the example I'm about to show you. So use memoize is actually very cool. You can do a bunch of interesting stuff. Again, in our case, we'll just take a look at the slow function example. So 
the way use memo works is very similar to use callback. We get use memo and then again notice it's looking for two arguments. First one is going to be the function. However, in this case, we're returning something from the function. And then the second one is going to be the dependency array. Now, in our case, in our example, we won't have any values in dependency array. It's only going to run once. Now, as far as our example, let's imagine that in our project, we have some kind of slope function that's doing some kind of calculation. Now, I will simulate that by setting up a very ugly for loop. So please don't judge me on this one. So essentially, let's create a function. I'll call this slow function JS in there. Set up this function. Again, simply, there's a value that I'm setting up a for loop, which I haven't done probably in four years or so. And then once I'm done with this long for loop, I just return a value. Effectively, it's just going to take quite some time to generate that value. So this function returns a value. And in the index, I want to import the slow function. I want to invoke it. And I want to set it equal to value. And you'll see the result. So let's navigate to the hooks. Like I said, in my case, I'll call this slow function. And as I said, if you don't want to work on this example, you don't have to. You can just see the result. And I'm pretty sure you'll get the main gist of use memo. So let's go to tutorial. Let me grab this. I don't think there's a need to create it from the scratch. Now I want to make sure that I'm in a star. Yep, that's my function. Then we want to navigate back to index. We want to import that function. And I'm going to rely on auto import and I'll right away set it equal to a value. So I'll say value is equal to and then slow function. Yep. We invoke it. We don't need to pass anything. And I simply want to log the value. So let me go with console log. And we're looking for the value. Let me save. And again, same deal. Pretty much every time I'll click on account, it's going to take time for my component to render. You'll see that it's definitely slower. If you would have, for example, some kind of input, and if you're typing, it's going to be with delay. So let me just showcase that I'm going to go to button and I'll click like six, seven times. And you'll notice that the value is not updating right away. Why? Well, because again, we're changing the state value, we are re rendering. And what do we do in each render, we run this slow function. And since our slow function is really slow, well, that's why it takes ages for me to see that count of nine. And this is where the use memo hook can definitely help us. Again, the syntax is extremely similar to use callback. We can go with use memo, we import the hook. And now I want to set up the slow function in the use memo. And as a result, you'll see that the slow function is only going to run once when our initial render takes place. So let's go with use memo. Again, two arguments. In this case, I'll pass in empty dependency array. Then I want to grab my slow function. But again, this needs to return a value. So let me cut this one out. I'll pass here the arrow function, like so. And then we'll invoke slow function. And now you'll notice that once we refresh, yep, the initial render takes a little bit of time. But after that, everything's cool. So unless I provide some kind of value in this dependency array, this initial value, the one that takes really long time for the slow function to calculate, it's only going to run once. I'm only going to get that value on initial render. And that's it. Since the value is not changing, essentially, I'm not slowing down my component every time a state update takes place. With React 18, we also got use transition hook, which we can use to treat some functionality as less urgent. So imagine this scenario. In your app, there is some kind of user interaction which triggers some heavy computation. For example, user types something in the input, and based on the input value, you filter, I don't know, 20,000 items. Here's the thing. 
while the computation is taking place, it will actually block the UI. Basically, our app will be less responsive. And as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Ask yourself, as a user, what's more annoying, waiting for some data to arrive or tirelessly clicking on the button? So use transition just allows us to mark certain functionality as less urgent, which in turn prevents the whole UI blocking thing. With that said, like I already mentioned before, React is fast by default. So even though this is a very cool addition to the library, it has very specific use cases, and most likely it's not something you'll use immediately in all your applications. And once we're familiar with the general concept now let's take it out for a test drive. In this video, we will heavily rely on array.from method. So if you're not familiar with it, or you need to jog your memory, please utilize this JavaScript Nuggets video where I cover everything in great detail. As far as the location in the app JSX, we want to grab the starter from 0 for React 18. Again, 0 for React 18. This is what we should see on the screen. Basically, there's going to be an input and we'll have some items below. And if we navigate to the file, you'll see that I have two state values. I have one for text, so that's for the input. And I also have one for items, which initially is just empty array. So in here, I have the form. Everything is awesome. I have the handle change. I also have heading four right below the form. So this is where we're displaying the items. At the moment, they're empty. There's nothing there. And as far as handle change, well, I have set text. I'm just grabbing the value. All of this is awesome. However, let's imagine that I attempt to do something very interesting. First, I'll create new items using array.from, and I want to construct a very big array. Therefore, I provide here an object with a length property of 5,000. And then the second one is the callback function, which gets invoked for every item. Now, I don't care about the actual item. I do care about the index. And yes, this is the case where I'll cheat a little bit and I'll set up the key as the index. Now, inside of it, I also want to return an image, which essentially is that nice and cute Vite SVG. So remember the public folder I talked about at the very, very beginning in React Fundamentals? Since it's in a public, I can just go forward slash and beat SVG. And then once I create that array, the 5,000 items, basically just a bunch of Vt SVG images, I want to set it equal to my new items. And if everything is still fast, we can also slow down the CPU. Because it's one thing to work in development with a fast computer, but it's totally different if you're somewhere out there with spotty Wi-Fi struggling with, I don't know, iPhone 3 or whatever. So the way we can slow down the CPU, so again, we're not talking about the network. We can also do it with the network. In this case, I want to slow down the CPU. We go with Performant Insights. Let me make this sucker bigger. And then notice here, it says no throttling. I can actually go with CPU and I can make it, I don't know, four times slower, something along those lines. Now, let me make this one again smaller, and you'll notice something interesting. Since I'm running this pretty much on every keystroke, you'll actually notice that my input is going to be somewhat slow. So I haven't saved the file yet. So notice, I can nicely type and everything's awesome. However, the moment I save the file and the moment I create those 5,000 items every time user presses something in the input, you'll right away notice that it's very slow. So I typed a few characters and notice how long it took for them to show on the screen. And it's going to be a little bit faster once we already have all the items and all that, since of course, we're not changing the path, but hopefully you can see the issue. So we need to somehow fix this where I still want a fast response here in the input. And then this one, the new items, well, that can happen in the background. 
So let's try this one out where I want to go to import and I want to grab use and then transition. So that's the hook I'm looking for. Then I want to go right after the items and I want to invoke it. And it's getting back two things. It's getting back is pending and the start transition. So the slow function, this one over here or functionality, let's maybe be more precise. We want to place that in the start transition and then is pending will use effectively to showcase that something has happened. So we're going to go here with const and then is and pending and then comma and we'll say start transition. Now, like I said, that is equal to my use transition. And I think I'll make this one smaller. It's somewhat annoying here. So yep, we invoke them. Then let's go to a handle change. And let's set up that start transition. And now let's pass both of these things inside of it. Now we do need to set up the function here first. So let's do that. Let's grab these two suckers. So the array with 5000 items and the set new items. Good. And now let's scroll down a little bit. And where we have the items, I actually want to look for the is pending, the value of is pending. And then if we're loading, basically, if it's true, then we'll display loading dot dot dot. And once we're good to go, then we'll display the items. So right before the heading four, let's open up the curlies, I'll go with is pending. And I'm going to go with ternary operator. So if it's true, what do I want to showcase? Let me go here with heading four, and then loading dot dot dot. Okay, awesome. And then if it's false, basically, once we're done, then we want to display those items. So let me cut this one out, copy and paste. And once I save, you'll notice something interesting, that now the response in the input is going to be much faster. And notice we have this loading. So essentially, something we want to keep fast, which is the response to our user is still going to happen fast. However, the slow functionality is going to happen in the background. Okay, and now let's see how we can do code splitting in react, which in turn will allow us to progressively load or lazy load our application. Before we take a look at the code, let's discuss the main benefits of such approach. First, improve performance by splitting up a code into smaller, more manageable chunks, we can reduce the size of the initial JavaScript payload that needs to be loaded. This results in faster load times and improved performance, especially on slow networks or low end devices. Second, better user experience. With code splitting, only the essential code needed for the initial render of your application is loaded. The remaining code is loaded as the user interacts with your application, leading to a smoother, less blocking user experience. You see, especially when it comes to bigger projects, not all the pages and components are equal, meaning there are certain resources that are used more often by the users. For example, typically, which page do you think gets more traffic? The homepage or the contact page? So million dollar question. If some resources are used less often than the other ones, does it make sense to jam all of that code when we initially ship our application to the browser. Because keep in mind, the more code we send, the more time it will take for the browser to compile it, which in turn will affect how fast the user can interact with our application. So wouldn't it be nice if we could prioritize the important resources over the less important ones? In order to lazy load our components or progressively load our application, we'll use a tool called Suspense. Now, Suspense is a series of APIs, and it actually has been around for quite some time. But at this point in time, only the code splitting feature, which we're about to cover, 
is fully supported. Other ones are still experimental, including data fetching, and therefore we won't discuss them at this time. Lastly, in our example, we'll progressively load a big component when the user clicks the button. However, a more realistic scenario is to lazy load our components when we have multiple pages, which is something we'll cover when we discuss routing in React. So this is just general info, and we will revisit this topic later on in the course. Okay, and now let's see suspense in action. For that, we want to navigate back to the same folder, the 04 React 18. And notice over there, I created a slow component. And essentially, the idea is going to be exactly the same as in the previous setup, where I want to create 5,000 items. Remember, those are images. And then in the component, I'll use use state. I'll set this one up as default value. And essentially, I just want to render them on a screen. So now I want to go back to index.jsx. And effectively, I'm not going to touch any of this logic. I just want to showcase something. So I'm going to go below this is pending, and I'll just showcase the slow component. And as a note, you know, I'll just refresh just so we don't have two of them on the screen. So still within a section, I want to go with slow component. Let's save that. We should eventually see the component on the screen. So let me refresh. Notice it took a little bit of time, but eventually we see those 5,000 items. Again, the idea is exactly the same. This time, we're not getting them from the input. We are importing the component. And of course, the reason why everything is happening so slow is because I'm still throttling the CPU. Now, what's also interesting, if I navigate to the bigger screen, you'll notice in the network tab, more specifically, if we look for JS, since we are right away displaying the slow component, we are also importing the JavaScript code, correct? But what if we have a different setup? What if I create a state value? I'm going to call this show and set show, and I'll set it equal to, let's say, the default one will be false. So that's my Boolean value. Then I'll set up a button that toggles it. So right above the component, I'm going to go with my button. I'll set up on click. Let's invoke here the set show. So set show and we'll set it equal to the opposite value, whatever it is in the state. And let's just call this toggle. Now in this case, I do want to add a class. So class name is equal to BTN. And then when it comes to slow component, I want to go with show. And only if the value is true, I want to display it. So let's go over here. Let's save. Again, let me navigate to the big screen. And notice, even though I'm displaying this component only when the value is true, I'm still importing right out of the gate, right? So I'm still grabbing that JavaScript logic even though there's no guarantee that the user will click the button. And essentially, it would be better if we only import this logic when we actually need to display that component, correct? So instead of importing everything on our initial render, which of course is going to add the loading time, we only want to import that slow component when the user actually wants to work with it. In this case, clicks the toggle button. So how we can do that? Well we need to first navigate up and we'll need to grab two things. We'll need to grab suspense component. So this is a component that React provides and we also need to go with lazy. Then we have this somewhat interesting setup where we want to go with const. We need to come up with an aim. In my case, it's still going to be slow component and that is equal to lazy. So invoke this, then we provide a function and then we go with import. So as you can see, now we're importing this dynamically. So we go with forward slash, and of course the path is still the same. So now I want to remove this one, the straight up import, and then let's keep on moving. 
And now we want to wrap our component in the suspense. And we also want to provide some kind of fallback. So I'm going to go and I'll wrap the slow component in the suspense, suspense component, then fallback prop. Basically, what do we want to display when we're loading? And I'll just cheat. I'll grab this value over here. And after that, we want to place the slow component inside of the suspense. And now notice something interesting. When I navigate to the big screen and refresh, you won't see anywhere the import for the slow component JavaScript code. Only once I click here, notice, then I'm importing, which again is really, really awesome because it allows us to decrease our initial load time since we're not grabbing all of the JavaScript code. And only if the user decides to interact with the component, only then we import. So essentially, this is how we can lazy load our components. Or in other words, we only import the functionality when there's a need for it. One last thing before I let you go. Typically, we will wrap our entire return in suspense. Since that way, we can lazy load multiple components. Now, the syntax and the result is the same. We will still provide fallback prop. And for all of the components, we import progressively the fallback value. In this case, the loading text will be displayed. The reason why I wrapped only the slow component in the previous example was just to underscore which component will get that fallback value. With that, we have the first part of my React course. And for further learnings and hands on experience, you can access the remaining content, including projects and additional library tutorials, for example, React Router 6 and Redux Toolkit, by enrolling in my course. If you found the content enjoyable, I invite you to check out this course, as well as my other offerings by visiting johnsmilk.com or just follow the links available in the README file.